stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. famous Go Farther Gasoline invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. You can't trust a stranger. As you walk down the crowded corridor from the district attorney's office, you can feel the stares and hear the whispers. There's Frank Malloy. He's getting out, but not for long. It's costing you $10,000 to walk out that front door, but it's worth it, isn't it, Frank? Because you have a plan, at least part of one. Yes. You reach the front entrance, push open the heavy door, and go out into the street. There at the curb, you recognize the long yellow convertible and the attractive blonde sitting inside. She slides over as you slip in behind the wheel. In again, out again. Yeah. How was jail this time? Lay off, Vivian. From what I read in the papers... They're going to put you away for a long, long time after the small formality of a trial. Well, don't believe everything you read. I'm not going on trial. You are? No. I'm not going to be around long enough to give them a chance. You're going to jump bail. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You'll lose your $10,000 bond. Doesn't matter. I've got plenty, and it's put away where I can get at it in a hurry. Where will you go? We. We're going together, baby. I'm ready, Frank. I don't know how or where we're going, but we're getting out of the States. We can beat it to Havana and then maybe South America. I'll get a divorce and we're all set. We've got enough money to last us the rest of our lives. That sounds wonderful, but how do you expect to get away? The moment they miss you, they'll be watching for you everywhere. Yeah, I know. The D.A. wants to see me in a couple of days. So whatever we're going to do, we're going to have to move fast. Well, we, we can't just take a plane or a train. Before we start running, Frank, we, we have to think of something, some kind of plan. Yeah, I know. What about a private plane and pilot? Let's find out about it right away. No. There's something else I've got to find out first. What do you mean? I'm going out to the ranch. I'm going to see my wife. You're going out to see Martha? That's right. Why? Vivian, didn't you ever wonder how the district attorney got hold of all my records and books that I kept? Do you think I sent them to him? Do you think I wanted the smoothest gambling syndicate in the state to come crashing down around my neck? But somebody else did. It had to be somebody I trusted, somebody close to me. I want to be sure it wasn't Martha. But, Frank, don't and you... And they have enough on me to put me away for 20 years. I want to know where they got it. Oh, Frank, what difference does it make now? All that matters now is getting away. We'll get away, baby. Don't worry. But first, I want to see Martha. I just want to know. <laughs> As you drive through the city and across the Bay Bridge, your thoughts dwell upon your wife, Martha, don't they, Frank? You begin to think back, wondering just how much Martha knew about you and your organization. Wondering if she knew about Vivian or any of the others. Wondering if it could have been Martha who brought everything crashing down, sending you to jail. And there are other things to be thought of. How will you manage to get out of the country before the district attorney knows you're gone? 
chartered plane and a private pilot might work. And you do have friends in Florida who would help you and Vivian get out of the country. After an hour of driving and thinking, you're suddenly startled as Vivian pulls violently at your arm. Frank, look out! Did I hit him? I, I don't know. He's lying by the side of the highway. I didn't see him in time. What was he doing out in the middle of the highway? Look, look, he's getting up. Come on, we better have a look at him. Come on. He is getting up. Yeah. Doesn't look like he's hurt too badly. Hey, hey, you all right? I, I don't know. I think so. What were you doing out in the middle of the highway? I was trying to catch a ride. Uh, well, does a- anything feel broken? No. No, I, I don't think so. I saw you coming right at me, and I dove for the side of the road. You didn't hit me. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> Looks like my trousers are finished. You, you're sure you're all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget it. It's my own fault for standing in the middle of the highway. Uh, what's your name? My name? Yeah. Chuck, why? Well, Chuck, I feel kind of bad about this. I think the least I can do is offer you a ride. Do something about those trousers, too. Forget it. Forget it. It's my fault. Well, we can't leave you standing here. We're going another ten miles. Okay. Let me get my hat out of the ditch. Frank, do you have to give him a lift? He admits it was his fault. Let's get out of here. Didn't you notice something, Vivian? Something real interesting about that fellow? What are you talking about? Look, he's just turned around. Look at him. Now look at me. Notice anything? Frank. See it? Looks a lot like me, huh? Yeah. Same size, build, even his features. Yeah, if I worked it out right, I could get away with it. Get away with what? Just think, Vivian. How much easier it would be for us to get away if everybody thought that I was dead. <laughs> If you really want to protect the money invested in your car, then the motor oil for you is Signal's amazing new heavy-duty oil that reduces engine wear 50%. Signal Premium, heavy-duty Signal Premium. Now there's the oil that really protects your car. This proved and improved heavy-duty Signal oil does more, much more than just lubricate. In addition, Signal Premium motor oil cools, cleans, cushions, seals, and protects. Result? Tests under all types of driving conditions prove new Signal Premium motor oil reduces engine wear 50%. Your engine keeps its like new pep and power twice as long. So if you're still using lazy, old-fashioned oil that merely lubricates, it's high time to make a change for the better. Change oil next time at a Signal service station. Change to new, harder-working Signal Premium motor oil that reduces engine wear... 50%. Fifty percent. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, will go for the gasoline. Almost every piece of the plan seems to fit together, doesn't it, Frank? If the police thought you were dead, you and Vivian could take your time about getting out of the country. You could go knowing they weren't watching for you. You study the man whom you almost hit on the highway, and already you're planning the last few hours of his life. I'd be real nice to him, Vivian, and get him to talk about himself. We have to find out as much about him as we can. You just leave it to me, Frank. Okay. All set, Chuck? Yeah. Let's go then, huh? Buggy. Yeah. Always promised myself I'd have one of these someday. <laughs> Look at me. I don't even have bus fare. My clothes are dirty and wrinkled, and I need a shave. <laughs> I look like a tramp. I don't blame people for passing me by. Where were you headed, Chuck? Los Angeles, I guess. They tell me the nights are balmy down there. It makes a difference when you sleep in parked cars. Well, don't you have any friends in Los Angeles? I don't have any friends anywhere. Well, that's a pretty broad statement, Chuck. Must have friends somewhere. Maybe uh, back home, huh? I wouldn't know. 
I haven't been home in a long time. Been everywhere else, Australia, Africa, Brazil. Been working on freighters. Just got back to the States last week. Just last week, huh? Right. Been gone nearly five years. Oh, where is your home? I come from a place called Hyannis. Ever hear it? It's in Massachusetts, Cape Cod. No, never heard of it. It's a fishing village. Oh. Still, it doesn't seem possible that a man doesn't have any friends. Oh, you must have a girlfriend. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Had a girl once in Hyannis. Her name was Mamie. Mamie? Mm. It was a long time ago when I was young and foolish. Whatever happened to Mamie? I wouldn't know. I wrote her for a while, but when I didn't get any answer to my letters, I just forgot about Mamie. Say, Chuck, tell me, what kind of work do you do? I'm one of those guys who can do anything until you pin me down, and then it turns out I can't do much of anything. Well, I'm sure you'll fit in somewhere, someday. Just haven't run into it yet. Maybe. In the meantime, I like drifting around the world. I'm not talking too much. I don't get the chance to talk to people very often, especially about myself. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. What are you going to do when you get back to L.A.? Look for work, I guess. I'm broke. Well, if you really want a job, Chuck, maybe I can do something for you. What, uh, what do you mean? Well, did you have a ten bar? No. Well, I own a string of bars throughout the valley. If you're willing to learn, maybe I can put you to work as a bartender. Me, a bartender? <laughs> uh, a guy's on his feet a lot in that kind of work. You can make good money. Yeah, yeah, I can believe that. But, uh, tell me something. Why all the interest in me? Well, we might have run over you, maybe killed you. I think the least Frank can do is try and help you out a little. Do you, uh, do you think I could learn to ten bar? Oh, I'm sure you could, Chuck. It's an interesting proposition, Mr., uh... Malloy. Just call me Frank. I'm Vivian, Chuck. Hi. <laughs> How do you like that? Yesterday, I was bumming around. Today, I'm going to be a bartender. Who knows what'll happen tomorrow? You know, don't you, Frank? You know exactly what's in store for Chuck tomorrow. As a matter of fact, you wonder if he'll even be alive tomorrow. Because now you're certain that he will do fine as a part of your plan. No one knows about him. No one even knows where he is. No one would miss him if he disappeared. He assured you of that. As you turn off the main highway towards your small ranch, you already have the first stages of the plan ready. You stop the car at the gate. I have to take care of some business here, Chuck. You go with Vivian. She'll put you up for the afternoon. Whatever you say, boss. Take him to my apartment, huh? Here's his key. I'll call you. When? As soon as I've made the arrangements we were talking about. Will they take long? No. Everything will be taken care of by tonight. Tonight? Yeah. And take good care of Chuck, huh? Make him feel at home. Now, well, we'll be at your place. You call me. I'll call you. Well, I'll see you later tonight, Chuck. Sure thing, Mr. Malloy. Bye, baby. Bye. Bye. You watch them disappear down the road, Frank, and then you turn toward the house. Everything seems peaceful and undisturbed, and you realize how long it has been since you've come out to the ranch. As you reach the steps and put your hand to the door knocker, you wonder if Martha will be surprised to see you. Hello, Frank. Hello, Martha. I, uh, I've come to see you. Come in. You don't seem surprised to see me. I'm not. You were expecting me? Yes. Then you knew I was out of jail. Sit down, Frank. Would you like a cup of coffee? No, nothing, except... Martha, I think you know who turned me into the district attorney. Who was it? Why, I did. I did what I thought was right. You must have known, Frank. I always trusted you. You were the one person I thought I didn't have to worry about. That's it exactly, Frank. You never worried about me. I don't think you even thought about me. 
There was a time when I was the most important thing in the world to you. So you fixed it, they'll send me to prison. You belong in prison. You become nothing more than a, a gangster, a hoodlum. You're not the man I married 15 years ago. Little by little, I watched you change. You began to make money, lots of money. And along with your money, you gained power. The more you got, the more you wanted. And anything you couldn't have, you destroyed. What did you expect to do? Own everything and everyone someday? But to turn me in I like that, I... had to stop you for your own sake, and I did it the only way I knew how. I cried for months because I knew the only way to stop you was to... was to call the district attorney. I did what I thought was right. <laughs> Now you know, Frank. You know who betrayed you and why it was done. You begin to pace around the room, walking faster and faster, bumping into things and knocking them over. And suddenly you stop in front of the mantel. You see the clock and the feeling of rage subside. You realize that by 9 o'clock tonight, things will be all right. And Martha, conscientious Martha, will have a strange punishment, won't she, Frank? She'll always believe she sent you to your death. After a long silence, Martha throws a shawl over her shoulders and walks outside. Frank, Vivian, everything all right? Yes, I've been listening to the story of Chuck's life. Seems his girlfriend, Mamie, was quite a gal. Now our bartender's in the other room practicing with your liquor. Good, now listen, Vivian, get one of my suits out of the closet and give it to Chuck. Have him shower and shave and put the suit on. We're, uh, going to a party. I understand. Tell him you're meeting me at one of my places up at the lake. Leave my apartment by 8.30 and drive up on Skyline Drive to Mountain View Club. Now don't stop anywhere. When you get there, wait in the parking lot and back. Be there by 9 o'clock, clear? Clear and simple. What exactly are you planning, Frank? Like I said, a party. I see. Good. Are you sure you've got it all? We'll see you at the party at 9. At 9. What are you doing out here, Martha? Listening to the crickets. It's a nice night. Yeah. I used to go riding on nights like this. You remember that? Of course. I'm surprised, Frank. Are you? Well, here's another surprise for you, Martha. I'm not going to do anything about the fact that you turned against me. Oh? Matter of fact, when I leave here, I'm going for a little ride. One we often used to take together. Along Skyline Drive. Frank. What have you got on your mind? Just you, Martha. I'll be thinking of you. I'll get my coat, Frank. Oh, no, no, Martha. Wouldn't be right for you to go anywhere with a... With a hoodlum, a criminal. Frank. Goodbye, Martha. Remember. I'll be thinking of you. <laughs> The expression on her face in her eyes delights you, doesn't it, Frank? Martha is still in love with you after all this time. And later, when your plan goes through, she'll have something to think about, won't she? Something that will be her punishment. Yes, Martha, conscientious as she is, will feel deeply when Chuck's body is finally found in your car, wearing your clothes at the bottom of the lake. Martha will always believe you killed yourself because... She turned you into the district attorney. And above all, she'll testify that you were heading for the Skyline Drive. That part will help eliminate the identification problem. High up on Skyline Drive, you pull into the parking lot of the darkened club, where you agreed to meet Vivian. A few minutes later, the headlights of her car come into view. 
Right on time. What? Oh, oh, hi, Mr. Malloy. Didn't know you were here yet. Say, thanks for the suit. How do I look? Just fine, Chuck. Are we on time for the party, Frank? Oh, right on time. Oh, say, Chuck, would you give me a hand with some stuff in my car? It's right over sure, here. Sure, sure. Vivian said we were going to a party. Is it in that place up there? No, not there. I didn't think so. Joint looks closed down. It's sure dark out here. What are we going to... Just chuck this! <clears throat> Yeah. What is almost over for you, Chuck? What happened? I hit him. It'll be oh. easier to handle this way. Pull that door open so I can put him in the car. Right. What are we going to do now? We can stay here about five minutes and then drive up the highway about one mile. Where the road makes that sharp bend around the lake. Yeah, I know where it I'll is. I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting there off the highway. Blink your lights as you approach and I'll come out and wave you down. Yeah, there. I thought you were going to bring Martha with you. No. I've taken care of Martha. Another way. You drive out of the parking lot, and in a few minutes you reach the sharp curve in the highway, pull over and stop where the edge drops off into the deep end of the lake. Then it only takes seconds to drag Chuck's body to the front seat behind the wheel. Carefully, you go through his pockets and remove everything. Then plant your belongings in his pockets. You put your ring and watch on him. Then everything is ready. You push the clutch in, put the car in gear. And as you jump back away from the car, it jerks forward and over the ledge. <laughs> to disappear in the deep black water of the lake. <laughs> for yourself. By the time they pull the car out of the water, it'll look like Frank Malloy was drowned when his car skidded off the road and crashed into the lake. Let's hope so. It'll be weeks before they find the body, and the water will make positive identification pretty difficult. But they'll find enough there to think it's me. <laughs> and Martha will help, too. Yeah, all we have to do is hide out until he's found, and we'll be free, Viv. Where do we go now? Well, first we have to stop at a couple of places down in the valley. Got to pick up the money I put away. <laughs> well, that's a must. Then we'll drive on to Los Angeles where we can hide out. Then we'll see. Whatever you say, Frank. Now let's get out of here. <laughs> you know, it's funny how Martha tried to send me to jail. When she recognizes my clothes, her story more than anything help to set me free. Throughout the western states, from Canada to Mexico, one gasoline is famous as the go-farther gasoline. It's Signal Gasoline. Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of Signal's good mileage, which has built that reputation but equally important to you as a motorist is the way Signal gives you such good mileage. You see, today's Signal helps your engine run so efficiently, you save gasoline three ways. One, you save gasoline with Signal's quick starting. Two, you save gasoline with Signal's smooth, obedient pickup, free from balking and hesitation. Three, you save gasoline with Signal's lively power that gets you into high gear fast, helps you stay there with a minimum of shifting on hills or in traffic. So you see, considering the number of times a day you start your car, accelerate, and shift gears, even a little gasoline saved each time soon adds up to a big saving. So there in a nutshell, friends, is why motorists call Signal the go-farther gasoline. Why not treat your car to a tank full tomorrow and go farther with Signal? Signal, Signal, Signal gasoline. Your car will go far, will go for the gasoline. 
One morning, two months later, you open your eyes in a hotel just outside the city of Los Angeles, don't you, Frank? Yes, you've been here two months, waiting for someone to find the body of Chuck and identify him as you, the missing Frank Malloy. And last night's paper carried the story you've been waiting for, the story of your death. Now it'll be safe to change your name and leave the country with Vivian. Everything has gone perfectly, hasn't it, Frank? You stretch out on the bed and your hand drops down to touch the small handbag you've kept beside you. The bag containing over a hundred thousand dollars. Suddenly you sit up, realizing the bag is gone. You get up and search the room frantically, but the money isn't there. Operator. Operator! Oh. Yes, sir? Would you connect me with room 303, Miss Vivian uh, Smith, and hurry? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Smith checked out of the hotel about an hour ago. What? Did she leave a message? Mm, nothing, sir. Uh, anything else, sir? No. Nothing. Who's there? Vivian. Vivian, the, the bag with the money. That's what you're looking for? Who are you? He's from the police department, Doc. The police? Yes, he picked me up at the airport. After reading the story in the paper last night, I thought it was safe enough now to leave, only it wasn't. She was taking your money and running out on you, Malloy. And why not? It would only be a matter of time before I meant no more to him than Martha. Shut up, but Vivian. It doesn't matter now, Frank. Sure it doesn't. You see, the newspaper story was just to get you out in the open. Some fishermen did find a body in the lake, but after all this time, it was a little hard to identify. He was wearing your clothes, Malloy, and was in your car. Your wife thought it was you. But I don't see how that I'll could... I'll tell you something, though. At the morgue, we found out different. You see, Malloy, it wasn't hard to figure out what you'd done when we found a tattoo on the drowned man's chest. Yeah, the tattoo of a heart with the words Chuck and Mamie. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember, regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. When you take a chance to save a moment, you take a chance on that moment's being your last. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Gerald Moore, Betty Lou Gerson, Shepard Mencken, and Charlotte Lawrence. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Gus Bays, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday, when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for The Signal Oil Company. Now for Horatio Hornblower, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty... 
you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain in The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now, the Whistler's strange story The Clock on the Tower. After a dismal breakfast, Joe Brill stood silently smoking a cigarette, staring through the narrow window of his prison cell at the big electric clock on the tower of the mercantile building a few blocks away. Joe had once believed that the pleasanter the circumstances, the more rapid the passage of time. But now he knew otherwise. The eight weeks since he'd been tried, convicted, and sentenced to death for the murder of his wife, Martha, had passed with incredible speed. And as he watched the hands of the big tower clock, he could hear its ticking in his mind's ear, as clearly as though it were inches away. Twenty hours of life. That's all that's left, Joe. Just twenty short hours. For unless a miracle happens, you'll enter the gas chamber at four o'clock tomorrow morning. As you continue to stare in hypnotic fascination at the clock, The sound of footsteps in the prison corridor causes you to turn quickly around. Your attorney here to see you, Joe. Oh, hello, Eddie. Good morning, Joe. Well, while I'm here, Joe, I wonder if you've decided what you want for dinner tonight. No, no, I haven't thought about it. I'll let you know. Okay, and remember, the sky's the limit tonight. Yeah, yeah, I'll remember. I won't be long, guard. Take as long as you want, Mr. Morris. Our boy gets anything he wants today. All right, I'll call you in about 45 minutes, okay? That'll be fine. Well, anything new, Eddie? Yep. Good? I think so. First of all, I just spoke with the governor on the telephone. You've got a stay of execution. Uh, No, 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 wait. Not quite that good, Joe. But he did promise to stand by his phone until midnight in case I come up with anything new today. And uh, it looks like I will. What? (laughs) Take a look at this wire. Let's see. Acapulco, Mexico. A found restaurant owner insists your missing suspect, Fred Barnes, is in Acapulco. Dines there frequently. Hope to verify by noon today, Franklin. Right, and Franklin's the best investigator in the business. Yeah, but his wire about somebody seeing Barnes in Aquapulco won't do us any good. Barnes has been reported seen in a lot of places. Doesn't mean a thing. Uh, it does this time, fellow. Even if Franklin doesn't come up with Barnes, the governor says that this Acapulco restaurant man is a respectable citizen with an honest reputation. He'll grant a stay of execution. You mean even if they don't find Barnes? Right. And if the governor grants you a stay, I'll guarantee I'll get you a new trial. Even if the stay's only for a few weeks. A new trial's all we need, Joe. The next time we'll win. (laughs) Now we're getting somewhere, Eddie. (laughs) Sure we are. I told you to keep your chin up. But you know, it it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Barnes not having shown up. He can read. The story's been in every paper in the United States. Wasn't in the paper until the day after Martha was killed. By that time, Barnes could have been somewhere in the mountains of Mexico. In fact, he probably was. Yeah. Well, you're, uh, you're positive he can clear you if we locate him. Well, sure I'm positive. Barnes knows I'd gone back to work when Martha was killed. He was in front of the house when I left. He saw her throw me a kiss. Yeah, okay, okay. I just wanted to be sure. You know, Joe, I've, uh, I've always had sort of a feeling that Barnes never left town. I think he's still here. Uh, you're way off, Eddie. Everybody, including his boss, knew he was leaving for Mexico that day. Yeah, yeah I guess you're right at that. Oh, here, I brought you the morning papers. Thanks. Ah, I guess I'm front page again, huh? Well, I haven't had time to look. And uh, don't you spend too much time looking either, Joe. I uh, brought along a transcript of your trial, too. The 
trial transcript? Why? I want you to study every line of it between now and this evening. I'll be back around six. Read every word of that thing. Maybe you can find something in it that'll help. Something else I can tell the governor when I phone him this evening. There's nothing in that transcript I don't know already. It was my trial. I was there. I remember every word of it. It's all right, but go over it anyway. Especially the testimony of that Jeffers girl. If she hadn't lied, you wouldn't be in here now. Uh, she did lie, didn't she, Joe? Well, of course she did. I broke off completely with her two weeks before I married Martha. Hmm. Where I made my mistake was in being nice to her afterwards. Driving her home from little theater rehearsals, things like that. Yes, you sure did. I knew she'd gotten, never gotten over my falling for Martha, but I didn't think she hated me enough to deliberately lie. To send me to the gas chamber. You know I was in love with my wife. Don't you, Eddie? Yeah, yeah, I guess I do. All right, now, go over that testimony carefully. I've got a hunch this is going to be the biggest day in our lives. I'm positive we'll find that that restaurant man in Mexico is a high-grade citizen and that the governor will grant us a stay of execution. Now, if you happen to dig up anything from the transcript that I can add to that, well, it'll mean a new trial. And many more tomorrow's show. <laughs> Back to the whistler. Well, Joe, you never thought you'd be in a spot like this, did you? In a prison cell, less than 20 hours away from execution in the gas chamber. The visit from your attorney, Eddie Morris, a few moments ago had raised your hopes for a last-minute stay of execution. But now that he's gone, your spirits ebb. Force of habit draws your gaze to your cell window and the tower clock in the distance. Again, you seem to hear it relentlessly ticking away the hours remaining before your unsought rendezvous with death. Abruptly, you turn around, open the newspaper Eddie had left you. A headlined column on page one reviews your whole story. Convicted wife slayer due to enter gas chamber. Tomorrow morning at four o'clock, Joe Brill, convicted two months ago for the slaying of his wife, will enter the gas chamber unless new evidence is unearthed or the police locate Fred Barnes, the missing witness the doomed man insists could prove his innocence. <laughs> Yes, Joe, you're in a tough spot. You've read about it happening to other men, but you never dreamed it would happen to you. Your mind races back to that unhappy day when it all began. The day the police picked you up at your office and drove you swiftly to police headquarters for questioning. Why did you come home at 11 o'clock this morning, Brill? Because I forgot some papers. You never went home at that time of day on a business day before. I never you? had any reason to. It's quite a coincidence. The only business day in a year when you return home from the office, your wife is murdered. But I didn't do it. Then the minute you got into the house, you had a quarrel with her, didn't you? No. It was over your girlfriend, wasn't it? I didn't have any girlfriend. That's not what Corinne Jeffers says. Corinne Jeffers? You talked with her about me? Sure. Oh, we picked you up. Well, then she told you the truth, that everything was over between us before I ever got married. She didn't say your little affair was over. She said there was anything else but over. She couldn't have said that. She did say it. I don't care what she said. I didn't do it. I can prove my wife was alive when I left the house to return to the office. How? By Fred Barnes. He lived next door. You better call him. Why, I... I, I, uh, I, I can't. He left town today from Mexico. Whereabouts in Mexico? We'll wire him for well, you. I don't know. He said he was just going to hibernate somewhere in the mountains down there. Another strange coincidence. The only guy who could have testified for you is somewhere in Mexico. Nobody knows where. But Barnes did go to Mexico. Sure, he went to Mexico. His landlady told us that. She also told us he left three hours before your wife was killed. <laughs> The memory of that first day's questioning in police headquarters still rankles, doesn't it, Joe? Even before they saw you, it was obvious the police were convinced you were the killer and would spend far greater effort in proving it than searching for another suspect. You toss the newspaper aside. The time is short. You realize you must do something. You turn to the transcript of the trial 
in the vague hope you'll find something helpful there. You skip lightly over the original indictment proceedings, scan the testimony of the opening witnesses against you. In the brilliant hands of the district attorney, even the simplest of truths was turned against you. Your every move, however innocent, seemed to stem from a sinister motive. Even the young bride, Mrs. Nancy Walters, your next-door neighbor, was like putty in the hands of the clever prosecutor. You are Mrs. Walters? Yes, sir. You discovered the body of the defendant's late wife the day she was killed, didn't you? Yes, sir. What were the circumstances? Well, you see, I live next door, and I'd just gotten home from my mother's. I went over to borrow some coffee from Mrs. Brill. The side door was open, and I walked in and, and found her on the floor in the front room, dead. Tell me, Mrs. Walters, was the defendant Joseph Brill aware that you were going to be absent from home that morning? Yes, sir. A at least I think so. Your Honor, I object. Objection sustained. Just answer the question, please. Mrs. Brill knew. I told her. You used to visit with Mrs. Brill? She used to visit us quite often, three or four evenings a week. Mr. Brill was out so much. Your Honor, I object to that statement. It's irrelevant. If the court please, the witness's statement is quite relevant. The state contends this defendant killed his wife because of his love for another woman. The testimony of this witness proves he spent many of his evenings away from home. Later on, we will prove where he spent them. Objection overruled. Counsel may continue. No further questions. That's all, Mrs. Walters. <laughs> That's the way the whole trial went, didn't it, Joe? Everything your neighbor said seemed to point directly to your guilt. Now, Mrs. Briggs, you've testified you were also a next-door neighbor of the defendant. And you further testified that the defendant was aware you were going to be absent from your home on the morning his wife was killed. You've also heard Mrs. Walters testify that she was absent from her home that morning. Oh, yes, sir. Then it would have been possible for the defendant to have sneaked home... Killed his wife and returned to work without being seen, wouldn't it? Your Honor! Your Honor, I object. Objection sustained. The district attorney is well aware that his question was improper. I must warn counsel that... I apologize. Further... I apologize, Your Honor. I withdraw the question. Proceed. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Mrs. Briggs, for several months prior to the murder, you had a boarder. A young man named Fred Barnes, did you not? Yes, sir. He left your home to go to Mexico the morning of the murder. Is that right? That's correct, sir. Now, Mrs. Briggs, a little while ago, you heard a police officer testify that the defendant swore to the police that Mr. Barnes was standing in front of your home at a few minutes after 11 on the morning Mrs. Brill was killed. Yes, sir, I did. And you know that the defendant further claims that Mr. Barnes saw that the defendant's wife was alive at the time? Yes, sir. Do you know what time Mr. Barnes left for Mexico the morning Mrs. Brill was murdered? Oh, I do, sir. It was about a quarter to eight when the taxi arrived to take him to the bus station. And you actually saw Mr. Barnes drive off at a quarter of eight. The same morning Mrs. Brill was murdered at a little after eleven. Yes, sir. He waved goodbye to me. Then it would have been impossible for Mr. Barnes to have seen Mrs. Brill alive or otherwise at eleven, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, sir. Your Honor, Your Honor, please, I object on the grounds that the question calls for a conclusion by the witness. All she knows is that Mr. Barnes said he was going to Mexico and entered a taxi. Objection sustained. No further questions. You are Mr. George Adams, president of Adams Incorporated. I am. You are formerly the employer of Fred Barnes? Yes, sir. Mr. Barnes give you any reason for leaving your employ? He said he wanted to spend a year in Mexico. Did he leave a forwarding address? On the contrary, he said he wanted to go somewhere where no one could find him. When was the last time you saw Mr. Barnes? On Thursday morning, September 14th, about a quarter of ten. Where? At our offices. Barnes stopped by on his way south to San Diego. He said he couldn't resist stopping in for a minute, even though he had to get off the bus. The San Diego bus passes right in front of your office, doesn't it, Mr. Adams? Yes, sir. You say that Mr. Barnes did stop at 15 minutes before 10 o'clock on the morning of Thursday, September 14th, the morning Mrs. Brill, wife of the defendant, was murdered. Yes, sir. Then Mr. Barnes couldn't possibly have seen Mrs. Brill at 11 o'clock when the defendant claims... Objection! Your Honor, Mr. Barnes had ample time after he left Mr. Adams' office at 10 o'clock or thereabouts 
to return to the neighborhood of my client's residence by 11 or a few minutes after, the time the state has established as the time of the murder. Objection sustained. No further questions. <laughs> Now, Miss Jeffers, I know this is a painful subject, but were you and the defendant, Joe Brill, in love? I was in love with him. Wasn't he in love with you? Well, he said he was. How long had this uh, romantic feeling existed between you? Oh, off and on since we were in high school. You broke off with him when he married, of course. Oh, yes, sir. And how did it happen to resume your association with the defendant after his marriage? We were both members of a neighborhood little theater group. He used to drive me home after rehearsals. Sometimes we'd drop in at some little place for a sandwich or something, and, well, you know how those things are. Yes, I see. The defendant was seeing you regularly up to a week or so before, he mur before his wife was found murdered. Yes. When was the last time you saw the defendant? About a week before he... Before his wife was killed. Can you recall the date? Oh, yes, sir, I can. It was Wednesday, September 6th. What did you do that evening? We just drove around, stopped at the beach for a while, and dropped into a cute little Hawaiian spot. He drove me home early, around 11.30. Did the defendant tell you that evening that everything was over between you? Uh, hardly. <laughs> What did he tell you? Well, just that... Well, go on, go on, Miss Jeffers. Uh, he said he, he thought he'd soon be free. Marry you? That's what he said. Thank you, Miss Jeffers. That's all. And in closing, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state contends that the defendant, Joseph Brill has been proved guilty of the murder of his wife, Martha, beyond the shadow of a doubt because of his love for Corinne Jeffers. We contend further that the defendant deliberately chose the time for the murder because he knew his next-door neighbors were absent and because he further knew that Fred Barnes, the man he claims, could establish his innocence, was leaving that same day for parts unknown. <laughs> Yes, Joe. The district attorney made a brilliant summation. But it was Corinne Jeffers' testimony that was the telling blow, wasn't it? After that, even your own testimony sounded unconvincing. You knew when she left the stand, the jury had decided against you. Too late, you realized the truth of the age-old proverb that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. For such was Corinne Jeffers' jealous hatred of you that she deliberately lied, committed perjury, to help send you to the gas chamber. Suddenly you see it. The answer to your hope for a reprieve, a new trial. You can prove Corinne Jeffers lied on the stand. You rush to your cell door. Guard! Wilson! Wilson! What's on your mind, Joe? Get my attorney, Eddie Morris, on the phone. Tell him to hurry over here. Tell him I found what he's looking for. You bet I will, Joe. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Tell him to hurry. <laughs> It's all right here in the transcript, Eddie. The only reason I didn't get it at the trial was because I was so knocked out by what Corinne said. I, I wasn't paying any attention to dates. All right, all right. Never mind the history. Show me what you found. Right here. Hmm? Right there, Eddie. You see? Yeah. She swore I was out with her the night of September the 6th. Drove her around, stopped at the beach. Yes, yes, I know all that. How can you prove she lied? Our little theater group had our dress rehearsal on September the 5th. Yeah. Corinne had the lead. Her costumes didn't fit. She phoned her dressmaker. She'd be over the next night. That was September the 6th. That's the night she testified she was with me. She couldn't have been with me. Are you sure she went there? She must have. The next night, the night of the show, her costumes fitted perfectly. Hmm. Do you know the name of that dressmaker? Uh, I, uh, I think so. Yeah, wait a minute. Yeah? Her name was, uh, uh, Bronson. Br uh, Bronson. I remember Corinne called her Mrs. Bronson. Do you know where she lives? Uh, somewhere near Silver Lake. That's all I know. Okay, I'll check on her, Joe. But you know, our best bet with the governor is that we find out that that Mexican restaurant owner is okay. 
Or better yet, that Franklin comes up with Barnes himself. Forget about Barnes, Eddie. Yeah. Nobody knows where he is. You can find Corinne Jeffers. She's right here in town. Well, naturally, naturally, I'll try to find her. But time's getting short. She might be out. So might that dressmaker. But look, if Franklin stands a chance of finding Barnes... That would have got... been fine before we had proof Corinne's testimony was perjured. Look, Eddie, it's my life. Concentrate on this, will you? It's a lot better than trying to find Barnes. Well, sure, Joe, sure, if that's the way you feel about it. Just the same, Get I don't... going on it, will you, Eddie? And then call in if you find the dressmaker and she backs me up. Will you please? Look, you bet I will, Joe. After Eddie leaves, you pace your cell. Try to interest yourself in the newspapers. Finally, light a cigarette. Sink down in your cot. And stare through the windows at the big clock. Finally, a few minutes after two, the guard brings you the news you've been waiting for. Well, kid, so far the news is good. Your attorney said to tell you he found the dressmaker okay and that everything was going great. He's on his way out to talk to Miss Jeffers right now. The next few hours seem like years as you wait for further word from your attorney. Finally, the lights in the cell block go on. And again, you stare out the window at the big clock, its face now brilliant with electrical illumination. Twenty minutes of six. Time is getting more precious with each passing minute, isn't it, Joe? You should have heard from Eddie by now. You begin to wonder if anything could have gone wrong. Again, you pace the floor. Smoke one cigarette after another. Then at last, you hear the guard. Joe! got news for you. And it's plenty good. You sure? Positive. Eddie Morris just phoned. Said to tell you that Corinne Jeffers had admitted her testimony was all one big lie. When? Where is Eddie? Why isn't he here? I guess he's trying to get hold of the governor. He sure has worked hard for you. I'll bet he's as happy as you are. I wonder what's keeping him. He'll be here soon enough. Don't worry about that. Yeah, sure, sure he will. That's not all the good news I got for you. Huh? Eddie said to tell you he'd located Fred Barnes, too. I'm sure glad you hit the jackpot, kid. I always figured you got a bum rap. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to the Whistler. The guard's message left you numb, didn't it, Joe? After all the weeks of waiting, you suddenly learn that Corinne Jeffers, the girl you'd broken off with after you became engaged to your late wife, has admitted that her testimony against you, testimony that had been the deciding factor in swaying the jury's verdict against you, was false. Just a matter of hours before your scheduled execution in the gas chamber, you wonder if Eddie has phoned the governor, whether your stay of execution, the first step toward the new trial, has already been granted. Once again, your eyes wander to the big tower clock. Five minutes pass. Ten. Twenty. Before Eddie finally arrives. You're surprised, shocked at the seriousness of his manner. Hello, Joe. I thought you'd never get here, Eddie. The guard said Corinne Jeffers admitted she lied. She did. Would you call the governor? Not yet. But it's after six, Eddie. We've still plenty of time. I wanted to see you before I phoned the governor, Joe. The guard said you'd located Barnes, too. I did. Where was he? I'm coming to that. You know, it's funny the way things work out sometimes, Joe. That little Jeffers girl was hard to break. When I uh, got to her house, she wouldn't talk. Then, when I got a little tough, she said she wanted a drink of water and went out to the kitchen. A minute or so later, I happened to look out the window. She was leaving in her car. She didn't let her get away. No. No, I jumped in my car and followed her. I finally caught up with her and crowded her over to the side of the road. She got out of her car and ran into a grove of trees. I found her on the other side of those trees, hiding in an abandoned quarry. That quarry was right behind your house, Joe. That's where I found Fred Barnes. It was all covered up with an old raincoat. 
and dirt. But not quite enough dirt. Nothing to say, Ejo. Well, I guess it wouldn't do us any good to phone the governor now, would it? I guess not, Eddie. You knew where Barnes was all along, didn't you, Joe? Yeah. Joe, why did you do it? Did Barnes happen to come back and see you kill your wife? Well, it's almost time to order that last big dinner, Joe. Would you like to tell me about it first? Might as well, Eddie. When I returned home from the office unexpectedly that last morning, Barnes was there, too. Then he did come back. Yes, yes, he did. When I opened the front door, I saw him in the living room with Martha. She was in his arms. They were planning to go to Mexico. Together. by Wilbur Hatch and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated, ASCAP, Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted solely to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. <laughs> Signal, a famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Trademark. The car, speeding up the rain-swept mountain road, rounded a final curve, then swung in sharply until its headlights pierced through the night to pick up the cabin set well back from the road. As the car skidded to a stop in front of the cabin, the woman at the wheel leaped out and ran for the shelter of the veranda. There, she paused only a moment to catch her breath before pounding heavily on the door. Open up! Cecile! Open up! Cecile, I'm not going away. You're going to talk to me. Cecile. Oh, Cecile. Hello, Martha. You've got to talk to me. You've got to listen. Oh, I don't have to, but I suppose I shall. Oh. All right, come inside. Sit down if you wish. No, I'd rather stand. Cecile, you, you've got to understand about that money from the firm. I believe I understand only too well, Martha. You've embezzled us. Cecile, I've been very important to your organization up until now. And... Up until now, you certainly have. Your ideas for merchandising and promoting cosmetics by Cecile have been superb, Martha. Simply superb. Then your inventiveness, development of perfumes, lipsticks, excellent. I'm sure this new lipstick you've worked out will prove a smashing success, a real innovation. However, you've also been stealing us blind. 
please, Cecile. I'm sorry. I'm going to discuss the whole thing with Jason in the morning. But if you do that... If I... I do that, you're through. Yes. He's the backer. The money backs. <laughs> Why, I'd be a confederate, a fellow conspirator, if I failed to tell him of your uh, indiscretion with company funds. You've always hated me, haven't you? Because you've always hated being just a figurehead. I named cosmetics by Cecile. My idea is to put you on top, and now it's crowded there. A little. Yes. Uh, they can probably accommodate you at the inn in the village, Martha. I can't permit you to stay here. So that's the way it's going to be. I'm being kind. You could go to prison. I'll try to talk Jason out of that. Good night, Martha. <laughs> Walking out of the cabin, you want to whirl and tear it a bit, don't you, Martha? Yes. But you don't. You know when you've been defeated. And you know, too, as you drive back toward the inn at the village, that you might as well forget. Might as well drive on back to Los Angeles in your apartment. But somehow you want to think it through. And you decide to stay on the scene. Besides, there's the storm, the rain. And the inn looks warm and inviting as you run your car into the shed garage pick up your overnight bag and go inside. The desk clerk is friendly and they uh, do have a room. 207, Miss Collins. Uh, just sign here. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, the room is at the back of the building, overlooks the alleyway. But That's then... all right. Sorry, the trip was unexpected. Hmm. So you have a bar. Oh, yes. And still open. Well, I'm cool from the drive. I think I'll have a nightcap. Go right in, Miss Collins. I'll have the boy take your bags up to the room. You just take your time. Thank you. Boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Your mood is far from the cheerful one of the desk clerk, isn't it, Martha? But as you enter the bar, you catch sight of someone you know. Yes, old Sam, the caretaker of Cecile's cabin. As you move across the bar and come closer to Sam, yes, you realize that he's had more than enough drinks. And he's saying some very interesting things. No, I'm telling you, Mac, I mean it. I mean every word. Now, if I had the chance, I'd... I'd Kill that Cecile woman, I'd wring her scrawny neck. All right, Sam, all right. You better hit the road now. Get home, sleep it off. Eh? No, no, I want another drink. No, no, certainly, Sam. The bar's closed as far as you're concerned. Okay, Mac. Last time I'll show my face in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry, lady. Sorry. What do you have? What? Oh, never mind. I guess I don't want a drink after all. <laughs> No, Martha, you don't want a drink after all. Because you want your head clear, perfectly clear. Because of the plan that's half-formed in your mind. The inspired idea that suddenly places the key to everything right in your hands. Yes, you may still not have to be counted out after all. First step, Martha, the clerk again. Uh, sorry to bother you, but my room, is it ready now? Why, yes, Miss Collins, but... I thought you were going to have a nightcap. You said... I yeah, know, but I don't feel very well. Must have been the drive. I don't feel well at all. Oh, yeah, let me help you, Miss Collins. And I'll help you upstairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. He helps you to your room, doesn't he, Martha? Very concerned. And then he calls the maid. Has her stay with you as you get ready to go to bed. And then to make it all just right. Um... Maid. Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell me, would it be too much trouble for them to bring me some hot broth or, or toddy or something? Oh, not at all, miss. I'll tend to it myself right away. Mr. Hensel's very worried about you. You watch her go, Martha. Smile to yourself. And then ask the obliging woman to sit with you as you drink the warm broth she brings. Then you're ready for the next step. Oh, so much better. I think I can sleep comfortably now. Of course you can, and you won't be disturbed, ma'am. Mr. Hensel was so sorry he had to give you a back room, but I think they're much quieter. Oh, I don't mind, but you will remind him I don't want to be disturbed, won't you? Oh, you just leave it to me, ma'am. Here, I'll, I'll take that tray. Thank you. Now, you won't be bothered, none. And if there's a thing you want, just anything at all, will you just call the desk? I will, yes. Thank you. Good night, ma'am. Sleep comfortable. 
You've arranged your alibi, haven't you, Martha? You watch the maid go, then throw back the covers, quickly put on your clothes, and move quietly out into the hall. You slip down the stairs, set the lock in the back door so you can re-enter, then hurry to your car and drive quickly through the storm to Cecile's cabin. Only this time, you go first to the little shack where the caretaker lives. You find the door open, an old Sam lying across his rumpled bed, still fully dressed but quite sound asleep, snoring loudly. It's the deep, stupor-like sleep of the intoxicated. And then you congratulate yourself on a real stroke of fortune, a rifle martyr, mounted on pegs on the wall. Quickly, you take a pair of gloves from your coat pocket, put them on, and you take the gun down, slip a cartridge into the chamber, step past old Sam and hurry to the cabin a hundred yards away. It's a long chance, martyr, but luck has been with you so far. You hesitate, summoning your nerve for what's ahead. You light a cigarette, move onto the veranda. Yes. You yes, freeze at the sound of Cecile's voice. Stand terror-stricken as you realize who she is talking to. All right, Jason. I'll be expecting you. Ten o'clock sharp. You breathe a sigh of relief, realizing that Jason Weatherby is not with Cecile, but only talking to her on the telephone. You find yourself praying that she doesn't say anything about you. Then... I have something to tell you, Jason, about Martha Collins. Something surprising. <laughs> we'll talk about it tomorrow. Goodbye. You lift the rifle. Lay it on the sill of the open French window. At the slight sound, Cecile turns quickly. Who, who's there? Goodbye, Cecile. Martha! I suppose we could say you counted me out too soon. <laughs> The silence tells you that old Sam slept through the sound of the shot just as you expected. You climb through the French window into the room. An electric clock gives you another idea. And you unplug the cord and put the clock into Cecile's limp hand. That's all for her, isn't it? And you've completed all but the very final steps, haven't you, Martha? Yes. Hurrying back to old Sam's shack, you're thankful for the rain which washes out your footprints almost as they're made. It'll do the same for your car, won't it? And as you place the rifle near old Sam, you're certain that you've built a perfect case against him. Just one more step now, Martha. Back at the inn, and luck is still with you. You're certain no one saw you leave or return. You're sure your alibi is perfect. And a few minutes after you're again in your room, you clinch it with a phone call to the desk clerk. A desk clerk? Hello, uh, Mr. Hanser? Yes, Miss Collins. I'm sorry to bother you people again, but my room, it's so cold. I'd been sleeping soundly. I woke up just freezing. Oh, we can send up an electric blanket for you, Miss Collins. Oh, that would be fine if it's not too much trouble. No trouble at all, Miss. We want everything to be just right for you. I'm sure you do. And, well, you've all helped me much more than you know. <laughs> When you hear a fanfare, you expect an announcement, something new, something important. Well, tonight's signal announces something excitingly new, something of major importance to every car owner. A new motor oil, so completely different, so vastly improved, it actually reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. New signal premium motor oil. It's true. New Signal Premium Motor Oil is the result of years of research involving new scientific techniques never before available to the petroleum industry. Scientific techniques which are actually able to measure at the very instant it happens exactly how much wear takes place under every different driving condition and at all rates of speed. Then engineers set out to develop new compounds, new lubricating qualities, to reduce wear under not just one, not just two, but under all driving conditions and speeds. Now this amazing new product is ready for you at Signal Service Station. 
the new Signal Motor Oil that reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. New Signal Premium Motor Oil. It's all fallen into place, hasn't it? From the moment when Cecile Dumas thought that she would ruin you by reporting your thefts to the head of the cosmetics firm. Until now, when Cecile lies dead in her cabin. A victim of a shot from her caretaker's hunting rifle. You've managed it all with a perfect alibi setup. Every sort of proof that you weren't out of your hotel room. And old Sam, Cecile's caretaker, was overheard making threatening reports to the hotel barkeeper. It's going to be a perfect case against him, isn't it? And now all you must do is complete the bluff, Martha. The next day is sunny, and you begin the morning by hurrying down to the village train depot, waiting for Jason Weatherby's train to come chugging into view. Jace! Oh, Jace, over here! Well, well, Martha, oh. my girl, how are you? I'm just fine, Jace. And you? Oh, not too lively. train always tires me out, you know. Nice of you to come down and meet me. You needn't have bothered. Well, it's a long way to Cecile's cabin. Come along, my car's right over there. Right. Uh, uh Marta. Uh-huh? Tell me, what's this all about? Do you know? I mean, uh, Cecile, what's on her mind? You don't know? I haven't been able to pry a thing out of her. I was talking to her last night. Oh? Well, she said it was something important. Uh, we had to get together right away. <laughs> Uh, you know, don't you, Martha? Uh-huh. It's a secret. Uh, how long have you known this, uh, this secret? Oh, for days and days. Well, I've never known any woman who could keep a secret more than 12 hours. Oh, you... Uh, come on, let's go straight up to Cecile's cabin. Funny, doesn't that? Yeah. Suppose she's still asleep? Yeah, could be. You know how Cecile loves to sleep late. Come on, let's go down to the patio. The French windows might be open. Oh, we're in luck. They are open. Good. I'll see you, Martha. Oh, thank you. Uh, what do you say we raid the kitchen, eh? I could use some breakfast. Good idea. Come on, let's... Martha, what's the matter? What? Oh. Good Lord. Cecile. Cecile. Jason, what happened to her? Martha, she... Uh, she's dead. Dead? Oh, jeez. Now, 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 easy, easy, my girl, easy. Better sit down. All right. I'll be all right. Oh, jeez, how horrible. Yeah. She's been shot. Shot? An accident? Well, I don't see the gun around anywhere. You... You mean it was... It was... Well, she must have been standing right here when it happened. You see, when she fell, she knocked... There's things off the desk. Mm. Clock two, pull the cord out of the wall plug. Yes. Stopped a few minutes after ten. Now, wait a minute. Must have happened right after I got through talking to her on the phone. I called her at ten. Oh, was she alone at the time? I... I don't know. Well, what did she say? I mean, was she expecting anyone? Oh, not that I know of. We just talked about my coming up here and about you. And that surprise. Oh, well, it's only a new lipstick I've perfected, that's all. Oh, Cecile just went on to complain about things in general. You know, the plant and the place here. Sam, the caretaker. Jace. And... What? Sam, where do you suppose he is? It's strange he didn't hear the shot. Let's investigate. Say, that's right. Come on, let's see if we can find him. Uh, this way, Jace. His cabin's around back. Uh -huh. Of course, he might not have been around last night when it happened. Well, that's possible. According to Cecile, he spent a lot of time in the village. Nearly every evening, visiting the bar. Oh, Jace, look, his cabin door's wide open. So it is. So it is. Uh, Sam! Oh, Sam! Sam, are you... Jason, he's not... No. Oh. No, just asleep. Whew. Sound asleep. Look on the floor at the foot of the bed. A gun. Yes. I wonder... If... Jace, what are you going to do? I'm going to wake him up. We'll get to the bottom of this. Oh, no, wait a minute. He might be dangerous. 
I think we'd better call the sheriff. Yeah, you're right, Martha. Yes. Yes, we'd better call the sheriff. Your little plan is functioning smoothly, isn't it, Martha? Everything falling neatly into place. And with the arrival of the sheriff, the case against Sam begins to take shape. You listen to the questioning. Poor, bewildered Sam, so very vague about his movements last night, remembering very little, admitting he'd been drinking heavily. Finally, it's over, and the sheriff takes him away for further questioning. Late that afternoon, as you sit on the veranda of the inn with Jason, the sheriff joins you. Were you at Cecile Dumas' cabin last night, Miss Collins? No, I talked with her on the phone before I left town. When I got here, the weather was so bad, I didn't go to the cabin. Mm -hmm. You came straight to the inn? Yes. I retired early, about nine or so. Yes, we found that out from the desk clerk and the maid. But you uh, were in the bar around eight o'clock? Yes, I was. Sam was there, too, wasn't he? Yes, I believe he was. The bartender tells me Sam was in a very ugly mood. Actually threatened to kill Cecile Dumas. In his own words, he was uh, going to wring her neck one of these days. He said that, sir? Yes, and the uh, bartender remembered you being there at the bar, too, Miss Collins. Thought you might have overheard Sam make that statement. Why, no. Okay. You wouldn't be wanting to protect Sam, would you? Maybe you don't think he did it. Well, I... I, I don't know. But sending Sam to the gas chamber, that... It's not going to bring Cecile back. Poor sweet dear Cecile. Now, 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 Martha, easy, easy. Sorry, Jesus, sorry. Well, I guess the bartender's word will be good enough. I uh, thank you, Miss Collins. Sheriff, sure, you really think Sam's your man, that he killed Cecile? Well, Mr. Weatherby, there doesn't seem to be much doubt about it at this point. Mm -hmm. It was Sam's gun that killed her. Yeah. No other fingerprints were on the gun. No, sir, there's no doubt at all. <laughs> You spend the rest of the day in the quiet of your room, in the seclusion, don't you, Martha? Grieving over the loss of your dear friend, Cecile Dumas. And you're confident that you're in the clear, that Sam, the old caretaker, will be convicted of the murder. Then that evening, shortly before you're to meet Jason for dinner, you stroll into the cocktail lounge, and you're sitting there sipping a martini when someone slides into the booth. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Mind if I join you? My name's Fuller. Ned Fuller. Well, I don't seem to remember... No, we've never met before. Miss Collins. Oh, you know me. <laughs> Do I? Yes, I know you very well. Very, very well. What does that mean? Well, it so happens I'm a private detective. How nice. And I know a lot of things about you. As such as? Oh, you're 28. You've been married and divorced once. You've been with Cecile's Cosmetics for five years. Now a partner in the firm... And you've been dipping into the till. Ah, oh, you spilled your drink. See here, what do you mean? You I've don't been look so it. shocked. And don't try to deny it. You see, I'm the guy who found out you were copying the company dough. You? Uh-huh. Cecile Dumar hired me. I see. Uh, don't you think we should continue this discussion elsewhere? In the private? All right. Let's go upstairs. <laughs> It was all arranged. I talked it over with Cecile before I left town. She wasn't going to say anything, and I was going to pay back the money, every cent of it. Well, that was nice of Cecile, wasn't it? Uh, uh, mind if I fix myself another drink? Oh, no, let me. No, no, no. You just sit right here. I'll manage. All right, Mr. Fuller. Make it Ned, hmm? Ned. That's better. You know, I'm glad we had this little chat. So am I. I really saved you a lot of trouble. After all, if I'd told the sheriff about all this, well, he'd been around with a lot of questions. Embarrassing questions. Yes, I know. The motive, you know. After all, she could have sent you to prison. Of course, but as I told yes. you... Yes. You two girls had it all straightened out. Yes. Sit down, Nick. Thanks. Do uh, you have a cigarette? Mm, on the table, right there at your elbow. Oh, thanks. Hmm. This is interesting. What is? 
It's the same brand. What are you talking about? Oh, I didn't tell you. You see, I found a cigarette stub on the porch of Cecile's cabin. Oh? The way I'd figured it, the killer must have smoked it while waiting there on the veranda by the French windows for Cecile to show up. I see. And the brand name on that cigarette is the same as this one. But it happens to be Cecile's brand, too. It might have been her cigarette. She could have tossed it out the window, you know. It's a standard brand. Anyone might have smoked it. Say, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that figures. Besides, I wasn't near the cabin last night. I went to bed here about 9 o'clock. The desk clerk and the maid can tell you that. You know, I'm glad I didn't go to the sheriff. So am I, Ned. And I won't be unappreciative. Ah, that. Of course, it'll be a while yet before I'm able to get my hands on some cash. Sure, it will. Time will take care of that, huh? Mm. I was worried about money now. You know, Ned, I think we're going to get along very well. The two of us. I think you have something there. Ned. No. Yes, I... I'm sure we're going to get along very well together. I told you that Signal's amazing new motor oil actually cuts in half engine wear due to lubrication. That was only half the story. Here's what half as much engine wear means to your car's performance, to your budget. By reducing engine wear 50%, new Signal Premium Motor Oil will keep that like new pep and power in your motor twice as long. 50% reduction in engine wear means that if your car is not already an oil eater, new Signal Premium will double the period during which you'll continue to enjoy low oil consumption. 50% reduction in engine wear means that new Signal Premium will keep gasoline mileage up, maintenance costs down. Yet this wonderful new Signal Lubricant gives you all these extra benefits at no increase in price. Good reason to get your next oil change at a Signal service station. Change to Signal's amazing new motor oil that reduces engine wear 50%. New Signal Premium Motor Oil. The threat is gone now, isn't it, Martha? With a kiss. Yes, from the moment Ned Fuller, the private detective, took you in his arms, you were certain he wouldn't talk to the sheriff, tell him what he knew about the money you'd stolen from Cecile's cosmetics, or turn over the cigarette stuff. Your cigarette, Martha. The one you so carelessly dropped on the porch of Cecile's cabin the night you killed her. You're sure you're in the clear now, aren't you? Yes. You're certain of that. And the following morning, as you pack your bags, there's a knock on the door of your room at the inn. Good morning, Miss Collins. Oh, Sheriff, good morning. Mind if I come in? No, of course not. I'm just getting my things ready. I'm going back to the city this morning. No, I'm afraid you're not, Miss Collins. Oh, what? You were lying when you said you went at the cab on the night your friend Cecile Dumas was murdered. You see, your new clue has turned up. New clue? Yes. A cigarette stuff. Well, uh... It was found on the porch of Miss Dumas' cabin. Well, that means nothing. I... I smoked several when Jason and I discovered the body. I know. We found those, too. But the one I'm talking about was left before the murder. You see, it was rain-soaked. And it stopped raining at 12 o'clock that night. We believe it's yours. My... Oh, now, really, Sheriff, well, a lot of people smoke my brand of cigarettes. Cecile did, as a matter of fact. We know that, Miss Collins. Besides, what possible motive could I have had? I don't think we'll have too much trouble establishing a motive. You see, we've already talked to a private detective named Fuller. Ned Fuller? Mm -hmm. Oh, Sheriff. Ned. Well, let's say that Ned's a friend of mine. Perhaps, Miss Collins. But he was also in love with Cecile Dumas. Ned was in love with Cecile? Yes. They were planning on being married. 
Married? Yes. Well, but I... But he... Oh, uh, that kiss, Miss Collins? That's why we're so sure that cigarette stub is yours. You see, we had the lipstick on it analyzed. According to your partner, Mr. Weatherby, you not only invented this lipstick, you're the only person in the world who has it. Then Ned was... That's right. The only reason Ned Fuller kissed you was to match up the rare lipstick and the cigarette stub with the lipstick you use. And that trademark of yours, Miss Collins, is going to put you in the gas chamber. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you this about the amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil, which reduces by 50% engine wear due to lubrication. It's available only at independent signal service stations from the same friendly dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Betty Lou Gerson, Joe Gilbert, John Stevenson, Bruce Payne, and Bill Boucher. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joe Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Murder Arrangement. The darkness of the deserted road was exaggerated by the shroud of trees lining either side. Larry Sims, bending over, trying to fix the tire on his car, felt very much alone, and he worked clumsily, impatiently. He straightened up at the sound of another car approaching very fast. Suddenly, the other car swerved in toward him. He leaped back just in time. It almost struck him down as its fender scraped his. Larry sprang forward again as the speeding vehicle rushed on. He tried to catch a glimpse of the driver, the number on the license plates. But the car, its lights off, was quickly swallowed up in the night. And all that Larry knew for certain was that someone had followed him, deliberately tried to kill him. He was still shaking nervously as he drove back to town. Even the friendly lights on the outskirts failed to cheer or calm his fears. He drove directly to an apartment, left his car in the alley, hurried upstairs. 
He had to ring the door buzzer several times before the door opened. I've got to see you, Mildred. Well, Larry, isn't this rather an odd hour? To Let be me in, Mildred, quickly. I've got to talk to you. Well, certainly, come in. You've never seen Larry so upset, have you, Mildred? His face is drained of color. His eyes, wild with fear, are blinking nervously as he quickly surveys the room. As if he expected someone else to be there. Someone he fears. Apparently satisfied that you're alone, he turns to you suddenly. Mildred, he's out of prison, isn't he? Fred Belton, I mean. Out? Well, yes, why? I knew it. I figured he'd get that parole. You'd better have a drink, Larry. You're actually shaking. Fred tried to kill me. tried to run me down tonight on a lonely road. What? Oh, you do need a drink. I'll fix it, sit down. I was trying to fix a tire. He came at me out of the darkness, driving fast. You've been listening to too many mystery programs, darling. There are much neater ways to kill people now. Neater and cleaner. Here's your drink. Mildred, you've got to believe me. Have you seen Fred talk to him? Yes. As a matter of fact, I drove up to state prison this morning and met him. Going back to the city. And you didn't call me? Mildred, you know I've been worried about him, trying to avoid him. Well, Larry, I do believe you're afraid of Fred. It's putting it mildly. Mildred, what am I going to do? You know he thinks I framed him, double-crossed him. Did he... Did he mention anything? Ask about me? No. Mildred, you're keeping something from me. He's made you promise not to warn me. He just wants to walk in on me. Larry! The... Your drink is getting warm. And so are you. Look, if you're so concerned about Fred, why not hide out for a few days? I've got to do something. I can't just sit around and wait to run into him. Guilty conscience, Larry. Mildred, you know I didn't have anything to do with framing Fred. I wasn't even around when Fred got picked up. I was at the cabin, at the crest line. Well, then, you've got nothing to worry about. Mildred, please help me think of some place to hide. <sighs> well, if you're that worried... I suppose he has had too much time on his hands in prison. I mean, too much time to think. Say, I know, Larry. What? Joan's apartment. She's out of town for a week. She left her key with me. Fred doesn't even know Joan. Wonderful. I'll go there right now, tonight. You can get in touch with me when you know something, huh? Well, you know best. I'll get you the key. If you... If you hear anything... That is, if I'm wrong about Fred... You'll let me know. You know I will. I I'll talk to him tomorrow. Oh, aren't you going to kiss me goodnight? You bet I am. Oh, you're okay, Mildred. You understand. I, I, I had to have somebody to talk to tonight. A thing like it's this. It's all right. And maybe you're right. At least you'll feel safer at Jones. And Larry, the next drink I fix for you. Yeah. You'll be able to stay and finish it. Good night, Larry. Fred, I'm only telling you... Mildred, you know I'm not after Larry. Well, he seems to think you are. That's why I sent for you this morning, to tell you to stay away from him. You, you don't deny you'd like to talk with him. No, I don't. I told you that yesterday. But not to kill him, Mildred. Larry wouldn't have the guts to frame anybody, least of all me. But he just might have an idea who did. I doubt that. I mean, he might have some information that I could fit in somewhere. Maybe even something he doesn't realize. Something that would uh, give me the whole story. And, um, when you know the whole story? Well, I told you that too, sweetheart. But I'll elaborate. Now, there's three things I want out of life now. One, there's a chance for a decent break. Two, the guy that sent me up. And three? You, Mildred. <sighs> you, you didn't lose your technique in prison, did you? Just made the appetite a shop, that's all. From your punctuality this morning, I'd say it also sharpened your attention to schedule. Yeah, it did. You know, I don't mind that part, the routine, everything on the dot. It's okay with Oh, me. Fred, why don't you stop worrying about who framed you and why? There are other things to think about. 
I know. But I'll get to him, baby. On schedule. In their proper time and place. Hmm? You know best. And you won't stay away from Larry? Nope. Might as well tell me where to find him. So you can talk? That's all, I promise. He's not the guy I'm after. I'm sorry, Fred. I think too much of you to let you get into trouble. When you're on parole, you've got to watch your step. Okay, but I'll find him myself. You do believe it, though, don't you? I had nothing to do with trying to run him down the car last night. I'll try to believe it. I want to. Because, well, you know. Sure, I know. Come here, man. You, you, you'd better go now. Okay. Like you said, uh, for all these have to watch their behavior, huh? Something like that. See you soon? Of course. Good night, friend. Hello? Mildred Carson, please. Speaking. Oh, Miss Carson, this is Jennings. You know, you drive car rentals? Yes. Hey, about that car you rented from us last night? What about it? Well, the right fender was badly scraped. You know, you should have reported that to me. You see, there's a charge for anything like that. Oh, yes, of course. Well, just send me the bill. Oh, well, uh, how did it happen, Miss Carson? Well, I really don't know. It must have been while it was parked somewhere. I really didn't have anything to do with it. Well, it's okay to send the bill to you then, huh? That's right. I'll be glad to settle it. It will be a pleasure. Good night, Mr. Jennings. <laughs> Now back to the whistler. Well, Mildred, you missed out, didn't you? In your desperate attempt to run Larry Sims down in that rented automobile. The only fortunate thing about it is that he didn't catch a glimpse of you driving when he leaped back just in time. But you still have Fred Belton to deal with. Stubborn, orderly-minded Fred, who won't rest until he talks to Larry. Tries to learn from him who was responsible for his arrest a few years ago. You know what'll happen if the two meet, don't you? Larry will say something you're certain that Fred can add to the facts he now holds. It will add up to one terrible thing, won't it? That it was you, Fred's supposed sweetheart, who tipped off the police and brought about his arrest. You must keep Larry out of sight, Mildred. Keep Fred from locating him, talking to him. But it can't go on indefinitely. So there's something else you must do. Yes, you've got to try again. And next time, you know you can't afford to miss. You're pacing the floor of your apartment, wondering what to do and how and when. As you hear a knock on the door, nervously open it. And sigh with relief as you realize it's Macaulay, the parole officer assigned a check on Fred Belton. Oh, Lieutenant Macaulay, come in. Well, thanks, Miss Carson. I haven't time. Just a word right here, if you don't mind. A word about Fred Belton. Yes, what about it? He isn't in trouble. No, no, not yet. I'd like to keep it that way as much as you would. Oh, well, he's just a friend. Yeah, I know. You said that the other day when you asked about meeting him upstate. Fred's landlady said differently. She said you liked the guy. Uh, nosy, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Well, all right. So I like Fred Belton. He's pretty. And you want to keep him out of trouble. And I want to keep him out of trouble. So what's going on? Well, we got a call at headquarters, a call from Larry Sims. Know him? Yes. Well, Larry Sims is a worried gent. Thinks Fred tried to kill him the other night. Thinks it isn't safe for him to come back to town. So? So? What do you think? So I think Fred isn't that foolish. I understand he isn't even carrying a gun. Mm, maybe not. But Fred Belton's got a bad temper, Miss Carson. Uh, just a friendly suggestion. Uh, keep him away from Larry, huh? I'll try. You could keep him away from anybody. Then I'll really try. Good. 
that's all? Uh, that's all. Well, nice to meet you, officer. A cop who's really interested in giving a guy a break. <laughs> There's a lot of us like that. You know that. Yeah, maybe I do. All right. And thanks, anyway, for Fred. You watch Lieutenant Macaulay walk down the corridor out of sight. He's given you an idea, hasn't he, Mildred? Yes, an excellent idea. The solution to your problem. Because if Larry Sims turns up dead soon, the first suspect will be Fred Belton. But you'll need one thing, won't you, Mildred? Proof. You've got to have something that will tie Larry's death to Fred without question. And something that you said, your own words coming back in your mind, provide the answer to that one. I understand he isn't even carrying a gun. That will do it, won't it, Mildred? He isn't supposed to be carrying a gun. No. But you're sure you can arrange that. Just as you're sure you can arrange Larry Sims' murder. You determine to start the arranging at once. The first step, an evening visit to Fred Belton's landlady. Yes, what is it? Oh, Miss Carson. Good evening, Mrs. Elkins. Do come in, my dear. Well, I only stopped by for a minute. I wondered if you'd do me a favor. Why, of course. I have a package here, a little gift for Fred. Mr. Belton, I was wondering if you'd let me into his apartment. I'd like to leave it there. It's sort of a surprise. Of course, of course. I'll give you my key. Oh, well, I, I'd rather you came with me. You see, well, there's something I want to talk with you about. Oh? Well, all right, Miss Carson. Be with you in a minute. Has it been a lovely day? Yes, quite lovely. Dear me, now, where did I put my key ring? I... Oh, here it is. Come along, my dear. Um... How is your husband, Mrs. Elkins? Oh, same as usual. Oh, really, now? I must speak to him again about this elevator door. Stick something terrible. Ah, there we are. Now, come along, Miss Carson. There was something you wanted to talk to me about? Yes, it, it, it's about Fred, Fred Belden. Nicest tenant I've had in the building ever, believe me. He was here for years, long before he... Uh, well, you know. Yes. He's changed a bit, of course. It does that to a man, I suppose, all those years behind bars. But still in all, uh, uh, here we are. Uh, Miss Elkins, just a minute before you open the door. I, I had a visitor yesterday, Fred's parole officer. Tall, well-built man, sandy hair. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've seen him here several times. He's worried about Fred. Oh? And frankly, so am I. Fred's been acting strangely. There's something on his mind. He seems to be brooding about something. Really, Mrs. Elkins, I am worried. Oh, now, now, now. I don't think Mr. Belton's apt to be doing anything wrong. I wish I could be sure. Well, thanks anyway for letting me tell you about it. This way... Mrs. Elkins, I'd like to ask another favor. Of course. What is it? Well, if you could just sort of, I don't know, keep, keep an eye on Fred for me. Let me know if he does anything unusual, the slightest little thing that doesn't seem right. I'd be glad to tell you, Miss Carson. There's very little goes on in this building that I don't know about. Here we are. Well... Now that that's off my mind, where will I hide this package? I don't want Fred to find it right away. Let me see. Um, uh, uh, there's the bookcase over here. Or that chair. You could put it behind the pillow. No, I know. The bedroom. In a drawer somewhere. Good idea. Oh, yes. Yes, I think this will be fine. I... What is it, my dear? Well, I thought I heard footsteps in the hall. Do you suppose... Oh, dear, it wouldn't do to have Fred catch us here. Wouldn't be much of a surprise, would it? No, I'll go and see. You don't waste a minute, do you, Mildred? As soon as she's out of the room, you step quickly to the bureau, open the bottom drawer, and drop the revolver on top of the shirts. You close it again. And you're standing by the window, looking out, when Mrs. Elkins returns. Not a soul there, my dear. Oh, well, thank goodness. For a moment, I was certain Fred had caught us red-handed. 
Well, now, let me see. The bureau seems like a good place to hide the package. Where does Fred keep his shirts, do you know? Bottom drawer, I think. Yes, here they are. I... Oh, dear. What's wrong, Mrs. Elkins? Look at this. A gun. What's Fred doing with a gun? Dear, dear, Oh, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. The idea of Fred with a gun, I... Oh, Mrs. Elkins, you mustn't say anything to anyone. I I'll talk to Fred myself right away. He's got to get rid of this gun. You're quite right. It'll only lead to trouble for him, and we certainly don't want that to happen. Maybe you could take it with you. No. No, I'm afraid that would make him angry. We'd better leave it just where it is. But the next time I see him, I I'll talk to him about it. I I'll tell him to dispose of it. I guess that is best. I'm sure it is. I, I, I wonder where he is right now. I have no idea. He went out late this afternoon. Oh, then he's probably downtown. Mrs. Elkins, is there a pencil and paper handy? I I'd like to leave him a note. Of course, my dear. There's some over there on uh, Fred's desk. I'll have to run now. Uh, help yourself. Uh, and don't forget to lock up when you leave. No, I won't. <laughs> It's working beautifully, isn't it, Mildred? Your little plan. Everything falling neatly into place. And now, with Mrs. Elkins gone, you make the next move. Take the gun out of the drawer and replace it in your purse. Then you drop the gift package into the drawer and close it. You move quickly to the window by the fire escape. Unlock it and open it slightly. Then you leave a note for Fred, asking him to call you. And hurry back to your own apartment to wait. Shortly before nine, your telephone rings. Yes? Hello, Millie? Oh, Fred. Uh, I got your message just now, and the gift. Thanks, but how come? Oh, it, it's not much, really. I just wanted to surprise you. I happened to be out shopping, saw the ties, and thought you'd like them. Well, I do, thanks. Fred, the reason I asked you to call, I've got to talk to you. It's very important. Okay, let's have it. Oh, no, not over the phone. I'll meet you somewhere. Uh, the park? Wait a minute, Mildred. What's up? I'll explain later. Meet me at the park near the fountain at 10 o'clock. Can you make it? 10 o'clock it is. I'll be there, right on the nose. You can be certain of that, can't you, Mildred? Yes, Fred's always been very punctual. And you know he'll be there on time, just when you want him to be. Now you're ready for the next step, aren't you? You hurry downstairs to the garage, get into your car, and drive across town to the apartment where Larry Sims is hiding out. Who, who is it? It's Mildred, Larry. Let me in. What are you doing here, Millie? I came to warn you. What? You better get your hat and coat. Fred is on his way. Fred, come here? But how did you find out? I don't know how he found out, but that's not important now. You've got to get out of here. And fast. think it's my only chance, Millie. I'm not so sure I've it is. got to get out of town, that's all, and keep running. Where will you go? Remember, it costs money to run and keep running. Yeah, I know that. Okay, okay, so you got any other ideas? Yes, I think so. What are you doing? Why are we stopping? The park is as good a place as any to talk things over. And we have things to talk over, Larry. Okay, okay. Huh. All right, come on, let's get out. Look, why can't we just sit here come and... Come on, Larry. We've got to figure something out for you. I can think much better when I'm walking. All right. Have it your way. You know, darling, I really don't have to get mixed up in this. I'm only trying to help you. Sure, sure, I know, Millie. I'm sorry. You're okay. Strictly okay to do this for me. Thanks. Tipping me off about Fred. Saving my life. Millie, I'll never forget you. No. No, I don't think you ever will. That would be 10 o'clock. 
Wouldn't it, Larry? Yeah, sure. So what? So? This. Hey, what? It's the idea of the gun. The idea, Larry, darling, is that I'm going to kill you. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Now back to The Whistler. Well, Mildred, it went perfectly, didn't it? You're certain of that, aren't you? Yes, every step of the way, just as you'd arranged it. Larry Sims is dead, and you've already put the murder weapon, the gun, back in Fred Belton's apartment, in the bottom bureau drawer where Mrs. Elkins saw it earlier this evening. It was clever of you to leave Fred's window by the fire escape open, wasn't it? No one saw you enter or leave his apartment. Now, back in your own apartment, a little less than two hours after you murdered Larry, left him lying in the park, you congratulate yourself. Confident that the case against Fred Belton is airtight. Standing there in the open doorway is the lieutenant from police headquarters, Fred Belton's parole officer. Good evening, Miss Carson. Well. Well, hello. May I come in? Please do. Still worried about Fred? He's been taken into custody. What's that? You remember this Larry Sims I was telling you about the last time I was here? Why, yes. He was afraid Fred was going to kill him. Mm Mm-hmm. Sims is dead, Miss Carson. His body was found in the park an hour ago. Oh, no. No, you don't mean that Fred... He denies killing Sims. But we found the murder weapon, a thirty-eight, in Fred Belton's apartment. I see. You had a date with Fred Belton tonight, didn't you? Well, I... He says you did. Yes, we had a date tonight. Miss Carson, uh, I've heard Fred Belton's version of what happened tonight. Suppose now you tell me yours. But I... Well, all right, I I guess I may as well tell you everything. I had nothing to do with the killing. Fred called me and asked me to meet him at the park, and I did. I I didn't know what Fred was going to do. Then when Larry Sims showed up, there was an argument. Go on, Miss Carson. Uh, Fred had a gun. I tried to stop him, but... Well, he'd have killed me, too. I had to stand by helplessly and watch him kill Larry. You know, Miss Carson, you've just about talked yourself into the gas chamber. What? You see, Fred Belton's landlady, Mrs. Elkins, was worried about him. She thought it her duty to tell us that Belton had a gun. Fred's on parole, you know, and a parolee isn't allowed to have a gun in his possession. (laughs) Mrs. Elkins told you this? Yes, She phoned us early this evening. Fred Belton never did get out to the park to keep that date with you, Miss Carson. We had him in custody an hour before the murder. He's been with us at headquarters all evening. by Wilbur Hatch and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated, ASCAP, Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted solely to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In The Whistler. (laughs) 
I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now, The Whistler's strange story. The Clayton Affair. The day, gray and overcast, matched the mood of the scene on the hill. The old cemetery, high up over the scene, a swirling mist moving in and out among those gathered for the services. The last rites, last respects to be paid by the little crowd of townsfolk who had known and loved Jeff Clayton. Killed in the prime of life. The remnants of Jeff Clayton's family were there, too. Mother Clayton, Jim, Jeff's older brother, Lenny, the youngest brother, cousin Freddie, and, of course, Jeff's attractive young widow, Ardeth Clayton. She seemed least able to bear up under the ordeal, even was supported by the menfolk until the services were over and they were all back at the house, the stately old Clayton mansion on the hill. Only then could Ardeth begin to control her grief. Oh, cut it out, Ardeth. It's over. It's all over. He's gone. My brother's gone. Your brother? He was my husband, Jim. I loved him so much. Sure, sure they loved each other. Lenny's right. At least half right. I'm sure Jeff loved Ardeth. Oh, please. Freddy, it's no use. Stop it. All of you. He's dead. Murdered. Oh, Mother Clayton, please talk to them. They're acting as if as if it were my fault. No one said that, child. No, nobody said it. I'm sorry, Lenny. Jim, Freddie, Mother Clayton. It, it must be the strain. The funeral. If you don't mind, I'm going upstairs to bed. We don't mind. No, no, we don't mind. Good. Good night, then. Good night. Good night. Good night, night. night all. <laughs> It's a strain, isn't it, Arthur? The day, the funeral, as you said. But most of all, the Clayton family. They act oddly, as if aligned against you somehow. And you have the feeling of a caged animal. You want out. You want to be free of the house somehow. And that's why you slip out of your upstairs room, down to the garage. A drive in the car would quiet your nerves, wouldn't it? <laughs> Oh, oh, Freddy. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Cousin Freddy. <laughs> uh, too bad, my dear. My dear. Arthur. Car won't start, huh? You heard. You know it won't. I'm sorry. No mechanic, however. Suppose your obvious intention of going for a spin is spoiled. Uh, Lenny has the other car. It was all right yesterday afternoon. As I say, my girl, no mechanic, I. Well, someone's tampered with it. They don't want me to go out. They're afraid I won't come back. They... You. Hmm? Oh, no mechanic, indeed. There's grease on your hand. You tampered with this car, Freddy. Really? You're observant, Arthur. Most observant. But I did nothing. As I say... I heard you. No mechanic. All right, Freddy, have it your way. <laughs> Good night, Arthur. It's a strange, nerve-wracking experience, isn't it, Arthur? The happenings here at Clayton House. You've never liked or understood this odd, close-knit family group. You return to the house, go to your room. A few minutes later... You hear footsteps, footsteps along the upper hall, and then the turn of the key in a lock, your lock, Arthur. 
You rush to the door. Try it. And step back, terrified with the realization. Locked in. I'm locked in. You wait, nervously wondering and waiting. And then, unable to stand it any longer, you ring for the maid. Then more waiting, pacing, until at last... Yes, Mrs. Clayton? Oh, Oh, you did come. They they left the key in the lock? Yes, ma'am, but I I don't understand. Here. Here, do you understand this? Money, but... Don't tell anyone. After a while, I want you to unlock that door and help me get out of this house. But why, Mrs. Clayton? What's the matter? I I don't understand. You don't have to. It doesn't matter. Just remember to come up here sometime after midnight. And don't let anyone see you. Yes, ma'am. You sink into a chair as the maid goes out, locking the door. The waiting is terrifying, isn't it, Artis? But the knowledge that you have someone on your side now, that you've bought some help, a chance for escape, Very reassuring. Finally, much later, you see the latch on the door turning. She's back, isn't she? And you rise quickly and throw a coat over your shoulder. And then... Going somewhere, Ryder? Jim Clayton. Uh Uh-huh. Jeff's big brother. His keeper, if you like. What is it? What's going on around this this terrible house? I think it's kind of nice here, Ryder. Always liked the old family homestead. You've kept me locked in my room. Why, Jim? Why? Sit down, Ardeth. I don't like excitable women. Tell me the truth, Jim. Why are you doing this to me? I said sit down. That's better. Cigarette? No. Then you don't mind if... uh... Ardeth, your husband, uh, my brother, Jeff, He didn't just die by accident, you know. We've been over all that with the police. Yes, sure, sure. Like they said, he was murdered. I know what the police said. And I know I'm being held captive here in this house, and I want to know why. I'm trying to tell you. This man who killed Jeff was shot and killed by the police. Or were you so busy being the grieving widow, you haven't heard the details? You know I loved your brother. Do I? Well, let's say I thought you did. Once. Only we've been looking into the background of this fellow, Joe Hansen, who killed Jeff. Seems that he had a girlfriend, Ardeth. So? So she was seen with him quite frequently. She shouldn't have been because she was a married woman. Go on. We Claytons have the idea Hansen's girlfriend was married to Jeff. What are you saying? I thought it sounded pretty clear. Do you want that cigarette now? What are you saying, Jim? That you did it, Artis. Because you were in love with this fellow, Hanson, and Jeff wouldn't divorce you. You killed Jeff Clayton. I had him killed in the same cold, matter-of-fact way you'd step on a bug. If... If you're so sure of that, why don't you tell the police? Because we're not quite sure. When we are, we'll decide what to do with you, Artis. If you're innocent, all right. But if you're guilty... How will you know, Jim? How can you possibly know? You can't keep me here, terrify me into saying things that aren't true. It won't be necessary. Not at all. You see, the fellow that saw you and the boyfriend together so many times, he's on his way here. I I don't understand. You will. When he identifies you as Hanson's girlfriend. Oh? Yes. Oh. Well, sweet dreams, Ardith. Mr. Fletcher will be here tomorrow. Good night. This time I'll take your door key with me. And now back to the whistler. It's a dread, sleepless night for you, isn't it, Artis? Yes. Because you know what will happen the moment that witness arrives. Names you as the woman so often seen with your husband's killer. But there's nothing you can do now. Nothing the following morning as Jim opens the door to your room. 
ushers you downstairs to join the rest of the Claytons in the massive library. They sit around like a silent jury. And then you become conscious of a frightening sound. Something just outside the library window. Someone's digging out there, Arden. A grave, perhaps? And you wonder if it's to be your grave. And then the digging stops. Shortly after that, Cousin Freddy comes into the room. Well, that's done. Oh, Arden. You should have kept me company out there. None of the others are interested in gardening. Gardening? Preparing a bed for my new bulbs, Gladiolus. Oh. You're all terribly quiet. We're waiting for Mr. Fletcher, Freddy. Fletcher? Oh, yes. The one who's to tell us all. Hmm. Odd I do hope he's mistaken. I've always had the... I... That you, Lenny? Yes. I brought Mr. Fletcher. We're in the library. Fletcher? Fletcher, I don't know any Mr. Fletcher. Hold it. The important thing is, does he know you? Oh, how do you do, Mr. Fletcher? How do you do? Well, Mr. Fletcher? Uh, no. No, this isn't a girl. I'd, I'd know her anywhere, and this isn't a girl. Oh. Jim, she's fainted. I'll get up, Lenny. No, no, leave her alone. Poor thing. The poor frightened thing. It's over, isn't it, Arden? And you know it even as you sink down on the chaise long and a half faint. You can hear them talking around you, hear them ushering Mr. Fletcher out. A man who could have sealed your death warrant with a few words, but he didn't recognize you. Now you'll be able to get away, go somewhere where they'll never find you. Even if they do someday learn the truth about Jeff's death. You rest for about an hour and then go to the garden for a little fresh air. Jim steps up to you. Ardeth, I, uh... I'm sorry. I guess we gave you a rough time. I know how you must have felt about your brother, but... Well, the part I can't excuse is the fiendishness of all of you. The kind of a family you are. Yes, I know. I... But you see, we're a close-knit family, Ardeth. We were just trying to make you break down and confess. But if you had, we wouldn't have taken the law into our own hands. We'd have turned you over to the police. You never liked me, any of you. Well, you might as well know I've despised you, too. The very name Clayton is something I'm anxious to forget. Now, leave me alone. All right. You look after him, smiling to yourself. Strange, isn't it, Arthur? How it's all changed. How you can say anything now and be excused rather than accused. You turn as Jim enters the house and... Stroll along the gravel path leading down toward the boathouse. You've got to think this out carefully now, don't you? And quickly, too. Decide exactly where to go so they can never find you. And you must get started soon, while the Claytons still believe you innocent. Artis? Artis? What? Oh, Lenny. Oh. Jim said I'd probably find you down here by the seawall. I thought you'd gone to the village with your friend, Mr. Fletcher. I did. Now I'm back, and I want to talk to you. Well, if you've come to apologize... No, I just wanted to chat about Mr. Fletcher. What about him? Well, as you know, I met him at the bus stop this morning. Yes, yes, you drove him out to the house, and he failed to recognize me. I know all that. No, but Mr. Fletcher did recognize you, Arthur. What? Yes, I showed him a photograph. He identified you as Hanson's girlfriend. Why, that's ridiculous. He was quite positive. But at the house a little while ago, he said... Oh, him. That wasn't Mr. Fletcher. What? Well, not the real Mr. Fletcher. The man you saw was a chap I paid to pose as Mr. Fletcher. I told him it was a sort of a joke. Oh, I see. I thought it best to keep the real Mr. Fletcher undercover for your sake. That was very thoughtful of you, Lenny. But you needn't have bothered. You going to tell me he was mistaken? Of course. I don't think so. This photograph is a very good likeness of you, Ardith. Here, see for yourself. Where'd you get this snapshot? Oh, I've been carrying it around in my wallet. It was taken about six months ago. Listen to me, Lenny. 
This man Fletcher is wrong. He's mistaken me for someone else. I tell you, I, I didn't know this man, Hanson. I, I, I had nothing to do with Jeff's death. Okay, I, I don't care one way or the other. What? I'm not sorry Jeff's dead. Not sorry at all. There were times when I think I could have killed him myself. Well, I, I knew you didn't get along, but... Get along? I hated him. Why, Lenny? Because I fell in love with you, and, and you belonged to him. Is... Is that why you did this? About Mr. Fletcher, I mean? That's why. He's mistaken about me, you know. I swear. Okay, so he's mistaken. I told you I don't care one way or the other. You... You do believe me, don't you? Sure, Edith. I believe you. But the rest of the Claytons won't. They'd rather take his word than mine. And if the real Fletcher should happen to talk to them... Oh, don't worry about him. He won't talk to anyone. Cash settlement works wonders. Are you sure? Positive. I've made all the arrangements. <sighs> Jim tells me he's going to leave us. Yes, yes, that's right. I thought I'd visit some friends in San Francisco and perhaps Honolulu. I just want to get away, forget. Sure. You know, I, I've been thinking of getting away from here myself. Go abroad, travel. It'd be sort of fun if we could do it together, don't you think? Uh... Yes, 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 it would. I'm not such bad company, really. Well, of course you're not. Why are you going in the boathouse? Oh, we can talk better in here. Come on. <laughs> you're safe with me. I'm sure I am, then. You do like me, don't you, Edith? You know I do. Enough to marry me? Marry you, Lenny? Yeah, someday soon. Well, I... I'd like some time to think about it. After all, you're five years younger than I am. Oh, so what? That's happened before. But I understand you're wanting to think about it. Um, why don't you come down to San Francisco in a few days? We could meet there and talk it over. Let me go with you now, Artis. No, Lenny. I'd rather you didn't. I want time to think. Oh, but, Artis... We'll meet Friday. That's only day after tomorrow. Well... No, artist. I'm as tired of this place as you are. I want to go with you. You're leaving today, aren't you? Yes, but... I'm going with you. Oh, you don't have to decide about marrying me right away, but... Lenny, listen to me a minute. I've got an important appointment in town at 4 o'clock, artist. But I'll be back in a couple of hours. This 4 o'clock appointment won't take long. I've already packed my traveling bag. Please, Lenny. You'd better do it my way, artist. It's safer. All right, Lenny. I guess it is. There isn't room in your plans for Lenny, is there, Arden? And you realize you've got to move quickly. Get him out of the way now. All you need is a few hours' head start. As he turns, starts for the door. Your eyes fall on the open tool chest nearby. In a split second, you reach down, pick up a hammer, and impulsively throw it at him. Lenny? Lenny? Lenny! He's dead, isn't he, Artis? Yes. In a moment of blind panic, you've killed him. You stand there staring down at him, unable to move or to think clearly. Finally, you take the key to the boathouse from Lenny's pocket, then manage to reach the door. You step outside and lock the boathouse door behind you. Put Lenny's key in your purse. I've got to get away. I've got to get away. Back at the house in your room, you pack your things quickly, stopping occasionally to glance out the window toward the boathouse several hundred yards away. You're certain no one will go near there the rest of the day. And there's a good chance a couple of days may go by before the body is discovered. You've decided to hide for a few weeks at the home of a girlfriend in Mexico. All you need is a few hours' start. Yes? Jim, may I see you a minute? Come in. 
Well, so you're really going, huh? I thought I made that quite clear to you before. Well, yes, but I... You wondered if perhaps I might have changed my mind? No. No chance of that. Well, what do you want to see me about? It's Mother. She'd like to talk with you. More apologies? Well, if you'll just look in on her right Later, now. if I feel like it. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to finish my packing. All right. Uh, you want me to drive you to the station? Well, if it wouldn't be too much trouble, I'd like you to drive me over to Milldale. I can catch a train there for Seattle. Sure, sure. Just as soon as Freddie comes back with a car, he's still in the village. Well, the convertible's out front. Why can't you take that? Oh, well, Lenny's got the keys, and I don't know where he is. Oh. The last time I saw him, he was with you, walking along the seawall. Yes, but that was quite some time I ago. I could hunt him up if you want. He might be at the boathouse fooling with engines. Oh, uh, no, no, don't bother. I'll, I'll wait till Freddie comes back. A sudden thought occurred to you, didn't it, Art? And it helps to calm you. Yes. There are only two keys to the boathouse. One of them belongs to Lenny. His key is in your purse. The other key is in Jim's possession, and he's going to drive you to Milldale. Now you're almost certain of a 24-hour start before Lenny is found. As you wait, you become more and more confident that you'll get away safely. Finally, you hear the big car stop in front of the house. You pick up your suitcase and hurry downstairs. Can I help with the rest of the luggage, Artis? No, I'm taking this one suitcase with me. I'll send for the rest of my things later. All right. Uh, did you stop in and see Mother? No. But, Artis, I I'd rather it. not. Okay. You say goodbye to her for me. And to Carla, of course. Sure. And give a big kiss to Cousin Freddy, huh? Oh, yes. By all means. Leaving us, are you? You think you'll be able to bear up under it? Well, it's a shattering blow, but I imagine I'll recover. Uh, give me the car keys, Freddy. I'm driving artists to the train. Well, I'd be glad to oblige. If you don't mind, I'd rather Jim drove. What's the matter, Artis? Afraid I'd practice more of my psychological warfare? Freddy. Sorry, Jim. Here are the keys. And bon voyage to you, Artis. Do drop us a postcard sometime, hmm? Oh, of course. Are you ready, Jim? All right, let's go. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. And now back to The Whistler. You look around for the last time, Artis. Clayton Hall, and now you're about to leave it. In another half hour, you'll be aboard the train headed north. But your plan calls for you to get off that train, take a plane headed south. Yes, when Lenny's body is found, they'll be looking for you in Seattle. But you'll be safely across the border into Mexico. Now, as you step forward, and Jim is about to open the front door. Oh. Well, I wonder who this is. Yes. Is this the Clayton residence? Yes, that's right. Well, I'm looking for a Mr. Lenny Clayton. Well, he isn't here at the moment. I'm his brother. Is there anything I can... Possibly. I, I was asked to come here to identify a woman. Your, your brother met me at the bus station, showed me a picture of this lady right here. No. Wait a minute. Who are you? Uh, my name's Fletcher. Amos Fletcher. Fletcher? Just a minute, Arthur. Let me go. Not till I get to the bottom of this... Look, Mr. Fletcher, you say my brother showed you a photograph of this woman here? Yeah, I, I recognized her right away. She was Joe Hansen's girlfriend. That's not true. Please, lady, I've served the two of you drinks often. Go on, Fletcher. Well, when I told your brother this lady was Hansen's girlfriend, he thanked me and told me he'd bring me $1,000 this afternoon. We made an appointment in town for 4 o'clock. Lenny's 4 o'clock appointment was to pay you? Yes. I waited for half an hour, and when your brother didn't show, I came out here. I see. Well, you'll get your money, Mr. Fletcher. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Are you certain this lady was a friend of Hanson's? Of course. He used to bring her to my cafe two or three times a week. All right, suppose I did know Joe Hanson. That doesn't prove I killed Jeff. No, it doesn't. But I think it will be more than enough to justify the police detaining you for further investigation. 
I, uh, I think I'll be running along now, Mr. Clayton. I hope you don't mind my barging out to your house like this. If, if your brother had kept his appointment... That's quite I... all right. Then he's pretty absent-minded. Probably forgot about it. Last time I saw him, he was walking toward the boathouse with Ardith. Maybe he's still there. by Wilbur Hatch and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated, ASCAP, Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted solely to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California. tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story. By the Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Two and one makes murder. To Mildred Wiley, the cool mountain breeze was delightful. She was sitting on the porch of Taggart Lodge chatting with the mother of her employer, Philip Taggart. Mildred smiled as she recalled her last conversation with him, when Philip had told her he was in love. Every so often during the 14 years Mildred had been employed by Taggart and Company, where she'd started as a 19-year-old stenographer and worked up to her present position of personnel director and treasurer, Philip Taggart had come to her and told her, in friendly confidence, that he had finally found the right woman. But each time he'd discover, after a few months, that he was wrong. And Mildred was certain that this time would be no exception. Yes, Mildred would see to that. Appearing younger and still beautiful in her early thirties, she'd long since decided that she herself would someday be Mrs. Philip Taggart, an heir by marriage to the Taggart fortune. As Philip's mother spoke, Mildred looked up. Well, Mildred, you didn't have a long wait. Philip's car's coming up the road now. Well, Mrs. Taggart, that, that, that's not Philip, is it? Of course it is, dear. But that girl with him, well, that's the secretary. And Backer. I didn't recognize her. Well, what's she doing? She's spending her vacation with us. I thought you knew. She and Philip are to be married very soon now. Married? Anne? Yes. Isn't it wonderful? Yes, I, I think it's marvelous. Tell Philip I'd like to... See him in the library. Will you, Mrs. Taggart? Of course, Philip, it's none of my business. But I think you're being very foolish. Anne's only 23. Well, she could marry dozens of young men her own age. Yet she chose me. Very flattering, isn't it? She chose you because you're Philip Taggart, heir to the Taggart fortune. That isn't very kind, Mildred. Kinder than you realize. I'm only thinking of you. A girl like Anne Backus, well, she could.
wouldn't make you happy for any length of time. Please, Mildred, you've been with us so long now, you're almost like one of the family, and I'm sure that you're sincerely interested in my welfare, but this is something that concerns only Anne and me. We're being married in a month. A month, Mildred. That's time enough, isn't it? You don't know just how you'll prevent Philip's marriage to Anne, but you're sure you'll find a way. After you return to the city, you decide one thing. You must give every outward evidence that the coming marriage has your complete approval. Yes, Mildred. The more you think of it, you realize that it's all important to you to make friends with Anne. So you invite Anne to drop into your office. You, you wanted to see me, Miss Wiley? Yes, Anne. Sit down, won't you? <laughs> don't look so distressed. I don't really eat people, you know. Oh, <laughs> I know. It's just that, well, I don't know you very well. And somehow I felt that you didn't quite approve of me and Philip. Oh, but I do, Anne. I'm sorry if you thought otherwise. You're quite right, though. We don't know each other very well. And that's why I asked you to come to see me. I think we ought to remedy that right away. Oh, I'd like that. I know how much Philip and his mother think of you. I'm sure we can be friends, too. As far as I'm concerned, we are friends, Anne. If you ever need me for anything, please feel free to call on me. You've made a fine start, haven't you, Milton? Yes, you've made Anne believe that all you want of her is her friendship. And you do want it, don't you, Mildred? You're convinced that having Anne's trust and respect is an important step toward preventing her marriage to Philip. For several days, you consider various other moves. Discard them one after another. You want to be certain you make no mistakes. And then one morning at breakfast, you open the morning paper. Philip Taggart. Well-known industrialist, Mary's secretary, Ann Backus, and surprise elopement. You stare at the picture of the happy pair, then crumple the paper angrily. It won't last. I won't let it last. One way or another, I'll break up that marriage forever. Pick up? Just try a tank full of signal ethyl and see. How easily will your car climb a hill? Climb a hill? Well, just try a tank full of signal ethyl and see. You'll see the smartest, most thrilling performance your car is capable of. After all, signal ethyl, the premium grade of signal's famous go-farther gasoline, is a true super fuel, engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. Engineered to put the pulse-quickening thrill of swift acceleration at the command of your toe. Engineered to sweep you over hills, even those steep ones, with smooth, sure power to spare. The kind of driving that's really fun. So, just for fun, why not treat your car to a tank full of signal ethyl and see. See for yourself. After all the years you've schemed to marry Philip Taggart, he suddenly elopes with his secretary, Anne Backus. But you're still determined to land Philip Taggart for yourself someday. And the day after they return from their honeymoon, you begin. First of all, you decide to win Anne's complete confidence. And for the next few weeks, you see her frequently at the Taggart home. Until you're certain Anne believes in your friendship, trusts you implicitly. And as you know her better you begin to wonder whether she's as sweet and innocent as she seems. Her studied avoidance of any reference to the past or her family make you more suspicious. You decide to take a gamble. You hire a private investigator to look into Anne's past, her family, her connections. After weeks of expenditure, worry, and secret hope, your investigator turns in his report. Well, Miss Wiley, I'd say your money had been well invested, very well invested. Your little girlfriend is personally above reproach, but she made a bad mistake once about three years ago. What? What kind of mistake? She got married. So Philip 
Taggart's charming young bride is a divorcee. No, she's still married to the guy she married three years ago. You mean she's a bigamist? Well, not by intent, by accident. This first fellow she married, Fred Backus, was a no-good tin horn gambler. When he and your little girlfriend split up, she wanted to go to New York. So to save time, she signed no contest papers. And he agreed to file suit immediately. But he never got around to it. Nah. You know where this Fred Backus is? Yeah, he's a sort of commuter between San Diego and Tijuana. He's still a tin horn gambler. Has a room in San Diego. He's a car dealer at a little gambling club, the Diablo in Tijuana. Stud mostly. Club Diablo, Tijuana. Satisfied? More than satisfied. You've earned yourself a bonus. Well, Mildred, you've made quite a discovery, haven't you? Mrs. Philip Taggart isn't legally Mrs. Philip Taggart after all. And Anne herself doesn't know it. The important thing now is how to use this explosive information. That night, you decide on an important move. Two evenings later, you arrive in San Diego. Register at an inconspicuous hotel as Mary White, San Bernardino. You dress carefully and taxi to Tijuana, where you easily locate the Club Diablo and Fred Bacchus. By four in the morning, it begins to look as though your visit to the Southland will be worthwhile. Look, lady, if the boss heard me say this, I'd get fired. But this isn't you and night. And I'd hate to see a classy dish like you go broke. Why don't you lay off the rest of the night, huh? Try again tomorrow night, hmm? Maybe you've got something, Mr. Uh, Bacchus, Fred Bacchus. Look, we uh, close in half an hour. How about me buying you some uh, ham and eggs? Why not? I've known you six days now, honey, and I'm still trying to figure you. You've got class. There's nothing to figure. I'm just a bored stenographer on vacation. You don't like your work? <laughs> I hate it. Well, well, why don't you stick around here for a while? I like to eat. Well, I think you could win enough at the club for coffee and cakes. Maybe uh, Tartar, even, if you didn't overdo it. And your percentage? Well, let's just say that I'm a good gambler, huh? Mm. Think about it anyway. <laughs> Thinking's bad for you, especially on a vacation. Incidentally, Fred, I don't think I'll come over to the club tonight. I've got some letters to write. You mean I'm not going to see you? You might drop by my place for a drink before you leave. Oh, will do. Well, come in, Fred. <laughs> Sit down. Thanks. A Seattle paper, huh? Yeah, a month old, though. I found it on a chair in the lobby. I never saw one before. Take a look at it, if you like, while I order something to drink. What would you like, Fred? Oh, uh, scotch and water. Hey, hey, Mildred. Hmm? This, this girl on the front page, Ann Backus. Who? What about her? She married a boss. Oh, happens all the time. Oh, not this, honey. You see, this babe is my wife. Oh, she doesn't know it, though. She thinks I got a divorce from her. But how could she... Think? Well, when we split up, I promised her I'd get one. And when she wrote later on, I told her it was in the mill. That she'd be free in 30 days. Oh, Fred, that's terrible. The poor girl. Yeah. Yeah, it is tough, all right. But I just never got around to it. Still, you know, it might not be so tough for you, Fred. Well, what do you mean? Oh, I imagine the new Mrs. Taggart would pay plenty for a quick divorce, plus your silence. Well, I'd... I'd hate to do that to Anne. She was a pretty good kid and... Fred. Hmm? You thought what we could do was... Say $10,000? Uh, we? If we had $10,000, I wouldn't have to go back to my job, would I? No. No, you wouldn't, would you? Isn't it worth a try? Honey... Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is at that. Say, how about that drink, baby, huh? Well, Mildred, Fred's no longer a problem, is it? By the next day, you've sold him on a blackmail approach to Anne. Seen him off on a train to Seattle with the promise that you'll wait impatiently for his return. 
Then you return to your hotel, check out, and hurry to the airport. By the time Fred reaches Seattle, you're already there and have set the stage. You're certain that once Fred contacts Anne, she'll come to the one person she feels she can trust with such shocking information. You, Mildred. And a few days later, just as you planned it, Anne pours out her heart to you over lunch. I don't know where to turn, Mildred. What to do? You... You haven't mentioned this other marriage to Phyllis. Oh, no. Not to anyone but you. I, I must tell him, of course. Oh, but you mustn't, Anne. What? You can't tell Philip anything about this, not until it's all over. But I'll have to, Mildred. It's up there to him. And there's the money. There's $10,000 spread to demand. Now, don't worry about the money. I'll lend that to you. Oh, no, I, I couldn't let... Anne, and listen to me. The 10000 is a small price to pay, comparatively. Oh, but Mildred, that much money, it must be... Most of my life savings, yes. I'm not worried about that. Once this nightmare's over, you'll pay me back. Believe me, Anne, there's only one course you can take. I, I, I want to do what, whatever's best for Philip. You know that. Well, let's consider Philip. You don't want to hurt him unnecessarily, I know. But if it ever reached the papers that, that Philip Taggart's wife was a bigamist. Do you know what that could do to a man in his position? I know, I, I know. Well, you can spare him all that scandal, all that notoriety, Anne. You'll have to ask Philip to divorce you temporarily. Divorce me? Oh, but I... I said it wouldn't be easy at first. But you'll have to let Philip divorce you. Then go to Reno and divorce Fred Backers. Once that's final, you can come back, tell Philip everything, and remarry him without any strings attached. But, Mildred, what about Philip? Will he want me back after all this? You know how much he loves you. If I know Philip wants your divorce and in a position to tell him the whole story, he'll love you all the more for sparing him the scandal. If you like, I'll go to Philip with you. Oh, Mildred, would you? I know Philip would understand if, if we went to him together. I'll be glad to. But first things first. Hmm? You tell your Mr. Backus he'll have his money tomorrow. <laughs> Well, Mildred, your biggest hurdle is over, isn't it? The weeks you've spent gaining Anne's confidence have paid you a real dividend. You're so sure your plans will succeed, you're tempted to forget Fred Backus. Let him keep your $10,000. But you quickly discard that plan as both extravagant and dangerous. And the next morning, you're again flying to San Diego, where you wait Fred's return as agreed. A few evenings later, the two of you celebrate his uh, success. <laughs> oh, this champagne's real stuff, huh, baby? <laughs> I can't get over how Anne forked over the ten grand, just like you said. Oh, I knew she would. You, uh, have the money with you? Sure. <laughs> right here, honey. <laughs> how about ordering some more champagne? Oh, now you're talking, baby. Now you're... T hey, waiter. Waiter, a couple more bottles of champ... Ooh. Gee, honey, all of a sudden, I don't... I don't feel so good. I think I'd better go outside and get some air. Oh, that's too bad, darling. Skip the champagne. Call a taxi. Hmm? I'll take you home. Once you get Fred to his room, he falls into a dead sleep. You made sure of that, didn't you, Mildred? You go quickly through his pocket. There it is. The blackmail money you gave Anne in Seattle. You smile as you slip it into your purse. Things are going just the way you planned. By the time Fred awakens, your brief masquerade as Mary Weiss will be finished. Your only worry now is whether Anne went through with her request that Philip divorced her. But that concern is quickly dispelled when you return to Seattle in the office and learn that it is common gossip that Anne has left Philip. You pretend to be deeply shocked and go at once to his office. Well, Mildred, I... I guess you can say I told you so. Hmm? I didn't come to say that. Anne will come back. Philip, everything will clear up, I'm sure. No, no, no. She's left me. She's taken an apartment at the Marlboro. She asked me for a divorce, and I'm going to file immediately. For some reason, she wants me to get the divorce. I, I don't understand it. But if that's the way she wants it, that's the way it'll be. Well, Anne was very young. Hmm. Too young to know what she wanted, really. I'm sure it wasn't your fault. Thanks, Millie. You... You've always understood me pretty well. Right now, that's rather important to me. The 
Philip welcomed your visit, didn't he, Mildred? There's little doubt in your mind now that you've won. That sooner or later you'll be Mrs. Philip Taggart. But the following evening, sitting in your apartment, an unexpected phone call hits you like a bombshell. Hello? Hello, sweetheart. Fred Dacus. You didn't expect to hear from me so soon, did you? No, I didn't. How did you find me? Easy, from your driver's license. My driver's license? Yes, it was in your purse. I saw it three or four times. I see. Well, what, what are you going to do? Nothing, if you play it smart. Back my dough. And if I don't? Then I think Mr. Philip Taggart might like to know why his wife left him. I could make it pretty hot for you, you know. Yes. Yes, I guess you could. All right, Fred, I'll have the money for you tomorrow night. Where? I'll bring it to you. Where are you staying? At the Winston, room 524. I'll be there at 7.30, Fred. I know when I'm whipped. But you're not whipped, are you, Mildred? No. Because suddenly a solution emerges quite clearly. You can remove Fred Backus as a threat and eliminate Anne as an obstacle to your plan in one daring move. Then your path will be clear to win Philip Taggart for yourself. Yes, Mildred, at last you're sure of what you must do. And you set your final plan into action the very next afternoon when you visit Anne at her apartment at the Marlboro. Oh, Mildred... Come in. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. You're the first person I've seen since I left Philip. Oh, here, sit down. Oh, well, I can't stay very long right now, but I had a hunch you might be a little bit lonesome. Wondered if you were planning to be home this evening. I thought I'd stop by later. Oh, I'd love to see you. I'll be here alone all evening. How about a drink? No, I don't think so. I'll just have a cigarette with you and run. Oh, there's some in the box on the table. Oh, I have some, thank you. John, hey, that's your last mad. Oh, don't I have any out? I'll go in the kitchen and get some. Fine. Meanwhile, do you mind if I powder my nose? Of course not. Right over there. Well, you've found out one thing, haven't you, Mildred? Anne is going to be home all evening, alone. Now you must get what you came for. Anything to tie Anne in with your coming meeting with Fred Backus. You glance around, see Anne's laundry bag in the corner. Reach in and come in with a soil handkerchief carrying the initials A.T. This is all you need, isn't it, Mildred? A few minutes later, you leave Anne. And at 7 o'clock that evening, you select a hat that comes well down over your face, don a veil and a loose-fitting blue coat, and take a steel letter opener from your desk, place it in your purse, leave your apartment, and walk the few blocks to the Winston Hotel... And Fred Backus. You know, you shouldn't have run out on me like you did, baby. Okay, Fred, I shouldn't have run out on you. Especially, you shouldn't have taken all the dough. You brought it with you? Yes. Right here in my purse. Here it is. Oh, sorry, Fred, it slipped out of my hand. Oh, don't let that worry you. I never mind stooping. <laughs> Without a glance at the man you have just killed, you carefully wipe your fingerprints from the steel letter opener and wrap it in a newspaper. Next, you pointedly drop Anne's initial handkerchief near the door. Quietly make your way from the hotel to the corner where you toss the letter opener into a sewer and then stroll back to your apartment. Next day, the papers carry an account of the murder of Fred Backus. But it's not until two days later that the police trace the handkerchief to Anne Taggart and pick her up on suspicion of murder. It's almost over, isn't it, Mildred? The following morning, as you reach the office, you find a telegram on your desk. In view of recent unhappy developments, Mother and I are staying indefinitely at Taggart Lodge. We'd enjoy having you spend weekend with us if you care to drive up tomorrow. Affectionately, Philip. Hello? Did you get the telegram I left on your desk okay, Miss Wiley? Oh, yes, Donnie, yes. No bad news, I hope. On the contrary, it's good news. I've just found something that means a great deal to me. Something I once thought I'd lost. How long will your 
your car last? Well, one thing is for sure. If you could reduce engine wear 50%, your car should last a lot longer, shouldn't it? And now you can do just that. Reduce engine wear due to lubrication 50% with amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil. Think of the extra driving pleasure, the extra savings this can mean for you. Thanks to new Signal Premium, your car should now run twice as many miles before needing an overhaul due to engine wear. If your car is not already an oil eater, new Signal Premium should double the period during which you'll continue to enjoy low oil consumption. And speaking of price, although most things have gone up, 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 this superior quality, heavy-duty type oil that gives you all these extra benefits has not been increased in price at Signal stations. So if you want to keep expenses down and your car's performance up for a long time to come, you know the oil to change to. New Signal Premium. And you know where to get it. At Signal Service Station. Well, Mildred, you're almost satisfied now, aren't you? With Anne accused of Fred Backus' murder, you're certain it's just a matter of time until you become Mrs. Philip Taggart. When you arrive at Taggart Lodge for the weekend, the time you spend with Philip is made even more enjoyable by the secure knowledge that no one, least of all Anne, has any idea you even knew Fred Backus. You sleep late Sunday morning, and when you go down for breakfast, there's a note from Philip that he and his mother have gone into town. When they return late in the afternoon, you receive a startling surprise. What? Well, Anne, dear. Hello, Mildred. Well, are, are you... Is everything all right? As far as Philip and I are concerned, everything's perfect. We're being remarried immediately. Remarried? Yes, Mildred. Now that Anne is a legal widow, I want to make her my legal wife as quickly as possible. But, but how did... Anne had she... nothing to do with Fred Backus's death, Mildred. But... but... That's wonderful. That's wonderful news. Mildred, this is Police Lieutenant Jason. Police? Yes. He thinks you might know something about Fred Backus. I? Oh, that's preposterous. Why should the lieutenant think anything like that? Because the switchboard at Mr. Backus' hotel shows he phoned you and talked to you for five minutes the night before he was killed, Miss Wiley. Well, I... Well, well, yes, he he did call me, but I didn't even know him. A mutual friend asked him to call me. Mm, Could be. But whoever killed Fred Backus left Ann Taggart's handkerchief at the scene of the crime, Miss Wiley. You and she are the only ones who had access to that handkerchief. How could I have obtained her handkerchief? Easily. You could have taken it the afternoon you called on her, a few hours before Backus was killed. Well, that's absurd. Anyone could have taken it. We've established beyond any doubt that you're the only visitor Mrs. Taggart had since she left Mr. Taggart and moved to the Marlboro. You and Ann Taggart are the only two people in Seattle who knew Fred Backus. Well, that doesn't prove I did it. Ann had a motive, a real motive. Either you or Ann left Ann's handkerchief at the scene of the crime. One of you murdered Fred Backus. Well, it was Ann. It I couldn't didn't... have been Ann. The coroner has fixed the time of the Backus murder between 7.30 and 8.30. From 7 o'clock on that night, Ann was at her apartment discussing the terms of her divorce with Mr. Taggart's attorney. <laughs> Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Betty Lou Gerson, Wally Mayer, Gene Bates, Ed Max, and John Daner. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Ed Bloodworth, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. 
Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for a program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Custom-Made Murder. David Price gripped the wheel of his speeding automobile firmly, and the grim set of his jaw matched the tightly building pressure within. He was oblivious to the heavy rain splattering against the windshield, oblivious to the danger of the storm-swept highway. He was too preoccupied with the anger welling around inside him, anger at his wife's older sister, Harriet, just arrived for one of her frequent uh, visits and her brilliant success in the style world. David could accept Harriet's money. In fact, he often did, in generous amounts. But he couldn't accept her, even for a short time. Harriet had always wanted David's wife, Margaret, to exploit her skill as a designer, or so she said. Actually, David felt she'd always wanted Margaret to divorce him. For marrying David was the one thing Margaret had ever done without Harriet's supervision and approval. Now David swung the car off the highway into the driveway and under the carport. A moment later, he was letting himself into the house. Yes. David? Oh, darling, you must have driven very fast. Where is she, Margaret? Where's your sister? Oh. Yeah, aren't you even going to kiss me? <laughs> Fine, greetings. Uh, on the phone, huh? Harriet? Oh, yes, it was an important call. San Francisco. Oh, sure, sure. Important. Everything's important to Harriet. And I suppose it's still important that you go to work for her, too, huh? Well, I'd at least be earning some of the money she gives me. Well, do you always have to bring that up? You bring it up whenever you need anything. And you can certainly afford to be nice to her, especially since she's only here for such a short time. And as short a time as I'd like. Oh, come on, David, forget it. She'll only be here a few days. Sit down, I'll pour you a drink. Uh, all fixed, huh? And martini, Harriet's favorite. I'll have bourbon, just to be abstinent. You are in a state. Margaret, I know she's your sister. You couldn't help that, but what you can help is... Well, hello, David. Oh. So get up. I didn't intend to, Harry. How sweet. You drink, dear. No, let me give it to him, darling. No, it's all right. David. Thanks. My, the Lord and Master. And now do you run, little sister, and set his pipe and slippers? And if she does... Well, she always was a little backward. Now you too. Don't worry, dear. David and I understand one another. That's what bothers him. I don't understand you, Harriet, or anyone who tries to break up a home. Is that what I'm doing? Well, it's what you'd like to do. Only I'm not the type to stand by and watch. No, no, no. I'm aware of your type, David. The big driving male, the burly one, bull in a china shop. Get it out, Harriet. I can take so much. And then the big masculine one starts breaking things. Maybe. I'd like to break your neck sometime. David. It's all right, Margaret. Like I've always said, he's plain speaking. Almost an earthy quality. You should wear more tweed, David, you know. 
And, Margaret, where is that pipe you were about to fetch? You love it, don't you? Grinding your heel. Am I a bug beneath it, Mary? Sort of like Kurt Kramer? Poor little Kurt Kramer. Kurt Kramer was a fool. Uh Uh-huh. But a faithful one. How long did he work for you? Sixteen years, wasn't it? And his reward? David, you know perfectly well that Kurt Kramer was a criminal. My sister did nothing more than any employer would have done. Hmm. Kramer was entrusted with company funds, David. Everything I said was true. Yes, yes. You're careful that way. It's probably true that Margaret should take up designing again. But it's scarcely necessary for her to leave her home and husband at door. You don't even try to understand, do you, David? For just one instant, you know, you might consider Margaret. They're not exactly rolling and wealthy enough. Oh, she doesn't need my money. She has you. Let me finish. Margaret could have four, five times as much as she came to work with me. And more than that, as much as it displeases me, I just may not live forever. I'm older than you two. Hmm. Margaret should know something about the business she'll inherit. The move to San Francisco is just the beginning. Eventually she'll... Stop it, Harriet. Both of you stop it, please. Stop shouting at one another. And stop acting as if I had nothing to say about this whole thing. Margaret, I... I'm... Sorry, Harriet, but I do want to try to make this decision independently. Independent of both of you. No, we'll see about that. But I'm telling you, Harriet, it won't work. Because like you say, I'm the driving male, the bull in the china shop. I won't stop smashing things until I'm certain my wife is going to remain my wife. A very no. And my way is to beat you at every turn of the game. A challenge? Take it any way you like. <laughs> It's in the clear, isn't it, David? Through all the bitterness and coldly amusing speeches you exchange, you and Harriet, your wife's sister, have squared off. And the plan of attack keeps buzzing around in your mind. That part isn't amusing, is it? No. Rather, it's a burning, bitter hatred. What to do, how, and when. And the knowledge that now, more than ever, Harriet will do her best to separate you and Margaret sharpens your fury to a fine point. You're determined to beat Harriet any way you can. The plan of definite action starts to take hold, doesn't it, David? And the following day at the office, it dominates your thoughts. Well, Mr. Price. Hmm. Yes? There's someone here to see you. Oh. You're right out here, Mr. Price. Yes? My name's Willard. George Willard. I was court reporter on the Kramer case. I'm out of that line now. I see. You said at the time it'd be worth your while to know what happened to Kramer. I mean, when he got out and all. Kramer is out of prison? That's right. A couple of months ago. And he's pretty bitter about your sister-in-law, Mr. Price. Told me he could kill her for what she did to him. Sending him up and all that. He could kill Harry? Like I say, he's pretty bitter. Uh, still worth your while to know about him? Why... Yes, yes, of course. Uh, where is he? He uh, wanted to drop out of sight, Mr. Price. I'll, uh, I'll make it worth your while, will it? Where is he? Little bird south of here. Loma Vista, I believe. Runs a shop there, tailoring. Men's clothing, mostly. Nothing like the old days. Kramer was a top designer once, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Hmm. Loma Vista. Shop of his own. I'm... Yeah, funny little guy. Not too well, I understand. Mm. Well, uh, thanks, Willie. Thanks very much. I, I'll uh, get my checkbook. Well, I'm glad you're a man of your word, Mr. Price. I didn't mean to bother you here at your office, but, well, you seem to want to know about Kurt Kramer. Oh, I did. I I appreciate it, Mr. Willie. Yes, maybe you want to help him, huh? In this way, does everybody a little good. Yes. Yes, this way will do everybody some good. As I say, I'm... Very pleased to be the first to know that Kurt Kramer is out of prison. You folks who listen to The Whistler regularly have heard me get enthusiastic about Signal Ethyl, the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. You've heard me say that the next best thing to a new car is any car of any age powered with signal ethyl. But tonight, friends, I'd just like to tell you in plain everyday language why I use signal ethyl in my car. 
When I touch the starter, I want my motor to spring to life quick, like turning on a light. And Signal Ethel gives me that kind of starting. When I step on the gas, I want a feel pickup that makes the back of the seat come up and push me forward. And Signal Ethel gives me that kind of pickup. When I start up a hill, I want plenty of smooth power to take me over the top without shifting. And I can always count on Signal Ethel for that. There you have it in a nutshell, friends, the reasons why I like Signal Ethel. And why I'm so sure you'll be just as enthusiastic as I am about Signal Ethel once you try a tank pool. It's interesting, isn't it, David, how a few hours a day can change things so. Now you've a weapon against Harriet, a means to frighten her, perhaps send her away. Because Kurt Kramer, a man who once vowed he'd repay her for sending him to prison, is out free. And only you know where to locate him. And there's something else, isn't it, David? Harriet's own words that Margaret will inherit her business. Harriet's dress business is worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. You feel that you can afford to be pleasant to Harriet, perhaps toy with her for a while before dropping the bombshell. Of course, you've no way of knowing that Harriet has a bombshell of her own. Hello? Anybody here? Margaret? What? Oh. Hello, Harriet. David. Margaret upstairs? No, no, she isn't. David, that tie, do you wear such things just to torment me? Now, Harriet, you're not drawing my fire tonight. I'm in a most delightful mood. Here, I'll take it off. Better? <laughs> Much. Providing you don't decide to choke me with it. <laughs> Hardly. Not even when I tell you about Margaret? What about Margaret? She's gone, David, to San Francisco. What? It was her decision. She arrived at it just as she said she would, independent of both of us. Cut it out, Harriet. I can't believe it. She'd go without telling me. She, uh, she left you this note. Hmm. I'd sort of like to know what it says, too. Hmm. You probably dictated oh, David. it. Okay, okay. I'll go along with a gag. She says as if you didn't know. Dear David, I thought leaving this way was best. I'm a little weary of angry words. I decided that going to San Francisco is the wise thing for me to do. How permanent this move will be is something I can't predict right now. When I reach that decision, I'll let you know. The only thing I'm certain of at the moment is that I do want to go. See whether I'm really a good designer or not. My dear. Not David. Get I... rid of Harry. But you're angry at me. You you could strangle me. I know uh, it. No, no, Harriet. I I was surprised for you. All right, it, it was a shock. But I'm not angry. What did you say? I'm not angry. Maybe, maybe it's best this way, huh? I'll take my chances with Margaret. If this is what she wants, she's entitled to it. She really cares for me to come back. Well, you do amaze me, David. You really do. I forget it. I'm tired. I'm going to turn in. See you tomorrow, Harriet. Maybe I could take you out to dinner. I'd love it. Just the novelty of it. <laughs> Good night, Harriet. You're glad you remain calm and reasonable. You've thrown Harriet off guard, and you've made a decision. You're certain you can win Margaret back, but only if Harriet is permanently out of the way. Yes, David, it's going to take a little time, some careful planning. And it begins the next day, with a quick trip to the neighboring city of Loma Vista, in a little shop operated by Kurt Crane. Fortunately, you find him alone. Uh, yes, sir. What can I... Oh, Mr. Price. David Price, no, it can. It is. Uh, David Price, in this place. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm all right, Mr. Price. No complaints. No? Well, you've a right to a few, I think. Why did find you here? I thought you'd head straight to my dear sister-in-law when you were released. Oh, no, 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 no. I had thought of it, yes. Once, Mr. Price, I, I'd give him anything to, to kill her. But now, now, all I want to have peace of mind. To live and let live. Believe me, Mr. Price... I don't even want to see Harriet Gordon. You, uh, 
You don't look too well. Oh, I'm all right. I'm fine, Mr. Price. Just do me a favor. I know. Say nothing to Harry about where you are. Uh, if you please. I, I don't want any more trouble. And your career? I'm out of prison. That's all I want right now. Uh, if you excuse me, Mr. Price, I have a suit pattern to lay out a rush job. That's good. Go ahead, Chris. Good luck, and I'll say nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. You always were all right. Forget it, sir. You watch him walk wearily off toward the back of the shop. And you start away yourself. And then your eyes fasten on something. A huge, shiny pair of tailor's shears lying on a table with some bolts of cloth and a tape measure. Quickly, you reach out, slip the big shears under your overcoat, and leave the shop. Now you know exactly what you're going to do. Don't you, David? Back home, you're surprised to find Harriet packing a suitcase. She's decided to join Margaret in San Francisco and then go on for a tour of her numerous shops. She greets her pleasantly, try to persuade her to stay on for a while. When she receives it, you drop the bomb threat. You know, Harriet, I uh, saw an old friend of yours today. Oh? Mm-hmm. Kurt Kramer. What? He's out of prison. Been out for a couple of months. Kramer. Ah. I wonder why no one told me. He's been very quiet about it all. You talked to him? I talked to him. Did he mention... You? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Several times. His uh, years in prison didn't make him feel any more kindly towards you. No. No, I don't suppose they would. Now, look, Harry. I'm not going to try to kid you that your safety means too much. But you are my wife's sister. She thinks you're pretty wonderful. And for her sake, I'd like to... Well, sort of watch out for you. I mean, we're Christmas. Until we know what he's up to. He wouldn't dare be in it. A man who's thought of nothing else for so long? I'm not so sure. Why not stay on a while, Harry? Let me help you. Ridiculous. I... I'll talk to the police. <laughs> you tell them somebody told you Kurt Kramer feels bitterly towards you, that you're frightened one of police bodyguards? They'll laugh at you. Yes, I suppose they would. What do you suggest? Let me handle it. I'll run down to Loma Vista and have a chat with Kurt. Well, that's, that's nice of you, David. But I still don't know why I shouldn't go to San Francisco. Because if Kramer were figuring on anything very desperate, he'd do it while you were on one of your trips, not here where he'd be picked up and questioned. Oh, I see what you mean. I think you're right. Perhaps I'd better stay here until you talk to him. Oh, Mr. Price, you're back. Yes, yes, I'm back. Thought I'd better come down and warn you. Oh? Yes, it's about Harry. She knows where you are. Oh, I didn't tell her. She knows about the shop and the house. I see. And you can expect a visit from her. For all I know, she may be on her way down here now. She's up to no good, sir. I'm certain she intends to run you out of prison. <laughs> run me out of business? <laughs> She'd be too late. What do you mean? Oh, I'm quitting. Didn't you notice the sign from the front window? Huh? Well, as a matter of fact, I didn't know. Oh, I'm closing out, Mr. Price. Finished. Hmm. That's too bad, sir. Hey, it will be very disappointed to hear about it, I'm sure. Very disappointed. <laughs> yes, to be sure. Mr. Price, would you do me a favor? Sure. Yes, take it. Hmm. If you keep to myself, give it to her with my compliments. Really? Hurt you? I mean it. Give her a key. You can have it all. I told you before, Mr. Price, I want peace of mind, and I'm going to get it. I'm leaving town tonight on the 10 o'clock train. Uh, oh, and you, you can give her a message for me. Yes? Tell her she might as well forget about me, because she'll never find me. I'm going a long way from here, and I'm never coming back. The key to Kurt's shop, safely tucked away in your pocket. You start the drive back home. It was a lucky break, wasn't it, David? Getting the key so easy. And now you know that Kurt intends to leave town on the 10 o'clock train. It fits your plan perfectly, doesn't it, David? It's early evening when you arrive at the house. Find Harriet in the living room waiting for you. Did you see Kramer, David? Yes, I saw him. We had quite a chat. 
Well? Now he wants to see you. Oh, does he? Well, I don't want to see him. I think you should. Get it over with, I say, once and for all. I'll go with you. What does he want? I don't know. Can't quite make him out. He seemed to have changed since my first talk with him. Frankly, I'm rather curious to find out what he has in his mind, aren't you? Well, well I... Well, there's nothing to be afraid of as long as I'm with you. We could run down there tonight. It's only a half hour's drive. I really think you should, Harry. All right, I'll go. Fine. Tell you what, I have to drop by the office for a bit. Why don't you get ready while I'm gone? I'll be back in a little while. I'll be ready. Her curiosity is aroused, isn't it, David? As you knew it would be. And now you hurry from the house. But instead of driving to your office, you turn off at the railroad depot. Chat pointedly with Sam at the ticket window. Then buy a ticket for San Francisco on the streamliner leaving later in the evening. And there it is, David. Another key step in your plan accomplished. As you drive home, you glance at your watch, a quarter to eight. It'll all be over soon, won't it, David? Yes. Harriet will be dead. And your wife, Margaret, is sole heir to her successful chain of dress shops. You'll kill Harriet around 9.30. And Kurt Kramer's sudden departure from town a half hour later on the 10 o'clock train will look like he's running away after killing her. You've planned the timing perfectly, haven't you, David? And when it's over, you'll take a plane to San Francisco and Margaret. Arrive there a few minutes before the streamline. You manage a confident smile as you reach home and enter the house. Harriet? Harriet? In here, David. Oh. Well, I said I'd be back in a little while. And... I've uh, changed my mind, David. I'm not going to see Freeman. He wants to talk to me. You can come to see me. Well, Harriet, I think you ought to get uh, I said chance. I'm not going, David. That's final. <laughs> You'll have to alter your plans now, won't you, David? But that won't be difficult. You decide to drop the subject of Kramer, and the two of you have a highball. Then you suggest going out for dinner, because in that you see a solution. Harriet's never been to Kramer's shop. You can drive her there on the pretext of taking her to an out-of-the-way restaurant you know. And to your surprise, Harriet's instantly agreeable. As you drive Harriet toward Loma Vista, you're conscious of the shears in your coat pocket. When you park on the side of the street that leads to the back entrance of Kurt Kramer's shop, Harriet becomes physical. Ah, it's in his restaurant, is he? In fact, I don't see anything much but a deserted building. <laughs> well, the atmosphere's on the inside. Oh? Come on, come on, you'll like it. It's a favorite of Margaret's, you know. All right, but you'll have to prove it to me. Uh-huh. I have to go in the back entrance. One of those exclusive deals now. Think at any hour. To give her your own tea, too. Mm-hmm. Think? But... It looks so dark, David. Yeah. After you, Harry. No, David, I don't want I to. I said after you. What? David, what? What is this? I don't like this. Oh, Harry. Uh, but I like it. I like it. Fine. <laughs> oh. It's done, isn't it, David? You've killed Harry. And drop Kurt Kramer's shears, your fingerprints white clean, on the floor beside him. A beam of light from the front of the shop highlights one of Kramer's signs on the wall behind Harriet's body. Quitting for good. <laughs> How apropos, Harriet. How apropos. <laughs> I'm from Missouri. You've got to show me. That was my answer to Signal's motor oil experts when they first told me new Signal Premium motor oil would reduce engine wear due to lubrication 50%. And show me they did, friends, with some of the most amazing, most convincing tests I've ever witnessed. On scientific devices, they showed me how some motor oils break down and permit damaging wear inside an engine, wear that causes engines to lose pep and power causes them to eat oil and need expensive motor overhauls. Then they showed me a revolutionary new technique that measures this wear at the very second it is happening. And on this device, they showed me how new Signal Premium Motor Oil reduces this wear due to lubrication by 50%. 
Well, friends, after seeing this convincing proof with my own eyes, you can guess what kind of oil I'm using in my car. The same kind I hope you're using if you want your car to last. New Signal Premium, the heavy-duty type oil you get at no increase in price at Signal Service Station. It's done, isn't it, David? You've killed Harry, and now you're leaving her in Kramer's shop. His scissors, the murder weapon, close to the bottom. Now all you have to do is drive to the airport, take a plane to San Francisco... Arrive there a few minutes before the streamliner, and you'll be with your wife, Margaret, when she receives the shocking news. The murder of her sister, Harriet, at the hands of her old enemy, Kurt Crane. You'll also be with her when she inherits her sister's flourishing business. You slip out the side entrance of Kramer's shop. As you turn to close the door, a car pulls up close by. A police car, David, and you know they've seen you. It's too late to run now. You've got to think quickly and revise your plan. Hey, you're there. Oh, officer, uh... I'm glad you're here. I was about to call the police. Yeah, what's wrong? In here, quickly. There's been a murder. Murder? Yes. Hey, Max, come on over. Okay, let's have a look inside. My sister in law, Harriet Gordon. I left in the shop more, more than ten minutes ago with Kurt Kramer. Ten minutes ago, yes. Eh? I dropped her off here, and then I went down the street for cigarettes. When I got back, the shop was dark. Kramer was gone, but I found Harriet. Where? Yeah, she's dead all right. Just a few minutes ago. This is horrible. Horrible. That Kramer, he must have hated her worse than I thought. Speaking of Kramer... Huh? Well, why, Mr. Price? Kramer! Recognize this woman, Mr. Kramer? Harry. That's Harry. It's Gordon. That's the woman who called us late this afternoon. Told us you'd threatened her life. But I've told you. I didn't threaten her, officer. Mr. Price has warned me about Harry. Said she planned to run me out of business. Oh, you threatened her all right, officer. I heard him. Miss Gordon told us Kramer hadn't made the threat to her in first. You must have told her about them. Oh, I uh, naturally do. To warn her. Yeah, I see. And you say you left Harriet Gordon here with Kurt Kramer ten minutes ago, wasn't you? Yes. You saw them together? Well, of course. Kramer opened the door when Harriet entered the shop. I'm afraid not, Mr. Price. Looks like you've got some explaining to do. Because of your warning, your sister-in-law called us. We decided we'd better ask Mr. Kramer a few questions. So we picked him up an hour ago. And he's been with us ever since. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speed, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Betty Lou Gerson, John Stevenson, Alice Backus, Fritz Feld, Charles Seal, and Byron Kane. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at the same time next Sunday, The Whistler will bring you another strange story, Seattle Takes Three, in which an advertisement for three passengers to Seattle leads to a double murder and the solution of a robbery. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler.
Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, A Law of Physics. The narrow, twisting road that hugged the canyon wall was precarious at best. But at the height of a driving rainstorm, it became a treacherous, uncharted course. And Ross Warren's car was literally out of control as he tried to steer it safely down the canyon. The headlights were of little help as the rain washed across the windshield in great sheets that obscured his vision. The older man seated next to Ross, his hands braced against the panel, peering tensely through its windshield, was Dexter Brand important client of the Ross Warren Advertising Agency. Suddenly, in between the waves of rain, Ross could see the road ahead of him quite clearly for just an instant, a split second. The car was headed for the far side of the road, and a sheer drop of several hundred feet. With one tremendous effort, Ross turned sharply, applied the wet brakes, and careened headlong toward the mountain. Are you all right, Mr. Brand? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Thank goodness. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I, I don't know what happened to this car. I, I couldn't see. Never seen such a storm. Now, what do we do? I... I don't think we have much choice, Mr. Brand. You know, there aren't many cars on this road, even in good weather. Yeah. Come on. I guess we'll have to walk. At least as far as the Edgeley place. Of course, that's a good mile down the canyon from here, but they've got a phone. All right. But, well, I'll be... What is it, Mr. Brand? Another car coming around the curve ahead of us. Hey, you there. Give us a hand, will you? Well, looks like you need it. Anybody hurt? No. No, not hurt. Can you take us back to town? Sure, pile in. I'll get the bags. Need any help with them? No, no. I've got them okay. I'll just put them in the back seat here. Uh, I don't know who you are, young man, but you're a friend of mine. My name's Brand, Dexter Brand. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Brand. I'm Bob Turner. Oh, uh, and this is Ross Warren, Mr. Turner. Uh, How do you do? You. I think if you'll drive ahead for about a quarter of a mile, you'll find a place wide enough to turn around in, Mr. Turner. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but what about your car? We'd better call the garage, hadn't we? <laughs> it's a good idea, but uh, hadn't we better wait till we get to a phone? We don't have to, Mr. Warren. I've got a phone here in the car. You have? Well, I've heard of them, Oh, it's but... a wonderful gadget, believe me. I wouldn't be without one. They've just installed service in this area. Uh, what's the name of your garage in town? Um, Hoffman's. Phone number's uh, Lawton 3264. Well, yeah, this store might give us some trouble on the call, but it's worth a try. Only trick is this button. You push it down to talk, release it to listen. Mm -hmm. This is your mobile operator. This is WJ65383. I want Lawton 3264. One moment, please. Mr. Warren, the garage is on the line. Oh, thanks. Hello, this is Ross Warren. Oh, yes, uh, this is Tom, Mr. Warren. What's the trouble? Wrecked my car on Willow Canyon Road, Tom. I'm okay, but the car's in bad shape. 
How far up the canyon? About, uh, about 15 miles from town. Mile or so above the Edgeley place. You better send a tow car and get this wreck off the road before someone piles into it. Right away, Mr. Warren. You'll be riding in with us? No. No, I've got a ride, Tom. Uh, do the best you can, huh? And let me know when you get through looking her over. You bet, Mr. Warren. Goodbye, Tom. And thanks. The car phone made a deep impression on Dexter Brand, your biggest client, didn't it, Ross? And you're certain that Bob Turner, owner of the car, made an even deeper one. And his dramatic appearance on the seldom-traveled road from Dexter Brand's cabin into town seems more than a mere coincidence, doesn't it? The next morning, as you reach your office, you find that it is. Oh, Mr. Warren, where have you been? I'm frantic. No, no, Edna, it couldn't be as bad as all that. Well, couldn't it? Oh, morning, I've been crazy looking for you. <laughs> Look, beautiful, suppose you calm down and calm tell me Calm down? What, what... How can I? He's dead, I tell you. He's dead. All right, Edna, he's dead. Now, who's dead? Mr. Average American. That's who's dead. Wayne Parks? The man we're featuring in this month's ad? Yes, a stroke. And Graphic Magazine is holding their presses and howling for another layout right away because, well, how can we salute Mr. Average American when he's dead? And what are we going to do? Well, uh, rush them next month's layout, of course. There isn't any, Mr. Warren. That was the last of the series, don't you remember? Next month, it's all different. Oh, that's right. I'd forgotten. We are in a hole, aren't we? Oh, Mr. Warren, if I may... Please, uh... you'll have to wait. Mr. Warren is very busy now. An emergency has come up. Uh, I know. You left the door open, and I couldn't help overhearing. Uh, Mr. Warren, I'm familiar with your campaign, and I believe there's a simple way to save that ad. Mr. Turner again, huh? You seem to have a knack of turning up at just the right minute. You've got an idea. Yes. Why not change the caption, We Salute, to We Mourn, Mr. Average American? All the rest of it can remain pretty much as it is. Hey... Hey, maybe you've got something there. Edna, did you hear? Oh, I think that's wonderful. Oh, I'm so relieved. All morning, the magazine calling and me not knowing where you were. I don't know what you came to see me about, Mr. Turner, but the way I feel right now, you can ask anything. Oh, just make it Bob. I'm with Blaine and Blaine, Mr. Warren. The big Hollywood advertising agency? <whistles> no wonder you had the know-how on that ad. <laughs> okay, Bob, what can I do for you? And you can make it Ross. Okay. Well, let me tell you a story. On my last vacation, someone looted my car, took everything, including my fishing tackle. Mm. So passing through Lake Town here on my way to the lake, I bought some new gear made by a manufacturer here in town. The man you met last night, Mr. Brand. I handle his advertising. I know. Well, his gear's wonderful. But later, when I tried to get more of it in some of the eastern cities, why, nobody had ever heard of Brand fishing equipment. He only sells in the western states. That's what I don't get. How come? Why, if he advertised more... Is that what you're here for? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to chisel your account. Just the opposite. You see, I'm fed up with my job, and I've got a little money put by, and I thought of starting my own agency, maybe in some place like Lake Town here. Oh? Competition, huh? Not if you don't want it. This is a manufacturing town. I figure there must be lots of local men who could triple their business if they went in for wider advertising. Now, you've got a nice setup here. If I can sell some of them on the idea... Could you and I maybe talk uh, partnership? Partnership? Say on any new accounts I bring in, and any hikes on old ones. You know, Turner, I think maybe I'll give it a try. Swell. On one condition. You either sell Mr. Brand on national advertising, or you find yourself another town. Fair enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Brand and his daughter are having dinner with me tonight. Why, why don't you join us? Hey, that's great. That'll give you a chance to sound out, Mr. Brand. Uh, but uh, no passes at Kitty Brand... She's beautiful, and she's mine. Engaged, huh? Well, we haven't announced it, so uh, mum's the word, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be good. You thought you did that rather well, didn't you, Ross? Well, you know that in Dexter Brand, Bob Turner will come up against a stone wall. And you have Bob's word that if he fails, he'll leave town. Yes, Ross. He'll leave, never knowing you lied about being engaged to Kitty. You couldn't know, could you, that by inviting him to dinner with the brands, you were inviting disaster. <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm being so hard-headed. You see, I hate manufacturing. Got into it in spite of myself. I couldn't get the kind of fishing rod I wanted, so I went ahead and made one. 
print sort. I had to make another, then another and another. First thing I know, I'm manufacturing all kinds of fishing tackle. That's why I hate it. Doesn't leave me enough time to fish. If I were to expand, it would uh, leave me even less. And I love fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. I beg your pardon. I said, sir, that I don't think you give a hoot about fishing. Look here, young man. Are you trying to tell me that... I'm afraid I you read the wrong line that time, Bob. Yes, young man. I wish you'd explain that remark. Well, you said yourself, sir, that you made rod for your friends. And why? Because you wanted them to have the best so they could enjoy their fishing as you enjoyed yours. Of course, which proves just... Well, think of the thousands of Isaac Waltons whose vacations will be spoiled for lack of brand equipment. Huh? Why, every time a good one gets away from a faulty hook or snaps oh. an inferior rod, you, Mr. Brand, are directly responsible. <laughs> <laughs> By Joe, that's the best argument I've heard yet. Ross, you ought to take this, uh, uh, this conniver on as a partner. You really think so, sir? He will, sir, if you'll expand your coverage. Oh, so it's a plot. Well, Ross, it looks like I'm stuck with more advertising and you're stuck with a partner. And if I were you, I'd look out. He's likely to take over your whole business. In that case, I'm afraid I'd have to find a way to dissolve the partnership. If a shiny new car doesn't happen to fit within your budget this year, no need to envy the other guy. After all, it's easy to enjoy the next best thing. And what's that? Why, any car, your car, powered with Signal Ethel, the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. Yes, this super-powerful super fuel is scientifically engineered to bring out the best in cars of any age. And when I say best, I mean the kind of performance many drivers never thought their cars capable of. I mean pickup, the kind that carries with it that satisfying feeling when the back of the seat comes up and nudges you gently forward. And I mean power, the kind that rockets you easily, smoothly over hills, steep hills that used to call for shifting. <laughs> Don't get the idea, of course, that Signal Ethel's going to let you step away from all new cars. After all, smart new car drivers use Signal Ethel, too, to bring out all the exciting performance that's built into today's power-packed high-compression motors. But of this you can be sure. The next best thing to a new car is your car, powered with Signal Ethyl Gasoline. A lot of things have changed since Bob Turner came into your life six months ago in that storm on the Willow Canyon Road. He's become a full-fledged partner in your advertising agency after selling Dexter Brand on the idea of a national campaign. And other accounts have followed Brand's lead until your business has nearly tripled. Bob sold you, too, hasn't he, Ross? True, you work harder and longer than you ever have. But you've acquired a great many things you've wanted. A healthy bank account, a big new car with all the extras. Yes, even including a car telephone. Through it all, you've had just one regret, haven't you, Ross? You haven't been able to see Kitty Brand nearly as often as you'd wanted to. But as you walk up the front steps to her home to keep your first date in weeks, you're certain that tonight will make up for all the nights you've been away from. Her. Kitty. Hi. You the official greeter here now? Oh, only when it's the maid's night out or <laughs> Dad's packing. Come in, Ross. Your father taking a trip? I'm just up to the lake. He and Bob have a theory about some special tackle or something. You couldn't prove it by me. But anyway, they're going to try it out. Come on in the library. I've mixed some cocktails. Bob's going too, huh? It's funny he didn't mention it. Oh, I think he's just driving Dad up tonight. Probably spend tomorrow fishing. Oh, I see. Here we are. Sit down, Ross. Mm-hmm. Oh, you look wonderful, Kitty. Do you mind if I drink to that? Well, let's make it that we both look wonderful. So we can both drink. <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah. Hmm. To us. Because we're beautiful. <laughs> oh, I've missed you, Kitty. So much. Well, that's nice, Ross. No, it isn't nice. I don't like missing you. I don't ever want to miss you again. Oh, my. So serious. 
I am serious, Kitty. I don't think I realized how serious I was until I saw you again a few minutes ago. Oh, Kitty, darling, I love you. Ross, I... Oh, my goodness, just one swallow from a martini. I want you to marry me, Kitty. I... I've wanted you to for a long time. But now I'm in a position Ross, to... Ross, please, don't. Don't say these things. Not now. This is the first time I've been able to say them. You've known all along. You must have... I, I, I thought I knew, Ross, but... Why did you wait so long? I had to, darling. I wanted money. Lots of money. It wouldn't have mattered before, Ross. Don't you see? It would have been all right. But now... I, now it's, it's all different. Why, Kitty, what's so different? I just got more money now. I haven't changed. But I have. I, I didn't want to, Ross. Really, I didn't. But I changed in spite of myself, I guess. I'm in love, Ross. Really in love. For the first time. Kitty. But who? With a man who doesn't even know it. He's never said anything or done anything. Oh, Ross, I don't want to hurt you. But it... It's Bob. Bob. Bob Turner. Why the... I, I, I've told you, he, he's done absolutely nothing about it. I'm sure he hasn't any idea how I feel. But... Well, since I do feel that way, Ross, I... Well, there's, there's not much I can do about it, is there? No. No, Kitty. I guess there isn't. Kitty and Bob. It's quite a shock, isn't it, Ross? Not at all the way you planned. You realize you'll have to do something about Bob because you're determined that no one can have Kitty but you. You're still searching for a solution shortly before midnight as you enter your apartment to find the phone ringing. Hello. Ross, this is Bob. Didn't wake you, did I? No. Just got in. Where are you calling from? I'm up at Mr. Brand's cabin. Going to spend the night here. Do some fishing tomorrow, but I'm driving back to town tomorrow night. Oh, I see. I, uh, I'd like to see you tomorrow night if you can make it, Ross. I, I've got some things to talk over with you. Okay, Bob. But uh, if you're off on a little fishing junket, forget about business. Oh, I, I don't want to see you about business, Ross. It's, well, I just want to talk with you a while. And I'd prefer to do it in person. Uh, fine, fine. Suppose we uh, meet at your apartment whenever you say. Oh, well, good. I'll leave here at 7.30. That should get me back to town about uh, 9. How does that sound? 9 it is. Tomorrow night. I'll see you then. Good night. Goodbye, Bob. Your solution came suddenly, didn't it, Ross? And Bob gave it to you himself. A little after eight the next evening, you park your car in the heavy woods at the foot of a well-known slide area on Willow Canyon Road. In a matter of minutes, you roll several boulders into the middle of the road. And then as you hear a car approaching, you rush back to your own car, completely hidden from sight. You peer through the thick trees, see Bob's car approaching. He suddenly swings to miss the boulders balances precariously on the drop side of the road. And then the car miraculously rights itself, hugs the road again, and moves past the boulders to a safe stop. You failed, didn't you, Ross? You watch Bob get out of his car, push the boulders to the side of the road, return to his car, and start for town. As you pull your car onto the road and drive slowly down the canyon toward town, you realize you must get rid of Bob Turner. Once he's out of the way, you'll control all the new business he's brought in and have a clear field with Kitty. Then it hits you, an even better plan. Then you're certain you'll not fail again. There's an automatic in your glove compartment and an alibi in your car telephone. You stop the car and place a call to Hoffman's Garage in Lake Town. Hoffman's Garage, Tom speaking. This is Ross Warren, Tom. Afraid I need your tow car again. Uh-oh. Don't tell me you're stranded on Willow Canyon Road again. Well, uh, not this time, Tom. I'm I'm about 20 miles out on the Marilton Road. The uh, car went out of control uh, just by those bluffs. You know the spot? Sure. Now, look, Mr. Warren. We'll be there, but it may take an hour or so. The truck's out now, and there's another call ahead of you. Well, that's okay, Tom. There's no hurry. I'll wait right here in the car for you.
It's a break, isn't it, Ross? An hour will give you ample time to get to town, take care of Bob Turner, and drive out to the bluffs on the Merrillton Road. You'll wreck your car there and make certain of a perfect alibi in the bargain. You're punctual. You're a little ahead of time. I just got here. I know. Uh, sit down. Man, I I need a drink. Darn near turned the car over coming down here. Boulders in the road along that slide area. I know that, too. You do? But how? I just... Bob, this personal matter you want to discuss with me, it's Kitty, isn't it? Well, yes, Ross, it is. I, I thought we could talk it out, you and I. You're in love with her. Want to marry her? Well, yes, but... Is she in love with you? I don't know. Uh, look, Ross, this isn't the way I'd planned it. Sit down, won't you, and we'll... But this is the way I planned it. No, I won't sit down. My aim's straighter if I stand. Oh, uh, Ross, are you crazy? Put that gun away. Don't! Okay, Bob. I don't mind putting the gun away. Now... He's dead, isn't he, Ross? As you turn to leave, you pull the drapes aside slightly to look out. And walking toward the apartment just a few houses down, you recognize a familiar figure passing under the streetlight. It's Kitty Brand. You sigh with relief that you saw her before she could see you. Then you turn quickly, race for the back of the apartment, let yourself out the back entrance, and rush out into the night towards your car parked on the side of the street. Once there, you check your time. You have half an hour, Ross. Ample time to drive to the bluffs on the Merrillton Road before the tow car from the Hoffman garage is due to arrive. And you make it with five minutes to spare. Now, to make this alibi, hold on. There. That ought to do it. Well, Ross, you're pleased with the way things worked out, aren't you? You bashed in the front of your car right by the bluffs just as you planned. And before the tow car arrived from town, you had time to bury the automatic that killed Bob Turner. You're confident now, aren't you, Ross? Certain that it's just a matter of time until Kitty Brand gets over the shock of Bob's death and agrees to marry you. The next day, you're properly shocked and bereaved as Lieutenant Norris calls for you in his police car. And the two of you discuss the crime as you ride along. You become so engrossed in the discussion, you're unaware that he's driven you far out from town on the Merrillton Road. Well, naturally, I'm anxious to help all I can, Lieutenant. Bob Turner was, well, like a brother to me. I'm going to take you up on that hell bangle, Mr. Warren. Tom Hoffman's already pointed out the spot on the Merrillton Road where he picked up you and your car last night. Why do you to verify that, if you don't mind? By... Of course. I'd be glad to. Oh, I didn't even notice. We're almost there, aren't we? That's right. Now, you see, Mr. Warren, the two stories are a little confusing. What two stories? Yours and Kitty Brand's. She was out for a walk last night, dropped by Turner's apartment and discovered his body. And she saw your car parked on the side street next to the apartment. But... Well, she couldn't have. I, I was... I know. Both you and Tom Hoffman say you were right here in a smashed car at the time. But that's true. Hey, that's my car there. Now, we took the liberty of bringing it back out here, Mr. Warren, to prove something to both of us. Come on over here for a minute. I'm afraid I don't understand, Lieutenant. You will. Now, just for the record... Will you get in your car and show me how you placed that call to the garage last night? Why, of course. I just picked up the receiver, pushed this button, and the operator answered. Well, 
That's funny. Something's wrong with this phone. No, Warren, there's something wrong with your story. Now, see here. Tom Hoffman picked me up right here. At the same time, Kitty Brand found Turner dead 20 miles away. In case you don't know it, Lieutenant, there's a law of physics that says no body can occupy two places at the same time. Now, that's right. And there's a law of electronics that says you couldn't possibly have made the phone call to Hoffman's garage from this spot, Warren. What do you mean, I couldn't? Just that nobody can make or receive calls from here. Because this whole stretch of road is an absolute dead spot for radio. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal dealers are so proud of the good mileage of their famous Go Farther gasoline. They have available free a mileage record book in which you can keep track of your own mileage, as well as other car purchases and information. This handy mileage record book is just one of the many thoughtful extras offered free by friendly, independently operated signal service stations to add more smiles to your miles. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Les Tremaine, Gene Bates, Bob Bruce, Elizabeth Root, Herb Butterfield, and Charles Seal. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by George Asnes, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler, entitled The Man in the Trench Coat, in which a top coat belonging to another man leads the wearer to the unmasking of a blackmailer and murder. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Man in the Trench Coat. It was clearly a mistake. A perfectly natural, understandable mistake. It could have happened to anyone. And it happened to Wally Layton. But he wasn't yet aware of that mistake as he strolled out of the North Beach restaurant, the trench coat draped over his arm, and walked back to the parking lot. As he approached his car, Wally reached into the coat pocket for the keys. And a strange, puzzled expression crossed his face as he withdrew an unsealed envelope and opened it. Money, Wally. Money. A lot of it. 
folded neatly inside the envelope. And you wonder how it got there. Suddenly, you're aware of footsteps behind you. Quickly, you slip the envelope back into the coat pocket. And then, as you're about to get into your car... Hey, you. Huh? Just a minute. You talking to me? Yeah. Hand it over. Hand what over? My coat, the one you just picked up in the restaurant. This? Oh, I'm afraid you're mistaken. Hand it over, I said. Look, fellow, this happens to be my coat. Why should I hand it over? Look. This is reason enough. Oh. Yes, I, uh... I never argue with a gent when he's waving an automatic in my face. Okay, pal, here's the coat. Thanks. My mistake. Yeah. And just to make sure it doesn't happen again. The gun butt catches you on the side of the head. and You fall back against the car, slip down to the pavement, and for a few seconds a black fog envelops you. Then as you shake it from your brain, stagger to your feet... You see the man with the gun drive away in a big gray sedan. Then you return to the restaurant. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Come back again. Oh, Mr. Layton, you forget something? Yeah, do you know? Looks like I forgot my top coat. Hey, your top coat. But you had it over your arm when you left a few minutes ago. It wasn't mine. There's mine still hanging where I left it. Oh, good, good. Uh, look. You know, I've done some things for you. Oh, yeah? Yeah, sure. Well, then tell me. A man just left here right after I did. About my build, mustache, wearing a brown suit. It was his coat I took. Who is he? Hmm, brown suit. Let me see now. Drives a big sedan. Maybe he's a regular customer. Oh, sure, sure. That's the Carter. Carter? Oh, sure. That's a chick Carter. Yeah. He's, uh, he's in trouble? What? Oh, you're a private eye, ain't you? And when a private eye starts asking questions... Oh, no, no. Nothing like that, Dino. I was just curious, that's all. The name Chick Carter means something to you, doesn't it, Wally? Yes. He's a racketeer specializing in blackmail. And as you drive downtown, you wonder about the money in Carter's coat. Arriving at your office, you're surprised to find a light still burning inside. Well, hello, Edna. You still here? What are you typing? My resignation. Oh, now, honey. Get yourself another secretary. Oh, come on now. What are you so about now? We had a date tonight for dinner, remember? Oh, that. Uh, I know. It slipped your mind. Well, now, look, Edna, baby. I, I was tied up, see? A client. Ha! Huh. Honest, honest. Anything happened today while I was out? Mm, the landlord was in again, and your tailor. He's going to snatch your shoulder pads right out of your suit any minute now. <laughs> Everything else? Yeah. How do you spell ish? What? Just what are you writing? A letter to my Aunt Hazel in Petaluma. Oh, how's the egg business? Just dandy, and I'm accepting her offer. What offer? Well, she's looking for a nice young couple to take over the ranch for her, and uh, we are a nice young couple. Well, <laughs> I hate eggs. You're turning me down? That's right. Do me a favor, will you? Get my engagement ring out of the pawn shop so I can throw it at you. Oh, now, Edna, baby. Look, were, mm. were you kidding me about having a client? Nope. Who is it? Well, I don't know yet. What do you mean? Now, look, honey, look. I ran into something big tonight. Something that sounds promising. Might even be terrific. Uh-oh. Here we go again. You string along with me, baby, this one time. Haven't I always? Now, look. i got to get on this right away and see a guy. I'll call you sometime tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Not here, you won't. You really serious about quitting? No. No, I'll be here, all right. But the phone might not be. You see, the jingle people were here today. They want the phone or their money. <laughs> You're quite anxious to follow up your hunch, aren't you, Wally? Yes. And five minutes later, you walk into a small bar not far from the Hall of Justice. Walk straight back to the man at the piano. Hello, Vince. Hiya. Oh, uh, don't let me interrupt. I won't. I want some information. On credit? Yeah, sure. I can't hear you. These cufflinks of mine you've always liked, they're yours. Suddenly I'm tuned in. 
You've heard of Chick Carter? Uh, yeah. I've heard. You know where he's staying? These cufflinks solid gold. Solid. He's staying at the Alba Hotel. Well, not much class. Wouldn't do for Carter to look too prosperous. The cops might want to start asking questions. What's his financial position at the moment? Lovely. Loaded? Yeah. And he ain't winning at poker. He's losing. Think he's in business again? I would say uh, he has another pigeon. Yeah. A dame, maybe? <laughs> A dame, usually. Thanks, Vince. You've been grand. Yeah. This sure is a nice tune, ain't it? The following morning, you pick up Carter's trail. Keep a close watch on him in the days that follow. Day after day, you keep after him. And finally, at the end of the second week, your patience is rewarded. In a crowded cafe, you see a woman brush past Carter's overcoat hanging on the rack. You see her slip an envelope into the coat pocket, then hurry out. You found the pigeon you've been looking for, haven't you, Art? Hello, Edna. Well, you certainly caught me at a most inopportune moment. I just took off my face. Hey, look, don't you know it's after midnight? I just dropped by to tell you the good news. Oh, something to, uh, to do with Carter? What else? Well, all I know is that you've been tagging him around for days, but you haven't told me why. I'll break it down to you quickly, honey. His business is blackmail. And tonight I saw a dame make a payoff. She slipped an envelope into his pocket. Oh? Well, who is she, do you know? It didn't take long to find out. She's Louise Murdoch. The Louise Murdoch? Franklin Murdoch's wife? Yeah, his former secretary. She married Murdoch six months after his first wife died in an accident. What does that mean? Well, the police were never too sold on the idea that it was an accident. I don't know if they are yet. So? So here's Louise, the second Mrs. Murdoch, paying off a blackmailer. Why? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. What I'm interested in is where you fit in. In a setup like this, there's always room for a smart guy to make a few bucks. Mm Mm-hmm. And you're the smart guy? Right. (laughs) You'll see, baby. certain you stumbled onto something good, aren't you, Wally? A simple case of blackmail. And you feel it may be well worth your while to follow it up. Next morning, you decide to risk a personal call on Louise Murdoch at the Murdoch townhouse on Pacific Heights, where, posing as a newspaper reporter, you learn she's horseback riding in Golden Gate Park. The park offers a better chance for an uninterrupted chat in the house, doesn't it, Wally? Yes. So you drive out. Park your car, seat yourself on one of the benches near the bridle path, and wait. Presently, a rider approaches, a woman you recognize as Mrs. Murdoch. Oh, Mrs. Murdoch, Mrs. Murdoch, I see you for a minute. Yes, what is it? Uh, Wally Layton's the name. I'm a private investigator. Oh? I thought we might have a little chat. What about? Blackmail. Blackmail? That's right. Maybe I can get you off the hook. I'm afraid I don't know what I was at the Regis Cafe last night. So, you were at the Regis... Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm not the owner of the trench coat. I still don't know what you're talking about. Well, maybe you need a little time to think it over, huh? Okay. Now, look, uh, I'm on my way out to the beach. I'll be on the midway having a cup of coffee in the diner right next to the merry-go-round. I'll be there one hour. Well, 
where? Well, sit down, Mrs. Murdoch. Coffee? No. I want to know what you have in mind, Mr. Layton. I want to know right now. Sure you do. All this ridiculous talk about blackmail. Ridiculous? Oh, come now, come. I saw what happened last night. I saw you put the money in Carter's coat. Everything. And Mrs. Murdoch. Yes? This man you're dealing with, he's well known in the gentle art of shakedown. The police would be very interested. We'll leave the police out of this. Will we? Well, now, uh, that depends, Mrs. Murdoch. But I can get you off the hook. You insist I'm on one. I do. If you weren't, you'd still be on that horse trotting about enjoying a ride in the park. Now go ahead. You're doing the talking. You're making it very difficult, Mrs. Murdoch. But supposing, only supposing now, that uh, you were paying off somebody for something... Amusing thought. Oh, not too. But it might be more amusing if the man you're dealing with suddenly found the heat on him so strong that he just might find it smart to forget the Murdochs. This does sound interesting, Mr. Layton. Uh, just how could you bring that about? Well, <laughs> I have several ideas. Like I told you, I'm a private investigator, and I have some pretty good connections. I see. Naturally, to arrange things for you... You would expect a small fee. Let's just say a fee. Mm. But it'll be a fair shake this time, Mrs. Murdoch. Honest Wally, they called me. Yes, I'm sure of it. All right. I'd like the arrangement, Mr. Layton. I think it might work. Uh, of course, the evidence this man holds happens to be trumped up. Oh, sure, sure. Also, just so we understand one another... It's my husband who's paying off, not me. I'm simply a go-between. Naturally. Are you uh, <clears throat> sure you won't have that coffee now, Mrs. Murdoch? All right. Might warm me up. Yes, it'll help, Mrs. Murdoch. That plus the fact that we're, uh, <laughs> well, uh, working together. You don't believe anything she says, do you, Wally? Or anything she tells you in the next half hour? But it doesn't matter who's guilty or what's been done. Just so there's something in all this for you. And there seems to be, Wally. Yes. There should be money. And there's also Mrs. Murdoch. She's an exciting person, isn't she? And when you have lunch together the next day to discuss your plan you find yourself even more impressed by Louise Murdoch herself. You find that you want to linger in the corner booth of the quiet little cafe as long as possible. This uh, whole thing is going to take time, Mrs. Murdoch. No, I understand. Uh, but you just leave it to me. I'll get the guy on the run. I'm sure you will, Wally. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know I'm stalling just to talk to you. I rather thought you were. I'm kidding. Are you, Wally? Sure, I... No. No, I'm not kidding, Louise. Hmm. Naturally, I'm going to take care of this thing, but I... Well, I hope that that won't wind everything up. Aren't you forgetting that... That you're a married woman? Yes. Yes, you make me forget lots of things. You say all the right things, don't you, Wally? You make me think of all the right things. No. We're both wrong. We're very wrong. Funny, those lyrics don't seem to match the music. Please, Wally, let, let's forget it for now, shall we? Sure. Sure, Louise. We'll forget it for now. <laughs> Louise has made you almost forget something else, hasn't she, Wally? Yes. The fact that you're engaged to Edna, whom you've scarcely seen since Louise Murdoch became your client. In the days that follow, you find excuses to be with Louise Murdoch more and more, giving her one excuse after another for your lack of progress. And you're almost sure she feels the same way about you. Doesn't mind the situation being dragged out in the least. And you know you don't really intend to do anything about Carter the man who was blackmailing you. Not anything, that is, except watch for the next payoff and feed him to the money. But you do want to talk to Louise. Be sure of her feeling for you. 
explain that the two of you can leave together. And there's one other thing you must be certain of. Next day after lunch, parked in a secluded spot on the beach road, you learn what you want to know. Louise, you sure what you told me in the beginning? It's your husband who's being blackmailed, not you. Well, that's what I told you, isn't it? Yes, yes, but I've got to know for sure. You do know. I told you. I... I couldn't lie to you, Wally. Don't you know that? Yes. Yes, I... Yes, I do. <sighs> oh, Wally, I... I don't know. I... I just don't know. Don't know what? I can stand it when this is over, when... When I won't see you anymore. <laughs> well, I've got some ideas about that, too. Any chance for you to get away and have dinner with me tonight? Yes, Wally. I'll make it somehow. Good. I'll tell you everything I've got on my mind. Tonight. <laughs> You still don't quite believe her, do you, Wally? And you determine to test Louise. Find out for yourself whether it's Louise or her husband who is the subject of Carter's blackmail. And the test is simple, infallible, isn't it, Wally? Louise has already told you the next payoff is to occur the next evening at 8 o'clock. And it will happen in the same way as before. Another envelope filled with currency. 20000 this time. The overcoat hanging innocently in a restaurant. At dinner that evening, you watch your expression closely as you tell her what's on your mind. Why not, Louise? Why not? Why not keep the money? We could get out of town together. It would give us a real start somewhere else. No, Wally. My husband would be exposed immediately if that money wasn't received. Uh, he must have done something pretty big. What was it? That's something I can't talk about. Not even to you. You're that concerned about him? I mean, considering the way we feel? I can't be that unfair, Wally. Or that careless. I didn't like that. Sorry. It sounded like you still doubt me, that you think I'm afraid of myself. Maybe it did sound that way. Oh, look, honey, you don't love Murdoch. Not anymore, not ever, if you ask me. Maybe that's right. It, it's taken me a while to find it out. Look, though. Louise, look. You know I love you, don't you? I, I hope so. And you either love me or you don't. If you do, you've got to leave Murdoch. I'll be waiting, Louise, tomorrow night at 9 o'clock at my apartment. I'll have two plane tickets. I want us to use them. Get away from here a long way. You want me to bring the money to you and instead of giving it to Carter? Why not? As far as your husband's concerned, the money's gone anyway. Think it over, Louise. Like I said, I'll be waiting. <laughs> Somehow, thinking about it after you leave her, you're more certain than ever that she's the guilty one, aren't you, Wally? That she'll never show up at your apartment with the money. You decide to take things in your own hands. So next evening, a few minutes before Louise is due to make her payoff to Carter, you're loitering near the cafe where the money is to be passed. And soon Carter appears, confidently approaching the place. You step back into the protective shadows of an alley. And then as he passes close to you... Carter. Huh? Come here. Now look, pal, what's the gun we'll for? We'll skip the I... conversation, Carter. I haven't much time. This gun is just to get you close enough for this. He looks strange to you, doesn't he, Wally? Huddled in a heap near the alley wall. You wonder if you hit him harder than you should have. And then you notice that he must have struck the wall as he fell back. You kneel down quickly. Listen. Straighten up as you realize that he's dead. You grab up the overcoat he was carrying and hurry into the cafe. Once inside, you hang up the overcoat. Then stroll into the bar where you watch the cafe entrance unobserved. Just as you expected, it's only a few minutes before Louise arrives to keep her appointment with Carter, admitting her guilt as far as you're concerned. You reflect that it's too bad, but that at least you'll have the money she leaves, and there's still Edna. 
Louise moves forward, slips the envelope into the pocket of the trench coat you snatched from Carter. You wait until she turns and hurries out. Then you stroll casually to the overcoat, slip it on, and walk rapidly to a drugstore three blocks away. Where you enter a phone book. Hi, Edna, baby. Oh, it's you. Look, Wally, if you... How would you like to go on a honeymoon to Rio de Janeiro? I'm in no mood for gags. Oh, this is no gag, baby. That guy I told you about just paid me off big to forget about that case I've been on. Now, wait a minute. I'll pick you up in about an hour. Remember, honey? I told you in the right kind of a setup, a smart guy could always pick up a few bucks. Back to the Whistler. Back at your apartment with the money in the pocket of the stolen trench coat. You're satisfied that you're in the clear, aren't you, Wally? You have no fear at all when the telephone rings. Louise will say nothing, and Carter is dead. And no one else will associate you with either Carter or Louise Murdoch. It looks clear and clean, doesn't it, Wally? And you're sure you can go your way. And then... Hello? Wally, it's Louise. Yeah. Wally, I started to your apartment tonight with the money. Oh, sure. I did, Wally. I want to go away with you. I mean it. Sure, sure you do. That's why you went to the cafe. I had to go on to the cafe, Wally, and leave the money. My husband was following me. He had a gun. Look, what are you trying to tell me anyway? Wally? Wally? Hang up that phone. Wally... Now, sit down. Over there. Operator. Give me the police department. Yes, sir. Hey, wait a minute. What's the idea here, pal? Police department, operator 26. I'm calling to report a murder. Where? Department D, 3151 Whitten Street. I'll tell you when you get here. I'll wait for you. Look, you're crazy. There hasn't been any murder. There's going to be one right now. Blackmailer. What? Your Murdoch. Yes. Oh, well, wait a minute, Murdoch. I can explain. That trench coat there explains everything. I saw my wife put the money in it. The last 20000 I had. You've broken me, Blackmailer, all the way. Now I'm losing my wife. Somebody I once murdered for. You... Then it was you who was paying off. She's fallen for another man. Now I've got nothing more to live for. So it's the end of the line. For you, too, blackmailer. Oh, wait, Murdoch. That money wasn't... <laughs> and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated, ASCAP, Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted exclusively to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California. Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler.
just laugh. I may be the district attorney, but if my son is guilty, he can pay the penalty like anyone else. I'll prosecute him. Then, Blake, I'll start on you. Sunday night. And again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the unusual story of the weakling. Young Clyde Banning, son of District Attorney Banning, steps out of a nightclub following a gay New Year's Eve party. An expensive limousine pulls up to the curb and Clyde gets in. Clyde has done some careless driving lately, had his driver's license revoked, and is now forced to be driven about by Rawlins, the family chauffeur. Where to now, Mr. Benning? Let's go home, Rawlings. Not yet, Clyde. Um, what are you doing in here? I thought you were still in the club. I didn't think you even knew I was there. Oh, I saw you a couple of times. Why have you been avoiding me, Clyde? You know how it hurts me. What's happened? Take Miss Blake home, Rawlins. No, I won't go home. I won't be brushed off like this without an explanation. You know how much I love you, Clyde, and I, I can't go on like this any longer. This is no time to make a scene. Clyde, you know you love me. Let's get married right now, tonight. Please, let's not talk about it now. I will talk about it now. Rawlins, pull up, please. I won't get out, Clyde. I won't. I'll drive, Rawlins. You can take a cab home. You'll drive, but listen Go on, here. Rawlins. I'll take Miss Blake home. Don't take me home, Clyde. I, I've got to talk to you. Please, drive down to the Ocean Highway. All right. All right, but cut out the melodrama. Why have you changed so, Clyde? Why can't we get married? You know as well as I. My father is district attorney, and he's out to crack that graft situation wide open. He knows who the big boss of the racket is, and he's going to get his scalp. Send him to the pen. But what's that to do with us? You know that Jim Blake is the big boss. Your own father. But we have our own lives to live. If I married you, Dad would throw me out of my ear. What, of that we could get along? How? Your father won't have a dime when this is over. Besides, Dad is up for re-election. How would it look? D.A.'s son marries convict's daughter. I... I thought you really loved me, but I've always liked you, Ellen, but... It just won't work. It isn't fair to Dad. Then you don't want to marry me? I've told you how I feel about it. <laughs> what a ridiculous fool I've been. Now, don't stop that hysterical stuff. I've again. hoped against hope that you weren't trying to get rid of me, but now I know. You're a low, spineless jellyfish. You didn't love me. You couldn't. Stop shouting. I won't stop. I wish everyone could hear me. To know what a despicable robber you Shut are. Shut up. <laughs> don't stop it, you little fool. Ellen! Good Lord. Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. Oh, Lord, her face. Ellen, Ellen, darling. Better get a doctor. Maybe she... No, she not move her. Yes, that's it. Get help. Yes, Clyde, better get help. There, just ahead, the low lights of a service station. Hurry, Clyde. Maybe she's still alive. What's the trouble, Clyde? You're slowing down. Well, they, they might think I did it. Think I pushed her out. She's dead. She must be. No one knows. Better drive on. You've passed it now, Clyde. You've really fixed things now. You should have stopped. Clyde's fear increases with every mile. He slips the car into the garage and hurries quietly to his room. But he doesn't sleep, not a wink. His head throbs, and with every thump of his heart, Ellen's words ring in his ears. Oh, spineless jellyfish. Oh, spineless jellyfish. Ellen, Ellen, please, I didn't mean it. Forgive me, please. <laughs> District Attorney Banning sits at breakfast with his attractive wife, Marsha. Marsha is Clyde's stepmother. The district attorney scans his morning paper as Clyde, pale and worn, slips into his place at the table. Hmm. What do you think of that? What is it, Henry? 
Jim Blake's daughter was found dead on the ocean highway early this morning. Oh, they found her on the ocean highway? Oh, good morning, son. How have you been? Oh, I guess I overslept. Really? <laughs> Looks as though you hadn't slept at all. I have a big evening. Too much champagne? No, no. Gee, that's terrible about Blake's daughter. What happened to her? I think she was thrown out of a car. Probably some enemy of Blake's. I dare say he has plenty. Thrown out? Does it say that? Yes. Well, I'd better go down to the office. Well, maybe she jumped out. Not likely. Venture to say she was pushed out all right. Why don't you have some coffee, Clyde? Help that hangover. I haven't got a hangover. <laughs> what in the name of heaven's wrong with you? You better take some aspirin, son, and go back to bed. Well, you're going to the office today? It's New Year's Day. Never go down there on a holiday. Going down for an hour or so. Will it upset your plans by any chance? I haven't got any plans. And what's bothering you? Something's wrong with you, Clyde. Nothing's wrong with me, and nothing bothers me. Just a moment. Who are you shouting what? at? I'm not shouting at you. you better go on back to your room go to bed. You're a bit too unpleasant to suit me. I'm sorry. Sorry, Marsha. That's all right, darling. I'll feel all right after a while. I guess I did have too much champagne. Never seen Clyde like this. Well, you've only been around him a year, Marsha. He's a moody type, has spells, but he's a good boy. You'll learn all his little quirks in time. Well, I'll run along, darling. Be back in an hour or so. I beg your pardon, Mr. Clyde. Yes? Yeah? What is it, Thompson? Rawlings, the chauffeur. I would like to see you, sir. Oh, yeah? All right, send him in. He'd see you, Rawlings. What do you want, Rawlings? I'd like to have a little talk with you, Clyde. Well, yeah? Yeah? What's on your mind? Uh, where did you go last night after you dismissed me? What business is that of yours? Well, I just thought I'd ask you. Got in around 2.30, didn't you, Clyde? What of it? Thought maybe you knew what happened to Ellen Blake. Well, I took her home. What happened after that, I don't know. She kind of put the pressure on you, didn't she? What do you mean? I heard her. Heard every word you both said. She, uh, she said she was determined to get married. So why? Well, it wouldn't be so good for you if I was to tell about last night. Well... No. Oh, you made a big mistake when you let me out of that car. If you let me drive her home, why, you might not be in this jam. Who said I was in a jam? I say so. What, what if you do tell what you know? That doesn't prove anything. Oh, I got better proof than that. What? Ellen Blake's handbag. I found it in the car this morning. Here it is. What? Her initials on it, some personal effects inside. Oh, yeah? Now, I'm the only one who knows about all this. If I talk, you're certain to get a rope around your neck. I didn't kill her. She, she jumped out. Yeah. Can you prove that? No. If I tell about the argument and establish the time, you wouldn't have a chance. I didn't kill her, I tell you. How'd you like trying convincing a jury on that? No. Well. But you know, I don't have to say a word about it, Clyde. Why should you? It all depends on you. What do you want? Oh, I could use a little money. How much? Uh, two or three thousand dollars? Oh, where would I get that much? You get a nice allowance every month. Huh? You're a dirty rat, Rawlins. I didn't like your looks when you came here three weeks ago. I thought you looked like a crook. I'll have you fired. I don't think you will. You can't afford to. Do I get the handbag? No. Not until you pay off in full. Suppose I tell you to go to the death. And you'll be in jail within an hour. I mean business. Yeah. Okay, I'll pay as much as I can each month. I don't want to wait too long. I'll try to get it as soon as possible. I want that handbag. You'll get it, kid. When I get the 3000 Good afternoon, madame. What do you mean, coming into my room without knocking? And how is madame today? What do you want? I want to wish you a happy new year. Well, of all the nerve... You get out now, of here. Now, now, Don't get excited. I thought you might like to talk to me. What do you mean? Well, I've got a little information that uh, might be of interest to you. Information? What are you talking about? I'm talking about Clyde. What about him? Well, I was just wondering what would happen if your husband had to prosecute his own son for the uh, <clears throat> murder of the daughter of the man he's out to break. Are you crazy? What do you mean? Clyde murdered Ellen Blake her out of the car. What? How do you know that? She was in love with Clyde. He was trying to shake her. I drove him away from a nightclub last evening. They had a very serious argument. And then he let me out and drove the car himself. That doesn't mean anything. Ellen Blake was killed about 1 a.m. 
Clyde came in about two. Good heavens. This morning I found his handbag in the car. It's Alan Blake's. If I were to tell what I know about it and produce his handbag, Clyde would have a rope placed around his neck by his own father. I doubt very much that the DA would ever be reelected. How could Clyde do such a thing? Well, he must have left lost his head. She was pretty insistent. But you don't have to say anything about this. Oh, I... I wouldn't have to. If this came out, Henry would be ruined. That's just what I mean. Now, you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? No. And it's all up to you. Up to me? Yes, if I cover up a murder, it might affect my conscience. I might worry a lot. But, uh... My conscience might be sad. What do you want? Well, it ought to be worth about $3,000. Three? Why, that's ridiculous. I have no such amount. Then get it. How could I explain what I wanted with $3,000? That's your worry, not mine, baby. Do you know what they can do to you for blackmail? No, no, this isn't blackmail, honey. No, I'm not threatening to divorce someone's past. It's bigger than that. As a matter of fact, you're going to bribe me to withhold a piece of important evidence. So you see, I... Hold the aces. Get out of here. Get out. <laughs> okay. But I know somebody with a lot of dough, and I'd just as soon turn the information over to Blake as anyone else. I just want to give you a break. How about this diamond bracelet? Oh. Yeah, that'll help. But it'll be hard to get rid of. I'd, I'd rather have cash. All right, I'll give you these diamonds, and you can hold them until I get the cash. Fair enough. Hand them over. Thanks. You know, I thought I'd... Well, that you'd see things in the right way. Goodbye, honey. Get out of here. <laughs> you rotten thief. Oh, listen to her. <laughs> As the days pass, Clyde and Marsha are both turning over every cent they can get hold of to Rollins. But the going is difficult, and Rollins becomes more insistent. And one day, Clyde gets a message to visit the big boss, Jim Blake, Ellen's father. I... I was told you wanted to see me, Mr. Blake. Yeah. Sit down, kid. Thanks. Everything working out all right? What do you mean? You look a little worried, kid. I thought maybe something was disturbing your sleep. Oh. Well, I've been having headaches. I think it's my eyes. Been seeing things, have you? In the dark? No, I haven't been seeing things. I don't know what you're getting at, but nothing's bothering me. Just when was it that you started meeting my daughter, Ellen? I don't know what you mean. Ah, uh, quit playing dumb. I found out about it today. Who told you such a thing? Does your father know about you and Ellen? I'll bet not. Now, look here. If you think you can stop father in this investigation by trying to frame something on me, you're crazy. You can't get away with it. I'll spill the whole thing. Oh, you will? Yes, I will. You're a crook. When my father gets through with you, you'll be behind the bars for the rest of your life. When I'm put behind bars, kids, you'll be dangling from the end of a rope. What? What are you trying to accuse me of? The murder of my daughter. Murder? I didn't kill her. Can you prove that? There's no proof that I did. I've got a witness, kid, and he's ready to talk when I say the word. Witness? That's ridiculous. Why should I want to kill Ellen? Because she was in love with you, and you wanted to shake her because you were afraid your father would kick if you married her. Your father's out to get me, and I'm determined to beat him to the draw. I didn't kill her, I tell you. Ellen left that nightclub with your car, New Year's Eve. You had an argument. She wanted to get married. When she got too insistent, you dismissed the chauffeur and drove the car yourself. And out on the ocean highway, you threw her out on the rocks. I didn't, I didn't. Did you stop? Did you look at her? Her face mangled to a pulp, her body broken to bits on those rocks? I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I've got a witness to the argument and the time element. You, you can't scare me. I just talked to Rollins, your chauffeur. Knows what time you got in, and he found Ellen's purse in the car. I, I don't believe it. Where's the purse? Rollins has it. He'll produce it when you get the trial. And your own father will have to prosecute you. Oh, I'll enjoy that. Too bad about that purse, kid. If you'd found the purse and Rollins didn't know what he knows, you might have gotten away with it. But you're stuck now, stuck with Rollins and the purse. And your own father will have to tie the rope around your neck. Rollins is a liar. It'll hold in court. The jury will believe him. He's a dirty liar. I could kill him. Kill him? You you wouldn't do that. Well, he isn't fit to live. Well, you aren't either. But I'm going to give you a chance to keep out of the noose. I'll keep Rollins from talking if you get me a couple of letters. What letters? Your father has them. They have my signature on them. You can get them very easily. You get those papers, and I'll put the quietus on Rollins. They're addressed to the county supervisor. 
Your father intends to use them against me. I want them. Is that clear? Yeah. You get the papers and we're both in the clear. Understand? Yeah, you understand. All right. I'll give you till tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. You can go now. Yeah. Remember, 6 o'clock tomorrow night. Saturday night passes. Then Sunday dawns with the most startling discovery. Rollins, the chauffeur, has been found dead. Shot to death in his apartment over the garage. No evidence is discovered, no weapon, no fingerprints, nothing. Now it is late afternoon. Oh, this is a fine mess. A murder in my own home. Everything will come out all right, Henry. You're certain to find the person who did it. Oh, yes, he, he may have had some enemies. After all, we know very little about him. He'd only been here a short while. Don't you understand? I'm the district attorney. Murder has been committed in my own home. Why, if I can't bring this to a solution, I'll be a laughing stock. I'll never be reelected. We're trying to help you, Henry. Oh, certainly. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but this has got to be kept from the police department. Once they get into it, it'll be plastered all over the front pages of every newspaper in town. Yes. I'll, I'll have to handle this from my own office. Well, neither one of us has been out of the house, and we haven't told anyone. What are you worried about? Surely a, a man like Rollins could have had many enemies. Who knows what he'd been mixed up in? Uh, Captain Stone to see you, Mr. Batting. Captain Stone? Oh, yes, I was afraid of that. All right, show him in. Afternoon, Mr. Banning. Oh, good afternoon, Captain Stone. Well, what are you doing out this way? We uh, heard about your chauffeur. Really? And who told you? Oh, friend. Body hasn't been moved, has it? No, no, Inspector Stone, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. Still in the room over the garage. Well, come on, Skelton. Let's have a look. Are you, uh, you don't mind, do you, Mr. Banning? I... I know. No, of course not. Well, thank you. We'll be back in a moment. All right. You know, I've got a strange feeling that Jim Blake knows something about this. Blake? Why do you think that? I, I don't know. He's just the type to think of something like this. Yes, yeah, a perfect setup for him. A murder in my own home. Nothing would please him better. Why would Blake resort to anything like this? Why? Because my dear Blake is in a tough spot. Yes. The more I think about it, the more right I think I am. Well, I'm going to have a talk with him. I don't think Blake had anything to do with it. Really? What do you know about it? Well, nothing, Father. Then please allow me to handle this in my own way. Henry, why must you be so harsh? I'm sorry, Father. I think you should keep away from Blake. Why? I don't know. I just think you should. Yes. Well, when I want your opinion, son, I'll ask for it. Well, here you are, Mr. Banning. We found it. Found what? We found this revolver behind the garage. Well, no, I... no, don't touch it. We want to check for fingerprints. Oh, of course, I know better than to touch it. Yeah. Fingerprints. Maybe there are none on it. Ah, uh, we'll check it just the same. Well, the, the killer would be a fool to leave his prints on the gun. How do you know it is the gun? We'll find out. Ballistics will know. How will they know who the gun belongs to? Maybe it isn't the gun. We already know who killed him. All we need is proof. You no. Know. How do you know? Who did it? Your son did it. What? We were tipped off. My son? That's right. Are you crazy? Why should Clyde kill him? He hardly knew him. Look, Mr. Banning, you think I'd come to your house snooping around unless I had a very good reason? Where did you get your tip? Well, I, I'd rather not say. Who's this friend? Come on, you'd better tell me. I'll bring it out eventually. All I know is that we were tipped off about the murder and told who did it. Your son threatened to kill Rollins. Who told you that? Jim Blake. He heard him say it. Where did you see Blake, Clyde? Oh, I don't know what they mean. Ask Jim Blake. Come on, Skelton. Let's check that gun with ballistics. <laughs> Two hours later, boss Jim Blake stands in the study facing the district attorney. There is a tense moment as each waits for the other to speak. Well, Banning, what do you want? I know what you're trying to pull, Blake. You're trying to get at me by framing my son with a murder. I'm not trying to frame him. I just told the police that I heard Clyde threaten to kill Rawlings. So far, there's nothing but circumstantial evidence. Clyde had no reason to kill Rawlings. And without a motive, Clyde is in the clear. Yeah. You had a scheme in mind to force me to drop that investigation, then your scheme went haywire. 
You pulled a boner. What do you mean, boner? If Clyde had threatened Rowland's life, the natural thing for a man in your situation to have done was to approach me instead of the police. Why? Well, you wanted those letters, didn't you? How could you possibly make a deal for those letters now that you've made your information public? <laughs> I'm way ahead of you, Benning. I'm not so dumb as all that. I'm still holding the aces. What aces? The ones I'll throw down for the letters. I think you're bluffing, Blake. I know why Clyde killed Rollins. I can supply the motive. I'll admit that without the motive, he'd be in the clear. But if I spilled the motive, he'd crack in five minutes. I still think you're bluffing. I know you've got a cinch case against me with those letters. But with what I know, I've got a cinch case against your son that will send him to the gallows. Not only that, but if I do spill it, you wouldn't dare show your face in this town again. <laughs> Sounds pretty gruesome. I can't imagine what it could possibly be. I'll say you can't. Clyde is really in it, up to his neck. You really think he's guilty? Certainly, but whether he is or not, he had the motive. And the motive for killing Rollins will lead to something that can be definitely proved. You mean material evidence? I do. So in order to prosecute me, you'll be forced to prosecute your own son. Hmm, I'll see to that. Now you hand over those letters and we'll all be in the clear. Believe me, Banning, I'm not bluffing. Blake, if you're telling the truth, then we're both in a very unfortunate position. You're a crook, and I happen to be a stickler for duty. I can't be bribed. You mean you'd actually prosecute your own son? I do. And if he's guilty, he can take the consequences. I don't believe he is, but I know you are. But I think you're crazy. And I still think you're bluffing. Try me. I'll call you a bluff. All right. But you'll change your mind, Banning. If you don't, you're a bigger fool than I've ever come across. Let's have it. Get your son in here. All right. Marsha, bring Clyde in here. Yes, Henry. What a sack you are, Banning. Over a couple of punk letters. Huh. Duty. A lot of bourgeois. You want me, Father? Oh, you can come in too, Marsha. Yes, Henry. What are you doing here? Well, kid, I've been having a little chat with your righteous father. He sent for me. He's a little stupid. He wants to be enlightened. Maybe you can help him. Yeah? Clyde, I understand you paid a visit to Mr. Blake. Huh? Go on. Better tell him, Clyde. What were you doing there, Clyde? Well, uh, Blake sent for me. Why? Well, he wanted to talk to me. What about? Well, uh, about what you've been saying. I told him what you said to me. Said about what? About Rollins. Uh, what did I say about Rollins? What did you say, Clyde? Uh, nothing. He's lying. Lying about what? We haven't said anything yet. Uh, he, he tried to get me to steal something. Steal something? No, we're getting someplace. Wanted you to steal some letters out of my safe. Yes, yes. He, he offered me a lot of money. Money? <laughs> I didn't even mention money. I didn't have Yes, to. he did. What inducement would money be to you, Clyde? You always get everything you want. Well, I offered well, you something better than money, kid. But was it, Clyde? He threatened me. Threatened to kill me. <laughs> How do you like that? You're in a tough spot, kid. You better start talking. You threatened to kill Rollins. I did not. I heard you. Why did you make that threat? Well, I was just talking. I didn't mean it. I couldn't kill anybody. But you did say it. But I didn't mean it. What had you done? What did he know? Something prompted you to say it. Now, what was nothing, it? Nothing, nothing. I haven't done anything. You killed Rollins. You said you would. I didn't kill him. You killed him to shut his mouth. What did he know, Clyde? Blade's lying. He's not trying to scare me. I'll scare you. You killed Rollins to keep him from telling what he knew about you and my daughter, Ellen. What? Your daughter? She was in love with Clyde. He wanted him to marry her. He tried to shake her, but when she got too insistent, he threw her out of his car, murdered her. I did not. I didn't. Rawlins heard them arguing. Clyde dismissed him and drove the car himself. Rawlins found Ellen's purse in the car next morning. Rawlins told He's him. He's lying, lying. I told him Rawlins wouldn't talk if Clyde got me the letters, but he killed Rawlins instead. Was Ellen Blake in your car the night she died? Yes. Did you dismiss the chauffeur? Yes, but I didn't kill her. She jumped out. She jumped out deliberately. Why didn't you tell this? Well, I was going to, but... And I got afraid they think I killed her. Rawlins tried to blackmail Clyde, then double-crossed Clyde and came to me. Where's the purse? Clyde probably has it. That's why he killed him. I haven't got it. I don't know where it is. I couldn't find it. And you were in Rawlins' apartment over the garage. Yes, yes, but I didn't kill him. I didn't oh, kill Ellen. Oh, believe yeah. Now, what do you have to say, Mr. Banning? Do I hold the aces? No. I'll bring it to trial. I'll find that purse if there is a purse. And if he's proven guilty, he can pay the penalty like anyone else. And then, Blake, I'll start on you. You're a fool, Banning. You're crazy. Come in. Well, here we are, Mr. Banning. Got quite a bit of dope on this Rawlins killing. What now? There were no fingerprints on that gun, but it was definitely the murder weapon. Ballistics checked it. Well, still doesn't prove my son fired the gun. Well, that's right. But we did manage to trace the original ownership. And what did you learn? Well, here it is. Gun was purchased four years ago in Seattle. By whom? By Patricia Rollins. Patricia Rollins? Mm -hmm. Did you check on Patricia Rollins? Who was she? Well, we checked on her. We also checked on Rollins. Patricia Rollins was your chauffeur's wife. They both have a police record. Rollins was a confidence man, three convictions. 
Why Patricia was implicated as an accomplice. Anything else? Yes, Rollins disappeared into Mexico three years ago. Finally turned up here. Rollins must have had the gun in his possession. Or the wife had it. In which case, she could have killed him. Quite possible. You'd better try to locate the wife. Oh, uh, here's a picture. We should be able to locate her without much trouble. What do you mean? Good Lord. Marsha. Yes, Henry? Look at this photo. Do you know who this is? Yes, Henry. Sorry, Mrs. Banning. We'll check your fingerprints with these on police record just to make sure. You don't need to check them. They're mine. Marsha, don't. Why not, Clive? It doesn't prove anything. Maybe somebody got into the apartment and killed him with his own guard. That's just what happened. He did have the gun, but I killed him. Three years ago, he deserted me. Later, I heard he was dead. Then after I'd married Henry, he turned up here. I knew what he was going to do eventually. But I was in love with Henry. Then when he found the purse, he used it to blackmail me. And when he double-crossed both Clyde and me by going to Blake, we determined to get the purse. But he caught us ransacking his apartment. He pulled the gun and struck me. We all fought for it. Clyde wrestled with him, and I got the gun and shot him. Why did you tell, Marsha? Why? Why not? It doesn't matter now. Tell me, did she shoot in self-defense, Clyde? Certainly. He'd have killed us both. Well, that will clear you of the Rollins charge. But what about Ellen? He still killed Ellen. Captain Stone, there's a missing purse. Ellen Blake's purse. I want it. You can start looking in Rollins' apartment. I'm going through with this, Blake, regardless of the consequences. Take a look at him, Captain. A man who'd sacrifice his own son, his own life, for a couple of measly little letters. <laughs> what a set. But District Attorney Banning, a determined man, goes through with his promise. The case against his son is in preparation. The day of the opening of the trial is set. Then the missing purse is found. And in it is a note to Clyde, written and signed by Ellen Blake. Go on, read it, Clyde. Dearest Clyde, I've tried every way to reach you. I know now that you've been avoiding me. I can't go on. I know you're false, but I love you. I can't help it. So I'm going to kill myself. I don't know how, but some way will present itself. Goodbye, Clyde. I hope... You find the happiness I've been denied. I love you, Ellen. Well, there you are. Ellen Blake did jump from Clyde's car. And Clyde, even though he did seem a weakling, was able to fight when it came to a showdown. And Marsha, because of her great love for Banning, was willing to sacrifice everything for him. So Clyde is cleared, Marsha is acquitted, and Blake is sent to prison. And that is the end of a story which might have ended very tragically had it not been for the note in Ellen's purse. Very convenient, that note. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next week, 9.30. I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Like anyone else, Van Barkley gave little thought to the precarious nature of everyday living. Had he had occasion to probe the fact, he might have acknowledged that danger is always present and that it can strike quite suddenly. Only Van Barkley wasn't thinking about such things. Perhaps he was too restless to care. A young engineer, unmarried, can get restless. Working in a new, strange city, he can get lonesome, too. Van Barkley was one or the other, or both of these things, on a Saturday night. But he came out of a movie and went for a stroll along the Santa Monica Palisades, in preference to going back to his hotel room. On a corner, he stopped to light a cigarette. That's when he first noticed it. The car was big, a Nash convertible. It cruised by him, came back around the block, moving slow. 
The third time around, he was standing on the curb, staring openly at the girl behind the wheel. She was very nice. Young, blonde, considerably more than attractive. And she was looking at him just as obvious. Hello. Hello. You opened a door before, no doubt. Hmm. In other words, isn't it a beautiful night for a drive? Well, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> That's what I said. You weren't going somewhere important. No, no, not at the moment. In fact, I was faced with a rather gloomy prospect of an evening at a hotel alone. And it is a beautiful night for a drive. Uh, I suppose it was on the golf course at Biarritz. What? Where we met. That's as good a place as any. Yes, only I've never been there. But I have a good imagination. And then... I remember so well those evenings at Monte Carlo when you'd say to me, Van, you must sit beside me at the casino tonight. You bring me luck. You called me Van in those days, remember? Never Mr. Barclay. And I used to call you, uh, uh, what was it I used to call you? It might have been Darling, mightn't it? Uh, yeah, it might have been at that. Or maybe the mystery woman, huh? Beautiful. Fascinating and unpredictable. Especially unpredictable. Oh, that's not very flattering, Mr. Barkley. You might have said, especially beautiful. Yeah, I might have. And meant it. Okay, you win. You're not only beautiful and fascinating and unpredictable, but you're too fast a worker for me. How come? How come what? All this. You're not happy about taking a drive with me, Mr. Barkley? I'm delirious. But why me? What I got? Well, you're not unattractive, you know. Yeah, but, baby, you never saw me before. How do you know what I'm like? Perhaps I like to take chances. Didn't your mother ever warn you about picking up strange men on the street? My mother was rather unusual, Mr. Barkley. She taught me that when I wanted something, there was only one thing to do. Get out and find it. Uh-huh. Okay, who's kicking? You'll pardon me if I pinch myself. This is something I wouldn't have believed. Sort of like an angel from heaven dropping in your lap. Oh, oh I'm no angel, Mr. Barkley. Would you like a drink? You're driving. Then come on, we'll go in. Well, this is the swankiest roadhouse I ever saw. Oh, it's not a roadhouse. I live here. Come on. Uh, not a bad little place to hang your hat? <laughs> hang it, then. We like it here. Probably have two or three scattered around the country. Oh, no, no. Just a cabin at Lake Anderson. Mm -hmm. Well, I gather you're not worrying much about any wolves howling at your door. Not that kind, anyway. The guy that owns this place must be a movie producer. Your father? My father. And he's not a movie producer, just an art collector. Uh, perhaps you'd like to take a look around. We have some very nice paintings scattered all over the house. You think we can find our way without a guide? There's no one else here, if that's what you mean. We only have one servant now. This is her night off. It's cozy, isn't it? The whole place to ourselves, all 50 rooms. <laughs> oh, it's not that bad. We'll take a look as soon as we have that drink, I promised you. You feel like pinching yourself, don't you, Ben? This is the kind of thing that just doesn't happen. But it's real. She's real. And she's even more attractive than she looked in the car. And it isn't the cocktails you've had. Finally, she leads you into the library. Like this room, Ben? Very much. Always wanted something like this. The right sort of library is good for a man. I designed this myself. Mm-hmm. Even no interior decorating, huh? You're, uh, pretty complete. <laughs> Thank you. Then, fix yourself another drink. The decanter is over there. I'll be right back. Take your time. This is all very pleasant. You fix another drink, sink into a big leather chair and relax. When you open your eyes a few minutes later, she's back, smiling down at you. Hello. Hello again. Oh, I see your glass is empty. Well, that's easily remedied. I'll pour you another one. 
Well, this is nice work, if you can get it. <laughs> Here you are. Thank you. Nice perfume you're wearing. Like it? I like everything about you. Good. Then you won't mind doing something for me, will you? Anything, short of murder. Walk over here. To the closet? Yes. Yeah? Now, open the door. There's something I want you to see. Okay. I'll play games with you. I... Hey, I thought you said we were alone. We are, Mr. Barkley. Because, you see, the gentleman in the closet is quite dead. It's a great deal more than you bargained for, isn't it, Ben? Yes. When you stepped into the car at the invitation of the beautiful blonde, you didn't realize what kind of a ride was ahead. It was like a dream, wasn't it? Going to her home, having cocktails and relaxing. And then in the library, you looked into the closet. Fantastic, Ben. Your mind spins, almost unable to cope with the situation, as you stare down at the quiet figure of a dead man on the floor of the closet. You scarcely hear the girl beside you. You'll help me, won't you? Huh? What'd you say? All you have to do is help me hide him permanently. Now, wait a minute. There's a place out in the garden where some newly turned earth wouldn't be noticed, but I'm not much good at digging graves. Uh Uh-uh, baby. You can count me out. I don't know how this guy happens to have a hole in his head, and I'm not asking any questions, but just count me out on any part of his You said you'd do anything for me. Yeah, but I don't go off the deep end for anybody, especially for a girl who's in the habit of keeping dead bodies lying around. Uh Uh-uh. No, lady. Pardon me. Well, I'll be seeing I think you'd better wait, Mr. Barkley. Oh. Yeah. See what you mean. I see you're wearing a gun, too. Uh Uh-huh. And I assure you I know how to use it. How can I doubt that, with the evidence staring me in the face? Good. That if you'll just pick up our late departed friend and come with me, I'll show you the place. You know that business about your being no angel? I'm just about convinced. You carry the body downstairs as she demands and go out into the garden. There's a shovel. Start digging. Like I said, dig it big. Sounds like a beach near here. The back of the yard drops off to the beach. But never mind, you've got other things to do. Dig deep and wide. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Sorry, baby. A heavy shovel full of dirt in her face knocks her off her feet. At the same time, you're leaping clear, racing for the drop-off at the back of the property. It's a wild, frightening scramble down through the rock and brush until you hit the beach, running hard. There are no shots, no footsteps. You're away, Van. Free. Far down the beach, you work your way back up to the highway, catch the bus for town and the safety of your hotel room. You're too upset to decide what to do that night. You want to call the police. But the memory of that blonde hair and those pale blue eyes stops you. You want to be sure before doing anything that will send her to the gas chamber. You turn in without deciding. Next morning, when you go downstairs, the desk clerk hands you something. Good morning, Mr. Barkley. Morning. What's this? A young lady left it late last night. Well, there's nothing written on the envelope. She just told me to put it in your box. Oh. Well, thanks. Hmm. That looks awful green. Yeah. A hundred dollar bill. And no note? No nothing? No. I wish I knew your secret, Mr. Barkley. You'd like to know that secret yourself, wouldn't you, Van? Now more than ever. One hundred dollars to pay for your silence. And probably a chance at more if you live up to the bargain. But there's also a chance to play it smart, isn't there? If you can find out more about this girl, her name, what's behind it all... You catch the bus again, and as you approach the big house, there seems to be quite a few people around. At the gas station on the corner, you find out why. All set, Mr. Armstrong. Anything else? That's all, Joe. Thanks. Hi there. What can I do for you, mister? Run out of gas or something? No. No, I was just walking, and I saw there was some kind of excitement around here. Yeah, more than we've had in a long time. They found a body down on the beach this morning. Oh, somebody drowned? Maybe so, but he got a bullet hole through his forehead first. Oh, murder, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Guy named Alfred Hamilton lived right up the street. 
Over in that house? Ridgely's? Oh, no. He used to be over there a lot, but he didn't live there. Well, I noticed that there was a police car out in front. Well, that's part of the excitement. Not only is this friend of the Ridgely's bumped off, but Doris is missing. Doris? Yeah, Doris Ridgely. Mr. Ridgely's daughter. Oh, that's uh, Ridgely the art collector? Sure, sure, you know. He's about the richest person in the neighborhood. Nice man, too. Mm -hmm. And Doris, his daughter. I remember, I've seen her. She's a blonde, isn't she? Uh, Good-looking? That isn't the word for that girl. She's a peach, and she's beautiful. Yes, but uh, rather hard and spoiled. Doris? No. Why, there isn't a nicer girl in town. And I ought to know. I've been taking care of her car ever since she started to drive. I sure hate to see her mixed up in anything like this. And missing, too. Why, she might be in the ocean herself. Only her car is gone, too. They think she murdered this guy, Hamilton? Mm, I don't know. But if you ask me, she couldn't have. She's too regular. And if she did, she had a good reason. Hamilton was no good. I never could understand why Doris and old man Ridgely put up with him. There's just the two of them live there, huh? Yeah, Mrs. Ridgely died a while back. Gosh, I hope they find the girl okay. It'd just about kill the old man if anything happened to her. Yeah. When was this guy murdered? Last night. And I can tell you exactly when. Ten minutes to eight on the nose. Oh? How can you be sure? Because I heard the shot. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but I did notice what time it was. Because I was just getting ready to close up. Did you tell the police that? Ah, Sure, sure. Where did the shot come from? How should I know? It was just a noise. Maybe from the house over there. Maybe from the beach where they found him. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Hey, uh, say, who are you anyway? Nobody important. So long. As you walk away, you feel sure about one thing. That Doris didn't murder Hamilton at all. She was covering for somebody else, wasn't she, Dan? And you've got to find her and bring her back. But, but where is she? Suddenly it hits you. The cabin she mentioned. Yes, at Anderson Lake. You decide quickly, Van. Next stop, Anderson Lake. Uh, Hello there, young fella. What can I do for you? Got everything here Bonnie needs. Groceries, notion, rugs, fishing, tackle. No, I was looking for somebody, Pop. Thought maybe you could give me directions. Well, I'm the person to come to. Can tell you about anybody in Anderson Lake. And who you're looking for? Doris Ridgely. She's got a cabin up here, hasn't she? Yep. Well, uh, how do I get there? You don't. Huh? Why not? Wouldn't do you no good. Why not? Nobody there. But I'm sure Doris is up here, and I've got to find her. Well, if you got eyes in your head, you wouldn't have to go to no cabin. Huh? <laughs> if you look across the street over there, you'll see her car in front of Jake's cafe. She's eating inside. Okay. Thanks, Pop. He's in Jake's cafe. And you wait outside until she comes out. As she gets into the convertible, you slip around the other side and open the door. Oh, Hello, uh, baby. It's a nice day for a drive, isn't it? Mr. Barkley. Don't reach you... for your bag. I'll take it instead. Oh. I'll take a look inside, too. Yeah, just as I thought, the gun, you still got it. Well, I'll just keep it this time, if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Barkley... Now, just a minute. I'll do the talking this time. First, I'll give this back to you. Even if I had a price for this sort of thing, it wouldn't be $100. It's all I had last night. I said even if I had a price, I don't. I'll keep my mouth shut until I'm ready to talk. Or you are. But what makes you think I have anything to talk about? Now, look, I think I know a good kid when I see one. If you're really in trouble, I'm sorry. But I don't think you are. I don't think you killed this heel, Hamilton. I think you're covering up for somebody. No, no, I'm not. I, I killed him. He was threatening me. Threatening to, to, to tell something about me, and I killed him. I don't believe you. All you did was try to get me to help cover up somebody else's work. No, that's not true. Okay, so you're not ready to talk yet. Come on, let's go for a drive. Well, you know, I'm sorry I had to smother you with that shovel full of dirt last night. But I didn't like the prospect of sharing that hole in the ground with Hamilton. You mean you thought I'd... Oh, no, I never intended to do that. Well, how'd you think you'd get away with it then? Just let me walk away to tell the cop? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, baby, keep your chin up. Of course you don't know. You were mixed up in something you knew nothing about. You couldn't have killed this guy, Hamilton, any more than you could have killed me. So, come on. Come clean. I... No, I I can't. Now, look, whoever this is you're covering up for, they'll be found out eventually. Probably they had a good reason for doing this, from what I hear about Hamilton. But now you've got to get yourself off the spot, and me, too. We're accessories to the murder. Yes, I know. I... Look, why are you doing this? Why did you come here? I'll show you why. If that 
answer your question? I, I, I... No talking now. Come on, start driving. We've got to have a little talk with the police. Well, Van, you found her, and she's grateful. You can see that. The way she smiles at you weakly, wonderingly. And perhaps later, when it's all over, you can pick up the dream where it left off. You think about it, you drive back to the city with her. Then as she swings the big convertible into San Vicente Boulevard, she suddenly slams on the brakes beside a police squad car. Hey, what's the idea, baby? We don't want a squad car. We want to go to police Officer? headquarters. Officer! Officer! Arrest this man. He's wanted for murder. And be careful. He's got a gun. You can't believe it's happening, can you, Vance? But it is. And later at police headquarters, your dream has turned into a nightmare. As Doris pours out a wild story to the chief of the Homicide Bureau. Yes, y yes, they, they were both at my house last night. They left together. Then I, I heard a shot. When I went out looking, I found Mr. Barkley standing over Hamilton's body down on the beach. He, he'd taken his wallet. What? You'll find it in his pocket right now. The officer here already has the murder gun. Are you kidding? Why, I haven't any wallet. I don't easy, have a... Easy, easy now. Well, seems you do have a wallet, Mr. Barkley. You see, Sergeant? Yeah, but... She put it there. She slipped it into my pocket while we were driving. This is Hamilton's wallet, and this is the same caliber gun that killed him, Barkley. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. It's all a lie. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Ridgely. Thanks for coming right over. The lad's right, Sergeant. He didn't kill him. Oh, Dad. It's no use, Doris. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you can't protect me. Dad, please don't say anything. I said it's no use, dear. You can release them, Sergeant. This young man and my daughter... I killed Hamilton. He was no good. I... I shot and killed him. The surprises are hitting you like punches from a fighter, aren't they, Van? The attempted frame against you by Doris. And now, out of the blue, her father facing the police, admitting that he killed Hamilton. You stare from one to the other, wondering and waiting. And then Doris breaks the silence. But, Dad, you couldn't have killed Hamilton. Why couldn't he? He just confessed. That's good enough for me. He confessed to protect me. Dad had no reason. He to... could have had the best reason in the world, blackmail. That was Hamilton's racket. Blackmail? And that's the answer, Doris. Hamilton had been bleeding me for a long time. But a few days ago, I got the evidence to clear myself and expose him. So you sent for him and told him. He got tough and... Uh... I shot him. I had to. In self defense. Oh, look, officer, you found the gun in Hamilton's wallet on this man right here. What more do you want? I tell you, I never saw this girl in my life until last night. It's no use, Doris. It happened exactly as I said. No, Dad, I know you didn't do it. There's only one way you could know, Miss Ridgely. Yes, Sergeant. There's only one way I could know. I tell you, my daughter is lying. Mr. Ridgely is right, Sergeant. Uh, oh, hello, Lieutenant. Find anything? Plenty. Your daughter's lying to protect him. We know from the gas station attendant's testimony that the shot that killed Hamilton was fired last night at ten minutes to eight. We've checked every move of Miss Ridgely's, and at ten minutes of eight, she was seen buying a pack of cigarettes at the corner drugstore. And it was Mr. Ridgely. Uh-uh. Mr. Ridgely left Hamilton in his living room last night somewhere around seven o'clock, probably after telling him he was going to expose him to the police. At ten minutes to eight, Mr. Ridgely was seen having a drink at the sea house. So, Barkley, you did take Hamilton's wallet. It was your gun. I tell you, I never even heard of any of these people. It I... wasn't young Romeo here either. And who? Alfred Hamilton committed suicide. Suicide? What? That's right. There's no doubt about it. Powder burns on his face. He was left-handed. The angle of the bullet in the left temple shows the wound was self-inflicted. And tests prove beyond a doubt that Hamilton fired a shot a few seconds before his death. I guess when he realized Mr. Ridgely was going to expose him to the police, he just couldn't take it. Now, Mr. Ridgely, if you'll come into my office a minute, I'll show you the reports. But, Dad, we'll wait in the car. I'll be along in a minute, Doris. Well, baby, you gave me a nice ride. A very nice ride. Oh, honestly, man, I, I'm terribly sorry, but... I was worried crazy about Dad. Van, do you think we could have that drink again? Sometime, maybe? Now, look. You're a nice kid. You're beautiful, fascinating, all those things. Especially beautiful. But, baby, if you ever see me walking down the street again, just go on by. Please.
Featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Hazel Lytle and John Dunkel, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, The Doctor's Wife. The Boston firm of Benneke and Woodruff, dealers in antiques, art objects, and rare books, has welcomed scholars and collectors into its long, narrow, and dimly lit showrooms for over 100 years. And since 1850, the same motto in neat gold letters on the plate glass window reads, A Firm of Integrity. But Charles Benneke, one of the present owners of Benneke and Woodruff, is too restless a man to follow in the traditional footsteps of his forebears. Even now, Though his policies have brought the firm to the brink of disaster, Charles remains self-assured and unruffled as he enters the showrooms late in the afternoon and walks back to the office of his partner, Paul Woodruff. Oh, there you are, Paul. Yes, here I am. Well, I did some good. Did you forge another letter by Keats, or was it Shakespeare this time? Lower your voice. What for? Because if I have to spend the next ten years in jail, I assure you, you will be in an adjoining cell. Thanks. Okay, what happened? They proved the Keats letter was a forgery. But they couldn't prove we, or should I say, I did it. But inasmuch as we guaranteed the letter in the bill of sale... Never mind the fine print. How much? Well, the judge awarded them $100,000. $100,000? You know what that means? We're through. Now, look, I told you five years ago when you started working in this dirty racket that I didn't want any part of it. But you never objected to sharing the profit. That's a lie. I objected then, I object now. I never wanted to get rich quick. Forget it. We've got to get busy. Oh? Doing what? Putting the stock up for auction and filing the bankruptcy papers? Not quite. I still have the genuine Tupo first edition of Bonelli's Fables locked away. Huntington Library offered $200,000 for it. <laughs> that was last month. They'll go even higher this month. I, I have a very unpleasant surprise for you. Another copy has turned up. Somebody was pulling your leg. Ours is the only copy in existence. Was. As you very well know, there were several copies turned out in the original printing. Another one has reared its ugly little head. Uh, the forgery. Yeah, sure, sure. That's the first thing you'd think of. Well, it's not. They did an infrared check on the watermark, and Huntington says it's an exact, exact duplicate of ours. Unmarked, perfect in every respect. Original Italian version, Bonelli's Fable Fables, F. Tupo Press, first known printing, issued February 13th, 1485, complete with the woodcut borders. Do you, uh, do you want any more? Who has it? Elkin Arthur, London, is the agent for the book, but is still in possession of the guy who discovered it, Dr. Roger Brookhurst, who lives in some London suburb. What do they want for it? Elkin Arthur figures they can swing the deal for around $50,000. Ridiculously low. We have to get hold of that book. <laughs> How? Even if we had $50,000, which we don't, thanks to you, Huntington already has an option on it. You seem rather pleased about the whole thing. As a matter of fact, I am. Even if I have to lose my shirt, at least I'll be through with you and your shady deals. Not just yet. I'm leaving town for a month, possibly longer. You'll remain in charge of the shop until I get back. Oh, who says I will? I needn't remind you that in the eyes of the law, you're quite as involved in the so-called shady deals as I am. 
I would strongly urge you to remain at your post until I return. Where are you going? London, of course. And I'm not coming back until I get that other copy of Bonelli's Fables. Three days later, you're aboard a World Airline Clipper, completing your trip across the Atlantic, aren't you, Charles? You lose no time sightseeing in London, do you? And after finding yourself in a quiet, fashionable apartment, you immediately put through a call to Dr. Roger Brookhurst. Hello? Dr. Brookhurst's office? It's Dr. Brookhurst's residence. I'd like to make an appointment to see him. The doctor's no longer receiving patients. Oh, well, I'm not sick. I wish to see the doctor on a business matter of extreme urgency. I'm afraid Dr. Brookhurst will be unable Oh, please. To... I've come all the way from America to see him. I'll do my best. I can't promise anything, but you may call at the house tomorrow at four. Won't you come in? Thank you. Oh, excuse me. This is Gerald Kimberley, Dr. Brooker's secretary, and... Charles Benneke. Please, I'm sure. Uh, forgive me, Yvonne. My head is splitting. I must be going. I'm sorry I'll about... I'll take care of it, Gerald. Don't worry. Well, then, goodbye, Yvonne. And good day to you, sir. Good day. Are you the doctor's daughter? <laughs> I'm his wife, but that is a compliment. Oh, the truth. Are all Americans like you? <laughs> In the presence of a beautiful woman. <laughs> In that case, I had better take you upstairs to see Roger immediately. Well, if you insist... I uh, want to warn you. He's been an invalid for some time. Stomach disorder. It makes him very short-tempered. Mm -hmm. I understand. Oh, Roger, the gentleman who phoned is here. Oh, yes, the American. Show him in. How do you do, Doctor? Uh, not very well. Sorry. Well, sir, what is this urgent business that brings you to my door? Your copy of Bonelli's Fables. You see... No, I don't. Now, look here, sir. I don't care if you came all the way from the North Pole. I have had quite enough of book buyers, book sellers, and book traders. My agent is Elkins Arthur, 84 Charing Cross Road. Consult him if you care to, but kindly leave me and my household alone. Well, I did tell you... Oh, no fault of yours. I try not to judge him, but... Cooped up with him day in and day out. Well, it's it just... Can't you ever get away? I can occasionally, but it's no fun by yourself. Well, uh, why don't you let me... Oh, no. I, I didn't mean to hint. After all, you're a complete stranger. All the more reason. Someone has to show me around London. I couldn't. Oh, nonsense. You can and you will. Let me take you out dancing somewhere after dinner tomorrow night. You can get away, can't you? Easily. Do you really want to? Oh, very much. Well, all right, I'll do it. Thank you. And I'm certain that neither of us will regret your decision. Yvonne. You know, the sound effects they use for radio are mighty interesting. For instance, supposing I were to broadcast that message you see on Signal's cartoon billboards. Next time, go farther with Signal. Well, if I said that same thing over a filter microphone, here's how it would sound. Next time, go farther with Signal. On the other hand, through the echo chamber, it sounds like this. Next time, go farther with Signal. But really, friends, the important thing is not how you say something, but what you say. And the important thing to you drivers is that from Canada to Mexico, Signal has become famous as the go-farther gasoline. After all, in order to give you such good mileage, today's Signal has to help your engine run more efficiently. And when your engine runs more efficiently, naturally you also enjoy quicker starting, peppier pickup, smoother power, more of the things that make driving more fun. So to be sure of both driving economy and driving pleasure, just be sure to fill up next time at a signal station and next time go farther with signal.
Well, Charles, it looked very bad when you first arrived in London with Dr. Roger Brookhurst, the owner of the only other first edition of Bonelli's Fables, in very ill health and equally ill nature. It seemed as if you'd be completely unable to talk him out of his copy of the book, which you must have to ensure the value of the one which you and your partner in America now possess. But the doctor's wife is going to make a difference, isn't she? You two get along beautifully the first night that you take her out, don't you? Dining in a secluded restaurant, dancing after and then a romantic stroll along the Thames. You don't even mention the precious book until you're riding home together in a cab. I don't know when I've enjoyed myself so much. Oh, it has been a splendid evening. You know, I can't see how a woman of your beauty endures that... I don't say it. I am married to Roger, and it's not his fault. Well, all the same, I... I... don't want to think about it. (laughs) Very well. This evening has been very strange. I feel as though I'd known you for years. And I've missed you for years. Charles, I... I... What are you trying to say? Nothing. Let's keep it light and gay. (laughs) All right. Let's discuss the subject you've avoided all evening. (laughs) I can't think of any. Remember I came to London to get my hands on a rare book? Oh. That. Yeah? How do you know I haven't taken you out for a purpose? I have had fun just the same. (laughs) Oh, you little idiot. Tell me, has your husband told you anything about the value of his Bonelli's fable? No, he never discusses business affairs with me. It's worth quite a lot of money, you know. Really? Yes. As much as 10,000 American dollars. That much? Honestly? That's right. You see Yvonne the next Friday, and then the weekend after that. You're sure she's in love with you, child, and you're sure she loathes her husband. But you have to find a way of bringing it out into the open, of taking advantage of it to get that book. Luck is with you there, isn't it, child? For on Wednesday evening, as you walk hand in hand down a quiet lane, Yvonne turns to you. You won't think I'm vicious, Charles, if I... if I... I know you're not. It's about Roger. I can't stand it another minute. Day in, day out, jailed in that old house with that nagging invalid. I, I, I'm sorry, it's not his fault. But you can't help what you feel. It's true, I can't. I'm young and I want to taste life. Of course you do. Do you care anything about me at all, Charles? Don't lie or pretend, please. I love you, Yvonne. You're not just saying that to get hold of that old book, are you, Charles? Yvonne, the book is important to me. I'm short of cash at the moment, and the client I represent will give me a handsome bonus for getting it, but, well, it has nothing to do with my love for you. You don't have to explain. Oh, darling, what can we do? Why don't you take the confounded book and run off with me? The devil take it off. I want to. I wish I could. Well, why can't you? The scandal would kill my family. Well, sometimes, Yvonne, we have No, Charles, it won't work. There must be some other way. If I could get a divorce, I... Oh, that's impossible, isn't it? Under the circumstances, yes. But you've got to help me, Charles. There is another way. What do you mean? It could be done quickly, safely. No one would be the wiser. No, no, Charles. Your husband is in a great deal of pain, Yvonne. No, not murder. Don't forget I mentioned it. Perhaps we'd better say goodbye. No. Wait. How... How would you... we do it if we decided to do it? I, uh, I assume Roger uses sleeping pills. Yes. Uh, a few extra in his glass of milk or tea, and... And it would be all over? Yes. Roger could leave a short note behind, explaining why he did it. Oh, but his handwriting. I've spent a good part of my life studying original manuscripts and letters. I'm... Something of an expert on handwriting. I see. Oh, but I'm afraid, Charles. I'm very afraid. Come here, darling. Please hold me close, Charles. Hold me tight. A few days later, Charles, as you sit in your lounging jacket reading a French novel... The phone rings. Uh, 
Hello? Charles? Yes. Can you come tonight? What time? Eight. All right. Don't have the cab stop in front of the house. No, of course not. Be sure no one sees you. I'll take every precaution. Eight, then. Eight. <laughs> afraid you wouldn't come. You know I wouldn't let you down. Did you get everything? Yes, in here. Mm -hmm. These are his letters? Yes, and they're recent, too. Good. Yes, his pen. Hmm. Is this his usual stationery? Yes. Let me do a little practicing on this scratch pad. Huh? Yvonne? Yvonne? Uh, yes? Uh, yes, Roger? Is there anyone down there in the sitting room with you? Uh, not really, Roger. Not, not really? Now, what does that mean? Is there anyone down there or not? I, I heard voices. Uh, uh, only a neighbor. Well, what does he want? Just to borrow a copy of the Times. Oh, very well. But you might tell your neighbor that subscriptions are available at the Strand. Yes, Roger. And bring up my tea, please. In a moment. Now. Maybe we shouldn't go through with it. Slip the sleeping tablets into the tea. What about the nose? Are you sure? It'll be perfect. All right, then. Yvonne! Yvonne! Coming, Roger! Well? He's drinking the tea now. The note? Oh, Jim. How's this? I've been a burden on my wife long enough. Forgive me. Roger Brookhurst, M.D. Good. Charles, perhaps you'd better keep away until after the funeral and the inquest. Yes, of course. I'll miss you, darling. I miss you too, Charles. I uh, hate to bring this up at a time like this, but we must be practical. Yes. Perhaps I ought to sell the book for you immediately. You'll need ready cash for the funeral expenses. Oh, no, and... Charles. They might ask about it at the inquest. Give me a week. Certainly, darling. Shall we arrange for a place to meet? What about our pub off Piccadilly Circus? Uh, just the place. A week from today. Four o'clock be all right? Yes. Anything else? No. I only hope I can stand the ordeal. When it gets bad, think of us in America, married, happy, together. I will. And now, upstairs, do you suppose he's... Yes, yes. We'd better have a look. The days that follow seem endless, don't they, Charles? You scan every edition of the newspaper, but all you find are short paragraphs in the back pages stating the simple facts of Roger's death. You fight to keep from phoning Yvonne, and the week finally passes. You find yourself at last in the pub off Piccadilly Circus for the four o'clock appointment with her. You wait for her nervously, and suddenly she's there, sitting down beside you in a black gown. Charles... I don't dare stay very long, but it is good to see you. Oh, yes. Everything go all right, Yvonne? Yes. Nothing suspicious at the inquest? Nothing. Ah, good. Did you bring the book? No. Well, why didn't you? I got a sharp cablegram from my client, and I'll need his bonus to book passage for the both of us. Well, I, I, I couldn't help it. There were a million details. Tomorrow, Charles, I promise. Well, I'll meet you in the morning. You'd better make it afternoon. Why? Because, silly, the book is in the Bank of London and I have to get all sorts of papers signed and sealed proving I'm me and that Roger was my husband and that I have a right to his bank vault. Yeah, all right. At three, the Bank of London. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'll see you tomorrow. You're not cross with me? No. You still love me? Oh, you know I do. Three, Bank of London. <laughs> You feel much better, don't you, Charles? You're certain that tomorrow afternoon you'll have your hands on the only other original printing of Bonelli's Fable. You feel a little sad about poor Ivan, but you don't let it bother you too much. You leave the pub and walk to the World Airlines office. Can I be of service, sir? I wish to book passage back to America. Boston. Oh, yes, sir. We have a flight leaving tomorrow night at 9. I'll take it. Uh, how many in your party? Uh, one. 
As you're about to get your ticket, you suddenly hear a familiar voice from another ticket window close by. Two for Paris. Yes, they'll do. I'm in a hurry. Here. You can only catch a glimpse of her back, but you're sure it's Yvonne. Your ticket, sir? Hold it for me. But, sir, I'll be back. You rush out after her, but she disappears into a waiting car and drives off. Desperately, you look up and down the street. Cabby! Cabby! Off in Yank. Bromley suburb. And step on it. Number and street, if you don't mind. I'll right. show you. Get going. You have the driver let you off a block before Yvonne's house and walk the rest of the way. As you approach, you see Gerald Kimberly, the late Dr. Brookhurst's secretary, drive off in a roadster loaded with suitcases. You're afraid you're too late, aren't you, Charles? As you rush inside the Brookhurst residence. Gerald, darling, is that you? I'm in here. The rest of the bags are packed. I'm getting the book out of the safe. Hello, Yvonne. Charles. Surprised? Yes. I didn't think you could do a thing like this after all we went through. Didn't you know? I thought that lady loved me. No crocodile tears, Charles. I was on to your game from the first. What do you mean, game? Oh, come off it, Charles. Imagine trying to tell me the book was worth $10,000 when poor Roger was giving it away at 50000 You knew. All the time, you knew. What did you take me for anyway, an innocent little fool? Well, now you know much better. I'll take that book. Oh, no, you won't. You'll get out of here. Gerald and I are going away together. And if I have any more difficulties from you, I shall call the police. You wouldn't dare. Why not? As I remember it, you forged a suicide note. I... Uh, listen, Yvonne. <laughs> this is wrong. I... I love you, Yvonne. Don't lie. Besides, if it were true, it would do you little good. Gerald and I have been in love for years, but... he couldn't bring himself to do away with Roger. So that's why you let me... You used me. That's right. I'll take that book, Yvonne. No, you won't. I, I let go of me. I... Oh. Too bad, Yvonne. You could at least have had your life. And Gerald. Cats, which are said to have nine lives, were once used as a basis of comparison for things which are supposed to last a long while. But today, pussy is a piker compared with the new Lee Super Deluxe tires. Here's what I mean. For extra long mileage, Lee toughens long-wearing cold rubber still further with patented high abrasive Phil Black O. And for extra safety, extra protection against blowouts or road hazards, Lee reinforces the carcass with double life rayon cord. No wonder Lee of Conshohocken, for half a century maker of first line tires, dares to back these famous nationally advertised new Lees with a double guarantee. Guaranteed for life against effective workmanship and materials. Guaranteed 15 months against all road hazards. When you consider that Lee charges nothing extra for all this extra quality, and dealers are now giving generous trade and allowances on old tires, you can see why more and more drivers who want to be prepared for what's ahead are going to signal stations and Lee Tire dealers for the tire with nine lives. Lee Tires. It was over quickly, wasn't it, Charles? With Yvonne dead, you were able to take the book, dispose of your gun, and leave the house without being seen. Then you hurry to the transatlantic telephone, talk to your partner in Boston, give him some hurried instructions. You're certain you can expect a visit from the police probably soon. And after talking with your partner, you're sure you're prepared for them, aren't you? Yes. You own an identical copy of the book. It's a matter of public record in book catalogs throughout the world. You're sure all you have to do is say that this is your copy of Benelli's Fable. Both volumes are identical, aren't they? Even the printing errors, the flaws in the lithography. And no one can know that your copy of Benelli's Fables is locked in the safe of your office in America. It's a risk, but only a slight one which you will have to take. You jump at the sound of a knock on the door. You wonder if it can be the police so soon. 
quickly, you slip the stolen book from your briefcase and put it in a desk drawer and lock it. Coming. Coming. Yes? Who are you? I'm Inspector Kramer of Scotland Yard. May we come in? Oh, please do. Sorry for the delay. It's quite all right. And, sir, I am here about a murder. Murder? Yvonne Brookhurst was found shot to death two hours ago. Oh, I... Oh, this, this is a shock. Rare volume was stolen by the murderer. Uh, Bonelli's Fables. Yes, yes. Uh, we understand from Mr. Gerald Kimberley that you were most anxious to get the book. I certainly was. Uh-huh. It's an original edition. I have the only other copy. I have it with me, as a matter of fact. Our ownership is a matter of official record, if you care to investigate. Mm. Uh, How do you happen to bring your copy with you, as valuable as it is? Oh, with both copies in my possession, I could ask and get any price for either. Or both. I'd hoped to sell them, either here or at home. Yes, and it still seems strange... You're more than welcome to communicate with my partner in the States, Inspector. He'll verify everything I've told you. The fact that this is our copy, the reasons why I brought it with me. Yes, you. yes, we may get around to that. Meantime, then, may I see your copy? Yes, of course. Here you are, Inspector. Yeah. It's interesting. Tell me, are you familiar with the book at all? Oh, certainly. Mm -hmm. I read it twice a year. It gives me a chance to brush up on my Italian. (laughs) Good. Are there any identifying marks in the book? Uh, Let's see. Uh, Yes, uh, turn to page 32, last line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Capital letter is missing on the first word. Uh, Any others? Mm -hmm. The, uh, The donkey, beautiful woodcut on the margin of... Page 50. Yes? The donkey's eye is missing. Mm hmm. Mr. Benneke, I shall have to arrest you for the murder of Yvonne Brookhurst. This is not your copy of the book, it's the Brookhurst copy. What do you mean, Inspector? What I said. You've never read this book, nor has anyone else. The two pages you mentioned are still uncut. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Les Tremaine, Alice Reinhardt, John Daner, Herb Rawlinson, and Donald Morrison. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Meyer Dolinsky, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by the Whistler entitled Man on the Run, in which a killer takes dangerous and breathtaking chances in an attempt to elude pursuit. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I 
am the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Three minus one equals murder. It was on the outskirts of Los Angeles. The girl stood in the glare of the oncoming headlights, waving her arms, not knowing for certain if the young man at the wheel could see her through the rain and the 3 a.m. darkness. She wondered if he was going to go on past, and she shouted out to him. Stop! Please stop! Hey, what's the matter? I almost ran over you. Oh, I was afraid you wouldn't stop. I got a flat. Look, if you expect me to change a tire in this rain... No, of course not. I can pick up the car tomorrow. How about a lift, huh? Okay, get in. Oh, thanks. Well, something wrong? No. no nothing is wrong. Oh, I didn't think I looked that bad. Uh, no, no. You, uh, you looked good. You're just a little wet. Uh, we better get going. I, uh, thought that was the idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, where to? It's not far. Uh, turn left down here and then take the road up to the hills. <laughs> What's so funny? Well, it sounds like you're taking me to Lover's Lane. I see you've been there before. Uh, only to look at the view. And did you like it? The view? Mm-hmm. Left me breathless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, here, take my handkerchief. Oh, thanks. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, sure glad you came along. You been to a party? No, I was just coming home from work. Work in those clothes? I'm a singer, Sylvia Starr. My real name is Sylvia Sanford. Oh, uh, where? Mario's. Well, it's quite a spot. <laughs> now my interview. Name? Yeah, Matt Blake. Matt Blake. Nice. Profession? Airplane mechanic at Glenview Airport. Sounds very exciting. As a matter of fact, it's pretty dull, especially the late shift. Just came off duty. <laughs> Lucky for me. <laughs> hey, if we don't hurry and get you home, you won't be able to sing. <laughs> Just around a couple of more curves. Who was it that said, let's get out of these wet clothes into a dry martini? Oh, Robert Fenchley. Oh, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, say, wouldn't you like to come in for a drink? Maybe by that time the rain will stop. Well, that's the best idea I've heard all evening. Here, turn in this driveway. Watch it, it's pretty sharp. You mean you live here? Mm-hmm. Big, isn't it? Singers must be doing all right these days. Oh, I'm... I'm not that good. I married money. Oh, you're married. Well, look, I'd better be getting out. Don't be silly. He's out of town. Oh? Well, after all, you've driven me clear up here. The least you deserve is a drink. Okay. You've twisted my arm. <laughs> oh, here's a light. Oh, it's good to be inside. Give me a coat. Make yourself at home. Home? I feel more like I was in a hotel. Then straight down the hall here. Wow. This is very cozy. Very cozy. I'm having brandy and soda. What would you like? Oh, that's good. I'll hold the soda on the side. Are you sure your husband isn't here? Positive. He won't be home for two days. Well, good for him. Here you are. Yeah. Home, sweet home. I'll open the curtain so we can look at the light. You know, when I'm alone, I like to sit here at night and look at the world down there. Are you uh, alone often? Yes. Dutch, my husband's gone quite a lot. With him, business comes first. Yeah, well, somehow I find that hard to believe. Oh, he's not at all like me. We live in two different worlds. What does he do in his world? Rob banks for a living? <laughs> no, he's got timberland. He owns half the trees in Oregon. Lady, you are in clover. Am I? Uh, what does that mean? Lots of girls think diamonds are a girl's best friend. Till they have them. 
Then they find out they want something more. Yeah, you women are all alike. You've got to complicate your lives. You got something against romance? I'm beginning to think more of it every minute. But with me, it, it might get in the way. You see, I, I'm a firm believer in the old school of marrying rich widows. They can't afford to be sentimental. It's either money or love, not both. No. By the way, uh, how's your husband's health? Better than mine. Yeah, lucky fellow. Perfect health, imported brandy, and a beautiful wife. In that order? Mm, not if you were mine. I'd put you right at the top of the list. You and your blonde hair. Here, give me a glass. I wish I could say, let me take you away from all this, but uh, somehow it doesn't fit. No, it doesn't, does it? Uh, you'd better just finish your drink before we change our minds. Yes, Sylvia, you send him away. And you're a little sorry it has to be this way, aren't you? Matt is handsome, with the charm of frankness you like so much. But you know what you're doing. And you wait just long enough before managing a second meeting out at the airport. Hey, Matt. Yeah, Joe. Coming here to see you. See me? Who is it? Standing over there. <whistles> Tell me how you do it sometime. Sylvia. Hello, Matt. I just wanted to thank you for the lift the other night. Oh, any time, baby. I didn't expect to see you here at the airport. See that civilian plane that just took off? Dutch is in it. Another trip. How long has he gone this time? Oh, a couple of days. Look, if I'm interrupting... Hey, hey, hold, hold it, sweetheart. You can't come and go this easy. How's the brandy holding on? Oh, there's plenty left. Oh, that's more like it. How about tonight? After I'm through here. All right, why not? Tonight, Matt. <laughs> Things are going fine, aren't they, Sylvia? And after that, you see Matt again and again. And finally, on one of your husband's many trips out of town, you and Matt are together in your cozy den. And you're sure now is the time to get on with your plan. Now that you're finally in his arms. Oh, baby, baby. Just hold me, Matt. Sylvia, what is it with us? Oh, Matt, don't you know? We're in love, you and me. But it's impossible, it's crazy. That's what love is. Look, darling, use your head, it won't work. It can work. We can make it work. Listen, darling, this is the chance you've been waiting for. You want a rich widow to take care of you. Rich widow? I want the job, Matt. You're going a little too fast for me. Do I have to make it any plainer? We could... We could get rid of Dutch. Wait a minute, Sylvie... You're talking about murder. We could have his money and each other. Oh, Matt, I'm desperate. Say you'll help me, please. Say. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, Sylvia, you missed your calling. You should be an actress. What do you mean? That little speech was very touching. Matt, I don't... Do I look that dumb? If you want to get rid of your husband, you'll have to get another sucker. I'm not going to be the fall guy for any dame. Doesn't my loving you make any difference? You expect me to believe that? I'm almost wondering if you didn't set this up from the beginning. Oh, you're a fool, Matt. I love you. Oh, stop it, Sylvia. When you get right down to it, you're just a woman, and every corner comes equipped with one. Not like me. No. Not like you. But an awful lot safer. Matt, Matt, don't leave I'm me. I'm getting out of here. So long, Sylvia. All right, go on. But somehow, I think you will be back. <laughs> Just mention those two words, go farther, to motorists anywhere around these Pacific Coast states. And what do they think of? Why, signal the famous go farther gasoline, of course. Now, it goes without saying, in order to be known as the go farther gasoline, signal has to give mighty good mileage. But sometimes a product becomes so celebrated for one feature, people forget it has other advantages, too. I'm referring to the satisfying performance, which naturally goes hand in hand with signal's good mileage. 
As you've heard me explain before, you get that good signal mileage because today's signal gas helps your engine run so efficiently. And when your engine runs efficiently, naturally you also enjoy quicker starting, peppier pickup, smoother power. That's why Signal hopes you'll remember. The best yardstick of a gasoline's performance is its mileage which also explains why more and more motorists who insist on the tops in driving pleasure are switching to Signal, the famous gasoline that helps you go farther. Go farther. Go farther. Sylvia, you finally told Matt what's been on your mind so long, the murder of your husband. And you don't give up when Matt storms angrily out, refusing to have any part of it, do you? No, because you're certain that here in this house is the answer to all of Matt's dreams. You, Sylvia, and the easy money he'll share with you once Dutch is dead. Matt stays away from you for a whole week, and then... Matt, oh, I knew it was you, I knew it. Why did I come back? Don't you? I want you to tell me. Because you love me. And I love you. Say it again. And mean it, Sylvia. Close the door. That tells me everything I want to know. What now, Matt? I'll do whatever you want, Sylvia. Anything. But it's got to be quick. But carefully. It takes planning. I've seen your husband at the airport, Sylvia, and I've been noticing things. He's the kind who takes chances, likes his night flying. Everyone knows the chances Dutch takes. Part of his nature. The way he drives his car. Don't you ever pick him up at the airport? No, he leaves his car there. When does he come home next, Sylvia? Friday night. Why? Well, that long stretch of road below here before it hits the hills, it's it's deserted late at night. But supposing he goes off the road at high speed, crashes. People would say he took one chance too many. Matt, it's awful risky. Whatever you do, be careful. I'll see that his car goes off the road. So long, baby. Goodbye, darling. Well, Sylvia, it's going to happen even sooner than you had dared hope, isn't it? The days ahead seem like years, but you check your impatience, knowing that it's all up to Matt. And whatever happens is on his shoulders. Friday night, you stay within the safety of your house in the hills. But it's not hard to imagine the scene on that lonely stretch of road when the hour comes. Your husband, driving at his usual breakneck speed. Now another car coming up behind, then alongside, crowding Dutch over relentlessly. Dutch's angry shout till his tires hit the shoulder, and then the wild crash as his car careens down the embankment. Hello? Relax, baby. Oh, Matt. Matt, are you all right? I couldn't be better, but I can't say as much for your late husband. Then it worked. You're sure? I said relax, Sylvia. It went just like I said it would. He was doing 70 when he went off the road. Oh, Matt, when will I see you? I better sit tight tonight. When I see you again, it's for keeps. Right, baby? Yes, Matt, yes. For keeps. <laughs> It looks like the house and everything Dutch has is yours now, Sylvia. And when the doorbell rings an hour later, you're sure it's the police coming to tell you of your husband's untimely death. Dutch. So surprised to see your husband, Sylvia? Why, why, no, I... It's almost as though you didn't expect me. Or did you? Well, of of course I did. It's just that you, you look so strange. What happened, Dutch? I'm not quite sure. Then something did happen. A car deliberately ran me off the road. I'm wondering why. Oh, darling, how awful. The driver must have been drunk. Maybe. Only he drove away safely enough. I'm not a bad driver myself, Sylvia, or I'd have turned over for sure. Oh, thank heavens you're all right, honey. Look, 
Why don't I get you a drink and, and then you can get some rest? Not the... now. Come into the den, Sylvia. I want to talk with you. Tonight? Why? I've been thinking about you these last few weeks, Sylvia. And uh, what happened in the past hour. Surely you're not accusing me of... Is there any reason why I should? No, of course not. Oh, Dutch. Dutch, you're not... Sit yourself. down, Sylvia. Now listen to me. Very well. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. You're still my wife. I've made up my mind about a lot of things. To begin with, you're giving up your crazy idea of being a singer again. I see. In spite of what you think, other people like my voice. They pay to hear me. They pay money to see you wiggle in those dresses you wear. You haven't changed, Sylvia. You're still the same girl I took out of the carnival five years ago, the snake dancer. Come one, come all, only a dime. Can't you ever forget you found me in a carnival? I can't forget, Sylvia, because you won't let me. <gasps> Why did you marry me? I don't think you ever loved me. You're wrong, Sylvia. I did love you. And besides, you're beautiful. And I like beautiful things, you know that. Yes, I still take pride in having you here, Sylvia. It soothes a man's ego to have a beautiful young wife. But you never let me do anything I like. You're always criticizing, always complaining. Perhaps it's because I see something in you that should be developed, some innate sense of refinement. Oh, really? You're supposed to marry people for love, not, not to develop them. I'm touched deeply, my dear. This is the first time I knew you ever married me for love. Oh, what makes you this way? Don't you have any feelings? Stop it, Sylvia. No, I'm going to say this once more, and this time I want it to sink in. I'm not a man who can live alone with disappointment, nor uncertainty about my wife. If you want to go on accepting the comforts I give you, enjoy my money, inherit it. If anything happens to me, you're going to have to live the way I want you to. It's that or else. Is that what you mean, Dutch? As of this moment, everything is changing. I intend for us to go abroad this winter. And I expect you to conduct yourself like a lady. Is that clear? Is it? Yes. It's perfectly clear. Good. And in the meantime, Sylvia, just to remind you, a lady always remains loyal to her husband. More days go by, Sylvia. But now that Dutch has delivered his ultimatum, you're more than ever determined to do away with him once and for all. But as long as Dutch is home, you don't dare see Matt. Because you're not quite sure how much Dutch might know, are you? But at last you call Matt from the beach house, and he rushes to meet you. Matt, he's been watching me like a hawk. Baby, is it safe here? Yes, he went to Bakersfield, but just for today. Besides, he hardly ever comes to the beach house. Oh, darling, I can't live with him any longer. I know, baby. It's got to be us. Straight down the line. Soon. It's got to be soon. Every day I'm away from the ice. But you were right. It's got to be planned. The next time we've got to be sure. It shouldn't be so difficult, should it, Matt? No, no. It's still the, the getting away with it. We could still make it look like an accident. He, he could fall in the pool. Or his gun could go off while he no, was cleaning no, no, it. No, no, no. That's, that's not good. At least no better than the last try. Oh. Baby, uh... Tell me some more about Dutch. Well, what? What do you want to know? Everything. Anything you know. Just talk. Well, I... I guess Dutch is what you'd call a proud man. He, he's always telling how he started with nothing and worked his way up. How he had to fight for everything. You sit there, Sylvia, talking, as the ice in your drink melts down to water, and the sunlight filling the room gradually turns to shadows. You talk on, oblivious to everything else, waiting for the perfect plan. That's because he was kicked around. Yes, that's why he's never trusted anyone. That's why he learned to fly his own plane, so he wouldn't have to depend Sylvia, on anyone. Sylvia, his own plane, why didn't we think of that? Oh, Matt, would it be possible? At the Glenview Airport, where I'm a mechanic, why not? You say he'll be back tonight, Sylvia? Late, yes. All right. All right, I better not do anything to draw suspicion. See, uh, you go out to Glenview and be there at the airport waiting for him when he comes in. Find out exactly where he keeps the plane, uh, who his mechanic is, and when he gets the plane ready for the next flight. Uh, you understand? Yes. You mean something could happen to his plane? I can fix it. Leave that to me. But what if somebody suspects? Dutch is a good flyer, Matt. He knows planes. Not like I do. Uh, see, a crash at the airport wouldn't be so good. Let him take off. That's it. 
It gets in the air. Things will be going fine till something snaps. You're sure it's possible? I tell you, I know a way, Sylvia. And once Dutch crashes and the plane burns, no investigation in the world will turn up anything. At 11 o'clock that night, Sylvia, you're standing inside the terminal gate waiting for Dutch. You watch the planes land and take off, almost forgetting to breathe. They're the symbol of your freedom now, and then suddenly... Sylvia! Oh, Dutch. I thought I saw you standing at the gate, but I couldn't believe my eyes. Why, I thought you weren't interested in planes. Well, you're, you're looking at a new woman, honey. I decided that since you spend so much time in the air, I, I want to know everything about it. Well, come on over with me and I'll show you the plane then. Oh, I'm glad you came on, dear. Now, before long, you'll be as crazy about flying as I am. You're probably right, Dutch. Uh, when are you taking your next flight? Huh? Oh, next Wednesday. Oh. Well, do I detect a note of sadness? Well, I was just thinking how long away that was. I, I mean, how long you'll be away. Sylvia, uh... I've been thinking ever since I got back from my last trip and we quarreled. I, I've been thinking... Oh, please, let's... Don't start in again, Doc. No, let me finish. I, I've i been blaming you for all our difficulties, and I've been very harsh, but it's been my fault, too. Maybe more than yours. After all, you're young, full of life, and it's not much fun being tied to a man who's away so much. Dutch, you don't hear me complaining? No, w wait, Sylvia. I, I've tried to change you and mold you to my pattern of thinking. That That was stupid. You... You were right. You can't marry people in hopes of changing them. You marry them because you love them. Well, uh, what I'm trying to say, and, I, and I'm afraid I'm saying it very badly, is I, I I do love you, Sylvia. Can't we make a new start? A new start? I'm going to give up all the business trips unless we can go together like the trip abroad I've planned. I'm going to stay home with you and spend all of my time making you happy. That would make you happy, wouldn't it? Why... Yes. And on this next trip, I'm going to get everything in order, wind up the loose ends, and then I promise you, dear, it'll be the last trip I'll take. Your last trip? Yes, Sylvia. And we'll make it an occasion you'll never forget. That night after dinner, you make an excuse to go out, phone Matt. And later, you meet him at an all-night market. Start setting the plans for next Wednesday. Lay the groundwork for murder. And then comes the hardest part of all, Sylvia. More waiting. There are five days left. Five days of staring at the clock. Five days of looking at the calendar. And Dutch never leaves you alone. He's very gay and attentive, trying hard to make you smile. You look up into his face and smile back at him when he kisses you. Every nerve in your body is twisted. But you smile back at him. Because you know you won't have to smile at him much longer. Of course, you don't go with Dutch to the airport Wednesday morning. When he leaves, you kiss him at the door and wave a fond goodbye. You know that Matt is waiting halfway down the hill. His work done. Waiting only long enough to see Dutch drive away. It's only a few minutes until Matt arrives and you're in each other's arms. Oh, you're sure, Matt? You're sure he'll crash? I'm positive. He won't be in the air more than a few minutes before he loses control. Oh, what if he notices something wrong before he takes oh, off? Oh, look, baby, I've taken enough planes apart and put them back together to know what I'm doing. He'll get off the ground, but not too much further. Our worries are over, Sylvia. Oh, darling. Matt, darling. Oh, don't cry, baby. We'll have everything now. We can really start to live. You hear people say, you don't get anything for nothing these days. Well, if I may borrow a phrase from Gershwin, it ain't necessarily so. At least you certainly get a lot of extras without paying extra for them when you buy Lee tires. For instance, like most modern tire makers, Lee uses cold rubber. But Lee gives its cold rubber extra toughness by adding patented high abrasive fill black O. All tires have to have some kind of carcass. But Lee gives its carcass extra reinforcement against blowouts and damage with double life rayon cord. And while numerous tires are guaranteed, Lee Super Deluxe Passenger Tires give you extra protection with a double guarantee. 
guaranteed 15 months against all road hazards, guaranteed for life against defective materials and workmanship. Yet you pay nothing extra for all these extras in Lee Tires. In fact, right now, signal stations and Lee Tire dealers are even giving generous trade-in allowances for old tires. So any way you look at it, for value, for mileage, for safety, your best tire buy is a nationally advertised Lee Tire, proudly featured and guaranteed by more than 19,000 dealers throughout America, including all signal service stations. The blast of the crashing plane was heard all over the valley, sending residents rushing from their homes to see the flames and smoke of the wreckage. Firefighters quickly blocked the area, but the newsmen got through, got the story, and called their papers. City desk. Hello, Scotty. This is Clary. Here's the story on that plane crash. Uh, Dutch Sanford, the lumber king? That's the one. What about his house? Uh, nothing left of it. Looks like an atom bomb hit it. According to neighbors, he flew low and buzzed it a couple of times, apparently signaling goodbye to his wife. On the last dive, he couldn't pull out of it, piled right into his own house. Uh, how did they identify Sanford? Dutch Sanford wasn't killed. The crash threw him free of the plane, and they pulled him out of some bushes. He'll be as good as new in a few weeks. Anybody in the house? They recovered two bodies, Dutch's wife, Sylvia, and some guy who was with her. We don't know who he was. Chances are we never will. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you. The USO, which serves as a home away from home for our boys in uniform, is one of the many worthy services you'll be helping this year when you contribute to the current community chest campaign. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Doris Singleton, High Averback, Bill Conrad, and Bob Bruce. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Jolene Hinman, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler entitled Love Match in which a terrible mistrust between a pair of conspirators leads to grimly exciting mystery and murder. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. Stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, The Clay Tree. <laughs> Thank you. 
Russ Thompson's movements were quiet, his steps slow and even as he paced back and forth across the wide corridor. Outside, the approaching storm was creeping closer. Russ would stop occasionally, look up to where the winding heavy rail staircase disappeared to the floor above. It was almost as if he could see what was going on up there in old Elvira Clay's bedroom. The doctor checking Elvira's fading pulse. Jennifer Clay, Elvira's niece, looking on. You start to pace again, Russ. And then stop as Elvira's attorney, Jace Devlin, sighs softly from his position in the big wing chair across the living room. What do you think, Jace? You think the doctor's right that Elvira won't last? He's old, Russ, very old, quite tired. Oh, I wish Jennifer would come down let us know. You heard the doctor's last report. Your attitude, Russ. What about it? Most admirable. I know you've always thought a lot of the Clays. I mean far beyond your management of their land and holdings. Uh, I've tried to do what's right. You've done nobly. Even this feeling about poor old Elvira. After all, it isn't as if she didn't live a good long life. That isn't everything. It helped. Killing of her son didn't help any. Especially the way he was killed. Poor Alvira. I still wish you would try to talk her out of leaving that tree up there on the hill with that plaque on it. To the memory of hasty hands that took justice and law unto themselves. It's a monument of shame. That's what it is. Why shouldn't it be? Your only son was hanged by a wild mob. It was done by mistake, Russ. A terrible mistake. That doesn't bring the boy back. No, no, no. The Anderson girl. They thought he killed but what are you going to do? Elvira's son was going with the girl. They quarreled. When she was murdered, it was natural for people to think he did it. Natural. Wasn't natural to hang him, take the law into their own hands. But they did, Russ. And then learned too late that the boy couldn't possibly have done it, that it was someone else who killed her. Anyway, I don't condemn Elvira. I mean, for putting the plaque on that tree up there. It's going to stay there, you know. So it seems, Russ. So is that crowd up on the hill. They're pretty mad. Elvira's mind is made up. I wish she'd change her mind. And I hope she doesn't. It's a strange situation, isn't it, Russ? Attorney Jace Devlin mistaking your attitude for strong devotion to Elvira Clay. Actually, it's far different, isn't it? Yes. And as you walk to the window... And look up toward the big tree on the hill. You're trembling inside. Trembling with fear and anxiety. The little crowd of townspeople around the tree, Russ. Supposing they got excited. Decided to tear the tree down. The old clay tree. You hate it as much as any of them, don't you? But for a much different reason. And in spite of your hate, you realize the tree must not be touched. At least for a while. Jace. Uh, yes, Russ. I'm, uh, I'm going out for a walk. In this weather? That's right. I'm going up to have a, another look at the tree. What if I am? Well, I guess the people know how you feel anyway. It will be a long time before they're in the mood to harm anyone else. Elvira's at least accomplished that. Yes, she's at least accomplished that. <laughs> Fighting the wind as you stride up the hill toward the old tree, your mind spins, doesn't it, Russ? Its branches silhouetted against the sky look weird, accusing. Equally accusing of the softly muttering people standing around at the base of the tree, staring at the plaque which Elvira ordered placed there following the hanging death of her son. You're thankful that the plaque is all that these people can see, aren't you, Russ? Yes. Thankful that no one but you knows of the terrible secret. As you reach the summit and the small group of muttering townspeople, you see Hank talking to a news photographer. Hard to blame the old woman for putting up that plaque. Well, let's see now. I want to get a picture of it. Well, it's right there, right in front of you, plain to see. To the memory of hasty hands that took justice and the law unto themselves. You didn't have to come all the way down here, mister. Those words been in the papers a lot the past two weeks. Oh, no, ours is a different angle. Pictures. We do a layout covering the whole story. The tree here, the plaque, reaction shots of the townspeople. Well, they won't oh. like it. Am I right, Mr. Thompson? What? I, I say folks won't like this magazine fella taking pictures. 
They're ashamed, but they're pretty fed Folks, up. Folks, would you move aside a little, please? I want to get a close shot of that plaque. Now, that does it. Now, get another for protection. And then if you folks don't mind, maybe a few of you looking up at the tree. Suppose we do mind. Yes, we've we just about mind. suffered enough. No, no, no. Easy, folks. Uh, Mr. Thompson, you better talk to him. I'm not interested. Look, folks, I'm just doing my job. It's news. My magazine, they sent me down here. And we're sending you back. Come on. We're not posing. You have your picture of the plaque. You better do what he says, mister. I can't be responsible. Oh, well, no, I... Okay, okay. Take it easy. You don't have to shove. I... I'll see you later, Mr. Thompson. I better help him get out of here. Sure, sure. Go ahead, Hank. You wait until the small crowd of townspeople and the protesting magazine photographer have all gone. Then you look around, decide there's no one watching, then step quickly over to the tree, reach your arm down inside the hollow trunk where your secret is hidden. Secret evidence, Russ. Murder evidence against you. Evidence proving you committed the murder for which Alvira's son was hung. The letters that the Anderson girl had written you. The gun you killed her with. Yes, Russ. Murder evidence. Evidence that could hang you. Evidence you hurriedly disposed of the night you killed her. But now, as you try to reach them, you find that the hollow extends much Just... deeper than you thought. Oh. Oh, it's no use. Probably hollow, clear down to the base of the tree. Mr. Thompson! Uh, you whirl, drawing your arm quickly out of the tree trunk, your hand empty, as Hank, the caretaker, comes back up the hill. Well, he's gone, Mr. Thompson, that reporter. <laughs> they run him off. Just as well. Been somebody around here ever since it happened. Yeah. Hey, what do you think will happen to the tree now, Mr. Thompson? Happen? Why should anything happen to it? Why, haven't you heard? I thought you handled all the clay property. Well, my office does, of course, but I don't know what Well, you... I heard only yesterday that some fellow named Carson's aiming to buy this property. Wants to put up a new house right smack on the nose here. Oh, no, no. Oh, Elvira would never stand for that. It, but if she dies, Mr. Thompson, and it seems as if she will, then what? Well, then there's her niece, Jennifer, a good, sensible girl. Yeah, but Jen never did hanker too much after putting that plaque up there. Thought it was unfair to all the people in town that didn't have nothing to do with the hanging. Jan might just sell, don't you think, Mr. Thompson? Well, I, I, I don't know, I'm sure. If you don't mind, Hank, I've got to get back inside. I, I, I forgot I left Jace Devlin waiting for me. You scarcely know what you're saying, do you, Russ? The fear inside you is mounting so. You were so certain you could reach the gun in those letters. Didn't realize that the hollow in the tree went so far down. And that you'll have to improvise a way to fish them out when you get the chance. You hurry back to the house. Discover Jace Devlin on his feet, looking toward the wide, circular staircase. Jennifer is standing there, isn't she, Russ? White face, silent. Looking down on both of you. Then... She's dead. Aunt Alvira's dead. It's up to me now to look after the house of clay. In that popular new song, she lived on the morning side of a mountain. He lived on the twilight side of a hill. They tell of a boy and girl who lived so near to each other, yet never got acquainted, never got to know each other. Well, don't laugh, friends. You may be living even closer than that to wonderfully improve performance for your car, yet never get to know what proud performance your car can deliver unless you get acquainted with signal ethyl gasoline. You may never know how quickly your car can start on cold mornings unless you try Signal Ethel. You may never know what peppy pickup, what smooth, quiet power your engine can deliver 
unless you try Signal Ethyl Gasoline. For the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline is a true super fuel, scientifically engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. And, fortunately, unlike the boy in the song, you won't have to drive over a hill to try Signal Ethel. You'll need only drive into the nearest Signal station and say, fill her up with Ethel. Why don't you, the very next time you need gas? It was a dread moment, wasn't it, Russ? Hearing that old Elvira Clay was dead and having no idea what her niece Jennifer will do now that it's up to her to run things. You try several times to recover your gun and the telltale letters from the murdered Anderson girl from the old clay tree, but you can't get to them. If the tree is chopped down before you get them, the evidence against you would be conclusive, wouldn't it, Russ? And the townspeople in their fury would destroy you in the same way they destroyed Alvira's son. You know that tree must stand, don't you, Russ? At least until you can somehow fish the gun and letters out of the hollow trunk. You wish that people would stop paying visits to the tree. And then one morning at your real estate office, another visit occurs, a frightening one, in the person of a Mr. Carson. Good morning, Uh, Mr. Thompson. That's right. Uh, My name is Carson, Finley Carson. I, uh... Understand you handle the clay properties? I do. There's one particular piece I'm interested in. The knoll just above that place. You know the one, I'm sure, with the old tree. That piece of property, Mr. Carson, is not for sale. Oh? But I thought since the old lady's passed on... The old lady, as you call her, Elvira Clay, as I call her, would not have wanted to sell. Then I'm certain her niece will respect those wishes. Oh, I see. I hope you do, sir. It'll make it easier for both of us if we... Respect the wishes of the deceased. Well, I must say that's a noble attitude. I didn't think that the average salesman... No need for there to be any unpleasantness between us, Mr. Carson. Perhaps I can show you something else? Uh, Not today, thank you. You see, I... Well, I more or less had my heart set on that knoll. Well, Mr. Thompson, I'll see you again, perhaps. Any other property in town, Mr. Carson, I'd be happy to help you in any way. Thank you. Good day, Mr. Thompson. You're safe for the time being, aren't you, Russ? But that isn't good enough, is it? You've got to find a way to protect the secret the clay tree holds. Make certain it will never be taken down. At least until you can somehow find an opportunity to remove the gun and letters from the hollow trunk. You think about it in the days that follow. And finally, the answer comes to you one morning as you're having a late breakfast at the corner lunchroom where you've grabbed quick snacks for years. You listen to the idle chatter of Frank, the counterman. Well, Mr. Thompson, I guess the clay house will have a lot of callers from now on, huh? What do you mean, Frank? I mean Miss Jennifer. Now that she's come into the clay money, I guess some of the young fellas around town will be dropping in to see her. Oh, yes, I suppose so. Nice girl, Miss Jennifer. Not what you'd call a raven beauty, but a mighty nice girl. She's all right. Uh... You know, uh, it might be smart for you to think about her a little more, Mr. Thompson, if you know what I mean. I'm afraid I don't. Well, she's always been sort of fond of you, ain't she? We've been friends for a long time. I got an idea she'd like it better if you two were more than just friends. Really? Yep. That's what I think. What do you think? I think I'll have some more coffee, Frank. Pressure would ease, wouldn't it, Russ? If you could be certain that, at least for the present, Jennifer won't sell the clay tree property. She's always liked you, you know that. But you've never paid much attention to her, have you? Hardly noticed her. But Frank, the counterman, gives you an idea. You decide to call on Jennifer, and you do several evenings in a row. And in the weeks that pass, you're most attentive. She's pleased, isn't she, Russ? 
Until one night as you stopped by the house to pick her up. Hello, Jen. Well, not ready yet. I thought we were going out to dinner. Come in, Russ. I'll only be a moment. Sure. I've had a visitor. Oh? Anyone I know? Competition, perhaps? Hardly. My caller was Mr. Carson. Carson? Yes. He told me he'd made you an offer for the clay tree property. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And you turned it down? Well, yes, I did. Why wasn't I consulted about this? Well, I, I, I didn't think it was necessary. Didn't you? Well, now, look, Jennifer. Oh, I know. You just naturally assume that because Aunt Alvira and the tree, that I'd turn down Carson, too. Of course. Well, you're wrong. What? I've accepted Mr. Carson's offer. You... You've accepted? Yes. A very generous offer, I think. Yeah, but, but the tree, he'll have it taken down. It's high time someone did. Oh, you can't mean that. I most certainly do. I never dared tell Aunt Alvira, but that tree, that horrible plaque, the whole idea of it. Well, I think it's perfectly hideous. Now, Jennifer, listen it's to no me. It's no use. That... I've made up my mind. I know Aunt Alvira thought very highly of you, Russ. Listen to your advice. I intend to do the same in all matters except this. I insist the clay tree property be sold. I see. Mr. Carson will be expecting your call in the morning. I want you to handle all the details. Of course. Now, let's drop the matter, shall we? It seems hopeless, doesn't it, Russ? You're certain you can't talk Jennifer into changing her mind. Carson's won. He'll have the tree chopped down immediately. And unless you can recover the damning evidence against you first, its fall will reveal your guilt. You spend a sleepless night trying to think of a quick way out. Following day, you're in your office when a visitor calls. It's Jace Devlin, Elvira Clay's attorney. Glad I found you in, Russ. Why, something wrong, Jace? I've just heard some rather disturbing news. Oh? The talk around town is that George Carson is going to buy the clay tree property. Well, yes, that's right. I tried to talk Jennifer out of she it, but can't she can't was... sell, you know. She... What? According to the terms of Elvira Clay's will, Jennifer cannot sell that property. She can't sell? That's right. It was Elvira's way of making certain nothing would happen to that tree. Jace. Jace Devlin, are you sure? Of course I am. Drew up the will myself. <laughs> I'm surprised Jennifer didn't know about it. <laughs> she, she, she can't sell. Something amusing, <laughs> Russ? <laughs> Are you absolutely certain I can't sell, Russ? According to Jay Stablin, and he ought to know, he drew up the will for your aunt. Oh, I see. I gather you didn't bother to read the will, Jen. Oh, no, I didn't see any reason why I should. I, I knew Aunt Elvira had left everything to me, and... Well, that, I suppose, no sale. No sale. If you'll excuse me now, I'd better look up Carson and tell him it's all off. Oh, won't you stay for lunch? Uh, better not. I have a busy day. All right. Will I see you tonight? I'm afraid not, Jen. I, I'm going to be busy then, too. Oh, I see. I'll phone you tomorrow, though, Jen. Yes. Do that. The tree is temporarily safe, isn't it, Russ? And time is on your side again. Soon the tree will be forgotten, deserted. And you can do whatever is necessary to get your gun and letters out. Even chop into it. Jennifer isn't important now. You hurry back to your office. Put in a call to George Carson. He's disappointed when you tell him the deal is off. But then something he says sends a wave of fear sweeping over you. Well, how was I to know? I thought the sale was on, and I wanted to get started right away. You sent Hank Thomas out to chop down the clay tree? Yes, he's probably out there now. Put up that axe. Huh? You're, you're all through here. 
Well, but I just got started. The tree isn't going to be chopped down. But Mr. Carson said... Never mind what Carson said. The deal is off. I, I just talked to him on the phone. The sale is off, huh? That's right. How about that... Five dollars he paid me. You can keep it. Well, that's fine with me. You know, I was just thinking I should have charged him ten dollars at least. It's a bigger job than I thought. Well, I guess I might as well get on back to the house. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're not going to leave the tree half chopped like this, are you? Why not? Well, there's a storm coming up. You better do something about propping it. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary, Mr. Thompson. As you can see, I didn't chop very deep into the trunk. I don't want to take any chances. Well... Whatever you say. I'll get some rope from the house and... Uh, let me see. I could loop a rope around that top branch, anchor it with a stake in the ground over there, and then I could do the same thing on yes, the Yes, yes, yes. I think that'll do fine. Will you get started, Hank? Sure, sure thing, Mr. Thompson. A few minutes later, Hank returns with several long coils of rope attached to two iron hooks, fastens the hooks to the topmost branches, and then climbs down to draw the ropes tight around some heavy stakes. All secure, Hank? Oh, well, sure, the whole fine, Mr. Thompson. In the morning, I'll see what I can do about something more permanent. Maybe put a jacket of cement around the base of the Just tree. Just send me the bill when you've finished, Hank. Right. Well, I'll see you later, Mr. Thompson. I got some chores to tend to. Of course, Hank. You go on. You watch Hank start away down the hill. He's brought you just the tools you need, hasn't he, Russ? The ropes and iron hooks he fastened near the top of the tree to fish your gun and the packet of the Anderson girl's letters from the hollow tree trunk. The first real chance you've had. It'll be easy, won't it? Russ! It's Jace Devil, Elvira's attorney. You know you must find a way to get rid of him quickly. The wind is increasing in fury, and you're not certain the tree can withstand the pressure of the storm after Hank's chopping into the trunk. And until the evidence against you is removed from the tree, the letters destroyed and the gun disposed of, there'll always be a threat to you. Hello, Jace. Hi, Russ. Still worried about the tree? Well, I thought I thought it best to take certain precautions. Of course. I must say you've shown great concern over the welfare of the clay tree, Russ. Well, yes, but you see, I, I, I felt a certain responsibility, Jace. After all, I, I should have checked with you before okaying Jennifer's sale to Carson. I understand, my boy, I understand. Well, guess I'll get back to the house, Russ, coming along. Uh, no, not right away. The wind's rising. I want to see how those ropes hold. I'll be along. All right. Don't think you have to worry, though. I'd say the old clay tree is going to stand for a long time. Yes. Yes, it does seem that way. Because so many tires these days claim to have some kind of guarantee. Tonight I'd like to point out the difference in tire guarantees. Point out the extra protection you get and the double guarantee on Lee tires. You see, guarantees against defective workmanship and material are quite common. But few tires are backed by a written road hazard guarantee such as is offered by Lee. A guarantee you can read, see what it says, and have it with you when you need it. Most important, however, is what Lee's generous road hazard guarantee covers. It covers any unexpected damage to a Lee Super Deluxe tire during the first 15 months. Any damage, such as cuts or bruises, which might make it necessary to replace a tire. Now, obviously, in order to give you such a generous written guarantee, Lee tires must contain extra quality, although you pay nothing extra for them. Any one of the hundreds of thousands of enthusiastic Lee tire owners could tell you how much extra Lees give. Extra mileage, extra safety, extra value that make it well worth your while to get your next tires at one of the 19,000 Lee tire dealers throughout America, which include all signal service stations. The news of the tragedy spread quickly and the townspeople flocked hurriedly to the scene. A windswept hill, a twisted, misshapen tree silhouetted against the sky. Exactly how the accident had happened was not quite clear to them. 
But one thing was, the clay tree had claimed another victim. The one man in a position to guess what might have happened, attorney Jace Devlin, told his story to the sheriff. When I left, Russ Thompson was standing right here, Sheriff. He was worried about the tree standing against the storm. I figured he was going to climb up, tighten things up a bit. Yeah, I guess that's what he did, all right. When Russ failed to show up at the house, I came back and there he was, up there swinging at the end of the rope by his neck. From where the rope is hanging over the limb, it looks as though he climbed the tree, unfastened the hook, and was bringing it down to fasten it lower down on the tree. And he must have tried to throw the rope over that other limb there and slipped. Yeah, I guess that's how the rope got tangled around his neck as he fell. That's the way it must have happened. Too bad. It sure is. Poor Russ. The pity of it is that the very tree he was trying so hard to protect, for Elvira Clay's sake, finally hanged him. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Larry Dobkin, Gene Bates, Herb Butterfield, Parley Bear, George Neese, and Britt Wood. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian Jean Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, End of the Road. It was night on Fountain Avenue in Hollywood, but the darkness was pierced with shafts of light from police car spotlights, and there was a crowd pushing forward, babbling excitedly, turning the usually quiet residential section into a bedlam. A siren wail as another police car swung around the corner and ground to a stop, and its uniformed occupants leaped out, ready for action. And it was about that time that Doris Chandler pushed her way to the front of the crowd. Pardon me, please. Close enough to hear the conversation of the officers 
intent on the small white bungalow now bathed in the searchlight. That's Jaeger. It was then, wasn't it, Doris? Uh, yeah, that yeah, you heard yeah, the name sir. of the criminal they yeah. trapped inside. As an officer explained to one who had just arrived. It's Jaeger, Mac. Steve Jaeger. The cop killer? Right. We got a telephone tip on him about half an hour ago. You're sure he's inside, huh? The boys in the first squad car got a look at him through the window. They put in the alarm when he started throwing slugs. Armed, huh? This won't be easy. Ah, we'll wait him out and then try tear gas. You got the loudspeaker ready, Dave? All set. Go ahead. Attention, Jaeger. Steve Jaeger. This is a warning. Come out on the front porch. Throw your gun away. You haven't a chance. The house and the entire block is surrounded. Jaeger, this is a final warning. Come out and throw your gun away. We'll give you one minute. One minute, Jaeger, to decide. It's all you need to hear, isn't it, Doris? And you ease back through the crowd. Hurry from the scene to your own apartment only a few blocks away. It's all over for Steve Yeager, you're certain. And the money, Steve's money, hidden in your apartment, will belong to you now. Yes, a fitting reward for your cleverness in phoning in that anonymous tip to the police. Safely inside your apartment, you lower the shades and smile to yourself as you think of what's happening to Steve just a few short blocks away. And then... Yes? Hi, sis. It's me, Charlie. Oh, Charlie. Glad you called. Just wanted to make sure my little sister's okay. Why wouldn't I be? Well, haven't you heard? It's on the radio. Steve Yeager. Steve? What about him? Oh, it's all right. Nothing to worry about. Only I didn't even know the guy was in town. They got him trapped in a house someplace. The cops. Steve Yeager? Trapped? Uh-huh. Good thing he didn't get in touch with you in any way, Doris. You'd have been implicated. He, uh... Didn't contact you when he hit town? Of course not. You know how I feel about him, Charlie? Uh-huh. But it was different in Seattle. You were pretty fond of him. Look, I don't like cop killers. Or payroll thieves. Now, look, Charlie, if you called me up Easy, to... Easy, sis. I told you I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Not involved. Well, I'm not. Then, brother, Charlie's happy. Nothing to worry about. No, you can go back to sleep. Wait, wait a minute. What? Sis, listen. Keep your apartment dark. Don't answer the door for anybody. What is it? On the radio. They just announced that Steve Yeager gave the police the slip. He's on the loose again. Your hand trembles as you hang up the phone, Doris. Your brother Charlie's warning seems unreal, doesn't it? Like something from a terrible nightmare. Steve Yeager, the man you double-crossed, told the police about, has escaped. And you know that he'll head straight to you. Yes, Doris. You lied when you told your brother you hadn't seen or heard from Steve Yeager, didn't you? Because every bit of the more than $50,000 he got from that payroll job he pulled in Seattle is in your apartment at this very moment because Steve thought it would be safe with you. You look out past the drawn window shades. The street outside appears quiet and empty. Then your heart seems to stop dead still. The kitchen. Someone there. And you recall that you left the back door unlocked. Doris? Miss Chandler, are you home, dear? Oh, Mrs. Fabian. Yes, dear. I just had to come over, see if you'd heard. Goodness, there's been some shooting by the police. Right in our neighborhood. A uh, shooting? They... They killed someone? Oh, I don't think so, dear. It's a criminal. They said on the radio he gave the police the slip. A killer. He shot an officer in Seattle a few months ago. I, uh, I see. It's on the radio. Don't you want to turn it on, dear? Uh, no, no, no. I, I've got to go out. My brother called. He uh, isn't well. I've got to go over there. Oh, you're not going out, dear, alone. I'm well, not afraid. I'll take the car. I just won't sleep until I see that Charles is all right. Oh, of course, but do be careful, child. Goodness, a killer walking the streets. You get on home, Mrs. Fabian. Keep the house locked. Oh, don't worry. I will. Good night, dear. Good night. 
You see your neighbor out the back door. Lock it after her. And then quickly hurry to the bedroom and pack a small traveling case. And the last thing before closing the bag, you take the money Steve left. Put it in the bag with your clothing. A moment later, you slip quietly out the back door. Hurry to the garage and lift the door. Hello, Doris. Baby. Steve. Yeah, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Didn't think you'd want to go anyplace without me. <laughs> One evening recently, while doubling in the role of babysitter, I was telling our neighbor's little son about Santa Claus, how Santa comes all the way down from the North Pole nonstop. Gosh, Marvin, the little fellow exclaimed, Santa Claus must use that famous go-farther gasoline like Daddy does. <laughs> well, reluctantly, I had to admit that Santa uses a sleigh powered by reindeer. But if Santa did use an automobile, you can bet he'd be interested in Signal's good mileage. And since Santa knows quality, he'd certainly appreciate Signal's quick cold weather starting, Signal's lively pickup, Signal's smooth as skating power. That's why you can put Marvin Miller on record as saying, if Santa ever trades Prancer and Dancer and Under and Blitzen for a car, I predict Mr. Claus will power it with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. It was a terrible moment, wasn't it, Doris? When you opened the garage door and saw Steve Yeager, the killer who'd stolen $50,000 in Seattle, the criminal who turned the money he took over to you for safekeeping, the man you double-crossed by tipping the police off to his presence in the area. And now he stands there, smiling coldly. And you're certain that it's all over, that he's going to kill you. And you're certain, too, that he's guessed it was you who called the police. Your mind struggles for an excuse, doesn't it, Doris? Something to say to Steve by way of explanation. But nothing comes from your lips. And then you realize that he's speaking and nodding toward the car. Come on, I said, in the car. We're getting out of here. Steve, Steve, you don't think that Save I... Save it. Get in the car. You got the keys? Right here. Go ahead, start it. Hey, the uh, dame next door, she came over. What'd you tell her? I, I said I was going to visit my brother. Uh, I, I was, Steve. I, I heard about you on the radio. I thought the police would tie me in with it. I thought if I took the money and hid out until I heard from you... Sure, I, sure. It's the truth, Steve. Here. See, I, I have the money here in this bag. Let's have a look. Uh, uh -huh. That part adds up, Doris. Nice of you to keep it for me. Steve, you've got to believe me. Maybe I will, Doris. Maybe I will. Right now, just keep quiet and drive. Go out sunset towards Beverly Hills. Sure, Steve. And don't worry. I'll help you. <laughs> I know you will, baby. I know you will. His manner terrifies you, doesn't it, Doris? And you can't believe for a moment that he's satisfied with your explanation. Driving out Sunset Boulevard, you make up your mind. The police must get Steve Yeager before he gets you. At a stoplight at the corner of Sunset and Doheny, there's a slight grade. Just enough to make your car roll back when you stop for the red light. You notice, too, that parked on the opposite corner is a police car. Perfect. Carefully, you ease your foot off the brake pedal. Let the car roll back toward the one in the rear. Hey, take it easy. Bumpers. Oh, you little fool. I'll see what I can do. It's a tense few moments, isn't it, Doris? Steve back trying to free the two cars. You wondering if you can reach the police or if you dare call out to them. And then you notice that one of them has started across the street to see what's wrong. 
He calls out suddenly as Steve gets back in your car. Hastily, Steve shoves you aside, slips behind the steering wheel himself. Steve. Steve, an officer, he's yelling at us. We're not waiting for him. But Shut up, will you? We're getting out of here now. Hey! Stop! Through the rearview mirror, you can see the police officer running for his car across the street. He's going to make a chase out of it. And a glance at Steve Yeager tells you that he isn't going to quit easily, doesn't it, Doris? The cars race along Sunset at terrifying speed. Their tires screeching. And you beg Steve to stop, to give up. Steve! Steve, he's gaining! Stop it! We'll both be killed! Hang on! We're not beat yet. Uh, let him try that. Steve! Steve, he didn't make it. He went on past. Yeah, he'll be back. But it gives us time, baby. Time to swing in. Here! Yeah. You sit beside Steve Yeager in frightened silence. You're parked in the dark, winding driveway of a huge mansion, aren't you, Doris? With Steve taking a chance that the police car will miss you and race on past. And then, a moment later... Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> I told you, baby... We're not through. You ride in silence for several miles and realize that Steve has pointed the car out toward the valley. And then you look over at him and notice the blood on his hand. Steve, your hand. Huh? Oh, yeah. it's from my shoulder. Those cops licked me as I was going over a fence. It ought to be attended to, Steve. A, a bullet wound. Okay, so we have it taken care of. Lonely enough section out here. Yeah, a little ranch house looks deserted enough. Now we'll see if there's anybody inside. Oh, yeah. There's a light. Yeah. Come on, up on the porch. Somebody home, all right, and quite alone. Steve is pleased, isn't he, Doris? You move up beside him until you can see through the window. There's a young man sitting at a desk inside. He's puffing slowly on a pipe, staring at the typewriter before him. All right, baby. You know what to say. He's coming. Oh, good evening. Hello. Um, our, our car is stalled out front. Um, may we use your telephone? Oh, why, of course. Come in. Come in. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, now, look here, old man. What you... Shut the door, baby. But what do you think of your... Oh, a gun. Yeah, one that says you're going to be a good boy. Yeah, definitely a good boy. Uh, <clears throat> look, if, it, if it's money you want... It isn't. Oh, thank heavens for that. You alone? Alone. Uh, yes, yes, quite alone. That's fine. Do as I say and you won't get hurt. Doris, draw the blinds. Go on. All right. Where's the phone? It's uh, right behind you on the table. Uh, that an extension? Uh, in a little place like this? That's absurd. Yeah, I guess it is at that. And I'll sit right here where I can keep my eye on that phone. You stay away from it, even if it rings, understand? Perfectly. Good. I suppose you get some hot water and something that'll do for bandages. Bandages? Oh, oh, a third member of the party, hmm? Perhaps lying mortally wounded in the car outside. Yes, I see. You don't see. Get moving. Later, Doris, as you dress the wound in Steve's shoulder, you glance from time to time at the tall young man standing by quietly, watching you. There's the faint trace of a smile on his lips. He seems calm, unafraid. And you're certain that if he were given the opportunity, he could overpower Steve. He's your one hope, Doris. What do you do, Junior? Uh, do? Oh, I, I, uh, I write. What do you write? Uh, oh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the crime doesn't pay sort of thing. <laughs> Any good? Uh, not very What's your name? Maybe I read some of your stuff. Oh, I don't think you have, but my name is Anton Gray. Sounds like something off a color chart. It isn't phony, if that's what you mean. Anton Gray, huh? 
Hey, uh, you ever hear of him, baby? No, I never have. Uh, I guess we... Hey, take it easy. Sorry. You about through with that? Yep, just about. Hey, you got any beer, Anton? No, but there, there's some sherry in the decanter there. Get it. Yes, of course. You might see about getting something to eat. Uh, cold corn beef's all I have. That'll do. All right, Steve, how does that feel? Oh, fine, just fine, baby. A glass of sherry, dear lady? Uh, no, thank you. Oh, here you are, old man. Thanks. Now, uh, the grub, huh? Yes, yeah, right. Uh, won't be a moment. I'd better help him, Steve. Yeah, sure, baby, you do that. But leave the kitchen door open, huh? Steve, you don't think that just I... Just leave the door open. Can I, uh, help? Oh, uh, no, I can manage. It's a rather interesting chap, your friend. My friend? Isn't he? I never saw him before in my life. Oh, I'm sorry, I just naturally assumed... He jumped into my car, forced me to drive away. I see. Um, bread's in the box there. Do you mind? Anton. Yeah? He's badly wounded. Weak. So? We could overpower him. It'd be easy if you... Oh, I forget it. What? Uh, don't let this cool, calm exterior fool you. I'm not a very brave man, really. You're afraid of him. Hey, we haven't got all night, baby. Hurry it up. Uh, duh. okay, Steve. And you're not afraid of him, huh? Neither of us has to be. He... he has a gun. That automatically makes me a coward. Listen to me. If I can draw his attention, you could slip up behind I'm Sorry, I am not the type. What are you two yakking about in there? Let's get going with the grub. Hey, uh, mustard or mayonnaise, old man? Anton's not going to help you, is he, Doris? And your one last chance of getting away from Steve has vanished. But later in the living room, a surprising thing happens. Anton casually wanders over to a table near the front window, picks up a cigarette, and then slowly starts to edge toward the fireplace. And suddenly you realize what he's going for, the poker lying on the hearth. Quickly, you dig into your purse for a pack of cigarettes and offer one to Steve. Thanks, baby. As you extend your cigarette lighter, you see Anton pick up the poker, start to raise it over his head. In three short steps, he can reach Steve, can't he, Doris? You hold your breath, but Anton doesn't move. And then Steve leans back in his chair, blows a cloud of smoke toward the ceiling. Anton? Uh, yes? Got any coffee? Uh, uh, coffee? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Hop to it. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Your heart sinks as you watch Anton replace the poker on the hearth. Drag himself slowly back to the kitchen. A moment later, you follow him. Why didn't you do it? Why? I, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't move. His back was turned. You could have easily... I know, I know, but I kept thinking, suppose I miss. Suppose I miss. He'd have killed me. He'll kill us anyway. But, but he said... You believe him? Look, Anton, he's a killer. What good are we to him now? All he wants to do is get away. And he won't leave anyone around to tip off the police, don't you see? But perhaps he'll just... Go away. Anton, listen to me. We've got to get him before he gets us. No. No, I, I, I can't. Not even for $50,000? What? He's got $50,000 on him, I know. If you were to knock him out, we could have the money. Share it. $50,000? Yes. $50,000. The two of us. Anton, we'd share it. No one would ever know. He stares at you for a moment, then throws a quick glance towards Steve sitting in the living room. And you're almost certain he'll do as you say now. Yes, that he'll be willing to take a chance for a share of the $50,000. Back in the other room with Steve, you watch Anton closely. Know he's struggling to make up his mind. And finally, you see him edge toward the fireplace again. You know you've won. To draw Steve's attention away from Anton, you reach over and... Uh, accidentally upset the sugar bowl. Oh, and Anton sorry. leaps across the room and brings the poker down hard. You've done it, Anton. You've done it. He, he's not... Dead? No, you'd better hit him again. What? Hit him again. No. I, I, I'm going to call the police. The police? 
Now you've got to kill him. He tell them about the money. Money? I don't want any part of it. I, I'm sorry if you thought I... So that's it. An honest man. Disappointed? Yes. Yes, I am. Well, now, wait a minute. Get back. I have the gun now. You'll do as I say. Yes. Yes, of course. Tie him up, hands behind his back. Use his belt. Whatever you say. First reach into his inside coat pocket. The money's there. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, yes, so it is. Give it to me. Fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, isn't it? Give it to me, I said. Here you are. Now tie him up. You see, too, that lamp cord will do fine. Yes, of course. And then I'll trouble you for your car keys. Oh, I'm, I'm afraid you'll have to trouble the finance company. What? Uh, well, you see, my financial status being what it is... You're lying. Uh, look, the carport's right alongside the house. Look out of the window. You can see for yourself. Quite empty. All right. Uh, you drove up here in a car, though, didn't you? So we did. But unfortunately, we had an accident, and the police have a description of my car. However, now that I think of it, I don't imagine it'll make much difference. It's night, foggy, and if I do get stopped, I can always tell them that Steve kidnapped me, forced me to help him make his getaway. Oh, well, they're sure to believe it. I did, at first. Hurry up with that, will you? Well, his hands are tied securely. Now, oh, now his feet... Oh, never mind, never mind. Where does that door lead to? Huh? Oh, a uh, closet. Good. Drag him in there. Hurry up! <laughs> All right. Now inside, both of you. Yes, as you say, dear lady. Oh, there we are. I hope you'll be quite comfortable... It'll be the first time I've ever spent an evening in a dark closet, but I imagine I'll manage. <clears throat> you see, yes, I have enough cigarettes. Good. I should kill you both, but this way I won't face a murder rap. Besides, all I need is a half-hour start. Nobody will ever think of looking for me where I'm going. Yes, I'm sure you're very clever. Uh, by the way, is there a reward for this chap? There is. You might claim it. I shall. Uh, is there a reward for you, too? <laughs> no. Not me. So long, sucker. Have fun with the reward they give you for the capture of Jaeger. Want to make a bet? I'll bet that one of your most faithful friends has been completely left off your Christmas list. Your car. Christmas, you know, is really a swell excuse to give the faithful chariot some of those things it's been needing. Things that'll pay you back later in extra driving pleasure. What's more, your signal dealer has just what Santa ordered. For instance, rugged new tires by Lee of Conshohocken to replace your smooth, dangerous old tires. Powerful new signal deluxe batteries. Guaranteed a full 30 months on a service basis. Or how about a set of new Champion or AC spark plugs for quicker cold weather starting and more pep? These are just a few accessories from your signal dealer's complete line, which includes windshield wipers, fan belts, radiator hose, light bulbs, polishes, and many other items. You see, signal service stations are much more than just headquarters for the famous Go Farther gasoline. In addition, each signal dealer carries a complete line of fine quality automotive accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. The fog that had settled over the Los Angeles area during the night had lifted now, and the morning sun was shining as Lieutenant Avery of the Los Angeles Police stepped out of the hospital room and walked down the quiet corridor. As he reached the elevator, a young man, a member of the local press, came forward to meet him. Okay, Lieutenant, she must be pretty important for you to come all the way down here. Who is she? Doris Chandler. Chandler? Mm -hmm. The woman Steve Yeager kidnapped last night? Hey, what goes? She was involved in a traffic accident. 
Only she wasn't kidnapped. Uh, was she hurt bad? Uh, she'll be around here for some time, a doc says. But she'll recover in time to stand trial as Yeager's accomplishment. She had the 50000 He stole with her in the car. Well, how did you stop her? We didn't. A truck smashed into the rear end of her car on Rosita Boulevard. It was a bad fog. The truck driver said he didn't see her in time to avoid the crash. No taillight on her car. No taillight, huh? <laughs> That's his story. That yeah, check's all right. According to a report turned in by squad car officers, a Chandler woman's car was involved in a minor accident earlier last night. Witnesses said she deliberately backed into another car at Doheny and Sunset. That's when her taillight was smashed. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, during this busy pre-holiday season, it's especially important to drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations, so that some avoidable accident doesn't mar your Merry Christmas. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Alice Reinhardt, Jack Moyles, Ben Wright, Norma Varden, Herbert Litton, and Bob Bruce. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Steve Hampton, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, The Whistler's Strange Story. Curiosity Killed a Cat. Two people sit on an old wharf piled high with lobster traps, wooden buoys, and fishnets. But the dark, half-puzzled eyes of the young man are not on those things, nor on the distant masts of the fishing smacks and draggers scuttling into the harbor. No, John Hawley sees only the sun-bleached prettiness of the woman opposite him and the sturdy lines of the trawler approaching the wharf. Both the woman and the boat belong to Captain Daniel Bailey. Yes, John. That's what you're thinking about, isn't it? Ever since you came home from the merchant marine to find your childhood sweetheart married to a miserly old man, you thought how easy it should be to get Captain Bailey's trawler, his gear, his house, his money, and his wife. And taking a job with a captain was only your first step. Favoring your bandaged finger, you pick up a brush and paint a red stripe around the lobster board. The mark that tells the world it's not wise to tamper with anything that belongs to Captain Daniel Bailey. Carrie glances nervously toward the trawler and back. Guess it'd look kind of funny me going back to the house now. 
Well, the Nautilus just landed. Ah, uh, Dan will seize you, Carrie. So does old Matt Tuttle. He just waved. Dan will took Matt along to haul traps in your place. Can't figure why they came back so early. Weather, probably. Oh, I counted on crushing my finger to give us the whole day to get her carry. You think Dan will guess you did it on purpose? So I could stay ashore with his wife? Are you crazy? I'm not crazy. The body has to live with my husband and know how suspicious and mean he can be. I don't know. I remember when we were kids, we used to holler at him in the streets, call him a miser. And later I joined the Merchant Marine, and while I'm gone, you up and marry the old coot. We're not kids any longer, John. I know, but... Why did you do it, Carrie? I never had a house of my own. I never had anything. Money or clothes. Oh, that's a good one. He hooked you and never even lost his bait. Captain Dan will never spend a dime on you. No, he hasn't. Yet everybody knows he's been salting it away for years. Gary, don't you know where? No. But I told you, he doesn't believe in banks. If we knew where to lay our hands on that dough. Well... I've been going out to haul lobster pots with him ever since he sprained his back, haven't I? Accidents happen pretty easy at sea. Dan's a violent man, John. He won't sit by. Listen, Carrie, the day we find out where his money is, you can get out your Sunday go to meet and dress. You always did look pretty in black. Give your ball eye to me, Matt. Here she comes, John. Okay. These are off now. Hi there, Captain Dan. Good haul today. Fair. No thanks to you, John. Get that stern line out, Matt, and hop to it. Nice of you to come down to meet me, Carrie. I was mending nets while John painted the buoy. Kinda figured you would. Suppose you get back to the house now and see to supper. We got company. Figure I owe it to Matt for helping me out. It's one way of getting out of paying him. Matt's a friend of mine. Something you wouldn't understand, John. Think maybe we should invite John to supper, too, Carrie? Whatever you say, Daniel. Seems like he needs somebody to help him nurse that crushed finger back to help. Right now, if you don't mind, I got to borrow John to help us sort lobsters. Oh, I'll bring him home to supper. Well, you look right nice, Carrie. Quite a spell since you fixed yourself up like this. Quite a spell since we had company. Where do you think you're off to now? Want to go up to the attic for a minute. The supper's ready, Dan. Matt and John are all ready to sit down. It seems to me every time I call you for supper, you decide to go to the attic. <laughs> yeah, General likes to look at that old sea chest he's got up there. Uh, leastwise, what's in it. Maybe uh, put a little more in it, eh, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like Matt's let the cat out of the bag about your your private bank, Captain Dan. All right. Suppose I have got some money tucked away. Hard work's just as important as ever, John. And that's what you're afraid of. Hey, yeah, like all young people today, want to start at the top. You don't see where scrimping and slaving I got you, Matt. Up at 4.30 in bed at 8 all your life. I'd like to have some fun before I die. You never used to complain about your luck, Terry. Anything special on your mind? I get fed up sometimes. Well, I'll put the things on. You men sit down at the table. Well, there's the horn starting. Guess I sniffed out the weather all right, eh, Matt? Yeah, hey, Daniel. Uh, sure glad we aren't aboard the Nautilus now. Why not? She's got a good compass. You know these waters as well as the rest of us, Matt. Yeah, maybe so, John, but... Too many men have piled up on the inner reef just the same. Uh, not if you know where you're going and how to get there. Never heard you sound so almighty sure of yourself, John. Well, it's a question of knowing all there is to know about a subject, Captain Dental. Navigation or anything else. Like, like maybe there's just one thing holding you up, and you find the answer to what you didn't know, and you're all set. I don't know as I exactly get the drift of all that, John. You understand him, Carrie? I think so, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel's mind is on uh, putting all that folding money in his sea chest. <laughs> no, no. I'm thinking more of the fog closing in, Matt. I can't very well forget it with that 
Foghorn sounding like it was calling the body to his doom. You know what your foghorn always makes me think of? Sure, man. Makes you think of death. Yes, sir. Yeah, it does it that. How'd you know, John? Well, I guess you might say it makes me think of the same thing. <laughs> It was quite a shock coming home from several years in the Merchant Marine to find your childhood sweetheart married to Captain Daniel Bailey, wasn't it? But you're certain Carrie still loves you, aren't you? And you tell yourself that things will soon be much different, especially now that you've made sure where the old miser keeps all his money. In an old iron sea chest in the attic. It's a cold and black Monday morning, two hours before dawn, as you walk into the cheerful beam of light coming from the Bailey kitchen window. Carrie's there getting her husband's breakfast. And you know she's thinking the same thing you are. How easy it is for accidents to happen at sea. Especially when there's a reason and a will to help them along. Then as you open the back door, you stumble over the sea chest. Oh, I hope you didn't hurt your toe on that chest, John. Be too bad if it kept you on land, too, like that crushed finger did. It's your fault for leaving it there, Daniel. I can't see why you brought it down in the first place. I figure on stowing it aboard the boat. Get your mug up, John. Let's cast off. <laughs> you know, Captain, it's your wife's coffee, not your 25 bucks a week that gets me up at this unholy hour to go out and haul traps with you. You know, I guess there was something about Carrie that interested you. Mm. Her coffee, huh? <laughs> Consider that a flattering remark, Carrie? I'm considering the work I got ahead of me, Daniel. Sooner you two get yourselves and that chest out of my kitchen, the happier I'll be. Well, that chest looks good and solid, Captain Daniel. Yeah, yeah, they made things to last in my father's day. I always thought a lot of that chest. Do you really think it'll be safe on the boat, Daniel? Well, an old, old sea chest? Why not, Gary? I got a feeling it's better stowed away in a locker. Where I can keep my eye on it. Uh, good sturdy lock there. Uh, fine workmanship. Hey, put that chest down. It was only hefting it, Daniel. Well, I was figuring on carrying it to the boat for you, Kevin. Well, you keep your hands off things that don't belong to you. Now you swig down that coffee while I get a couple of lobster traps out of the shed if you're so anxious to carry something. All right, all right. All right, Captain. You don't need to get sore. You know, there's an old saying, John. Maybe you heard it. Curiosity killed a cat. Makes a lot of sense. You know where he keeps the keys of that chest, Gary? One of the key ring or the other in his jacket. Hauling gets to be hot work. If he'd take his coat off before he went out in the door, he might have a chance. Maybe he took the money out, hid it somewhere else. Well, not from the way he's acting. He suspects it, John. That's why he's moving the chest to the boat. Listen, the cabin's always locked, except when he's on board. He keeps that key on his ring, too. <laughs> Don't you worry. When I'm ready, Carrie, Captain Daniel won't have things his way at all. You wonder about Captain Daniel as he shoulders the chest and walks behind you down to the wharf where you board the Nautilus. It's interesting to see that he can't wait to get out of the harbor before locking the chest in the big locker on the starboard side, isn't it, John? Of course... It's probably coincidence that he suggests you both haul traps from the same dory when you reach the outer shoal, and that he never once takes his jacket off, even when pulling up the heavy crate. It makes you wonder if he knows you plan to kill him. But you've got to wait for the right moment, don't you? And two days later, you think that time has come when Daniel's about to climb up over the side of the trawler from the dory riding below. As you stand over him on the deck... Careful of your back, Captain. Now, let me give you a hand up. No, no, not yet. Let me get the door uh, mic closer, John. 
Wooden water fall between her and the Nautilus. Well, come on, get a hold of my hand. I'll hang on to you. Say, would you look who's coming into view? Ahoy there, Matt! What's Matt's motorboat doing out here beyond the reef? I thought he stuck a shallow I wanted. He changed his lobster traps day before yesterday. That's funny. I wonder why. Because I suggested it, John. Now you can give me a hand up. <laughs> That evening when you explained to Carrie that you failed, there's something almost like contempt in her eyes, isn't there, John? So you make up your mind tomorrow will be the day, no matter what. And by noontime, it looks as though Matt Tuttle was a blessing in disguise at that. You've finished your haul when Captain Dannel decides to give Matt a hand with his. You watch the captain set out alone in the dory. Then you go quickly below to the cabin where you saw him throw his jacket on the bunk. When he comes back, you'll have the sea chest open and the money in your pocket. And there'll be no more hide and seek, no more waiting for the right setup. You'll kill him in the cabin, out of sight of Matthew's prying eyes. Later, there'll be ways of getting rid of the body. Eagerly, you pick up his jacket. And as your hand goes into the side pocket... I'll take my jacket, Cap- if you don't mind. Captain Dettler. Oh, I, I noticed you forgot your jacket, You sir, think I... so? Toss it here. Then take the Nautilus and head back to port. I'll be going back with Matt. He's expecting me, so I wouldn't try anything if I was you. Why, of course not, Captain. By I... the way, I won't be needing you anymore, John. I worked out a deal with Matt. He's going to help me. Oh? You intend to pay me for a full week? Not if you don't work it. Tomorrow's Friday. You want to make it your last day? Can you think of any reason why I shouldn't? Maybe. Now I got my keys, John, I'll be going. Just you better remember what I said about curiosity killing a cat. You've failed again, haven't you, John? You tell yourself Captain Dannel wouldn't be alive now if he hadn't caught you by surprise. If it hadn't been that Matt was expecting him. The next morning, you skip your mug of strong black coffee in Carrie's kitchen and go directly to the trawler to wait for Captain Dannel. This is your last chance. And you're afraid to let Carrie see the little fears and doubts crawling in your desperate mind. When the captain arrives, his mood is as cold and heavy and silent as the fog which hangs over land and sea. But just as you're about to cast off... Dan off! Carrie, what do you want? I've decided to go out with you today, Dan I'm coming aboard. Well, I'm counting on stormy weather when the fog lifts, Carrie, but if you want, you're free to come aboard. <laughs> Breeze has sprung up, Dano. Barometer's fallen, too. Well, it's time to make our haul anyway. We may catch it on the way back. Want me to take the wheel, Captain? No. The less you have to do with this boat, the better. Oh, look, Captain, I know it looked bad yesterday, but when I picked up your jacket, it was, it was natural. Oh, I forgot to... all about that. I got other things on my mind. I reckon we all have. You mean the storm, Dano? There'll be danger, will there, coming back? You know, you sound a mite worried, Terry. Mind if I ask why? No reason at all, Daniel. Well, as long as I'm at the wheel, you... Well, maybe she'd feel safer, Johnny, if you was to explain that you can navigate these waters as good as me. Well, sure I can, Captain, but... but Funny I... thing, you know, I don't remember your worrying about my getting home safe before, Carrie. I suppose it's different when you're along yourself. I guess that's it, eh? Of course. I'm going on deck for a breath of air. As long as Daniel insists on staying at the wheel, John, I don't see why you have to stay in the cabin. Why wait till we reach the lobster grounds, John? Why not now? These are fishing waters, Carrie. Don't you see those other boats off there? You think they're blind? Still trying to put it off, aren't you? Another half hour and we'll be there, Carrie. If the weather turns bad... Can we get back without him? I've done it a hundred times. I know these waters like the, like the palm of my hand. Look, Carrie. When we're almost there, I'll slip up behind him while he's still got his attention on the wheel. And... I'll be watching to see you do this time. No mistakes. It's got to be over before Matt Tuttle's boat gets there. For 
a half hour, there's no sound but the steady chugging of the engine. And then suddenly it stops. Dead ahead is the first of Captain Daniel's lobster bulls. Carrie hands you the piece of lead pipe you dropped. There's no turning back now, is there, John? Holding the weapon in back of you, you silently open the cabin door and step inside. Captain Daniel isn't there. He's tied the wheel to a set course. And before you can turn... You can drop that lead pipe, John. I wouldn't want to shoot a man in the back. Now, let you and me step out on deck with Carrie. Look, look, Captain, I, I don't know what you're thinking, but... Thinking? For a whole week, I've been trying to keep myself from being killed. And at the same time, give you a chance to tip your hand. It would have been one or the other if you weren't so yellow. That's why you let me come along today, Dano. I wondered if you wouldn't take a hand sooner or later, Carrie. You came along to give this young fella some nerve. Well, what are you going to do? Might kill you, John. <laughs> Don't like that, eh? Well, I've always been a law-abiding man. I figure the sheriff will know what to do about attempted murder. And what about me, Dano? You... You love this weak need squirt, Carrie? Yes, Daniel, I always have. Then, by thunder, you can stand right alongside him in court. Huh. There's Matt's boat coming in. We'll take him aboard. What does Matt Tuttle know about this, Daniel? Nothing, up till now. I don't wash my dirty linen in public. Oh, as much you don't, you tight-fisted penny pincher old... Old miser, huh? Maybe, John. But it appears to me your craving to get your hands on money beats mine all hollow. What do you mean? All you know... The way both of you perked up when Matt mentioned my old sea chest that night. Well, it was a sight to see. Right then's when I knew. Right then's when I decided to move it here on board. A man as mean and suspicious as you would be hard to fool. My money was the bait I hooked you two on. That sea chest was like a bait bag bulging with herring. And it pulled you into my trap like a couple of greedy lobsters. So all the time you were giving you a rope to hang yourself. And now let's have no more talk. We'll anchor and wait for Matt. You get up far, John. Be ready to drop that anchor over the side. And I'll come along. Just in hopes you'll give me calls to shoot you the way I'd like. And so, John, with Captain Daniel's revolver pointed squarely at your back, you move carefully before him up onto the slippery bow. He keeps his distance. He's not giving you a chance to turn on him, is he, John? Balancing yourself, you squat over the heavy anchor and move the line toward the chopper. Then you notice something. As old Daniel stops walking, watches for the right spot to drop anchor, he steps into a loop of the anchor rope. This gives you an opportunity you hadn't expected. With one move, you shove the anchor over. And the rope tightens around Daniel's leg, pulling him overboard and... Ah! Carrie, John and me searched as long as we could. Daniel's gone. There's nothing more we can do. Thank you, Matt. I... I could... Don't try to say nothing now. And you, John, you better get out of those wet clothes. It's a mighty fine thing you did, going right over the side air trim like that. I couldn't reach him, Matt. I think he got untangled from the anchor line all right, but he must have been in bad shape. Probably hit his head as he went over. Eh, try not to think of it anymore. Lucky I happened along when I did, oh, though. Oh, you were a big help, Matt. Eh, ain't just what I mean, Carrie. There was something preying on Daniel's mind. Some said he was worried about you two. Uh, well, now, look here, Matt. I wasn't one of them, John. Jumping catfish, I've known you kids since you was... Knee high to a grasshopper. But Daniel, rest his soul, he had one of them suspicious minds. I don't minds. think you should talk like that. But there might have been, well, talk about his death, Carrie. Lucky my boat was close enough so as I can swear nobody was near him when he fell over. You got me to prove to folks it was an accident. Well, I gotta get back to my motorboat. She don't ride a storm like this boat, eh, hey, John? Hey, here she comes. I'll close your cabin door tight. <laughs> By the time Matt gets through talking to folks, you'll be a hero, John. <laughs> <laughs> what a break. 
As soon as he gets out of the way, we'll start back, eh? Then we'll get that sea chest out of the locker and have a look at it. He called it a bait bag. Bulging with herring, Kerry. To tempt a couple of greedy lobsters. Only this time, baby. You and me are the ones that got away. It was easier than you had dared hope, wasn't it, John? Captain Daniel's foot caught in the anchor line that dragged him overboard to his death. And your diving in after him took care of the rest, didn't it? And you're perfectly safe because Matt Tuttle saw the accident. Will even swear you risked your life to rescue Captain Daniel. You head the Nautilus back toward port. Leave Carrie at the wheel. Get the captain's sea chest and rejoin Carrie. The storm is increasing in fury. So you place the chest on the chart stand by the compass and take the wheel. But soon your curiosity overcomes you. You turn the wheel over to carry again and start to open the chest. Just a few twists of the blade. And... Carry? What, John? That bellboy sounds the port should be to stab it. Keeping the compass just like it says. Uh, I see. Oh, well, when rain cuts your visibility, you get to imagining all sorts of things about the rain. Get on with the chest, why don't you? Oh, the lock rope. It's kind of stiff, but I'm getting it. Carrie, give me that wheel. What are you doing, John? You're turning this off, of course. You mean I'm trying to? What are you talking about? We're too close to that reef. The wind and current are against us. We're being pushed under the rocks. Any second, Carrie. said our course was north. It was. When I put that iron chest on the chart stand, it affected our compass. We're headed right under the inner reef. If I hadn't been so excited about the money, I'd have remembered that chest was in iron. Look, the chest is empty. Empty? Yes, except for girl charge wood for yourself. Oh, well, that's what that scheming Captain Dan was up to. He knew we were dying of curiosity about that old sea chest. And he knew it was empty. But where is his money, John? I don't know. Now we'll never know. Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this time. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, Lamont Johnson, Peggy Weber, Griff Barnett, and Charles Seal. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Jack Kelsey, music by Wilbur Hatch. It was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, transcribed by the Signal Oil Company to enable the entire production staff of The Whistler to spend the Christmas weekend at home with their families. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story. By the Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Christmas Gift. (laughs) 
Christmas was only a few hours away, and Mary Winston couldn't help but marvel that its spirit could reach down and touch a cheap nightclub like Pete's Cantina on the outskirts of Panama City. Sitting alone at a table, she gazed at her tawdry surroundings. And then from the bar at the far end of the club came the strains of a Christmas melody, a melody which brought back memories of happier Christmas Eve. Yes, the Christmas spirit is undying, isn't it, Mary? You watch the strolling soloist, Sailor Reynolds, nod as he comes closer and passes your table. It's been three months now since you were hired as a singing hostess at Pete's Cantina. Three months that you've been billed as Candy Porter with no one. Not even the proprietor knowing your real identity, Mary Winston. At long last, as Candy Porter, you seem to be safely away from your past. As the music ends, you look up, aware suddenly that Pete Gardenas, the rolling, heavy-set proprietor, is approaching your table. Candy! Candy! Look, there is an American gentleman just came in. He wants to buy you some champagne. Champagne, you hear? Please, I'm not in the mood tonight. Oh, kid, this looks like a big spender if he wants to buy champagne. All right, all right. You turn and see the tall, heavy-set American approach, and suddenly you become tense. After a year of running away, you've learned to spot his kind in a moment, haven't you, Mary? You're certain he's a detective. And now you have to fight to remain calm as he approaches. Sit down, Mr. Forte. Sit down. Sure you don't mind, Miss Porter? Of course not. Uh, thanks. In that case, I will. I'll go get the champagne. I keep him on ice. Eleven years old, too. Cigarette, Mr. Fontaine? No, thanks. You don't mind if I do? Oh, no, no, of course not. Oh, here. Light? Thanks. Well, this is very unusual for me, spending the Christmas season so far away from home. Mm hmm? How come? Business. Important business. Couldn't it wait? No. This business means a lot to the people I work for. <laughs> yes, yes, the, uh, what do you say, the bubble water? <laughs> uh, from Marseille, 13 years old. You said 11. Uh, that was from Le Havre. <laughs> this is even better. Now I put him back in the ice. If you want some more, just call Pete. I've got more, just like him. Well, I guess it's a few hours early to say Merry Christmas, Miss Porter. So I guess I'd better just say uh, good luck. Huh? Thanks. He is hoping you find whatever you came here for. Oh, uh, I've already found what I came for. You see, I came for you, Mary Winston. <laughs> Friends, to all of you who have opened your homes to the Whistler, not only throughout the year, but even tonight on this last busy weekend before Christmas, Signal Oil Company has asked me to express their sincere appreciation for this privilege and pleasure. And we of the cast want to add our thank you, too. During the nine consecutive years that the Whistler has been broadcast by Signal Oil Company, many of us have celebrated Christmas with many of you a number of times. And believe me, we're mighty proud that you consider us a part of your entertainment family. Tonight, on behalf of Signal Oil Company and the independent signal dealers who serve you in the states of California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, I want to convey warmest season's greetings. May the many blessings of living in these United States of America enrich your holiday season and the new year. It's ironic, isn't it, Mary? A sorry Christmas gift after all the months of hiding, running from one town and then another, using a different name in each place but never your own, Mary Winston. These past three months you've been known as Candy Porter, 
singing hostess in Pete's Cantina here in Panama City. And now this detective sitting across from you has called you by your real name, Mary Winston. And you can't run, can you, Mary? Facing Fontaine, you decide there's only one move you can make. That you've only one card left. But if you play it wisely, carefully, it might prove to be an ace. You say you came here after me, Mr. Fontaine? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know what you mean. I think you do. And if I were you, I'd be ready to leave for Los Angeles in the morning, Miss Winston. Like the billing says, my name is Candy Porter. I know what the billing says. I know what it said in Brooklyn when you were billed as Doris Trent. And Denver when you were billed as Gladys James. But when you took a powder out of Los Angeles a year ago, you were Mary Winston. You know, it's strange you're mentioning Mary Winston. I was even thinking about her when you came in. A lot of other people have mistaken me for Mary Winston. We could have passed for twin sisters. She was my best friend. I could tell you a lot about her if you feel like listening. Sure, sure. I'll listen. Go ahead and talk if it'll make you feel any better. We can't get away until tomorrow morning anyway. The more you tell now, the less you'll have to tell later. Thanks. You see, Mr. Fontaine, Mary Winston was just a good kid who got a bad break. She was in love with a swell guy, but scared to death of a hoodlum. It's an unusual story, Mr. Fontaine. It was an unusual story, wasn't it, Mary? It began a year ago at a Christmas party given by your employers, the Southwestern Manufacturing Company, in the pink room of the Swank Wilchester Hotel. And you were the hit of the evening. You sang three songs and went over big. Your friends from the office hadn't known of your talent, but they all agreed you were fine, and when the party was over, you were feeling good. So good, you decided to drop into the hotel cocktail lounge. Make a phone call or two and have a nightcap by yourself before going home. When you finished your phoning, you walked to a vacant stool at the bar. Scotch and soda. Uh, Make mine the same, Bill. Gotcha. I uh, heard you sing tonight. You were terrific. Thanks. Uh, What's the matter? Did he stand you up? Who? The guy you were just talking to on the phone. Uh, No. (laughs) No. I guess he didn't stand you up. Didn't he? He's on his way here right now. Lucky guy. Here you are, folks. Uh, take it out of here, Bill. Dollar uh, eighty out of ten. Well, now, look here, Mr. Oh, uh, take it easy. It's practically Christmas. What's the harm in my buying you one drink? Like I said, I liked your voice, Here's Miss your Winston. Change. Thank you, Bill. You a detective or a mind reader? Oh, you mean your name? Mm-hmm. It wasn't any trick to find that out. I just asked one of the boys I saw dancing with you. My name's Joe Collins. <laughs> I see you've never heard of me. Should I? Uh... Oh, now I get it. You're a professional talent scout and want to get me into the movies. <laughs> nope. I'm a gambler. Uh, disapprove? Why? Live and let live is my motto, and that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. What? <laughs> live my life and let you live yours. Good night, Mr. Collins. Just think, I can tell the girls at the office tomorrow I met a real live gambler. Uh, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. You could tell them a lot more than that if uh, you believed in your voice as much as I do. Really? Mm-hmm. You've heard of Domingo's Out on Sunset, haven't you? It's an undercover gambling club, isn't it? It's more than a gambling club. There's a swell floor show. A lot of big people go out there, people that uh, count. And all intimate friends of yours, I'm sure. No, but I know quite a few. Some who could push you right to the top with that voice of yours. Mr. Collins, this is the oldest line I ever heard. It's not a line, but uh, skip it. Go on home, listen to the radio, eat candy. You can have a terrific time. If you go to Domingo's with me, you can't tell what might happen. You might have to meet a couple of show producers, maybe even sing. So um, play it safe, go on home. Maybe dull, but you'll always get to work on time. Is that all you have to say? Yeah, that's all. Except, uh... Nighty-night. Wait wait a minute. Yeah? Could we be back early? We'll leave any time you say. Well, uh, what are we waiting for? Well, now you're making sense. I'll call a cab. Well, never mind. I have a car. It's parked right around the corner. (laughs) 
Joe Collins used just the right approach, didn't he, Mary? You realized you were being a fool. But as the hours passed, you told yourself your fears were groundless. Joe treated you with perfect courtesy, introduced you to several people, including the producer of the Four Show. You even sang a number which was well received. Later, you watched the gambling for a while and then proceeded to the Silver Room to enjoy the second floor show. Afterwards, you had supper in the main dining room and watched the guests dancing. Joe. Then suddenly you've had enough. Joe, do you mind if we leave now? I said we'd leave any time you said. What hit you, the music? I guess that's it. Another guy? Another guy. My fiancé, Dr. Frank Wilson. What happened to uh, Dr. Wilson? He's in Korea. Marines? No, Army doctor. It was his car we drove out here in. Oh, that's too bad. We could have had a lot of fun. Well, shall we go? Please. Hop in, unless you want me to drive. No, I'll drive. Good. We'll probably be safer that way. <laughs> As you drove toward your little apartment on Clinton Avenue, you were glad your reckless little adventure was nearing its end. Everything had been fine so far, but you couldn't throw off a feeling of uneasiness. For a few miles, Joe said little, and then he seemed preoccupied, and you were relieved when he finally broke his strange silence. Say, uh, Mary, would you mind stopping for a minute at that drive-in? All of a sudden, I got an awful headache. Maybe I can get some aspirin there, huh? Well, I doubt it, but we'll give it a try. Oh, uh, you can keep the motor running while I'm gone, huh? I'll only be gone a few seconds. Okay. What? Joe! Get going. Joe, you shot him! I said get going fast. There's a gun in your ribs, baby. You just saw what happened to one guy that crossed me. Did you kill him? I don't know. You, you... Oh, why was I such a fool? Turn right at the next corner. A car's been tailing us for the last five minutes. I'm glad. I hope it's a prowl car. It'll save me the trouble of phoning the police. I said turn. <laughs> yeah, he didn't turn, baby. You know, you shouldn't have said what you did about phoning the cops. Nobody but me and you knows about that drive-in job. You just better pull over and park got a couple of things to talk over. I said, pull over. Okay. Please, Joe. Joe, don't kill me. I, I know you can do it easy, but I'll never tell about tonight. That's the way you feel now. An hour from now, you'll feel different. Oh, no, I won't. On my word of honor, I'll make a deal with you, Joe. I'll trade you my silence for my life. I swear I won't talk about it ever. You sound like you really mean that. Oh, I do mean it, Joe. I swear it. I swear it. You swear it, huh? Yes, Joe. I swear it. Well, I'm not being very smart, but I'm going to take a chance. You drove the getaway car, so I guess that makes us partners anyway. Yeah. You know, partner, we ought to have a lot of fun together. Now, how about dropping me off at my place, huh? Tell me where to go. Live about six blocks from here. Just turn to the right of this. After you dropped Joe and reached your apartment, you were so weak you could hardly stand. You literally fell into bed. You tried to sleep, but sleep was impossible. Early the following morning, you heard the newsboy shoving the morning paper under your apartment door. You hurried across the room and looked at the front page. The headlines and stories sickened you. Drive-in manager shot in attempted hold-up dies. Unidentified man and woman seen fleeing from scene of crime in dark green 49 model sedan. Pedestrian 
believes he can identify Carr. There it was, Mary. Your situation looked hopeless, didn't it? You felt you must keep your word to Joe Collins, but you knew you must never see him again. Only one avenue seemed open to you. You had to leave town disappear. You dressed hurriedly, packed a few belongings, withdrew your savings from the bank, and by noon were on an eastbound plane for New York. You decided to take advantage of your voice and become a professional entertainer. The first few weeks you auditioned almost daily with negative results. But finally, after three months, you were singing at the Golden Lion, a prosperous little nightclub in Brooklyn, New York. After a shaky start, you became a featured performer under the name of Doris Trent. As the weeks went by, your work improved. You became sure of yourself. And one night you noticed Vern Shields, famous musical comedy producer in the audience. His presence seemed to inspire you, and you went over better than ever. Afterwards, in your dressing room, you wondered what he thought of your voice. You were certain that your visitor was Vern Shields. Weren't you, Mary? Come in. <gasps> oh. oh, long time no see, Miss Trent. Doris Trent, it says on the program. Joe. I'm surprised you recognize me. I thought you'd forgotten me. All right, Joe, you found me. Now, what's on your mind? You double-cross me, baby. Were you crazy? That's why I left town, so I wouldn't even have to talk to anybody. You wrote the police, though, didn't you? Oh, you're wrong, Joe. I didn't write to anybody. It had to be you. It couldn't have been anybody else. Two days after you left, they picked me up for questioning. But it wasn't me. I've kept my word with you, Joe. Yeah? Well, there's one way you can convince me. How? Marry me. Tonight. Marry you? Mm Mm-hmm. That way I'll be sure of you. Wives can't testify against their husbands. Besides, I'll know what you're doing all the time. Look, Joe, I, I, I got to do my show. Let's talk this over in the morning. Tonight, we can run up to Connecticut. But go ahead and do your show. Only if you've got any ideas about calling the cops, don't forget you drove the getaway car. And in case anything happens to me, there's a written confession in my pocket telling exactly how you helped me pull the job. How we use your boyfriend's car. How you kept the motor running waiting for me. You've thought of everything, haven't you? Everything, so don't try anything. Now, go ahead and do your show. I'll wait for you here. You started down the hallway, turned toward the powder room off stage. Suddenly, you you realized what a fool you'd been. But you made up your mind not to keep on being a fool, didn't you, Mary? Not with that wall telephone just five steps ahead of you. Operator, get me police headquarters and hurry. Better hang up quick, baby. I mean, quick. I had a hunch you'd try to double-cross me. Now I know for sure who wrote that note to the cops. Oh, didn't you? Honest, I didn't. You just tried to call him, didn't you? All of a sudden, I've lost interest in getting married. We're just going to take a little ride. Now, come on, baby. No. No, Joe, I'm not moving a foot. Not an inch. Come I... on. You go on my arm. Hey, what's going on here? Something wrong, Doris? This guy bothering you? Yes, he is. He, he wants to date me. Tell him to leave, will you, Eddie? Well, maybe i better take him into the office and call the cops. No, thanks, Eddie. There, there is no need for that. He's just another wolf. Tell him to leave. That's good enough. You heard what the lady said, Bob. Start traveling. Okay, Pop, anything you say. I'll see the lady later. I'll be parked right across the street, Miss Trent. You should have let me call the cops. I would have. If he hadn't had you covered with a gun. Oh, I see. Gee, thanks, kid. I guess you saved my life. Skip it. Look, Eddie, I gotta get out of town and fast. After what you just did for me, getting you out of town is a cinch. Grab some clothes while I phone my wife I'm bringing you home. We'll go out the rear entrance. My car's on a lot next door. Tomorrow I'll call a friend of mine in Denver. He'll put you to work right away. You better change your name, though. That'll be easy. I'm getting used to it. So, Mr. Fontaine, that's where I met Mary Winston. In Denver, at the Hi-Hat Club, billed as Gladys James. She was there for quite a while, room with me. Then she left, just like that one night. When a waiter told her some guy wanted to interview her for a magazine, 
She figured it was Joe Collins again. It's the last I ever saw of it. That's the end of the story? That's the end. And Mary Winston told you all this? Well, we were close friends. <laughs> I'll say you were. You don't believe me, do you? If you were in my position, would you believe a story like that? No, I don't suppose I would. With Santa's arrival only two days away, who can help being in a whimsical frame of mind tonight? Whimsical about such things as uh, how Santa can travel so far in one night. Well, maybe here's the answer. A child asked his father one day how St. Nick went so far on a sleigh. The wise father replied, he can take that long ride because his reindeer drink signal, they say. <laughs> well, I decided to check this story with Santa himself, and now I can report to you... Said Santa when boarding his sled... This year I'm using my head. It's signal for me. I'll go farther, you'll see. And over the rooftops he sped. Now, as you've no doubt guessed, in addition to letting you in on Santa's mileage secret, there's also a moral to this story, which is... <laughs> the gas used by Santa, my lassie or lad, is also the gas that is best for dear Dad. With Signal, Dad's car will not only go far, but give top performance the best to be had. Well, Mary, it looks as though you've lost, doesn't it? That your show wasn't good enough. The man across the table... The detective you're certain has come to take you back to Los Angeles to stand trial for a murder you had nothing to do with doesn't believe you. You're certain, too, that the jury in Los Angeles won't believe you, not after you're running away. Your phony names, your present surroundings. You're sure Joe Collins has been captured, that the authorities have read his confession, that he's trumped your last card, ruined forever your hopes of eventual reunion with the man you still love, Dr. Frank Wilson. Yes, Mary, it looks as though you've lost. But you're going to play the game through to the end anyhow. White Christmas. If Sailor Reynolds knew what that song did to you, the memories it brings back, he'd play something else, wouldn't he, Mary? As Fontaine gazes into space and drums his fingers silently on the table, you watch him closely, await his next words. How long did you say you'd been here? I didn't say, but I got here about three months ago. You like it here? No. That's what I figured. Hey, look, Miss... Uh... Cigarette, Mr. Fontaine? Yeah, thanks. Light? Mm-hmm. Thanks again, Miss Porter. Did you say Porter? Well, that's what you said your name was, didn't you? That's what the billing says, too, isn't it? You mean you believe me? You sounded straight to me. Well, it looks as though I came a long way for nothing, doesn't it? Still, I'm kind of glad I came. I always figured that confession they found on Joe Collins' body was a phony. Joe Collins? Is Joe Collins dead? Yeah. The Brooklyn police got him one night about five months ago. A woman called the police from a little night club, the Golden Lion Club. She hung up before they answered the phone, but the Brooklyn boys decided to investigate anyway. One of them spotted Collins in the car parked across the street. He got figure happy, and that was that. No car. Finished. Right. Well, uh, Miss Porter, if you ever run into Mary Winston... I'll tell her all about the Christmas gift I got from a swell detective named Fontaine. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just a private detective, Miss Porter. But the police gave me the tip that you... Uh, I mean, Mary Winston might be working here. Oh, then they knew... And a man they... named Wilson hired me for the case. A Dr. Frank Wilson. Frank Wilson? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's out of the army now. 
Still very much in love with Mary Winston. Doesn't care where she's been. Just wants her to come back and marry him. He must be quite a guy. Yeah, he's okay. Now, incidentally, do you think you'll ever see Miss Winston again? Yes, I do. Well, do you uh, think she might come back to Los Angeles sometime and clear things up with the police? Make the doctor happy? I'm sure she will. Someday. You see, a girl like Mary gets to feel a little soiled after working around in joints like this. She'll probably want to spend a year or so in cleaner surroundings. Maybe out in the desert. Sort of freshening up before going home. Seeing anyone she cared about. Yeah. From what you said, I expect she would. Well, I might as well be getting along. Merry Christmas, Miss Porter. Happy New Year. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Signal Oil Company has asked me to remind you, there's an easy way we can all help to make this holiday season happier for ourselves and others. Drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Conrad, Bill Boucher, Marvin Miller, and Brett Wood on the harmonica. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Ed Bloodworth, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transcribed and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. The famous Go Farther Gasoline invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Borrowed Byline. The trip from Calcutta to Hong Kong had been hot and dull, and Craig McKelvey was glad when the slackening of the ship's engines told him they were moving through Laiman Pass into Hong Kong roads. 
At the railing outside his stateroom door, he could see the lights of Victoria rising from the jam-packed esplanade to the luxurious villas high up on the peak, and off to the starboard other lights marking Kowloon Point on the mainland. He was glad now that he'd taken the bull by the horns and come here. Calcutta was a fine place for a year, even two, but six years had been too much, and when the opportunity for some quick money had come, he decided to take it and come to Hong Kong, orders or no orders. Five minutes after the gangplank had been lowered to the dock, there was a knock at his stateroom door. Craig McKelvey smiled as he turned to open it. Solendrum hadn't changed a bit, still as prompt as ever. Well, Alphonse Solendrum. Good evening, McKelvey. Nice to see you again. Yes, indeed. Oh, have a chair. Uh, thank you. Let me fix you a drink, Solendrum. Scotch and splash? You're very kind. Oh, on the contrary, I'm very practical. You always discuss business better over a drink. And I know the wire you sent me had a deal in it somewhere. I thought I made that clear. You're never very clear, Solendrum. Particularly where money's involved. And what makes you think there's money involved, my friend? <laughs> you don't think I'd jump my job and take a long boat ride to renew an old acquaintance, do you? Wait, wait a moment. Jump your job? Well, not exactly... But my editor in London... Oh, uh, Mr. Ames. All yeah, right, Mr. Ames fails to realize that at times a roving correspondent has to row. He might take a dim view of my sudden departure from Calcutta. I hope not. Oh? You see, McKelvey, your excellent standing with your newspaper in London is exactly the reason I wired you to come here. Here's your drink. Thanks. Your health, my friend. Ah. Uh. Excellent, Scotch McKelvey. Excellent. You can thank the purser. I won it from him last night in a card game. Now, uh, what are you saying about my job? I think perhaps we'd better discuss mine first. I've established a new connection, McKelvey. I see. Representing a British importing firm. Sounds honest. Oh, it is. <laughs> That's strange, Alphonse. I've never known you. Ah, to... da, 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 da. My past is a closed book, something to be forgotten. There's much to be done here, McKelvey. New worlds to conquer. The right man, the right set of circumstances, and the wealth of the Orient is here for the taking. Uh, tell me, my friend, how much do you know of natural history? What? Do you know, for example, that on the slopes of the mountains to the west, there lives a species of deer, a small hornless animal, unimpressive as a trophy, but worthy of the most skillful hunter who ever held a rifle? Uh. If you don't mind, old man. Uh, <laughs> I'm being obscure again. <laughs> to make a long story short, McKelvey, this little animal is the source of one of the most precious materials in the world, a substance for which there is an almost hysterical demand at this very moment. Well, go on. What is it? Musk. Musk? An essential ingredient of the finest perfumes. What little there is is in great demand on today's market. Well, that's all very interesting, but where do I come in? I'm coming to that. It seems there is a persistent rumor that a fabulous amount of purest Tibetan musk is floating around East Asia somewhere. My firm is most anxious to locate it. So anxious, in fact, that they've retained me for the past eight months solely to conduct the search. And that, McKelvey, is where you come in. Oh, is it? A simple dispatch in your very reliable newspaper indicating I have discovered the musk would simplify my problem immeasurably. I'm still a lap or two behind, Alphonse. I... I know I can be frank with you, my friend. From the moment I accepted this proposition, my problem has been to persuade my superiors in London to advance funds to cover the purchase. Needless to say, my firm in London tends to be cautious, since the transaction will come to over a quarter million American dollars. Then you have found the musk? Oh, uh, no. Mm. Yet you want me to file that story? Oh, come, McKelvey, you haven't developed any moral compunctions after all these years? No, just being practical again, Alphonse. You'd never get away with it, you know. In the first place, they'd never send the funds without checking. In the second place, the idea of picking off a quarter million dollars and disappearing is simply fantastic. You underestimate me, my friend. After all, I haven't been at work on this for eight months for nothing. So all you need is a story over my signature and they'll jump. They do anything to close fast, prevent competitive bidding. I see. You realize, of course, that this kind of a sellout would finish me as a foreign correspondent. It should be well worth your while. How much? 
25,000 American dollars. <laughs> you underestimate me, Alphonse. Make it 50,000. That's a lot of money for a story. You're buying a career. Excuse me. Yes? Cablegram, sir. Oh, there you are. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Hold for arrival. <laughs> what? Consider your impromptu departure from Calcutta inexcusable. Your services with this paper terminated immediately. Frank Parksley has requested temporary transfer to Hong Kong, instructing him to replace you on arrival. Ames. Anything interesting in your cablegram? Oh, nothing much. It was from Ames. Just another raise. Oh, that's very fortunate. Your reputation with your paper must remain unimpeachable, McKelvey, until the story is filed. Yeah, I realize that. Now, uh, how about the price? Uh, 50000 it is. Good. When do I file it? After I prepare the way in London. We must be cautious now. Can't afford to be seen together. Uh, suppose I meet you tomorrow night at 9 at the Twin Dragon Bar? Right. Well, Alphonse, here's to the story. Yes, my friend. Do your story. The high compression engines of many of today's newer cars are designed to perform best on a premium quality gasoline such as Signal Ethyl. But if you're nursing along an older model, you may think ethyl gasoline wouldn't make any difference in your car. Well, if you'd see some of the vintage models that fill up at the Signal Ethyl pump and hear the enthusiasm of their owners, you'd change your mind. For instance, a chap who lives up in a hilly section was relating, you should see some cars struggle when they try to pull my hill. But with Signal Ethel, my 41 model walks right up in high. Another driver of a 46 model remarked, On cold mornings, I hear some of my friends complaining about hard starting. But with Signal Ethel, my car starts quick as a rabbit. Yes, folks say mighty nice things about Signal Ethel, because this premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline is engineered to bring out the best in any car of any age. So if you're not getting the fun out of driving you used to, why not try this little experiment? Do as new car buyers do. Treat yours to a tank full of Signal Ethel. See if you don't feel the difference, a wonderful difference, in Signal Ethel. It's strange, isn't it, Craig? At the very moment it became clear that your position with the paper in London meant everything to you. With Alphonse Salendrum sitting there in your stateroom, ready to pay you $50,000 for that false dispatch. The crushing wire from Ames discharging you arrived to change it all. You realized, of course, that Salendrum must never know about it. And even as you tore up your editor's message discharging you and turned to Salendrum, you were trying frantically to think of some way the story could be filed and published the following day in London. Salendrum's gone now, and you sit alone in your stateroom for a long time thinking. You remember that no one knows you in Hong Kong. Decide for the time being it has to stay that way. A few minutes after leaving the ship, you check in at a nondescript waterfront hotel. You've never been one to apologize, Craig, but this time it's got to be. You hurry down to the cable office, scribble the message out, and hand it to the clerk. Let me see now. Timothy Ames, Fleet Street. Hmm. Can't believe you're serious. Came here on tip, underground movement, very active in southern China. Know you will allow me time for full report. McKelvey. <laughs> Yes. Mr. McKelvey? Yes, speaking. 
we have received a cable for you from London. Oh, would you please read it? Repeat, you are relieved immediately. Oxley arriving Hong Kong, SS Malaya, soonest. Ames. I see. Any answer? Uh, no, no answer. But at that moment, Craig, as you hang up the receiver, you know there has to be an answer. That the story must be filed somehow, even if you have to use Frank Parksley's name. That with $50,000 involved, nothing is going to stop you. You call the porter's desk. Porter's desk? Uh, when is the steamship Malaya due in? Malaya? Uh, Sunday night. Thanks. <laughs> And Sunday night is uppermost in your mind as you sit with Solendrum later that evening in a dark booth at the Twin Dragons. Going over the text of the story, you know you'll have to file under Frank Parksley's byline. You've got that straight, McKelvey. Negotiations are underway. Mind you, nothing more. We must not imply the deal is anywhere near closed. Oh, of course. They must fear competition, you see. Rival offers, higher bids. I see. When does it go? Tonight. Tonight, huh? Yes, we can move fast now. Everything's in readiness. Oh, uh, aren't you being a little hasty? Why do you say that? Well, it's very simple. The heaviest advertising days are at the end of the week. Our story might end up on the press room floor. Uh, well, then, what do you suggest? Sunday night. We can't miss if we aim for Monday's late edition. Oh. Well, I hate to wait now. You've got to wait if you want to be sure. Well, all right, McKelvey. I'll leave it up to you. Sunday night. Yes, Craig, it has to be the night Parksley will arrive on the Malaya. Because your mind is made up, isn't it? On Sunday night, you're going to check out of the Hotel Oriental as Craig McKelvey. You're going to move into higher circles in the Victoria as Frank Parksley. And between the two, there'll be a murder. Sunday night finds you at the dock waiting looking up at the sleek side of the passenger vessel that just pulled in, the SS Malaya. You breathe a sigh of relief when you see Parksley, the linen suit, the thin, rangy figure, the same Frank Parksley you saw in Singapore years ago. Hello, Parksley. Huh? You don't remember me. I'm McKelvey. Oh, oh yes, McKelvey, of course. I'm sorry. No, I... we only met once. Yes, um, London, wasn't it? Singapore. Oh, but it's all right. I wouldn't have remembered you if I hadn't been told you were coming. Oh, well, then they, they did inform you that I... Yes, they uh, sent me a cable. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, old man. I, I've been trying desperately to get out of Burma, but it hasn't anything to do with displacing anyone. Oh, I know. That's my own doing. And Ames, he agrees that I'm a bum. Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. We, uh, we all have at least one editor who can't stand us. Sure. Uh, Look, I hired a car. I'll uh, drive you up to the hotel. Well, that's space boarding of you, McKelvey. However, there's, there's been a delay in getting my baggage off, and I'm afraid... Oh, they'll send it up for you. Well, if you don't mind, I'd rather wait. Uh, past experience, you know. Somewhere in the Orient, there's a typewriter, three suits, and six pair of my best argyle. Yeah, I know what you mean. So we wait. Yes, if you don't mind. I insist. You don't know Hong Kong, Parksley. But it's like the baggage. A man can get lost here. I was a little surprised when they named you as my replacement, Parksley. What struck you to want to leave Burma? Oh, well, at the moment, I think there's more opportunity for me here. Oh, really? Yes. I say, is this the road to the hotel? Well, it's a roundabout one, but I thought you might get a kick out of seeing the bay. Well, it's a... Well, yeah, it's pretty all right. There's quite a view spot up ahead. A friend of mine drove me out to it the first time I was here. Oh. Yeah, here we are, just around this curve. Yes, I say, uh, you're right. It takes in the whole shoreline, doesn't it? Yeah. Actually, we're not up very high. Just the way the island jets out here. 
Well, not many people could know this spot. It wouldn't be so deserted. I'll have to remember it, McKelvey. You listen as Frank Parksley prattles on about the view. He's right, isn't he, Craig? Not many people know this spot. You're thinking that as Parksley turns his head, looks away from you in the direction of the bay. Your hand moves down and tightens around the handle of a heavy wrench at your side. Ah, uh, the light's over there, McKelvey. They're glittering like the gold we mortals are always after, hmm? Have you ever thought of them that... <coughs> The drive back to town gives you your first chance to really let down since meeting Frank Parksley. It's over now, Craig. You did it. Killed Parksley and sent his body, heavily weighted with stones, over the side of the cliff and splashing into the waters of the bay. You're glad now that he insisted on waiting for his luggage. You have a use for it, haven't you? Yes, at Parksley's hotel. But not before you return the rented car and attend to a few things at your own hotel. Oh, you leave, Mr. McKelvey? Yes, checking out, Sam. Getting passage on the Malaya. Here's the Hotel Victoria, mister. All right. There, here you go. Oh, thank you. Front, boy. Front. Oh, uh, uh, yes, sir. I uh, wired for a reservation. The name is Parksley. Oh, yes, I remember. If you'll just sign this card, Mr. Parksley. Very well. And it's room number 402. Here's the key. Uh, the boy will take your bags. Fine. All right, Sonny, let's... Well, if it isn't my good friend... Solendrum. Yes, indeed, my dear man. Uh, you go on ahead, boy. I'll be right up. You said yourself we shouldn't be seen together. But not you... here, not here. I'm in room 402. If there's anything to talk about, wait about a half hour and then meet me there. As you wish, my friend. Room 402. <laughs> Operator, I was talking to the cable office. Could you reconnect me? I was filing a dispatch for my paper. Oh, sorry. Uh, one moment. I'll get them again. Go ahead, Mr. Parksley. I'll give it here from the beginning again. Hong Kong, August 17th. Supposedly well-founded reports indicate certain Alphonse Solendrum, agent for a London importing firm, negotiating for purchase of largest quantity Tibetan musk ever involved in single transaction. Solendrum, commissioned by his... A few minutes later and it's over, isn't it, Craig? You hang up the phone, sit back and breathe a sigh of relief. You worked fast, didn't you? And it went through. Everything you said. The report will appear in the London paper. You've managed to keep your promise to Solendrum, haven't you, Craig? with the aid of Parksley's arrival and sudden uh, departure. Now all that's ahead is to wait and collect your fee. Hello, my friend. Come on in, Solendrum. I trust you feel free to talk now, my dear McKelvey. Anybody see you come up? Why are you so nervous? You're not at all the man of iron. Never mind. Just don't like to ask for trouble, that's all. I did a serious thing. I hope you appreciate that. You've already filed the dispatch? I have. Oh. Uh, What's the matter? You don't tell me it isn't going to work. I have better news, McKelvey. Much better. News that will preserve your integrity as a correspondent. What are you driving at? Supposing I were to tell you that anything you said concerning the negotiations for my firm in London were true. Is that what you are telling me? Exactly. At long last, after eight months, mind you, I have been contacted by letter. The man who has the musk wishes to discuss business with me. Now, wait a minute. We had an agreement. Oh, please, my friend, I'm forgetting. Not for one moment. As you say, we had an agreement, a gentleman's agreement. And because of it, you will receive the amount I promised. But if you have to make a legitimate purchase... I'm not above such an action, McKelvey, not under the right circumstances. You're meeting this man tonight? He's coming here to the hotel, yes. I, uh, 
I must talk to him privately. You see, the margin of profit is accounted for by the simple fact that he did not come by the musk by entirely honest means. So he's willing to sell for less? I am buying the musk for exactly half the price my firm will pay. I see. <laughs> Very neat, Solandrum. So you need have no concern over your share. I'll bring it here to your room the moment my, uh, my guest departs. Uh, sorry, Solandrum. I hate to be indelicate about it, but I'm in too deep. We'll wait for your man right here. Together. Yes, Doc? Uh, this is 402. Yes, sir. Mr. Solandrum is visiting with me, but he expects a caller. If anyone asks for him, would you send him up here? Certainly, Mr. Parksley. Thank you. All taken care of, my friend? All taken care of. Nothing to do now but sit and wait. Ah, yes. And the moment is close, McKelvey. This will-o'-the-wisp I've pursued these many months is almost in my grasp. <laughs> Think, man, in a matter of hours, perhaps minutes, we will both be rich. And you are thinking, aren't you, Craig? There's a tense, nervous feeling inside you. And you know Solendrum senses it, too. Both of you sit there in silence, waiting, waiting. You glance at Frank Parksley's brown leather luggage piled next to the chair, thankful that the initials F.P. are facing you and not Solendron. It's too late to even wish now that you'd thrown it into the bay along with the body of its owner. Eleven o'clock. Eleven thirty. Twelve. You're both wondering now. So many things could go wrong. So much could happen to a man alone in Hong Kong with over $200,000 in his hand. And then... You'd better answer the door, my friend. Our visitor is here. If you're not getting a new car, you naturally want your present car to keep performing as well as possible. Well, the lubrication and service a car gets have a lot to do with its performance. And that's where independent signal dealers shine. With them, you see, servicing cars isn't just a temporary job. It's a permanent business in which they've invested their own money. That means signal dealers not only actually enjoy working with cars, but on the average have had years of experience. Experience which gives them valuable know-how that can make such a big difference in a car's performance and upkeep. Also, independent signal dealers are well aware that their success and very livelihood depend on how well they satisfy you. Well, naturally, this conscientious type of personal service can add a lot to your car's life and your driving pleasure. Good reason why so many drivers these days are switching to the friendly service stations that feature the famous Go Farther Gasoline. Signal, that is. For a moment you can't move, can you, Craig? Then suddenly you find yourself on your feet. And in the few seconds it takes you to cross the room, the whole nightmarish story flashes across your mind. The cryptic wire Solendrum sent you in Calcutta, the fortune in Tibetan musk, the false dispatch, Frank Parsley's body lying at the bottom of the bay, and above all, the fear, the terrible knowledge of what will happen if they find you here in his place. Yes, Craig. From now on, you have to move fast. Good evening. I wonder if I'm in the right room. Oh, yes, yes. The man you wanted inside. Oh, come in. This is Mr. Solander. Good evening. I presume your part, Miss Parksley. Yes, please. The man I've been expecting. That's very interesting, Mr. Solander. I'm Inspector Wilson. 
And you, Frank Parsley, wasn't working alone, so I've been following him ever since he robbed a trader in Burma of a fortune in Tibetan Musk. This is obviously something between you two gentlemen, so I'll... Oh, no, my friend, don't go. You're in this, too. You're quite right. You see, after tracing Parksley this far, I lost track of him momentarily. Disappeared. Quite remarkable. Then this afternoon, some fishermen reported a body visible at low tide in the shallow water off Crown Point. A body? Yes. Parksley's body. Now, suppose you tell me... Which one of you killed him? Oh, no. Now, wait a minute. We haven't seen this Parksley. You registered here in his name? But we haven't seen him. We, we were waiting for him. Then how does it happen that his luggage is there by that chair? I'd know it anywhere. Or do. I followed it long enough. You see, some of that luggage contains the stolen musk. What? I said that luggage contains the stolen musk. Interesting, eh? Let that whistle be your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with signal gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speed, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Jack Moyle, Marvin Miller, Ben Wright, Raymond Lawrence, and Byron Kane. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton. Music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on the Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday, when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty... You always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. <laughs> Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Shakedown. Riding up in the elevator, the attractive young woman, Jackie Mills, appeared deep in thought. She seemed hesitant, undecided, as she stepped into the corridor on the ninth floor, walked down to Suite 906. 
She paused outside the door. It's quite a decision, isn't it, Jackie? With your dangerous past seemingly behind you, you know the kind of activity Paul Jessen, the man inside, is about to suggest. But you're tired, aren't you? Tired of trying to make a living playing the piano in the club Chanticleer. Tired of being without the things one more transaction could bring you. You open the door. Step inside. Well, Jackie, so you decided to come. You said you wanted to talk. And you want to listen. I thought so. The minute I recognized you at the club Chanticleer. Now sit down. Let me finish my pinhead. Your what? Oh, you wouldn't understand. It's my hobby. Precision craftsmanship and all that. I'm always engraving poems with this stylus. Quotations from the Bible. Odd sayings on the heads of pins. Oh, sure. Oh, really? There. Take a look through this jeweler's glass. What? It is, and very clear. Judge not the men whose souls are on fire, for they are beyond good and evil. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. The philosophy of criminals and poets. Yes, isn't it? Can I show you any more? Well, how many do you have? Oh, five or six hundred. You see, I keep this little engraving outfit in my pocket, and every time I have a spare moment, out it comes. Takes a steady hand and nerve. Oh, easy, once you get on to it. I can engrave a sentence at one five hundredth of an inch in just a few minutes. Fascinating. But uh, wasn't there something else you wanted to talk to me about? Yes, there was. However, I thought we might go out for a drink. And... I'm busy. <laughs> you have a reputation for being cold and unapproachable. I find it pays. Sometimes. Ever hear of the Victoria Watch? No. One of the most famous watches ever made, perhaps the finest. Rose diamond, platinum hand. Never mind the details. What's it worth? A hundred thousand dollars. Is it registered? Yes. Uh, count me out. Too risky. Now, what do you take me for, a fool? I have no intention of stealing the Vittori. The owner's going to give it to us. His name is Lindquist, Benjamin J. Lindquist. I'm listening. Now, Lindquist is respectability itself in the social register, multimillionaire, about my age. Sixty? Not quite. Go on. All right. Benjamin J. is deathly afraid of the slightest breath of scandal about his good name, and yet he can't keep away from a beautiful woman. He's not the only one, I hear. No, he isn't. Oh. All right. Now, where do we go from here? We'll rig a little trap for Benjamin J. With me as the chief. Something like that. And if he bites? We play him along, carefully. And of course, the proceeds from the watch we divide equally. Fifty-fifty? Sure. Okay. But I won't settle for less. You won't have to. Now, all you have to do is to drop into the Blue Angel Cafe this Friday by accident. Benjamin and I will be having cocktails. The Blue Angel? Right. But let me handle everything. Everything, Paul? I thought you needed me. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll know where to take over. You know, I think we practically have that watch now. It's an interesting situation, isn't it, Jackie? The kind you've never been able to resist. And on Friday at the Blue Angel, under the high-sounding name of Jacqueline Carraway, the accidental meeting goes very well. Though you do have difficulty keeping from laughing at Paul's introduction. <laughs> Miss Jacqueline Carraway, Benjamin Lindquist. How do you do, Mr. Lindquist? Miss Carraway? Jacqueline's almost like my own daughter, Ben. Oh? Yes, since her father died. I've kept a sharp eye on her. He was my dearest friend. Where's she been all these years? How come I've never seen her before? Well, until a few years ago she was in school. Then she wanted to study art, so I let her go to Paris for a while. She just got back. She stays at your place, I suppose, where you can keep your eye on her? No, she has her own apartment, but I still keep my eye on her. <laughs> <laughs> he sure does. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to continue to. Now, for one thing, 
I'm going to take you away from Ben here. What's this? Oh, sorry, old man. You're a friend, too. But I recognize that gleam in your eye. A fine thing to say. I might have something to say about this. Maybe there's a gleam in my eye. Uh Uh-huh. I thought so. See here, Paul. Good night, Ben. Pleasant chat. See you soon, eh? Coming, Jacqueline? Uh, I'm afraid there's nothing else I can do. What's the big idea? He's watching. I like to troll slowly for big fish, my dear. Don't worry. He'll call or stop by tomorrow, ask to take you to dinner. Only you don't go. Not about Daddy. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. But Paul does know, doesn't he, Jackie? You find that out the next day when Benjamin Lindquist contacts us, asked to take you both to dinner exactly as Paul predicted. And all through dinner, you can see that he'd like to talk to you alone. Only Paul doesn't give him the opportunity. Not that night or the next. But a week later at dinner, a planned phone call takes Paul Jessen away to meet an important client at the airport. You're finally alone with Ben Lindquist. And in a few minutes, you should know where you stand. Well, I hope you'll forgive me saying I'm not going to miss Paul. (laughs) Well, you know how fathers are, even adopted fathers. They never believe you're grown up. You seem grown up to me. I find you, well, twice in a true woman. Of course, uh, you have a young man somewhere. No, never got used to young men, I guess. They're so, oh, well, so well scrubbed and silly, like a, like a boy on his first day at school. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> but it makes it lonely. Paul's friends are older, but, well, they think they're robbing the cradle of Bridget. Look at him. They're probably afraid of you and themselves. Oh, it must be nice to be settled. Children, home, wife you love. Mm, looks nice, on paper. Oh? Understand, I don't want to say anything against my wife, Estelle, but... Uh, but you've outgrown her. Uh, you might say that, yes. Oh, it happens so often. I wonder if you... I mean, could a girl you always... No, no, it is quite impossible. I'm afraid it is. But why shouldn't we, Jackie? All these evenings of seeing you. Please, Mr. Lindquist. Ben, I- I'd better go home. No. It's been so difficult getting a chance to even talk, and you do like me, I can tell. Yes, so, yes, I do. Too much. We'd better quit while we both can. No. I'm going to see you again. I... Now, please. All right. Friday. I'll send my car for you. But, Clayton, I'm not here. Good. Uh, maybe we'd better not tell Paul. Paul understands perfectly later that evening at your apartment, doesn't he, Jack? The two of you enjoy a good laugh at the romantically inclined Benjamin Lindquist. And then Paul explains the next move. You'll still take your time, Jackie. He wanted to lose his head, so you don't kiss him goodnight, you don't fall into his arms until he swears he loves you and promises to get rid of his dear wife, Estelle. Hi, Dad. Glad you agree. Of course, I will admit I'm trying to keep you out of his reach as long as I can. I didn't just happen to choose you for this deal, and you know it. Well, I'm beginning to respect you, Paul. It isn't going to end here, Jackie. See, when all this is over, you and I are going to be much more than just good friends. Oh, I'm flattered. But until we have the Vittori watch, let's concentrate on the business at hand. Shall we, Paul? John? Friends, this is Marvin Miller. You folks who listen to The Whistler regularly have heard me get enthusiastic about Signal Ethyl, a premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. You've heard me say that the next best thing to a new car is any car of any age powered with Signal Ethyl. 
But tonight, friends, I'd just like to tell you why I personally use Signal Ethel in my car. When I touch the starter, I want my motor to spring to life quick, like turning on a light. And Signal Ethel gives me that kind of starting. When I step on the gas, I want to feel pickup that makes the back of the seat come up and push me forward. And Signal Ethel gives me that kind of pickup. When I start up a hill, I want plenty of smooth power to take me over the top without shifting. And I can always count on Signal Ethel for that. Well, there you have it in a nutshell, friends, the reasons why I like Signal Ethel and why I'm so sure you'll be just as enthusiastic as I am about Signal Ethel once you try a tankful. Well, Jackie, it's going well, isn't it? Ben Lindquist, infatuated as a schoolboy, and surprisingly, the slick, smooth Paul Jessen actually in love with you. When the time comes, you'll know how to turn both situations to your advantage, won't you? But for now, you know that you must concentrate on Benjamin J. Lindquist. You play it very warm and friendly during the next few weeks, but still manage to make Ben keep his distance. Then you and Paul decide that it's time to move in for the kill. And so one night after a quiet dinner at an outlying supper club, as you and Ben Lindquist are sitting in his car in front of your apartment... Ben, Ben, where are we going, you and me? I don't understand. You don't know what I want to hear, what any woman wants to hear? That I, I love you, is that what you mean? Is it what you mean? Of course. Oh, I'm glad. Ben... What do you intend to do about Estelle, your wife? Uh, that's a big problem, Jackie. Yes, it is. But you'll have to solve it. Or do you love me enough to, to want to marry me? You know I do. And naturally, I expect to get a divorce, but you've got to give me some time, darling. How much time? I intend to see my lawyers about it, uh, well, next week. Divorce is serious business. So is love, Ben. You know, Ben... This way it isn't fair to any of us. Not to me, your wife, or even you. Jackie, please. I'm here. You want to kiss me, don't you? Yes. It's all right, darling. Uh, it's all right. Because I'm going to say goodbye to you, Ben. Now. Oh, Jackie. Goodbye, Ben. I'm not going to see you anymore. I'm not going to see you again. Oh, Jackie. <laughs> Jackie! It was a perfect performance, wasn't it, Jackie? Just right, you tell yourself. And you avoid answering the telephone, which rings incessantly for the next few days. You and Paul want Benjamin Lindquist to put it down in black and white. And finally, he moves into the trap. Special delivery letter from Miss Jacqueline Carraway. Sign here, please. I'm looking for a Jacqueline Carraway. This Western Union. Yes. I got some flowers for you in a telegram. A registered special, ma'am. Sign here, please. Thank you. You've played your part well, haven't you, Jackie? And now it's time for the last scene before the final curtain, the shakedown. Paul is to handle this part. While you remain in your bedroom, supposedly suffering from a nervous breakdown. A few days later, Paul comes over and phones Benjamin Lindquist. Ben hurries over to your apartment. Paul, oh, I came as soon as I could. How is she? Not very well. Come inside. Is there anything I can do? Yes, there is. Go in to see her, take her in your arms, and tell her you're going to marry her. Why, oh, you know I can very well do that. I was just carried away. Do you understand these things, Paul? Understand. Then this is despicable. You deliberately led her on, told her that you loved her, that you'd get a divorce and marry yes, her. Yes, yes, I was wrong, but, but aren't we making too much of this? Are we? Go in and look at her and then tell me that. Oh, Paul, she'll get over it. 
Find a nice young fellow. I'm, well, much too old for her. You weren't too old a month ago. Nor are you now too old to be taught a lesson. I'm going to let your friends see those letters you wrote her. Your business associates, the public if necessary. I'll make you a laughing stock. No, you can't do that. There's my wife and my sons to consider. The, the scandal. Paul, you know I have positions of trust. Uh, look, I'm a wealthy man. Perhaps I Jacqueline can, uh, has never wanted for money. She was well provided for by her father. You don't seem to understand, Ben. The girl's in love. She only wants you. Paul, I... Well, I, I can go to Estelle about this. There was... Well... Another incident last year, you know. I do indeed, because I know you. Oh, I warned Jackie, I warned you. Well, uh, perhaps some gift, uh, a substantial token of my affection for her. Well, I don't know. What could you possibly give her to make up for what you've done? I am prepared to be generous, Paul, very generous. But I told you, she doesn't need money. I know, but there must be something, something special she wants that money can't buy. You've known her for years, Paul. Can't you think of anything? Well... I don't know how much it would help, but ever since you showed her your jewelry collection, she's talked constantly about the Victoria watch. Well, that's the only thing I've ever heard her say she really wanted. The, 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 the Victoria? No, I just can't give that up, Paul. Well, Ben, you asked me. I told you. What's the Victoria, Paul? It, it's not its worth. I, I don't mind that. Well, neither does but... Jackie, nor I. But it would mean so much to the girl. Can't you understand, Ben? Heaven knows why, but the girl is completely in love with you. Yes, yes, I know. Oh, I am sorry. Well, all right. I guess she deserves it. The Tory will be hers. I want her to have it. You tell her, Paul, a symbol of what she means to me. And uh, uh, Yes? Uh, perhaps that way, when you explain, uh, I uh, might say it again, huh? Well... I'll do my best to explain. Uh, good. <laughs> good. Well, I'll run on now. And the arrangement? I'll send the watch over with the bill of sale, transfer papers, everything. The messenger will be here within an hour. Goodbye, Paul. You heard it all, but you've won, haven't you, Jackie? The Vittori watch will soon be in your hands. And you and Paul enjoy your biggest laugh to date as he recounts Benjamin's sly hopefulness towards seeing you again when you're over your nervousness. And Paul takes you to dinner by way of celebration. You agree to meet at his office the following afternoon. Well, Jackie, how do you feel? Not even a hangover. Wish I could say the same. Sit down. Well, anyway, the Victory is safe and sound in the vault. Good. How soon do we sell it? It'll take about two weeks to get top price. Yeah, I guess I can stand it that long. Oh, will it feel good to have money. Do you still plan to split? What do you mean? Oh, I thought we might keep it in the family. We might. Eventually. What's the matter with immediately? We could get married in Vegas. I'd, uh, I'd like to have time to think it over. What for? Well, the girl needs time to make up her mind. Now, stop it. You can't pull that act on me. I've watched you, remember. You don't sit around daydreaming, batting your eyes in innocence. Paul, please, let's not... I'm not going to be another Benjamin Lindquist, Jackie. You're going to marry me, understand? Since you're getting nasty, you might as well wake up to the fact that if I wanted to marry a man your age, I could have done it a long time ago. Okay. Now we understand each other. I hope so. You've got two weeks to sell the watch. Don't take any longer. You're worried now, aren't you, Jackie? Because you're forced to watch Paul. On Friday, exactly two weeks later, you rush up to his office, determined to demand a settlement of your agreement. You walk down the corridor to suite 906, Paul's suite. You open the door, enter. Inside, you see a man moving the furniture and listing each item. Is Mr. Jessen... I can't do back any money. Uh, may I ask why you're itemizing Mr. Jessen's office furniture? We're removing it, ma'am, early Monday morning. Mr. Jessen's put the story. Well, guess this does it. Say, if you're still here when Mr. Jessen gets back, tell him we'll make the pickup first thing Monday, will you? Yeah, I will. Oh, 
Paul. Fred, Jackie, glad you're here. Of course, you've forgotten our little episode. I have great news. A Swedish collector has offered us 100000 for the Victoria. He'll cable the money Monday. On Monday? Yes. Just drop over here at the office Monday afternoon. I'll take the watch now. What? Why? This is a gun, and it's bleeding. But, Jackie... I talked to the man from the moving company. Oh. Come on, Paul. Give me the watch. I never argue with this guy. All right. It's in the vault. Come on. We'll go and get it. <laughs> Now, get in there and get the watch and the ownership paper. I'll wait out here. And don't forget, I'll be waiting with a gun. Who's that? I don't know. We'll stay in there. Don't stop the vault door. You don't know the combination. I might stop it. I'll scribble the combination down. What is it? Three left, ten right, four left. Three left, ten right, four left. Yeah. Now, now, while I see who dropped in on us, just find the Vittori. Oh, hello. I'll just be a minute. What are you doing? Building engineer sent me up to check the thermostat. Seems to be all right, though. Well, I hope so. We're expecting an important client. Don't worry. I'll be out of here in no time, man. Just a little fishing here. I'll be through in a few minutes. You're relieved as the building maintenance man finally leaves, aren't you, Jackie? And you hurry back. Open the heavy door to the vault again. Still covering Paul with your gun. Paul stands just inside the vault, the Vittori watch in his hand. Thank you, Paul. I'll take that. Jackie, you know you can't finish this job without me. Oh, stop it. I'm not trying to commit the perfect crime, Paul. Sooner or later, the police will trace me to this place, but it'll take a little time, and that's all I need. Just a little time to get out of the country. Jackie, you can't get away with this. Oh, can't I? Today's Friday. They won't open this vault until Monday. By that time, you won't be able to tell anybody anything. Jackie! And that'll give me two days to disappear from the face of the earth. You've been around me enough to know that I can do it. Goodbye, Paul. And thanks for everything. Auto accidents due to skidding always increase during rainy weather when pavements are wet. So if even one of your tires has worn smooth and slippery, the time of your life to trade it for a new tire may be now before any more rain. And the tire buy of your life is definitely today's new Lee Super Deluxe Tire. You see, for added traction on slippery pavement, Lee's new Super Deluxe Tire has a wide eight-rib tread design that assures far quicker stopping plus extra protection against skidding. And for added wear, the rugged cold rubber in Lee tires is toughened still further with patented Phil Black O. The result is such long life, these Husky Lee Super Deluxe tires actually cost less per mile. What's more, the generous trade-in allowance signal dealers are now offering for, low tire, for old tires reduces Lee's cost even further. And liberal credit terms are available at signal stations, so play safe with your life and your wallet. Find out now how little it will cost to protect yourself and your passengers with new Lee tires, whose double written guarantee is backed by 19,000 dealers throughout America, including all signal service stations. Well, Jackie, luck has been with you all the way, hasn't it? And now you're about to realize the big payoff. The Vittori watch is legally yours. You decide to forget the Swedish buyer, take less, sell immediately to a famous local jewelry firm. You leave Paul's office and hurry over to the Terman Jewelry Company, one of San Francisco's largest firms. You grip your gloves nervously as you stand in front of the owner awaiting his decision. Outside, a cab is waiting to take you to the airport where you can make connections to get out of the country. Well, your ownership papers seem in order, miss, and $80,000 is their price. Good. Then it's settled? I don't see why not. I will, of course, have to examine the watch a little more carefully. You understand we can't risk buying a paste copy. I understand. Well, it only takes a few minutes. Just sit down here. Put my tools in my piece. There we are. 
<laughs> Diamonds are all right. Diamond hands all right. Now, quick look at the work. Very interesting. Is, is anything the matter? I'm not sure. Not me, Mr. Cullen? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Mr. Hobie here is our store detective. I'm going to ask him to uh, watch you while I call the police. The police? Yes, I'm going to send them over to the Hopkins building. Well, what about the watch? Why should you... Well, this may merely be some practical joke, Miss Calloway, but I'm afraid we'll have to check. You see, there's a new inscription inside here, signed by Paul Jessen. Paul? His engravings. It can't be read without this letter. But it says quite clearly, Hopkins Building, Suite 906, Woman Locked Me in Vault. Name, Jackie Mills, alias Jackie Carraway. Signed, Paul Jessen. February 1st, 1952. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speed, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Joe Gilbert, Edgar Barrier, Herb Butterfield, Britt Wood, and Pat McGeehan. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Meyer Dolinsky, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Little Red Book. It was night, and it was Panama City, and the few passengers on the Augusta Queen were waiting for the big freighter to resume her voyage to San Francisco. Larry Layton was even more restless than some of the other passengers. Also, he was bored. He'd had little success in trying to strike up an acquaintanceship with an attractive young woman on board. And now, from the aft rail, he could see her going ashore with a portly little gentleman, 
clad in ill-fitting white linen. It's annoying, isn't it, Larry? What such an attractive girl can see in a man like that. And suddenly you decide that you must know. You flip your cigarette away, hurry to the gangplank, and walk ashore. Once ashore, you follow the girl and her companion. And see them turn down an alley in back of a warehouse. You walk to the entrance to the alley and then stop at the sound of their voices raised in anger. You little cheat. So that's it. That's why you've been playing up to me. Stop it, Roy. You're all mixed up. Not so mixed up that I don't know I talk too much after a few drinks into the wrong dame. Your boy sounds. I'll teach you how to talk to Roy Tate, Julie. No cheap dame pulls anything on Roy Tate, understand? I'm going to... Julie, why... You freeze back into the shadows, don't you, Larry? A moment later, the girl runs past you. You wait for a moment, make certain no one is approaching, and then move down the alley. The man who called himself Roy Tate is quite dead, isn't he, Larry? A knife lying nearby. You lean down and quickly search him. The inside pocket of his coat is badly torn, but his wallet is there and a considerable amount of money. Quickly you pocket it, then wrap the knife in your handkerchief. It would be dangerous if it were found on you, but you're reasonably sure it won't be. And it might prove quite valuable later. You return to the ship and walk briskly up the gangplank. Well, Mr. Layton, you didn't stay ashore very long. Change your mind about going into the city, huh? Well, I figure the scotch is just as good in the ship's bar and a shorter walk. <laughs> you're probably right, sir. Oh, I am right. Hello, Curly. Want to dance? Sorry, baby. Not in the mood. Oh. Nobody wants to do anything. A fine sailor. Scotch and soda, Sam. Sure thing, Mr. Lighton. Uh, go easy on the lady. She's feeling low. <laughs> you mean high. I don't remember her, Sam. She came aboard here in Panama. Been talking to me a mile a minute. First voyage, she said. Nobody see her off. Lonely. No husband. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I like mine younger, Sam, and prettier. Oh. There you are. Thanks. Well, is this more what you mean? Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Evening, Miss Fraser. Hello, Sam. Still nothing for me, beautiful? What? Well, all this mileage together, not even a smile. <laughs> Drink? <laughs> Thank you. The same as yours. Oh, that's much better. Oh, Sam. I'm on it, Mr. Layton. Say, Mr. Layton, Miss Fraser. Can we make it Larry and, uh, uh... Julie. Oh, of course. Mm. And I'm Marie. Well, hello, Marie. I'm sailing tonight. You sure are. Oh, now don't tease me, Curly. I'm just trying to have a little fun. Sure, go on, Larry. Dance with the lady. Yeah, but I... I'll I... Uh, put on another ring. Oh, fine thing. I'll do the same for you someday. <laughs> Come on, Curly. Okay. Cheer up. I might cut in. Okay. Come to my arms, Marie. Gladly, Curly. <laughs> Gladly. It's all quite different than before, isn't it, Larry? Julie's a different girl, and you're amazed at her calmness after what you saw her do to Roy Tate only a short while before. The moments in the ship's bar stretch into hours, as along with other passengers, the two of you wait for the ship to get underway. You and Julie are dancing together now, and you make several attempts to learn what it was all about. You also wonder what Julie took from the murdered man. As you recall that his coat pocket was torn badly. Perhaps it happened when she lunged at him, but you'd like to know for sure. One thing you do know, the girl in your arms can be as lethal and deadly as she is beautiful. Mm. You dance very well, Larry. Better than, uh, Roy Tate. What do you know about Roy? Very little. I spoke to him a couple of times on the voyage down... By the way, where is he? Didn't he go ashore with you? Yes, he did. Oh. But he didn't come back with you? No. Roy isn't going to come back, Larry. Oh? No, he's uh, meeting another ship. Going back where he came from, you mean, huh? Mm, something like that. Uh, let's not talk about him anymore. Okay. Just wondered. I, uh... I didn't see him taking any luggage ashore. 
Won't the purser think it's odd? His that... luggage is ashore. Uh-huh. Roy sent a message back with me. Mm-hmm. He wanted his luggage sent to the International Hotel, hell for arrival. It's there now. I see. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> glad he thought of everything. He <laughs> did. Funny. What's funny? You two seem so, well, chummy on the voyage down, and now you don't even seem to miss Roy. You want me to miss him? No. <laughs> and why are you so concerned about him? Okay. What's okay? Like you said, let's not talk about him anymore. <laughs> That's better, Larry. Hey, wait a minute. Sam? Sam, is that sailing time? Sure, we're sailing. That's right, Mr. Layton. Almost 12. Come on, Julie. You want to go out on deck while she get underway? No, thanks. I'm going to turn in. That's a good idea. I'll go with you, Curly, and then we'll come back and dance till morning. Oh, now, wait a minute, Marie. You two fight it out. I'll see you in the morning. Check. Good night, Sam. Good night, Miss Fraser. Now, Curly, we got the whole bar to ourselves. You and Sam have the whole bar to yourselves. I'm awfully tired, Marie, and I'm turning in, too. Oh, nobody wants to have any fun. A fine thing. <laughs> this is where I came in. Good night, Marie. Good night, Sam. Good night, Mr. Leitner. You go out on deck, wander along the rail, watching the deck crew as they work to get the ship underway. You know which stateroom is Julie's, don't you, Larry? 11B. You're still wondering if she took anything away from Roy Tate. There has to be a reason for murder. Outside of 11B, you pause and look around. No one is watching and the porthole is partially open, the light from inside shining through. You glance in just in time to see Julie staring at an ordinary little address book, slowly turning the pages. You wonder if the book was Roy's and what it means. And you wonder further when you observe Julie carefully circling an address and then hiding the book behind a wall mirror. And then quite suddenly the light goes out. You leap back and hurry away. You swift steps along the deck and you bump squarely into another passenger. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's all right, Curly. Oh. Anyway, everybody's in a hurry, don't you think? Yeah. Everybody's either running after something or away from something. Don't you think so, Curly? Don't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I suppose they are. Uh, now we all start running, Curly. We're getting underway. <laughs> and I'm too bad nobody wants to have any fun... This could be a very interesting voyage. That's right, Marie. It could be a very interesting voyage. Now, a word about popularity. A friend of mine, when he's dining out, always chooses a restaurant that's crowded. They must have something, he says, to be so popular. Well, by the same token, Signal Gasoline must have something when you consider that last year, motorists bought a lot more gallons of Signal Gasoline than during any other year in Signal history. What is that something which accounts for such increasing popularity? It could be the good mileage, which has made Signal known throughout the Pacific Coast states as the go-farther gasoline. It could be the way cars respond with life and zing to a gasoline that's engineered to help your engine run more efficiently. But frankly, friends, just as sure as my name is Marvin Miller, you're never going to know all the good reasons why so many drivers are switching to signal until you try a few tankfuls in your own car. Why don't you this week and see if you don't agree with me? You get a full measure of all the things that make driving more pleasure when you fill up with signal. The famous go-farther gasoline. It's tantalizing, isn't it, Larry? The question mark that surrounds Julie Frazier... You know that she killed a man in a back alley of Panama, a man named Roy Tate. But you don't know why. You wonder if it hasn't something to do with a little red address book which Julie keeps hidden in her stateroom. And you're determined to somehow examine that book. 
But your opportunity doesn't come until the morning the ship approaches San Francisco's Golden Gate. You enter the dining room quite late to learn that Julie hasn't appeared for breakfast. Good morning, Curly. Your little playmate isn't here. I'll have you all to myself. Marie, the name is Larry. Ah, it's Curly to me. I like nicknames, and I like you. Good, good. I like you, too. I'm glad, darling, because after little Julie gives you the brush off... You think she'll give me a brush off? Oh, yes. I've known a million like her. They always do. And when she does, you can come back to Marie. I'll make you forget all about her. Hey, you know, I'm beginning to think you mean it. Oh, I do, Curly. You're what I've always wanted. And Julie's just playing with you, I can tell. And you're not. You know I'm not. The minute I saw you, I knew you were the one guy I needed. I'm very determined, too. Marie, you amaze me. Now you run on, knock dutifully on Julie's door, see if she's seasick or anything. I can wait. Yeah, like I said. I amaze you. Well, that's something. Curly, supposing I told you that I was a uh, very wealthy widow. Well, that's something, too. I've read about things like this, yeah, darling. You don't believe me. Oh, now, don't be hasty, pet. I tell you what, I'm working on a deal. Now, if it falls through... Then you'll come back to me? Uh-huh. How sweet. Yeah, well, eat your breakfast and keep thinking about me. Oh, I will, Curly. I will. <laughs> You shake your head as you leave the dining room. Marie is certainly a strange one, isn't she, Larry? But harmless. And you've other more important things on your mind. On the way to stateroom 11B, you see Julie approaching and hide behind a lifeboat until she passes. A moment later, you're trying the door of her stateroom. Find it open. Inside, you cross to the wall mirror. Take down the little red address book from where you watch Julie hide it. Quickly examine the addresses inside. You find one carefully circled, and you copy it down and place the book back in its hiding place. And then you freeze in your tracks, almost afraid to breathe. Miss Frazier, it's the steward. Miss Frazier. You hold your breath, hoping the steward will go away and not enter the stateroom and find you there. Finally, he does leave. You hurry back to your own stateroom. That afternoon, Marie bids you a tearful goodbye, insists on your writing down an address where you can reach her in San Francisco. And then later on, you're on deck with Julie as a tug pulls your ship slowly toward the dock. Well, here we are. It's all over. Doesn't have to be, Julie. I mean, can't I see you to your hotel? No, Larry, I'm sorry. I... I have other things to take up my time in San Francisco. Well, I guess Marie was right. Marie? She predicted you'd brush me off. Says that's when she's moving in. Well, I'm not brushing you off, as you put it. I, I'm sorry, Larry. It's something I can't explain. Perhaps we'll meet again sometime. Julie, if you're in trouble, if you need a strong arm man... No, I'm not in trouble. It's just that... Well, it's... Goodbye, that's all. It has to be. Okay, Julie... Like you said, goodbye. But you've no intention of letting Julie get away from you, have you, Larry? No. It's simply that you'll have to play things her way at the moment. As the ship ties up, you're the first to shore and make your way out to the Embarcadero and start down the street. Cab, mister? Uh, yeah, yeah. Here, I'll take your bag. Thanks. Where to, sir? I don't know yet. Don't know, huh? No, no. Oh. We just sit a while, huh? You don't mind. Why should I mind? So we sit, so you pay. I got to turn on the media, you know. Oh, sure, sure. Hey, it looks like quite a town, Frisco, huh? Please. What? San Francisco. Oh, I'm sorry. I was out here on the coast once before, about uh, five years ago. Never got up here, though. Had business in Los Angeles. L.A., huh? Los Angeles. Oh. Nice town. Wait. Start up, start up. Huh? See that young lady over there? Yeah. Wouldn't get into that cab? That's right. There's ten bucks in it for you if you don't lose her. I won't lose her. Ten bucks says I won't. You follow Julie's cab to a large downtown hotel. 
As you hurry inside, you see her enter the cocktail lounge. You slip into a back booth and watch as she slides the little red book across to the bartender, and then turns and walks away. Your eyes follow her as she moves through the lobby toward the desk. Then you lean back and order a drink. You're still puzzled about that little red book, aren't you, Larry? What it means? Why she left it here? And you decide it's time for a showdown. You finish your drink, and then step across to the hotel desk. Good afternoon, sir. Miss Julie Fraser, please. What's her room number, clerk? Miss Fraser? Uh, let me see. I believe she just checked in. Yeah, I'm surprised at you, old man, that you'd forget her so quickly. <laughs> Miss F is a very attractive young lady. I'm sorry, sir, but we have no Miss Fraser. Now, look, she was here just a few minutes ago. Blonde, medium height, wore a tan coat, brown hat. With oh, a... that young lady. Yeah, yeah, that young lady. Come on, what's her room number? Oh, uh, she isn't staying here, sir. But I saw her. She merely wished to know the correct time. The... Thanks, Lodes. You hurry outside, but Julie is nowhere in sight. You've let her get away, haven't you, Larry? And you're certain now you've lost her for good. And you still don't know why the little red book is so important. Why Julie killed a man for it. However, there's still the address, isn't there, Larry? The address you copied from that little red book. The answer you're looking for could be there, couldn't it? You set out for that unknown address. Glad you're carrying Julie's knife in your pocket in case you need a little protection. <laughs> Well, hello, Larry. As they say so often, fancy meeting you here. I've been expecting you. Come in. Thanks. Cut the down. Have a drink? Yeah, scotch if you have it. Anything else if you have not <laughs> You're easy to please. Not always. Meaning what? I'm very particular about women. Ah, you mean. <laughs> yeah, really. Soda? Yeah, soda. You know, Larry, I must say I'm surprised. Oh? But it turned out to be you. I thought a moment ago you said you were expecting me. Well, I was expecting someone, but I didn't know it would be Larry Layton. Not sorry, are you? <laughs> of course not. Here's your drink. Thanks. Not joining me? No, later, perhaps. Uh, do you mind if I sit down? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Lots of room here. Oh, thanks. Tell me something, Larry... Did you expect it to be me? Let's say I was counting on it. Very much. Then you knew all along. Aboard ship, I mean. Maybe. <laughs> oh, silly, really. You could have saved yourself all this trouble. Why didn't you tell me then? I was in no hurry. Oh, weren't you, darling? Besides, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you weren't much help. When I tried to see you home, you fobbed me off with something about leaving it as just a shipboard friendship, remember? Oh, that's right. I did say that, didn't I? And so you had to go to the cocktail lounge, get my address, and here you are. Yeah, here I am. You have the money. Money? The payoff, darling. Well, uh, that's something we should talk over. Huh? Talk over? Oh, no. Now, take it easy, baby. Look, the job's done. A deal's a deal. You would have bring the money to the address circled in the little red book. No negotiating, no questions asked. Relax. Sure, I'll relax when you hand over that 30000 Thirty thousand. <laughs> oh, we could have an awful lot of laughs, baby. We? What are you talking about? A partnership. When we collect that dough, we'll split it. When we collect? But, but I thought that, that you... That I was the payoff boy? The happy chappy with all the folding stuff? <laughs> no, no. I see. Oh, Julie, Julie, how could you be so stupid? Oh, no, no. Now, look, handsome, if you think you're going to muscle in. Think, I am in, Julie. Are you really? Yeah, we just sit here, wait till the payoff comes along. Oh, you fool, you've ruined everything. I have, how? The book, when you picked it up at the bar. Don't you see, how is the party who's supposed to pay off going to know this address? Take it easy, baby, I didn't pick up the book, I didn't have to. What? But how did you know to come here, how... Hadn't we better answer that? Hello? 
Is that right? Yes. No, don't send it over here. I'll come and pick it up. Just you better change your mind, sweetheart. This knife might slip. Uh, wait a minute. Do as I say. Right. Hello. On second thought, I think you'd better bring it here. Yes. I'll be waiting. So the payoff is on its way over, huh? Yes, but it won't do you any good. I'm not splitting that money. Fifteen thousand apiece isn't bad. I'll keep the whole thirty thousand. You'll see. I don't think you will, Julie. My la- Larry, please, that, that knife. Bother you? <laughs> Being so close to your lily white throat, or you're just remembering what happened in Panama? Panama? What do you know about that Panama? That guy Roy Tate was a sucker to trust you, baby. He's the guy who did the job, huh? Whatever it was, told you how he was going to be paid for it. You killed him for that little red book, circled your own address, knowing you'd get the payoff. No, I didn't. Sure you did, Julie. With this knife. Where did you... Oh, no. Oh, yes. I saw you. It's your knife, baby. I want you to have it. Always. I'll just take the whole $30,000. Dollars! The two things you want to be sure of when you buy a new battery are one, power. Plenty of power for quick starting, plus the many electrical needs of your car. And two, long life, so you won't have the expense of buying another battery soon. Well, tonight I want to tell you why, for power and economical long life, you just can't beat today's new Signal Deluxe battery. First of all, improved microporous rubber separators allow freer flow of acid between the plates yet are impervious to the action of the acid. Result, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power. Secondly, Signal Deluxe batteries are guaranteed, not just for the usual 12 or 18 months, but for a full 30 months on a service basis. That makes the cost per month so low, you're actually saving money while you're enjoying the extra power and dependability of a Signal Deluxe battery. So before you buy any battery, get your signal dealer's trade-in offer for your old battery. Find out his convenient credit terms. Prove for yourself that today's smartest battery buy is today's finest battery. The new, improved Signal Deluxe battery at Signal Service Station. For a moment, you're stunned, aren't you, Larry, at the realization that Julie Fraser is actually dead at your feet. Then the whole weird story whirls across your mind. The way Julie killed Roy Tate in a back alley of Panama. Your own confused wondering as to the reason. The little red book she took from him. The way she circled her own address instead of his. And now finally what it all added up to from the beginning. That Julie had found out how Roy Tate, the professional killer, was to be paid off. She hadn't counted on your interference, had she, Larry? No. And now you've put her out of the way hurriedly hidden her body behind the Davenport. And it's you that waits in her quiet apartment for the payoff money. And finally... Well, Miss Frazier has a boyfriend, huh? Uh, yeah, that's right. Look, Julie had to step out. We're, uh, we're working together. You can, you can leave the door with me, huh? Oh, I think I better have a look around. Hey, a badge. You're a cop. Right, Slade, homicide. Wait there in the hall, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, what do you know? Come to pick up a murderess, find her dead, and the guy that killed her waiting for Now, her. look, I don't know anything about that. I... David Fowler, the prince on the knife will settle that. I guess you don't know some other things. Sarge, bring Marie in here. Marie? Curly. Oh, Curly. I don't get it, Marie. Oh, it's my fault, Larry. Curly, I'm the one who was meant to pay off for that Griselli killing in the East. The syndicate gave me the money and told me to come out here to make the payoff, get the address from that little red book. Then I I got ideas of my own. Keep talking, Marie. Curly here seems to be very interested. When when Roy Tate left New York by boat for San Francisco, I figured he was a trigger man. So I flew to Panama, caught the Augustus Queen for San Francisco. I thought I could talk Roy into a 50-50 split of that payoff money, but Roy Tate wasn't a bore. He had been. So I found out when we reached San Francisco. I read in the papers that a man identified as Roy Tate was found stabbed to death in Panama. 
How did you happen to tie Julie in with it? I picked up the little red address book the way I was supposed to and called the phone number. When, when I recognized Julie's voice, I saw my chance. To do what? Get rid of her. Tip the police off. She was getting the payoff. Oh, I didn't dream the cops would trace my call so quick and pick me up when I walked out of the phone booth. But why, Marie? Why did you want Julie out of the way? She meant nothing to you. No. But she meant something to you. I'm sorry it turned out this way, Curly. You see, I thought we'd have such good times, just the two of us, with that $30,000 of payoff money. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember, regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Gerald Moore, Betty Lou Gerson, G.G. Pearson, Harry Lang, Joe Forte, and Herbert Litton. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Robert Hafter, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invite you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, A Rose for Pamela. <laughs> The concert was progressing successfully, brilliantly, as Denise Barrett listened closely. The young artist had perfect command of the keyboard at her fingertips, and the quiet, inspired audience watching. This was because, like her famous father, the late Thomas Barrett, she loved music. It was a part of her. And she felt no more nervousness than he might have had at the height of his brilliant career as one of the world's most celebrated pianists. Pamela Barrett might have felt differently, however, 
if she knew what was in the heart and mind of Denise Barrett, her young and attractive stepmother. Pamela's touch might not have been so fine, so sure, if she had the knowledge of Denise's cold, calculated plan for murder. It was a plan that began some time back, wasn't it, Denise? At an even more innocent affair. An impromptu concert at a pleasant social gathering. Friends of yours and of Pamela. As usual, you watched admiringly as Pamela played for her friends. Softly. Beautifully. Pamela, darling, it was beautiful, wonderful. Thank you, Denise. All of you, thanks so much. She's ready now. Oh, you must arrange a day before, Denise. I should say so. Oh, you hear them, darling. It's what I've been telling you repeatedly. You mustn't let anything interfere with your music. Uh, nothing will, Denise. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me, I have to... You've done a marvelous job as a guardian, Denise. Her father would have been proud. Yes, it's a shame Thomas Barrett couldn't be here. Oh, yes, he would have loved to hear his daughter play tonight. Yes. Yes, it's our only regret. Oh, now, dear, I'm sorry I mentioned that. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Just the excitement, the thrill of hearing her play so much like, like Thomas himself. Yes, Denise, so much like Thomas Barrett himself, your late husband. The thought is still on your mind as you excuse yourself. Leave your guests discussing the way you've managed Pamela, brought her along, guided her career and affairs so efficiently. And on the terrace, you're congratulated again by a guest who has remained in the background, Marty Drake, attorney for the estate of your late husband, Thomas Barrett. She was very good, Denise. Very good. The girl does have talent, doesn't she? Uh-huh. You uh, think she meant that about not letting anything interfere with her career? I hope so. So do I. You ought to make sure, you know. A young girl in love that way. I've managed her pretty well until now, Marty. And she has faith in you, both personally and as an attorney. She told me the other afternoon she was glad you were handling the estate. Oh, sure. I was just thinking her father's brilliant career ended by an accident. It would be dreadful if anything had to end the daughter's, too. Please, Marty. Sorry. Like I said, just thinking. Marty... It, it would be terrible if, if... You couldn't handle it? Couldn't talk her out of marrying Richard Matthews? Oh, but I can. I must. You can say that again, baby. Her marriage would put us both in a position of having to account for the hundred thousand dollars we've managed to remove from the estate. A hundred thousand? Is it that much, Marty? We've lived well, Denise. Very well. Since Thomas fell over that cliff. A year ago. But a hundred thousand, Marty, that's... That's the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony. You'd better go to work on Pamela. I will. Tomorrow. Thought you might like a cocktail, Mrs. Barrett. There. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you, Alma. Uh, thank you. I could use one very nicely. Oh, Alma, would you tell Pamela there's another number I'd like her to play? List Liebenstrom. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. She told me to tell you. She's gone out. There was a phone call. Not... Not Richard Matthews. Oh, yes, ma'am. Richard Matthews. Well, and you tell me not to worry. Marty, we're going to have trouble. So is Pamela. How do you mean? We uh, won't have much choice, Denise. If your lovely stepdaughter persists in marrying, there might be only one way to stop it. Yes, one way. And this time, you'll do the stopping. If you don't, baby, you won't be around to spend any more of Pamela's money. You'll be on the inside looking out. Oh, no, Marty. I'll stop her. And if you don't? If I don't, it's like you say. Another accident. Another tragic loss in the Barrett family. And the music world. <laughs> Throughout the seven Pacific Coast states, from Canada to Mexico, motorists call Signal the go-farther gasoline. 
Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of Signal's good mileage, which has built that reputation. But equally important to you as a motorist is the way Signal gives you such good mileage. You see, today's signal helps your engine run so efficiently, you save gasoline three ways. One, you save gasoline with signals quick starting. Two, you save gasoline with signals smooth, obedient pickup, free from balking and hesitation. Three, you save gasoline with signals lively power that gets you into high gear fast, helps you stay there with a minimum of shifting on hills or in traffic. Well, considering the number of times a day you start your car, accelerate, and shift gears, even a little gasoline saved each time soon adds up to a big saving. So there, in a nutshell, friends, is why motorists call Signal the go-farther gasoline. Why not treat your car to Signal and go farther? Yes, Denise. As Marty indicated, Pamela must be dealt with firmly, decisively. Her romantic inclinations toward Richard Matthews must come to an abrupt halt. Yes. Because with marriage, Pamela would be in a position to explore the nefarious financial dealings in which you and Marty have engaged with the funds from the estate. Also, Pamela might have reason to suspect the grim fact that her father, Thomas Barrett, might have died by other than accidental means. You lose little time in facing the situation squarely, Denise. As the following afternoon, you hurry down the long corridor toward the music room, determined to talk to her. However, as you pass the study, the maid steps into view. Oh, oh ma'am. Uh, yes, Alma. Um. Uh, about Mr. Barrett's curio collection. Miss Pamela said she didn't want anything touched. I told her that oh, you... Oh, now, really? I don't see why she insists on keeping those awful things around. Spears, poison darts, those vials of South African poisons, snake venom, all those things. Well, her father's man. I can't didn't... imagine what Mr. Barrett had in mind bringing those horrible things back with him after that South African tour. I just can't. Oh, poisons. They make me shiver. Oh, well. Never mind, Alma. I'll talk to Pamela again later. Very good, men. You play Chopin nearly as well as your father did, Pamela. You're still angry with me, aren't you? Well, I, I don't blame you, really. I should have told you the reasons I thought it best that you postpone your marriage to Richard for a year or two. The main reason is that you enjoy telling me I can't do things, isn't it, Denise? You think I'm very unfair, don't you, dear? Aren't you? I don't think so. Oh, Pamela, I know how hard it's been for you since your father died. It's been hard on me, too. I loved him very much. And I, I, I've i just been trying to keep a promise I made to him about you. I guess I've gone at it very badly. Promise? What was the promise? I promised him I'd see to it that you followed in his footsteps. Became a great concert pianist. You did? Yes, dear, I did. Dad asked you to? Yes. He wanted you to make your debut at Civic Hall on your 19th birthday. Well, that's scarcely two weeks away. Yes, it is. But I made all the arrangements some time ago. And that's why I was so shocked when you said you wanted to give up your music and marry Richard. And why I was so emphatic in saying I wouldn't let you. My career meant a lot to Dad, didn't it? Pamela, you're awfully young to get married. Why not wait for a couple of years, and in the meantime, go ahead with everything just as your father planned? I guess it would have made him happy. No, of course it would. All right, Denise. I'll try to go on with my career. You'll always be glad, darling. You may feel bad now about postponing your marriage to Richard, but... Well, after you get started on your career... Denise, you, you must have misunderstood. I said I'd continue with my music, but I didn't say I changed my mind about marrying Richard. <sighs> but you, you, you can't marry him. You wouldn't have time for both. Look, you... Denise. Legally, I'm old enough to be married, with or without your consent, even if you are still guardian of my money. If I decide to marry Richard, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Remember that. Nothing. Yeah. 
You've failed, haven't you, Denise? That look on Pamela's face. You've seen it before on her father's face. The man you married with so much more than love in mind. Yes, Denise. To gain control again, there's another step necessary, a more drastic one, but something more in your line. You've always managed with men easier than with women. And later that week, out at the swimming pool, you call on all the strength of your considerable feminine powers to turn the tide for you. Win Richard away from Pamela. Morning, Richard. Good morning, Mrs. Barrett. How's the water? Oh, warm and wonderful. Here, give me a hand, will you? Oh, sure. Oh, there we are. Oh, thanks. Now to get this cap off. Oh, it was such a beautiful morning. I just couldn't resist the pool. Uh, hand me the towel, will you? Oh, yeah, here we are. Oh, thank you. Pamela around? Uh, oh, she had some shopping to do. That's why I asked you over. I, uh, I want to talk to you alone. Sit down, Richard. All right. Pamela tells me you're quite a musician. Uh, she's prejudiced. You, um, you like Pamela very much, don't you? I love her. Enough to put her welfare above your happiness? Of course. Well, then, don't let her think about getting married until she's reached the place in the music world her father planned for. Why couldn't she do both? <laughs> she, she just couldn't, that's all. Well, hundreds of women have combined marriage with a career. Rather successfully, too. Oh, perhaps, but not Pamela. She's different. Her life shouldn't be complicated with emotional disturbances. Her thoughts should be only of her music. And uh, you are rather distracting, Richard. Oh, now, really, Mrs. Barrett, you make it sound... Denise, please. All right. Denise? Uh, did it ever occur to you that the... Uh, well, the things Pamela sees in you are obvious to other women, too. I, I never thought much about it, Mrs. Denise. You know, Pamela is such a child, naive and all. But you and I, Richard, we're the same kind. I knew it from the first time I saw you. Remember, Richard, Pamela's first concert? The afternoon you brought her the first rose? I remember you seemed a little surprised when we were introduced. Uh, yes. I suppose I was. I didn't expect Pamela's stepmother to be so... So what, Richard? Well, young and, uh, so attractive. <laughs> How nice of you to say that, darling. You, you really think me attractive? Yes. Very. My, we are getting along well, aren't we, Richard? I, uh... I think we should get to know more of one another. Don't you? Uh-huh. Well, there's no time like the present, is there? Whatever you say, Denise. He's falling into the trap, isn't he, Denise? Soon you'll be able to twist him around your little finger. Yes, you're confident that when you're through with Richard, he'll have forgotten that Pamela ever existed. You sit there at the edge of the pool with Richard for over an hour. Then when he's gone, you hurry to the telephone and call Marty. So you charmed the boy, huh? What did he tell you? Well, it isn't what I told him. It's what I left unsaid, Marty. That's what counts. I'm certain he thinks I'm quite mad about him, and he's very interested. You say keep that little rendezvous? Oh, of course not, and I didn't ask him to. I merely mentioned that I'd be dining alone tomorrow night at that quaint little cafe overlooking the sea. And how I loved it there, the soft music, the candlelight. Think he'll show up? <laughs> how could he turn it down? Don't worry, Marty. After tomorrow night, all our worries will be over. Promptly at seven the following night, you enter Shafini. That quaint little cafe on the beach. The head waiter steers you to a secluded table near the large window overlooking the sea. And there in the candlelight, you sip a martini. Wait for Richard to show up. Suddenly, you're aware of someone standing at your elbow. Good evening, Mrs. Barrett. Yes? Allow me. I am ready to demo. May I sit down? Oh, well, just a moment. I don't... I am from the Hollywood Escort Bureau. Escort I... Bureau? 
Yes, Mr. Richard Matthews hired me. He said Mrs. Barrett hated to dine alone. Get out of my way, you... you are... Now, look, lady, how about my fee? Collect your fee from Richard Matthews, the man who hired you. He'll pay. Yes, he'll pay all right. Denise, are you sure Richard sent that two-bit Romeo, the guy from the escort bureau? Oh, of course, Marty. And of all the dirty, shabby tricks. <laughs> Worse than the one you tried to pull on Pamela, baby. You must be losing your technique. Well, you won't think it's so funny when I tell you that last night, Pamela informed me she and Richard are planning to get married right after the concert. What? I said they were planning, Marty. But the wedding will never take place. Well, how are you going to stop it? Poison her cornflakes? Oh, don't be a fool. I... Poison. He has poison. That's it, Marty. What are you going to do? The Barrett Curio Collection. The poisons my late husband picked up in South Africa. Some of them are fatal, almost in a matter of minutes, Marty. I can't imagine why a great musician like Thomas Barrett went in for a gruesome hobby like collecting poison. I'm surprised you didn't dispose of them after his death. Oh, Pamela wouldn't let me. Pamela wouldn't let me get rid of a thing. Now, very thoughtful of her. How very thoughtful. Just a scratch from any one of those poisons, and it's all over for little Pamela. All right. But how are you going to do it? I don't know, Marty. But I'll think of something. I'll think of something. Yes. And it's on your mind all that night, isn't it, Denise? You've got to find a way to kill Pamela with one of the poisons from her father's collection. And somehow Richard must be blamed. Just how you're going to do that isn't clear, not yet. Not until the following afternoon, when suddenly, quite by accident, you stumble on the answer. You're sitting in the library when your maid walks into the room. Oh, Alma. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, there are some things I want sent to the cleaners, if you'll come upstairs with me. Right away, ma'am. Oh, uh, where are you going with those flowers? Well, Miss Pamela asked me to take them out of her room and put them in here. Gardener picked them this morning. Aren't the roses beautiful? Yes, they are. They're, oh, they're quite beautiful. Put them in that vase over there. I just, I just remembered I have something important to do. The waves are really coming in tonight, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You know, Marty, I've been thinking. Oh. It's really very simple. We poisoned Pamela with a rose. A rose from her darling Richard. I don't follow you, Denise. Well, Richard always sends her a rose when she appears on the stage. It's become a superstition with him. She wouldn't appear without it. All right, so? I'll arrange to be at the door when the florist delivers it. Now, they always wrap the stem of the rose with a very thin wire. I'll put several sharp wires on it, Marty, and one of them right up through the rose. And all of them especially treated. One of those wires will be sure to scratch Pamela. Mm. But suppose... I'll pin the rose on her and arrange it so she'll be certain to scratch herself. Ah, it'll never work. The police will be sure to find out. Well, it'll make it all the better if they do. Richard sent her the rose, not me. He always does. Yes, but the motive. Why would he want her out of the way? Because he was madly in love with me. And he wanted the Barrett fortune, too. You see, he knew that with Pamela out of the way, all the money would go to me. You know... That might work. And with you, the attorney for the Barrett estate, to back up my story, it can't fail to work. Sure. It'll stand up, baby. And in another month, Marty, the Barrett fortune will be all mine. Uh, ours, baby. <sighs> all right. Ours. <laughs> However, I think I should warn you, Marty. Oh? Just in case you get ideas about pushing me off a cliff and keeping all the money for yourself. Oh, now, look, we're getting married. Yes, I know. But I've taken the necessary precautions just the same, darling. I've sent a letter to a friend of mine, a lawyer. That letter will be opened in the event of my death. What are you driving at? And it's all there, in the letter, Marty. All the evidence the district attorney will need. How you embezzled money from the Barrett estate and the complete story of Thomas's death. You see, I'd hate to have an accident happen to me, Marty. Fall off a cliff like he did. You don't think I'd double-cross you, Denise? I'm crazy about you. Oh, of course you are. But I just want to make certain you don't have a change of heart. 
You might get to think that a half million dollars looks better to you than I do. You see what I mean, darling? How much does it cost per month? That's really the only accurate way to judge cost when buying a new battery for your car. Here's what I mean. If a battery is guaranteed 30 months, that means 30 months is about the minimum life the manufacturer has built into that battery. So you divide the total cost by 30 to find the cost per month. Well, judged on that basis, one of today's lowest cost batteries is also one of today's most powerful, most trouble-free batteries, the new Signal Deluxe battery. In fact, you enjoy up to 35% more power from a Signal Deluxe battery. That means quicker starting, extra power for the many electrical gadgets on today's cars. But because it's built to last up to two and one-half times as long as ordinary batteries, a full 30 months on a service basis, a Signal Deluxe battery costs amazingly little per month. Even less when you consider the generous trade-in allowance Signal dealers are now giving for old batteries. And easy credit terms are available. So next time, get more for your battery dollars. More economy, more trouble-free service. Next time, get a Signal Deluxe battery from a Signal service station. It was easy to complete your plans for the murder of your stepdaughter, Pamela Barrett, wasn't it, Denise? The single rose you knew Richard would send her arrived while Pamela was upstairs dressing for the concert. It took you only a few moments to turn it into a deadly weapon. Then you went to Pamela's room and carefully pinned it on her dress in such a way that she'd be certain to scratch herself and die by the poison you took from her late father's curio collection. You lie down for a while, certain that you'll soon be in full control of the Barrett fortune. You're calm and confident when Marty calls for him. Now as you sit beside him in the concert hall, watching Pamela's performance, your eyes are fastened on the rose she's wearing. But as the recital progresses, you become more and more tense. The fear that your plan has gone wrong gradually comes over. Something should have happened to Pamela long before this, shouldn't it, Jimmy? And as her brilliant performance draws to a climax, you exchange worried glances with Mark. Oh, baby, what's gone wrong? I don't know, I don't know. I was afraid of your idea from the start. Wait a minute, I've got to. Marty, we'll go backstage to her dressing room. This way, Marty. Excuse me. Uh, pardon me, please. Will you excuse me? Oh, wonderful, wasn't it? Yes, great performance. Your father would have been proud of her. Excuse me. Oh, come in, ma'am. Oh, wasn't Miss Pavilla wonderful tonight? Yes, yes. Where is she? Oh, she didn't come back to her dressing room. Ran right off the stage. Left with Mr. Richard. What? Yes, ma'am. She gave me this note for you. What is it, Denise? My dear Denise, sorry to rush off like this, but Richard and I are driving to Reno to be married. What? I know you don't approve, but I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive us, love, Pamela. Married? Miss Pamela getting married? Oh, how wonderful, man. No wonder the poor child was so excited before she left for the concert. Oh, Maria, I don't feel well. I feel a little pale myself. Yes, ma'am. Miss Pamela was so nervous she could hardly pin Mr. Richard's rose on her dress. I had to do it for her. What? Miss Pamela was so excited. You pinned I... Mr. Richard Rosen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. But you couldn't have. I did it for I took it at the door when it came and pinned it on her dress in her room. That's right, but I'm talking about the artificial rose Mr. Richard brought later when he came to pick up his camera. Artificial rose? Well, you know the allergy she's developed recently. Her allergy for flowers. Yes, I forgot. Can you sneeze? But that's why Mr. Richard brought her the artificial rose, so she wouldn't sneeze during the concert. Oh, um, what did you do with the real rose? Well, Miss Pavlet thought it was too pretty to throw away, so she put it in your corsage just before she left with Mr. Richard. My corsage? This 
Yes, ma'am. Look what you're wearing. Denise, you're on, sweetie. Oh, my, you must have touched yourself. Grab. Oh, yes. Yes, I have. What did you do there? I, I don't know. It, it must have been... Oh, Marty. Marty. Oh, well, what's the matter, man? Is something wrong? Marty. The poison. Call the doctor. You know how quick it is. Well, help her, Mr. Martin. Denise. 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 Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Joe Gilbert, Barbara Eiler, John Stevenson, Sarah Selby, Bob Bruce, and Rye Billsbury, with piano passages played by Gene Lapique. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed by Robert Hafter with story by Nancy Cleveland, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. A matter of odds. It was a matter of odds from the beginning. Because that was the way Danny Atkins lived, by the odds, a betting chance. But he played safe, carefully figured the odds in Danny's own favor. It was that way right now, in a dimly lit back street in Panama City. Danny was carefully following a sailor named Keller, with whom Danny had had several drinks, before Keller left the Seven Sinners Bar with a little too much alcohol aboard. Then two blocks in an alley later it happens, up ahead, a dark figure leaping forth. An exchange of blows. 
And then Danny running forward. I'll get him, Kelly. I got a boy, Jerry. Okay. Okay, mister. I had enough. Let me go. Try to jump my pal, will you? Let me go. All right. Keep your dough. Get him, Danny. Oh, skip it. Ah, but I thought that you we... You thought had... nothing. Here. Your wallet. Are oh, you too tight to see? Oh, now look, Danny. Sure, sure. Look, Keller, I suppose you didn't talk too much back there in the Seven Sinners, huh? Well, I... suppose I... you didn't go big shot flashing that wad. Look, Danny, we just met. I'm yeah, not sure to... we just met, and I just saved you three months' pay, sailor. All right. So come on, I'll buy you a drink. You're my pal. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay, Keller, I'm your pal. You can just do that. You can buy me a drink. <laughs> Anywhere you say, pal. Any place in old Panama City. Amusing, isn't it, Danny? The way you picked up with Sailor Keller and the Seven Sinners became friendly with him. He showed you a picture he had taken in Tokyo. And you even showed him an old snapshot of yourself when you were a high school baseball star. And all the while you were figuring the odds, weighing how much bigger Keller was, how drunk, how much of a protest he'd put up verbally and physically. Someone else jumped in, and now you emerge as a hero instead of a villain. But as you enter another bar, the blue moon, you tell yourself that it isn't over. Not yet. The blue moon here is as good a place as any. Hey, even knew somebody in here. Hiya, Francie. Hey, hey, take, take, take it easy, Keller. They'll toss us out of here. Hey, who's your friend, sailor? Danny boy. Ah, uh, he's just, just Danny boy, sweetheart. <laughs> Don't you go getting too well acquainted. Don't worry. Wow, ditto. Hey, I'm not so sure I want to sit at the same table with him. Oh, come on, come on. He's my pal. Just save my neck. Uh, okay. Here we are. Sure, my pal. Quite an athlete, too. Uh, show Francie that baseball picture of your daddy boy. She isn't interested. Go on, go on. Hey, waiter, a round of drinks for my friends here, huh? Joey! Hey, Joey, got a customer for you. Huh? Who's Joey? Ticket vendor. You heard of the National Lottery. A lot of dough going to be changed hands soon. Oh, sure. Yeah, really? Uh, hello, Francie. Want to buy some tickets? Oh, my friend does. Sailor Keller. Oh, Mr. Keller. All right. How many, sir? I'll take a fistful. Joey, a fistful. A fistful? Hey, look, oh. Keller. Relax, Danny. I feel lucky. Uh, give me lots of threes, Joey. Three's lucky for me. Sure, Mr. Keller, sure. How about uh, 3303? Okay. Buy some for the lady, too? Yeah. Oh, gee, For my pal, Danny boy. Oh, no, no, never mind me. I'm no gambler. I thought you were always figuring the odds, Danny. Uh, didn't we talk about that? Yeah, I said I figured the odds on people, Keller. People, situations. I don't make wild bets. Oh, uh, you would. Okay, okay. It's going to be your loss. Uh, skip him, Joey. But me? Give me a fistful of those threes. And, and waiter, another round for us here for Fancy, Joey, and me, and, and my pal, my old pal, Danny Boy. Oh, you're a sport, oh, sweetie. Oh, look, Kelly, you're a sucker. The odds are against you, 50,000 to one. Uh, pay no attention to him, <laughs> Against honey. me? Okay, Danny Boy, so what? <laughs> so what? So I'll see you in the morning. Over at your hotel. <laughs> Anything you say, pal. My room's 214. Right now, I'm going to stay anchored for a while. Me and little Francie. Mm, that's right, hon. Oh, I was wrong, Keller. A hundred thousand to one odds. And all against you, all the way. <laughs> just bitter. Little old Danny boy is just yeah. bitter. Night, pal. Night. <laughs> It's infuriating, isn't it, Danny? Watching Sailor Keller spend his money so foolishly. Money you'd hoped for. Money that might have taken you back home to the States. But there's very little you can do about it, is there? And the next morning on your way to Keller's hotel, you look into the bar, wondering if he even made it home last night. And then something hits you. A number marked on the mirror in the back of the bar. Number 3303, Keller's number. The winning ticket in the week's lottery. Your mind spins, already starting to figure the odds in still another direction. In his hotel room, Keller is probably still sleeping off last night. A plus in your favor. Keller has a gun, and that's a definite minus. 
But you decide you must get that ticket, Danny. You weigh the odds and decide your chances. You walk up the flight of stairs to the second floor, and down the hall to 214, Keller's room. When you reach there, you're surprised to find his door half open. You enter cautiously. Sailor. Hey, sailor. He's <laughs> creeping like a baby. That's great. Uh-huh. Here are the tickets. Now, let's see. Now, wait a minute. 3303 is missing. Winning tickets gone. Francie. Francie, she beat me here. That's why that door was open. It has to be Francie, doesn't it, Danny? Yes, the girl in the bar last night. It's the middle of the afternoon before you finally find out where she stays and stop by her apartment. Lottery tickets? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, no, you wouldn't. You packing, Francie? Huh? Going somewhere? Well, yeah, I got a new engagement. I'm being booked into San Francisco. Oh, sure. It's funny, you know, I'm heading that way myself. Yeah? Oh, well, well, look here, Francie. Right on top of your pretty things. All this money. Okay, well, all right. So, so I cash Keller's ticket. Look, we can split it. I took it from Keller, sold it to my boss for $30,000. Uh, so I see. Thanks for cashing it for me, Francie. $30,000 will take me quite a distance. Hey, but you... Oh, poor old sailor. You wouldn't believe me about the odds, would he? Never mind the sailor. He'll sleep all day. Well, look, Danny, don't take it all. Leave me some of that money. After all, I was... Some... Yeah? Who is it? Me, Francie. Sailor Keller. Open up. I want to talk to you. Keller, what do we do? Shh, shh, come on, Francie. If you don't open this door, I'll blast the lock. He, he's got a gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Francie, I'm giving you exactly ten seconds. No more. When Milady gets spring fever, out she goes and buys a new hat to perk up her spirits. Wouldn't you like to be able to perk up your car's spirits that easily in spring? Well, you can, friend, you can. Simply by treating your car to a tank full of the famous Go Farther gasoline. Signal, that is. Aha, you say you thought mileage is the thing signal gasoline is famous for. You're so right. But that's only half the story. The other half is what makes Signal deliver such good mileage. Namely, Signal helps your engine run so efficiently you save gasoline. Well, when your engine runs that efficiently, naturally you also notice quick starting, peppy pickup, smooth, obedient power, the very things that make driving more fun. That's why Signal says performance and mileage are like birds of a feather. They go together. No need to choose between driving pleasure and economy. Get both by powering your car with the famous Go Farther gasoline. Fill up next time at a signal service station. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with Go Farther gasoline. Well, Danny, it was a frightening moment, wasn't it? Trapped in that Panama City hotel room with a furious armed man on the opposite side of the door. The odds were poor then, weren't they? But the window and the fire escape gave you a way out. Once you've given Keller the slip, you hurry to the airport, make airplane reservations for Mexico City under your own name of Dan Atkins to throw Sailor Keller off your trail. At midnight, you take passage on a slow freighter for San Francisco, where you arrive three days later. Once there, you relax. Begin to enjoy yourself with Keller's money. You replenish your wardrobe, buy a new sports model car, and start driving north. The odds you always figure seem definitely in your favor, don't they? With little chance of Keller finding you in your old hometown of Trent City. When you arrive there, you pull in at a gas station. Yes, sir. Fill her up. Hello, Jack. Well, what do you know, Danny Atkins? Hey, welcome home. 
You here to stay? Uh, maybe. Uh, nothing like the old hometown, Danny. Yeah, looks good to me, Chuck. <laughs> nothing changed much, has it? Nah, the old gang's still around, too. Most of them married now, though. Freddie, Bert, Marilyn. Yeah? Just about all of them, I guess. Except Diane. <laughs> Remember her? Diane Johnson? Oh, she was just a kid out of high school. But my, how she's grown. Why don't you look her up? Yeah, maybe I will. You notice that new ranch house on the left as you came into town just past the bridge? Yeah, I did. A lot of class. I was wondering... The old who... man built the place last summer. Some huh? of that mining property you owned up there in the hills paid off. You're kidding. No. Nope. Looks like maybe it was a mistake for you to leave town, Danny. He always wanted you to go into business with him. Yeah, I know. Uh, still playing the odds, Danny? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. What are the odds in you staying on here? Oh, right now, Chuck, they, uh, they look pretty good. <laughs> After you leave Chuck, you register at the local hotel and cruise about town. Your old friends are glad to see you, aren't they, Dan? Yes. And you can tell they're impressed. Your new car, the fine cut of your clothes. You spend two or three days enjoying yourself, renewing old acquaintances. And then one afternoon, you drive to the large ranch house near the bridge, the Johnson place. Danny Atkins. How are you, son? Hello, Mr. Johnson. Well, I'm glad to see you. I heard you were in town. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're looking fine, Danny. Fine. Oh, thank you, sir. From what I've heard from the folks around town, you seem to have done pretty well for yourself. Oh, I've heard the same about you, Mr. Johnson. Oh, I've been lucky, I guess. <laughs> I've been lucky, too. Oh, I know better than that, Danny. It's more than luck with you. Good common horse sense, that's what it is. You figure things out. Your dad was like that. Oh, Diane. Yes, sir. Come here, honey. I, uh... I haven't told her you were in town. Wanted to be a surprise. Wait till you see the look on her face. What is it, Daddy? What's happening? Daddy. Oh, Daddy. You stare at her, don't you, Daddy? Unable to believe what you see. She has changed, hasn't she? Yes, you'd hardly recognize her from the gangling schoolgirl in the blue jeans and plaid shirt you knew years ago. She's really beautiful, isn't she? After you recover from the surprise, the three of you settle down in the den for a pleasant chat. You stay on for dinner. Through it all, you find you can't keep your eyes off of Diane, can you, Dan? And later, the two of you go for a walk along the quiet, tree-lined street. Ah, it's wonderful having you back here, Danny. Oh, it's good to be back. You know, I've missed all this, the old town, old friends. Well, we haven't had much time to talk about them, have we? <laughs> With Dad monopolizing the conversation. <laughs> I hope he didn't bore you at dinner. Oh, of course not. I suppose you know what's on his mind. Do I? He still wants you to join the firm. <laughs> Danny, when he does ask you, think it over carefully before giving your answer. It would mean a lot to him. And to you? Oh, yes. <sighs> to me, too, Danny. It becomes quite clear to you in the days that follow, the hours you spend with Diane, that your friend Chuck was right then. Yes, the schoolgirl crush she had on you hasn't left her, has it? Only it's more than that now. She's very much in love with you, isn't she? And then early one evening, the two of you drive down to San Francisco and have dinner at a fashionable hotel. You're having a good time, Diane. Mm, of course. But you still haven't told me what this is all about. Are we celebrating something? Yes. I am in your father's firm. What? Danny, <laughs> Danny, that's wonderful. Dad didn't say. I wanted to be the one to tell you, darling. Oh, Danny, I'm just so happy about this. I, I just don't know what to say. Well, you could say yes when I asked you to marry me. Well? Let's go out on the terrace, darling. I think little Diane is going to burst into tears. It's all working out just the way you've planned it, isn't it, Dan? And you're looking ahead, aren't you? The day of Mr. Johnson's death, Diane will inherit his interest in the company. And she'll be your wife. You'll control it all. <laughs> The 
following morning, you accompany your future father-in-law into the hills to look over his newest project, the abandoned Crofton Mine. You catalog each item in your mind. Listen to Mr. Johnson's suggestion. And then you have some of your own to offer. Seems pleased. Son, I go along with those ideas of yours 100%. A lot of angles there I hadn't figured on. Oh, Mr. Johnson, one more thing. About that double cable running from the mine entrance here across the river to uh, the road on the other side. Well, they're pretty worn out and rusty, aren't they? Well, I've already taken care of that, Danny. Going to have the boys put in a couple of new cables. Well, why? Like I said, they're all rusty. They won't hold well, up. I mean, why Why use the cables at all? Well, how else are we going to haul the stuff we take out of the mine here to the tracks across we the river? We don't have to cross the river, Mr. Johnson. If we build a road from the main entrance to the new highway a few miles down, trucks could drive from the highway here to the mine on this side. We, we could load them on this side. Forget about the river. Well, it cost a little money, wouldn't it? Yeah, but uh, it'd be worth it in the long run, considering the time save. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it worth that. Doggone it, Danny, that's what I mean. Something as simple as this staring me right in the face and I don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a little figuring, Mr. Johnson. That's all. Plans for the reopening of the old Crofton mine run smoothly in the next few days, don't they, Danny? And you find more and more time to spend with Diane. And then one night something happens that you hadn't counted on. You drop Diane off at her house after a date. Walk back towards your car. Hello, Danny boy. Kill her! Get in. Yeah, your sailor friend. What odds were you giving that I wouldn't find you? Look, I... Um, how, how did you find me? That baseball picture you showed me in the barn. You forgot it showed your high school in the background. Trent City High. Or maybe you thought I was too high to notice it. Danny, I want my dough. All of it. You don't think I carry it around with me, do you? Then we'll trot on down to the bank in the morning and get it. I, I don't have it. I, uh... I've invested it. You know, I was afraid of that, Danny boy. I heard around town that you'd gone into some business deal with a gent named Johnson. Okay. So get it back. Get it Get it back. That's impossible right now. A, a few months, maybe. I can't wait that long. I'll give you a couple of days. The dough or else. Or else you'll plug me with that rod, huh? What good is that? Oh, I wouldn't plug you, Danny. Unless I had to. No. Well, then what? The hometown folks might be surprised to learn how you got that dough. That little chick you've been running around with. Old man Johnson, all your pals. Oh, it's your word against mine. So if you didn't cop the dough, where and how did you get it? They might like to know. But look, Keller, you, you'll get your money. Sure I will. One way or another. But how do I know you won't tell them anyway? You're good at laying odds. Suppose you figure that one out. There's little sleep for you that night, Danny, because of Keller and the threat he holds over you. He could ruin everything for you, couldn't he? And the odds are that he will unless you stop him, silence him. The dangerous step to take, isn't it? One you must think over carefully, weigh the facts, the odds. You've made up your mind what to do when he calls you two nights later. You arrange to meet him on a quiet road just outside of town. He's standing by his car waiting for you when you walk by. Right on time, Danny boy. That's fine. Uh, what's in the shoebox? You wanted cash, didn't you? Yeah. Hold still. I want to make sure you... I, I don't have a gun. I'll decide that. No? No gun. All right, now, how about putting yours away? Makes me nervous. Sure. Why not? Okay, let's have the dough. Open the box. The moment he slips his gun into his pocket, you open the shoebox. And your hand closes over the 38 you've hidden inside. <laughs> Kelly staggers forward as he's hit. The brief struggle. His hands close around your throat. You pull away. Then he falls back and slumps to the ground. You stare at him for a moment. And suddenly you're aware that a car is approaching. You dive into the ditch. A truck, Danny. 
loaded with townspeople coming home from the barn dance at Fondale. And you recognize the voice of your friend Chuck. Hey, hey, there's been an accident. Yeah. Well, uh, let's have a look. Huh? Let's go on. Hey! This guy's been shot, Chuck. He's dead. Yeah. They better go for the police, Jimmy. All right. The rest of us stay here. Wait. What's this in his hand? Part of somebody's shirt collar. Your hand goes to your collar. You realize for the first time that in the struggle, Keller ripped a good part of your shirt collar away. And if you're caught, it will be easy to prove the torn collar in Keller's hand came from your shirt. The odds against you have mounted fast, haven't they, Danny? You decide you've got to make a run for it. There's nothing else you can do. Hey, look! Look over there! Somebody running across the field! Hey, hey maybe that's the killer! Let's get him, you guys! Come on! They're not far behind as you approach the foothills, are they, Danny? And then as you reach the river, you know you're trapped. There's no way to get across. But then suddenly you remember. Yes, the mine cable stretching across the river, not far downstream. A few minutes later, you reach them. What are the odds now, Danny? The cables are eaten by rust, and it's a long way across, isn't it? A rushing river below. You make it to the other side, you'll be safe. You stay here, the chances are you'll be caught. You weigh the odds carefully, don't you, Danny? It's a matter of timing. And even if the cables do break and you fall into the river, you're a good swimmer. And you're certain you can make the other side. And then... I tell you, I'm sure he came up this way. Well, he isn't here. Did you get a good look at him? No, it's too dark. He probably headed downstream toward the bridge, the only way across. Yeah. Hey, hey but wait a minute. I, I just happened to think of something. What about those cable lines leading across the river? They're around here someplace, aren't they? Well, yeah, sure. But a guy would be a sap to try it. Hand over hand, more than 50 yards. Uh -uh. Yeah, I guess you're right. He wouldn't try it. Come on. Yeah. Oh, wouldn't I try it, Chuck? Wouldn't I? <laughs> Time to change. Time to change. Yes, it's time to change, says that sign outside Signal Station. Time to drain tired out old winter motor oil. Time to refill with fresh, clean Signal Premium motor oil. The new heavy-duty Signal oil that reduces engine wear 50%. Think what a 50% reduction in engine wear means to your wallet and your car's performance. Engines not only keep that new car pep and power twice as long, they also run twice as far between overhauls because new Signal Premium Heavy Duty does so much more than just lubricate. In addition, it cools, cleans, cushions, seals, and protects. No wonder so many motorists who want to protect their car are changing this spring to new Signal Premium Heavy Duty motor oil. Changing at Signal Station, where you see that sign outside. Time to change. Time to change. Time to change. A small group of townspeople, shocked by the news of the tragedy, had gathered at the river's edge just below the Crofton Mine. High above them at the mine entrance stood Sheriff Delsing and Mr. Johnson, surveying the scene in stunned silence. Presently, the two men approached the edge of the cliff. The sheriff pointed toward the opposite shore. Well, that's where Danny fell, mm -hmm. right out there on the rocks. I just don't understand this at all, Sheriff. I don't understand why he was on those cables. Well, there's lots of things I don't understand about this either. One thing I'm pretty sure of, though. What's that? Well, according to where he fell, he must have been about a third of the way across when that first cable snapped. I guess he knew the other cable wouldn't hold his weight very long either. It's too bad. That second cable had broken a few feet further in either direction. He'd have landed in the river instead of on those rocks. Mm -hmm. Probably be alive now. Yep. Yeah, I can just see Danny. Up there in that cable. He's got a quick decision to make. Keep going or turn back. <laughs> you know how Danny was about decisions. Yeah, the odds. Always thinking about the odds. I guess this time he took just a little too long to figure them out.
Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the whistler, Lamont Johnson, G.G. Pearson, Tom Tully, Bob Bruce, Bill Boucher, and John Shea. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Adrian John Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at the same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for The Signal Oil Company. now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty... You always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, transcribed by the Signal Oil Company to enable the entire production staff of The Whistler to enjoy a summer vacation. Signal, the famous Go Farther Gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Man in the Way. It was night, but even with the protection of darkness, Max Tyler crouched low on the apartment house fire escape. He was tense, alert, ready to run. And suddenly it happened. A window thrown up, an angry shout. Hey, what are you doing? Leaving. Come back here. Tell him. Tell him there was someone out there. Watch it. Wait, you. Wait. <laughs> Wilson? Yes, who is this? It's Max Tyler, Mrs. Wilson. I'm afraid I don't have anything definite for you yet. I, uh, I ran into a snag on the case. But don't you worry. I'll have something for you soon. Oh, uh, look, Mr. Tyler, I'd rather you didn't. I, uh, I've changed my mind. I don't want you to do anything. Anything at all. Oh, but, uh, wait a minute, Mrs. Wilson. What about my fee? You already have it, Mr. Tyler. As much as I'm going to give you. But... I told you. I no longer need your service. Good day, Mr. Tyler. Thank you. 
A phone click and Max Tyler, private detective, isn't talking to anybody anymore. You can guess what's happened too, can't you, Max? Yes, the suspicious wife in the case has done a better job of detecting than you have. And you're through. Another phone number that you can forget. There's only one phone number that you can count on anymore, isn't there, Max? You find yourself writing that special number on your desk pad, thinking that it deserves to be framed. The magic combination of numbers that means your girl. You reach to dial her number and stop as the door to your office opens. Well, hello. Hello. Mr. Max Tyler? Yes, that's right. Can I... can I do something for you? I hope so. I can pay you quite well. For doing what? A simple job. For you. One that I'm sure you're most familiar with. Mm-hmm. I think I get the picture. Do you know who she is? No. I'm not even sure there is a she. There's always a she. I mean, when things get this far. What do you mean, this far? Far enough for you to search out a private detective, tell your husband. That's it, isn't it? You'll do it. It's not the kind of work I like to take. I'm able to afford the kind of fee I'm sure you'd like to take. <laughs> that can make a difference. One hundred dollars a day. That's double what I understand is the customary reimbursement for a service of this sort. Plus expenses. And they sometimes run high. Plus expenses. One hundred in advance. Where do you live? What's your husband's name? And where does he work? The name is Townsend, Bradley Townsend. Our address is 12 Wickton Drive. My husband doesn't exactly work any place. I mean, he has some interests, some investments and so forth. Looks to me like he does pretty well. Or do you have a friend who raises mink and uh, money trees? I have my own money. My income is larger than my husband's. Considerably larger. I get it. What you mean is your husband's investing is done with your dough. That isn't important. It is if you're buying mink to look good on somebody else. My husband doesn't have access to that kind of money without my knowledge. I see. You kept a tight grip on the purse strings, only now he's double-crossed you by letting go of the apron strings, huh? You always know where your money goes, but you don't always know where your husband goes, and that's where I come in. Well, you put it rather crudely, but I can see you comprehend the situation. Yeah, sure, I get the picture. What more do you need to know? Oh, a few minor details, like what does he look like, what kind of car does he drive, the license number, when does he come home, and when doesn't he come home? Well, he usually drives our town car. It's a Cadillac. Black. License number H2N843. He's quite handsome. Very. His face is youthful. Tan. Brown eyes, black hair. He's old enough to have gray hair. He dresses very well in good taste. Tweeds and Oxford greys. And up to now, he could do no wrong. You're just plain crazy about this guy you bought, aren't you, baby? You get the picture. Just plain crazy. And just plain scared you can't keep him. Just plain scared I've already lost him. Mm. You asked one other thing. When does he come home? Well, the answer is that lately he doesn't. I mean, not really. When he comes, he never stays. He only comes home to change from the tweeds to the Oxford Gray. After I find out who she is, then what? Then you get paid. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay with me, Mrs. Townsend. You buy the ticket, and I take $100 a day tour into your husband's private life. Oh, and uh, don't try to reach me at any time. I'll contact you. Anything you say? Find out who she is and where she is. Good night. Just a minute. Yes? Your handbag. I have it. That's just what I mean. I think it could be in safer hands. When it comes to money, Mrs. Townsend, I'm sure you know exactly what you're doing. But when you start carrying something else around in your purse, you're liable to get into trouble that money can't get you out of. You better let me have that gun. That's better. <laughs> Mrs. Townsend meant business, didn't she, Max? 
But you want to keep your client out of trouble. And so now the gun she carried is in your pocket, out of harm's way. And you're ready to start a day's work, or rather, a night's. You go to Townsend's residence at the address Mrs. Townsend gave you. Wait quietly outside. And soon the man who is nothing but a description in your notebook appears. You follow as he drives away in the big black Cadillac with a license number you jotted down. The trail leads to a nightclub downtown. Park. And then wait. And then follow Mr. Bradley Townsend inside and casually approach the mater d. Hey, good evening, sir. Your pleasure? Um, could I have that table right over there? The one just across from the gentleman being seated? Certainly, sir. One moment. A oh, Chris. Yes, sir. Table five for this gentleman. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You sit quietly, studying your prey. He fits his wife's description, doesn't he, Mac? Youthful somehow, tanned and handsome. Tonight his tweeds have been exchanged for an expensively tailored dinner jacket. You can understand why Mrs. Townsend would worry whenever he was out of her sight. You wish to order now, sir? Uh, just another drink, waiter. The same. Right away, sir. You look around and notice that more than one woman in the room has her eyes fastened on Bradley Townsend. And then you notice his expression. Realize that the woman he is waiting for has entered the room. You turn slowly, following the line of Townsend's gaze. And then feel your fist clenching tight. And your other hand brings your drink down sharply on the tabletop. What is it, sir? Of all the women in the world, he has to choose mine. Mine! Mine! Something wrong, sir? What? I said, uh, is there something wrong, sir? Is there anything I can do? No. Yes. Not you or anybody. It's just something for me to do. You know, friends, in addition to being summer, this is also the time of year when more and more drivers switch to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Vacation-minded folks just naturally go for Signal's good mileage. But mileage, mind you, is only half of Signal's story. Just you talk with a few Signal customers, and you'll find they're equally enthusiastic about Signal's performance. After all, in order to give you such good mileage, today's Signal gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you also enjoy quick starting, proud pickup, and smooth, purring power. The things that make driving a real pleasure. So to get the most out of your vacation travel dollars, make the friendly signal stations you'll find throughout the seven western states your headquarters for happy mileage. And even if you're not planning a vacation trip, well, any time is a good time to power your car with signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, will go by the gasoline. It's a terrible shock, isn't it, Max? Seeing the man you were hired to follow in the company of the girl you love. You've never liked surprises, and this one is almost too much to bear, isn't it? You leave the nightclub, wait outside, your mind spinning with hate and confusion. Then you leave and drive to the apartment building where Barbara lives and go straight to her apartment on the second floor. You take your key ring from your pocket and select one of the most important tools of your trade, a master key and quietly open a door. Then close it carefully after you enter. You walk across the living room to the leather Davenport near the window. Finally, after what seems like hours, you hear a key in the door. Here we are. Had a wonderful time, Brad. Glad you did. Barbara. Yes? You're a very beautiful woman. You know that. Do I? Come here. It's 
early yet, Brad. You can stay a while. Wait, I'll turn on the light. Thanks, baby, for turning on the light. I can take a better aim. Hello, Mr. Bradley Townsend. Back. Hello, and goodbye. Max, you've killed him. Are you crazy? Only about you, Barbara. What are you going to do now? That depends on you. Suppose you tell me. What are you going to do now? Max, you, you know how it is with us. The same. It'll always be the same. And him? Where did he fit into the picture? Well, the, the only place you don't. He, he took me to nice places, bought me nice presents. He sounds real nice. I guess maybe he was. I... I, I really didn't notice. You're not a nice guy, Max, but you're for me. What are you trying to say? I'm saying it. I'll go all the way with you, Max. Even if it's murder. There isn't any if, baby. This is murder. Tell me what you want me to do. I gotta play it dumb. That means you gotta play it smart. And I gotta trust you. Up to a point, at least. Like, say, the point of a gun. I mean what I said, Max. Every word of it. A girl always means what she says. When she says it. I'm not just a girl, Max. I'm your girl. Remember? There's never been anything wrong with my memory. From now on, just make sure that yours stays in working order. What are you doing? Checking Mr. Bradley Townsend's identification. Real money. Quite a wad. Considering the story I got from the little woman. You've met his wife? She's my client. She hired me to find out about you. I'm sorry, Max. That was rough. Too late for tears, baby. Things could get rougher now, but not if you stick by me and not if we play it smart. Listen, baby. I'm keeping this money. It's no use to him now, and she's got plenty more where this came from, so I'm playing finder's keepers. When all this is over, I'll supply those nice things you seem to want so badly. You going to make this look like robbery? It's going to look exactly like what it could have been. Murder. Motive jealousy. I'll leave enough dough on him to make it look good. And I'll also leave this. The biggest, fattest clue a cop could ask for. Your gun? It's Mrs. Townsend's gun. Oh. And that's how it's going to be. That's how it was, baby, and don't forget it. I'm sorry this happened to him, but if anything ever happened to you, Max, I don't think I could stand it. And if it's up to me, nothing's going to happen to you. Then that's the way I leave it, baby. Up to you. <laughs> It's a bad situation, isn't it, Max? Having to depend on a girl who has already double-crossed you. But there is something on your side. Barbara knows you mean business. She can't help but know that after having seen you kill. Quickly, you rehearse her in the parts of the story that she can tell. A story you're certain will hold up if Barbara maintains it. You make her repeat it over and over and over again. Then, as she calls the police in response to your instructions, you hurry downstairs, slip out a back door of the apartment. The following day finds you in the office of Lieutenant Carter of Homicide. Your visit is voluntary. So is the information you provide. Well, that's the way I figured it, Lieutenant, but uh, maybe I could be of some help to you on this case. Yeah, maybe you can. Only aren't you playing this a little out of character, Tyler? The way I remember it, you've got no use for police routine. How come this time you're asking for it? I'm not asking for anything, Lieutenant. This time I've got something to give. You can take it or leave it. Doesn't make any difference to me. Oh, we'll take it, Max. For whatever it's worth. I've only got facts to offer. Number one, that Mrs. Bradley Townsend was a client of mine. Number two, that she was jealous of her husband. And number three, that when she came to my office, she had a gun in her possession. Those are the facts. You can add them up for yourself. Oh, not yet. Not until I have them all. Yes, sir? Uh, bring Mrs. Townsend in, please. Yeah, perhaps your client can supply some of those missing facts. You think so, Tanner? Perhaps. If you know a fact when you see one. Hmm. Isn't it sometimes hard to tell when you start asking somebody who might be the murderer? It's police routine to sort out the facts after we get them. And as for who we get them from, why, anybody might be the murderer, Max. In a homicide case, everybody is suspect. 
That's routine, too. Uh, hello, Mrs. Townsend. Won't you sit down? Thank you, Lieutenant. You know Mr. Tyler here? Yes, I know him. Now, Mrs. Townsend, what I would like you to do is to start at the beginning again and tell me your whole story. Oh, but I already have. I've told you all that I can. You insist you did not kill your husband. I could not kill my husband. I didn't even know where this this Barbara Allen lived. Now, Barbara Allen claims you were hiding in her apartment when she and your husband returned from a nightclub. That you shot him deliberately as soon as she turned on the light. How could I have gotten into her apartment without a key? Oh, I don't know. But there are many ways. Maybe Miss Allen left the door open when she went out. Maybe you happen to have a key that fit. There's lots of ways. Why would Miss Allen say you did it if you didn't? I don't know. Now, that's the statement of an eyewitness, Mrs. Townsend. You admit you were jealous of your husband. You admit he was killed with your gun. I admit, as you put it, to everything that is the truth. I told you about the gun. It's mine. But it was taken away from me. By Mr. Tyler. Oh. Well, thank you, Mr. Townsend. That'll be all for now. Sergeant, you show Mrs. Townsend out. Hmm. I'm certainly sorry this happened, Lieutenant. Maybe if I'd been called in on the case earlier, I mean, if Mrs. Townsend had come to me sooner, maybe I could have stopped her. Stopped her from what? Why, from killing her husband. That's what you're saying she did, isn't it? Oh, maybe that's what I'm saying, but what she's saying is she didn't. So that makes us only even. Well, then you've got no real proof against her. Maybe, maybe not. I've got this gun. She says it's hers. Ballistic says it killed her husband. And? Well, you heard her. She says something else. She says you took the gun away from her before it killed her husband. I should have. I wish now that I had, but I didn't. Well, go on. Well, when she came to my office to hire me to tailor her husband, I saw she had a gun in her handbag. I told her guns had a way of getting people into trouble they couldn't get out of. I said she'd better give me the gun, but she didn't. She gave me a promise instead. What was the promise? She promised to leave her husband up to me. So you let her keep the gun? Yeah, it looks like that was my mistake. Oh, it looks like it was hers. Maybe. Maybe? Well, she says you took her gun. You say you didn't. We're still only even. I see. I'm glad you do. After I talk with our eyewitness, Barbara Allen, again, maybe I'll see, too. Okay, Lieutenant. When you do come up with all the answers, let me know, will you? Now that I find out I'm considered a suspect in the case, I'm more interested in it than ever. Well, don't you worry, Tyler. You'll hear from me. The lieutenant's not satisfied to have an open and shut case, is he, Max? You're sure he's out to polish his badge with a little personal glory. He probably figures if he doesn't do everything the hard way, he'll be labeled a dumb cop. And to you, that's just what he is, isn't he, Max? He represents the very thing that kept you from becoming a regular cop on the force. Police routine. The monotonous study, the ceaseless probing... The repetitious, unrewarding duty of police routine. You only hope that your sweetheart, Barbara Allen, will understand this attacking mechanism of police routine and be equipped to withstand its many masked maneuvers. Hello? Tyler? Oh, that's right, Lieutenant. Found any new answers to the Townsend case? Looks like the case is closed, so far as I'm concerned. Well, what do you mean? I mean, it's going to be up to a judge and jury from here on in. And it doesn't look too good for Mrs. Townsend. And there's an eyewitness who'll swear to the crime. It sort of puts a suspect's back against the wall. The eyewitness's story sealed up the case for you? Yeah, it looks that way. Townsend's girlfriend is in the clear. And so, incidentally, are you. Well, thanks. That's nice to know. I'll be seeing you, Lieutenant. <laughs> summer, when you start off on your vacation trip, it'll be mighty handy to have a good map in your car. And there's no map handier than the free one you'll find at signal service stations. No need to squint to find where you're going on a signal map. They're jumbo size for quick, easy reading. And no need to wrestle with them, getting them open or folded again. 
signal maps have the latest accordion fold for more convenient handling. But that's only the beginning. In addition, signal maps contain a guide to interesting places to visit, plus a traveler's radio guide, so you can follow your favorite programs as you travel, plus enlarged sections of metropolitan areas. And if you happen to need a street map to guide you in the larger cities of the Pacific Coast states, signal stations have them free, too. In fact, whether you need a free map, some helpful advice, or a tank full of the famous go-farther gasoline, you'll find that friendly, independently operated signal stations have just about everything it takes to make your vacation driving or your everyday driving more pleasant. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with no other gasoline. Yes, Max, things look good, don't they? The way you have it figured, you've a full house. You have your girl, your freedom, and a well-fed wallet, thanks to the late Mr. Bradley Townsend. So here in the safety and seclusion of your office, you take out the crisp new bills to feast your eyes on them. And in your preoccupation, you fail to hear your office door open. King was in his counting house counting out his money. Hello, Tyler. What's the matter, Lieutenant? You got such tender knuckles you can't knock on a door? Yeah, wait a minute, Max. Leave the money on the desk. Nothing's going to happen to it with a cop in the room. I figure the cop's not going to stay long. Uh-huh. Look here, Lieutenant. You've got no right to come busting into a private office and keep your hands off my door. Now, what's worrying you? Don't private gumshoes come by their money honestly? Yeah. Of course, I had no idea business was so good in your line. What's that crack for? No crack, Max. <laughs> hey, how about fixing us both a drink? It looks like you got some good stuff there. Help yourself. Oh, thank you. We'll toast the wind-up of the Townsend case. That's okay with me. I'm tired of it. Of course, in the Townsend case, you didn't exactly earn your dough, did you? What I mean is you said you never did get on Townsend's trail before he met his untimely end. I'd just been called in on the case. I hadn't had a chance to even get a line on the guy yet. Well, like I said, you didn't exactly earn your dough this time. Just what are you getting at, Lieutenant? Cherchez la femme, Max. And that means you never did find the woman, either. The doll that Bradley Townsend was double-crossing his wife for, that right? That's right. Yeah. I didn't even have the chance to get a line on Townsend, so how could I find the girl? Why don't you just get to the point, Lieutenant? What's up? All right, Tyler, I'll explain it to you. I think you already know that when a dumb cop goes on a case, it's routine to check every angle. Even when a big clue stares him right in the face, like Mrs. Townsend's gun. Or even when he's got a convenient eyewitness, like Miss Barbara Allen. So? Well, this case was no different. I follow routine. I check every angle, including every line I can get on you. You won't find anything on me. <laughs> I already found it. What do you mean? I tell you my slate's clean. Is it? Now, Max, if you never knew Bradley Townsend's girlfriend, how come you knew her telephone number? I didn't. I think you did. You wrote it down. Wrote it? Look, Lieutenant, you can't pin anything on me. You can't prove I knew that number. Oh, yes, I can. I admit it might be tough, Max, almost like magic, but I can do it even if I have to do it with mirrors. What are you talking about? On your desk here, you wrote down the number. You're guessing, Lieutenant. I write down lots of numbers, but I always throw them away. Ah, yes, but this time you made a mistake, Max. Before you threw this one away, you blotted that number on your desk blotter, you see? My blot... Barbara's phone number. Yeah, Barbara's phone number a dozen times. Sort of says your own number is up. Right, Mac? Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life. 
possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Les Tremaine, Alice Reinhardt, Joe Gilbert, Larry Dobkin, and Herbert Litton. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Shirley Gordon, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transcribed and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Night Flight. It was early evening, but the man sitting in the corner booth with Kelly Owen had entered the hotel cocktail lounge in the early afternoon, and he was beginning to show it. He'd taken a liking to Kelly when he found out that he, too, was a flyer. As for Kelly, he wasn't in a mood for liking anyone. But his present situation of unemployment made him more than mildly interested in what the stranger had to say. You even find yourself willing to gamble a bit, don't you, Kelly? Spend part of the few dollars in your pocket on more drinks in the hope that you'll pick up some profitable information. Hey, Tokyo. <laughs> Have I ever made that hop? <laughs> Pal, I've flown freight back and forth across the Pacific so many times I think I can swim a load over on my back. <laughs> Here you are, gentlemen. One oh, straight yeah. bourbon and one scotch and soda. I swell. It's, uh... it's a dollar thirteen. I get this one, Sam. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you, sir. Hey, wait, hey, wait a minute. What'd you do that for? I told you old Sam had hit the jackpot. All right, skip it. Ollie, uh, uh, you, you didn't finish telling me, Sam, something about a private deal? <laughs> I, 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 I can't tell you everything, pal. It's too important. Yeah? Hush, hush, understand? <laughs> important passenger. Big. Oh, that's it, huh? Well, a big fare is nice, Sam, but not like what you were talking about. Not, not enough to retire on. I think not, huh? <laughs> Don't you think 25 G's go pretty far, don't you? 25,000? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sam, who do you know that's taking a private trip around the world? I don't know. And they don't know me. That's why you ain't going to know me either. Nobody is. All right, Sam. Yeah, sir. Talking too much. 
Ooh. I don't feel so good. Had a lot to drink. Uh, you sure have. Hey, look, I, uh, I gotta go upstairs, see, to my room, pal. I gotta sleep it off. I can't, can't fly no plane like this. <laughs> the way you are, you can fly without a plane. Yeah. <laughs> you are, Sam. Help yeah, you upstairs. Sure, yeah. <sighs> Thanks, thanks. Oh, hey, 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 you you tell the desk clerk for me, will you, huh? I go, go, go. Tell, tell him what? Yeah, you to call me about uh, about 10 o'clock. They're, they're picking me up here in a car. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. I'll tell him. Uh, come on upstairs. Yeah, that's you know, it looks so good. It sounded interesting, didn't it, Kelly? $25,000, Sam said and something about it being his payment for flying an important passenger somewhere, but all too vague to be of any use to a man in your position. By the time you help Sam upstairs to his room, lay him on the bed, he's fallen into a deep sleep. And instead of 25000 you're thinking of the dollar thirty you spent, aren't you? A dollar thirty that might have gone towards a better hotel room for the night. And then you think of something else. Yes. You're helping yourself to the contents of Sam's wallet as the phone near the bed rings. Sam stirs restlessly, and you lift the receiver quickly to prevent waking him. Mr. Ledford? Hello? Mr. Ledford, there's someone here to see you. Mr. Ledford? Someone here to see you. The words flash across your mind, don't they, Kelly? And you recall something that Sam said downstairs in the bar. I don't know him, he said. They don't know me. But it wasn't until 10 o'clock that the somebody was to meet Sam in the lobby. Was it, Kelly? Mr. Ledford? Mr. Ledford? Why don't you answer? Uh, hello? Oh, Mr. Ledford, there's someone waiting for you in the lobby. Should I tell the lady to come up? Uh, no, no, no. I'll tell the lady that, uh, that Sam Ledford will be right down. Yes, sir. <laughs> It's a chance, isn't it, Kelly? A chance you've decided to take. And with Sam Ledford's wallet, identification, and pilot's license in your coat pocket, you let yourself out of his room and go downstairs. There's a girl in the lobby, a dark-haired, very attractive girl. She's alone, waiting impatiently. Miss, uh, Miss Martin? Yes? You wanted Sam Ledford? And supposing I did? Well, uh... You don't have to look any further. Oh, well, I I didn't realize. That's okay. I suppose you're ready, Sam. Oh, I didn't expect anybody until uh, 10 (laughs) o'clock. Well, that's right. Well, um, quite frankly, when I talked to you on the telephone, you sounded like you just might be in the mood for too much celebrating, but... um... Is that so? (laughs) Yes. That's why I came earlier, Sam. I know $10,000 is something to celebrate, but... You're an uh, awful little there, aren't you, Miss Martin? I understood I got 25000 for this job. <laughs> All right, Sam, so we won't bargain anymore. Not at this late date. Okay. You, uh, you won't mind leaving now, though? Anything you say, Miss Martin, now, later, you're running it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad we understand each other. All right, Sam, there's a cab outside. Wait for me. I've got one quick call to make. Uh, wait in the cab. Okay, Miss Martin. You... you won't be long, will you? No, Sam, I won't be long. You've a nervous, uncertain feeling inside, haven't you, Kelly? Miss Martin seems to have accepted you as Sam Ledford. But walking out to the taxi cab parked in front of the hotel, you wonder about her reference to a quick call. Wonder if perhaps the call is in some sort of a checkup with whoever made the original arrangements with the real Sam Ledford. But there's nothing to do but sweat it out, is there, Kelly? Play it close and careful for the biggest payoff you've ever gambled on. Ten minutes later, Miss Martin comes out, slips into the cab beside you. Everything uh, all right? Yes, Sam. Everything's fine. Know where we're heading now? <laughs> Like I said, uh, you're running this. (laughs) (laughs) Sam, I think we're going to get along perfectly. Driver, the airport, please. (laughs) 
You understand everything now, Sam. I think so. Be sure you rent at least a three-place ship and make certain of the fuel. You, uh, you haven't uh, told me yet exactly how far we're... <laughs> Never mind. I'll tell you that part after we're in the air. <laughs> Check. You're not coming with me? I'll wait here till you get the plane. Tell them you want it for a sightseeing hop over the city. Tell them I'm the girlfriend. The girlfriend, huh? Okay. It's going almost too well, isn't it, Kelly? Thela Martin is a warm, exciting girl. And the thought of $25,000 isn't exactly chilly. But you are nervous over what's just ahead, aren't you? The renting of the plane in Sam Ledford's name. It has to be done that way, just in case Thela should check at the last minute. You cross toward one of the rental hangars, hoping whoever's in charge doesn't know you or Sam Ledford. But nothing goes wrong. And 20 minutes later, you escort Thela from the cab to the warm-up apron, where a mechanic is readying a trim Fairchild job. You help Thela into the front seat. You step back as the mechanic finishes the warm-up. Nice clear night for sightseeing, hot miss. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks, I'm sure I will. You're in good hands, all right. Understand Sam Ledford's taking you up. Yes, that's right. You freeze at the mechanic's words, leap back toward the tail of the ship, trying to avoid him. Thela can't see either of you, can she, Kelly? But the mechanic is waiting between you and the door to the ship. Then in absolute desperation... Hey! Yeah? Isn't there something wrong with this tail assembly? Wrong? I don't think so, Mr. Ledford. We just... Hey, what is this? You're not Mr. Mr. Ledford. Sorry, pal, but I got a date with 25,000 bucks. And nobody's getting in my way. I'm sure, friends, you're glad that although this is the season when so many popular shows go off the air for the summer, there'll be no vacation for the Whistler program. Thanks to your loyalty to The Whistler, which has made this the most popular West Coast program in radio history, plus your loyalty to Signal Dealers, which made this last year the greatest year in Signal history. Signal Oil Company is keeping The Whistler on the air all summer without interruption. So each Sunday evening throughout the summer, when you turn to this spot on your radio dial, you can depend on finding your favorite mystery. Just as each time you turn into a Signal station... You can depend on finding a friendly, independent dealer to serve you with fine quality signal products, including the famous Go Farther gasoline. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with Go Farther gasoline. You've managed every step, haven't you, Kelly? Every one since the telephone rang in the sleeping Sam Ledford's room. The moment when you decided to take his place with the unknown air passenger who would pay $25,000 for a single mysterious flight in a rented plane. The last step was a dangerous one, wasn't it? Knocking out the mechanic at the airport, a man who realized that you weren't Sam Ledford. But it's going to be all right, isn't it, Kelly? And as you level out high above the twinkling lights of the city, you glance over at Thela in the seat beside you. Well, Thela, you said once we were in the air... Yes, I know. All right, Sam, we fly almost due south to a spot near Rosarita Beach. Across the border? Yes. There's a landing strip there. We'll sit down and wait. It's been a lot of waiting. You're getting a lot of money. Yes, I am. All right, Thela, settle back. Grab a few winks if you like. I'll wake you up at Rosarito Beach. Thela? I think they're here. Car just pulled off the highway. All right. Get back to the plane. If it's them, they'll flash the headlights off and on. 
I'm to answer with a flashlight. Check. Feeler? Yes? You're sure you don't want to tell me who this guy is? Use your head, Sam, if you want to keep it. We're across the border, aren't we? We're flying him back to the States in the dead of the night. Doesn't that say enough? $25,000 says enough. And by the way, we're not taking him back to that airport, you Of know. course not. We've got a spot all picked out on the desert. There's a car waiting, everything. Yeah, everything. Even you. Skip it, will you? And remember, not a word to him during the flight. Just keep your mind on your flying. Oh, sure. There go the car lights over there. Yes. Go on, Sam. Back to the plane. I'll answer them. Mr. Ledford. Wait. What for? I'm flying back with you. We'll return the plane. Yeah, but I got him into the States now. What about my money? You'll get your money, Mr. Ledford. Just do as you're told. But... I said do as you're told. What about this guy, Thela? Look, Nick, this plane has to go back and be set down from where it took off, and two sightseers have to get out of it. You don't want to leave any trace. Sure, sure. All right, flyboy. You wait for the lady, huh? Uh, look... I'd, I'd, I'd like to go into town for a little while. Why? I I didn't mention it, but I was having a little trouble. A fuel line. I'd, I'd feel safer if I could ride in and buy some stuff for it. What do you think, Peter? Is it necessary, Mr. Ledford? Very necessary, Mrs. Martin. The plane won't be safe otherwise. Well, Nick, I'll be flying back with him. All right. So he goes into town. Come on. You had to think fast, didn't you, Kelly? You know you can't take the plane back to the airport where you picked it up, posing as Sam Ledford. The mechanic you knocked out will have revived, reported the theft. And yet they've told you that you won't get your money until the plane is returned. You need time, don't you, Kelly? Time to think it out, decide what to do. And as you sit beside Thela and the big guy in a chauffeur-driven limousine that met you when you landed a plan begins to take shape in your mind. In town, you go through the motions of buying what you need to repair the broken fuel line, and then wait as the big guy gets into the limousine and is driven off toward the highway. You get everything you needed, Sam? Oh, yeah, yeah, all set. Well, then we might as well get back to the plane. Oh, what's the hurry? We can take a cab back any time we want. Yes, only I, I thought you'd be sort of anxious to take off. Oh, an hour or so won't make much difference. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, going to suggest we have dinner. Well, there's a spot down the street a few blocks. The Palm Inn. Yeah, well, what are we waiting for? Sam. Yep. I've been wondering. If I was going to buy another brandy? Oh, sure. No. <laughs> no, I was wondering about that 25000 What are you going to do with it? Oh, I don't know. Got a girl? Nope. Why? Oh, I don't know. Don't you ever think of the cottage small, white picket fence, roses around the door? Quit kidding, Thela. Anyway, I'm not in the market for real estate. Uh, so, uh, you're the big guy's girlfriend, huh? That's right, meaning... Nothing. All right, so he buys me everything I need. Well, have fun while you're young, I say. <laughs> you know something? I like you. I like you a lot, Eddie. Eddie? <laughs> you're a little mixed up, aren't you? Eddie, Frank, Harry, Sam. What's the difference? What are you driving at, sweetheart? What is your name, really? Sam Ledford. Uh-uh. 
You see, I closed this deal with Sam Ledford in person long before you showed up. Okay. So where does that put us? That's up to you. You went along with a deal even though you knew I wasn't Ledford. I was in the market for a new pilot. Sam was too talkative. Besides, I like you. I like your nerves. Something for a girl to fall back on. Well, you're pretty okay in my book. Uh... Kelly. First or last? Kelly Owen. Kelly Owen. I like that, too. Yeah, so let's get down to business. Now, let's start with my 25 grand. So I'm not Ledford, but I pull the job. I'm entitled to dough. Of course you are. And more. Oh? How would you like to split a hundred thousand dollars, darling? A hundred grand. Sound interesting? Very, very. Tell me more. Uh, let's get back to the plane. You have work to do. Uh, work? The fuel line, remember? Oh, oh, sure, yeah. Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Was that fuel line really giving trouble? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, sweetheart, suppose you fill me in. The big guy was willing to spend 25 grand so long as he got back into the state. Yes, I know. Oh, I said to myself, why should a little sealer pick up that dough after the job was done? Ah, double cross. So you knock off the pilot, keep the dough yourself. Why not? Go on. Well, when I saw you, another idea occurred to me. A way we could both get more than the 25,000, and I'll need your help. My help, huh? Definitely. I knew that as soon as you walked up to me in that hotel lobby. What's the deal? Nasty words. Blackmail. Oh, real nasty. Mm. But keep talking. The big guy's in the States now, and he plans to stay. Only how much do you think it would be worth to him to keep the information from the police? You tell me. Another 75000 for a starter. So, how do we set this up? First, a little trip to South America for you. I always wanted to go there, too. I'll go on to join the big guy in New Orleans. He's rented a house there. 21 Rue Saint-Germain. And? And in about a month, he gets a letter from South America. Well, the blackmail pitch. He pays off or else. I like blackmail by long distance. Much healthier. <laughs> well, Kelly, is it a deal? Yep. One more thing. How do I get to South America? Oh, that. Yeah, that. My 25 grand. I have it. You'll need, let's say, uh... 5000 to get settled. You'll want a few thousand to spend, so I'll give you half now. 12500 What about the other half? I'll hold on to it for the time being, just to be sure you don't double-cross me in South America. After you've clipped the big guy, we'll meet down there, and then... Well, you think you could stand to have me around, partner? <laughs> oh, give me time, sweetheart. I just might go to love you. <laughs> <laughs> Flying north along the coast, your mind is spinning, isn't it, Kelly? There's $25,000 in Thela's suitcase. And there will be another $75,000 once you reach South America and send the blackmail letter to the big guy. $100,000 in all, Kelly. That is, if Thela doesn't double-cross you. After all, she was willing to double-cross Sam, wasn't she? Yes. And you decide quietly not to take a chance on her, to follow through alone now. Not share the money with anyone. Not even Thiel. Darling, do me a favor. Sure. Do you have to fly over the water? It makes me nervous. Oh, what's your diff? Land the water. If you fall, you fall hard. Oh, please. Relax, Thiel. Say, uh, h- how do we address the big guy in New Orleans again? Nick Hughes, 21 Rue St. Germain. You won't forget it, will you, darling? No, no, I won't. Nick Hughes, 21 Rue St. Germain. No, I won't. Forget it! Your fist lashes out, catches Thela on the point of the chin, and she slumps down in the seat. You reach over, open the door beside her. So long, sweetheart! It's over quickly, and you're alone in the plane with a full $25,000. You swing the nose around, head inland, 
and soon ease into a landing in an empty pasture not far from the highway. A truck driver gives you a lift into Los Angeles, where you spend the rest of the night in a quiet hotel. The following morning, you're downtown. First stop, a fashionable men's store. May I help you, sir? Yeah, suit the works. I uh, beg your pardon? I tried out the best you got. Suits, sport outfits. I ran the market for a complete wardrobe. Oh, yes, sir. This way. I'll need some luggage, too. That uh, light airplane stuff. Of course. You're planning a trip? Yeah, uh, South America. Uh, by the way, where's the nearest airline office? Uh, down the street, three blocks. However, if we may be of assistance, uh, that is to say, if you should care to use our telephone... No, no, thanks. I'll walk down after I finish here. Oh, uh, Mr. Knowles, this way, please. Best man in the store. He'll take care of you. Uh, thanks. I hope you have a pleasant trip and a most enjoyable stay in South America, sir. Thanks again. I'm sure I'll have a great time. Yeah, <laughs> a great time. A friend of mine was telling me last night that when he's eating out, he always chooses a restaurant that's crowded. They must have something, he says, to be so popular. Well, by the same token, Signal Gasoline must have something. When you consider that last month, drivers bought more gallons of Signal Gasoline than during any other month in Signal history. What is that something which accounts for such increasing popularity? Hmm? Some users tell us it's good mileage, which has made Signal known throughout the West as the go-farther gasoline. Others say it's the life and pep and smooth, easy response they get with the gasoline that's engineered to help your motor run more efficiently. But frankly, friends, just as sure as my name's Marvin Miller, you're never going to know all the good reasons why so many drivers are switching to signal until you try a few tankfuls in your own car. Do it this week and see if you don't agree with me. You get a full, full measure of all the things that make driving more pleasure when you fill up with signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. The future looks bright, doesn't it, Kelly? Very. And you're looking forward to your trip to South America. You're carrying close to 25,000 with you now, and this to be more, a great deal more. Once you reach Rio and set up your plan to blackmail the big guy who has entered the United States illegally. The following morning, the airline limousine picks you up at the hotel, takes you out to the airport. And then as you're checking your luggage... Mr. Owen? Kelly Owen? Yeah, that's right. I'm Lieutenant Dawson, L.A. Homicide. Uh, homicide? Yeah. You bought a new wardrobe downtown yesterday, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Discarded the old suit you were wearing, left it at the shop? Sure. I, I, I told the clerk to give it to his favorite charity. So what? Well, you dropped something out of your wallet as you were transferring it to your new clothes. The clerk tried to catch it, but couldn't. Then when he noticed the name he'd seen in the papers, he called us. Hey, look, look, I don't follow this. Here's what the clerk found. Identification cards, including a pilot's license made out to Sam Ledford. Ledford? Yeah. Better turn in your plane ticket, Mr. Owen. You ain't going anywhere. Oh, wait a minute. What's this all about? That's what we want to know. You see, Sam Ledford was found in a hotel room late last night. Dead. He'd been murdered. M murdered? Sheila. Sheila must have got him when she went back to make that call. You were carrying Sam Ledford's pilot's license around. I'm afraid that's one you'll never be able to explain, Mr. Owen. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Meantime, Signal Oil Company and the friendly independent dealers who help you go farther with Signal Gasoline hope you'll remember. Regardless of what gasoline you use, 
you'll enjoy more miles of happy driving if you drive at sensible speeds, obey traffic regulations, and avoid taking chances. You may even save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman as the Whistler, Lamont Johnson, Betty Lou Gerson, Bill Boucher, Byron Kane, and Jack Moyles. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In The Whistler. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. Whistler's strange story, Triple Play. On the morning that a cool, distinguished-looking gentleman stepped from his limousine and made his way to the mayor's office at City Hall, casual onlookers would scarcely have suspected that an era in city government was drawing to a close. The gentleman was Daniel Cobb, known to insiders as the city's political boss to the average person as owner and publisher of the city's largest newspaper, The Star. And the future looks unusually bright to you, doesn't it, Dan? As you stop at the desk of the mayor's attractive and gracious secretary, Patricia Wilkett. Well, Patricia, is the mayor in? Yes, Dan. Shall I tell him you're here? Oh, I can wait a few minutes. You know, I shouldn't come up here at all. Oh, why not? Your beauty is simply overwhelming. I won't get a stitch of work done all day. <laughs> oh, Dan. Stupid of me, I know, to fall in love with a woman half the city is pursuing. Not if she's the right woman. Is she? She doesn't know yet, for sure. When do you suppose she will know? In the fullness of time. Now, I have work to do. All right, but don't forget who you're having dinner with tonight. How could I? Shall we take in that new play at the Globe afterward? Wonderful. I'll expect you at six, hmm? I better tell Leslie you're waiting. Mr. Cobbs is here to see you. Send him in. Dan, you going to tell him? Yes, but don't worry about Leslie. He'll take it all right. See you later, darling. Well, how's our mayor this fine morning? Never felt better. What can I do for you, Dan? I'll get right to the point. Don't have much time. I'm meeting my editors this morning at 11. Shoot. It's this way. I'm announcing your retirement from public office this evening in the last edition of The Star. Why, oh, you're... You can't be serious. I am. You're not running in the next election because you're tired of public life, Leslie. And are eager to get back to some 
real living on your farm. Oh, but I, I don't understand. I've played ball with you, haven't I? That's not the point. No complaints, but uh, frankly, there is a man I'd prefer to see as mayor. Who's that? Myself. Oh, I see. Well? Yeah, I'll step aside, naturally. Well, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, but... Well, you thought this over carefully, Dan? Of course I have. Yeah, Stump Reynolds is going to be running against you. I don't like to say this, but you won't have much of a chance against Stump. I'll take care of Stump Reynolds, Leslie. All you have to do is get out there and give me your support without any hedging. Yes, I'll welcome the opportunity. I'll do everything I can for you, Daniel. I trust you will. Oh, by the way, huh? I wish you'd see to that reception room before election. It's as cheerful as a tomb. I'd like to have it redecorated before I move in. You could cover those atrocious wire glass windows with some deep red drapes. And uh, a soft gray would do nicely for the walls. Anything else? Yes. I'd like to have the floor done in aquamarine. Aquamarine? That's right, aquamarine. A little unusual, but I like it. Okay, I'll place the contract. I admire your self-confidence, Daniel. <laughs> I bet you do. But whether you like it or not, I go after what I want. And I get it. <laughs> The moment of decision is past, isn't it, Dan? You're moving into the limelight on your own. Yes, the puppet master is stepping out on the stage. But as you break the news that you're running for mayor to your editorial board later that evening, you're seized with fear and wonder if what would happen if you lost. That's the one thing you could never face, isn't it, Dan? Defeat. But you manage to thrust aside your fears and bark out instructions to your staff. Quincy... You're in charge of publicity. I want stories in every edition. Faulkner, you'll handle the business end of this campaign, and by heaven's sake, don't count pennies. Harrison, mark this carefully. Yes, sir? I have to beat Stump Reynolds. No one else matters. I want you to take three of your best reporters and go out and get me the dirt on Reynolds. No scandal is too big or too small, understand? Perfectly, Mr. Cobb. Good. Well, that's all for today, gentlemen. Let's get started. All right, boys. The campaign is underway. There's no turning back now, is there, Dan? The headlines, stories, and pictures announcing your candidacy are all over the evening edition of The Star. And you're a little jittery when you first pick up Patricia. Take her to dinner at your club. But gradually, her beauty and warmth reassure you. And as the evening wears on, you become more confident. After the theater, you stop by her apartment for a drink. I've heard about... Stump Reynolds, Dan, but what about this other man that's running? Uh, what's his name, Coleman? John Coleman? Yes. <laughs> Don't worry about poor John. He's always running. Oh, I gather he's not much competition. A very poor third. Simple, honest John, they call him. <laughs> I believe he teaches political science at the college. Oh. Patricia, not to change the subject, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask you something. You're being very serious suddenly. I mean to be. No, Dan, please. I... Oh, Dan, you shouldn't have done that. Why not? I said in the fullness of time, remember. I'm in love with you. You know that. Yes, but I want you to wait. I'm not sure that I can, Patricia. Then we'd better not see each other for a while. When will you know? Can I take a rain check until after the election? You're going to be busy campaigning. So that's what you're waiting for. To see if I'm the next mayor. I think you ought to know, Dan... I don't like myself for it, but I'm a very ambitious woman. Don't worry. I'll win. Are you very angry with me? Yes, I am. But I can't blame you. I play to win. Why shouldn't you? I'm glad you see it that way, Dan, because that's what I'm doing. Playing to win. Now you're more anxious than ever to be elected mayor, aren't you, Dan? Because you're certain that your election will also mean your marriage to Patricia Wilkins. And Patricia means more than anything in the world to you, doesn't she, Dan? The more you think about Reynolds, the more worried you become. You must head him off. And a few days later, you arrange to meet him at a small cafe close to the city hall. Anything more, sir? No, that's fine, thank you. Stump? I'm satisfied. Now... What do you want, Dan? 
<laughs> I'm a blunt man myself, and I like a blunt man. We can dispense with the posies. All right, Stump. What do you take to pull out of the race for mayor? Well, I've never been mayor. I wouldn't know what it's worth. Suppose you tell me. Shall we say an appointment as political editor of the Star, $15,000 a year, a 10-year contract? <laughs> Four years ago, Dan, you double-crossed me and switched to Leslie Bryan. You remember that? Oh, nothing personal, Stump. Politics is a rough game. That cuts two ways. And this time, I'm going to get the personal satisfaction of beating the head man myself. You're making a mistake. Let's see what happens at the finish line. You're going to have a fight on your hands, Stump. And I don't play Marcus at Queensbury rules. It'll be a dirty campaign, and before I'm through, you'll be smeared right out of the state. Okay, Dan. <laughs> but don't forget to pick up the tab. This lunch is on you. Now, back to the whistler. campaign is in full swing now, isn't it, Dan? But beneath all your claims of a landslide victory at the polls, the cold fear of defeat is gnawing at you. Stump Reynolds' refusal to be bought off is the big worry, and you're increasingly aware of his threat to your success. Then the all-important speech before the Northside Community Club occurs. John Coleman makes the opening speech. He gets some scattered polite applause, and Stump Reynolds steps to the speaker's rostrum. You scarcely listen to Reynolds as you watch the audience. See their reactions as he sums up his stand in a daring, shocking and statement. Gentlemen, let me promise you that if I am elected mayor, the first thing I'll do is run Boss Cobbs and his crooked organization right out of the city hall and into the city jail. And then, then I'm going to sweep this town clean of the gangsters and the grafters and the gamblers. A vote for me is a vote for honest governor. <laughs> Following your introduction, which is received with a mere ripple of applause, you step to the speaker's rostrum with fists clenched and ready to fight back. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, it is a pleasure to be here this evening among my many friends and readers. Most of you have known me for many years and know how I have always fought for good government and the best interests of our city. <laughs> You do your best, but the rest of your speech doesn't go well, does it, Dan? And as you leave, you're sure defeat is staring you in the face. The next morning, you know it's even worse, as you face the leaders of your own organization at an emergency meeting. Do you still figure on beating Reynolds, Dan? I'll beat him yet, Charlie. I know I will. You can make yourself a chunk of money, Dan. The bookies are given five to one, you lose. I know, I know. Bookies and polls have been wrong before. Eh? Well, you're the boss, Dan. What you say goes... We all think you ought to pull out and run Leslie Bryan for re-election. I want a little more time, boys. I'll get something on Reynolds, some dirt. I promise you I'll find a way to beat him. You don't sleep at all well that night, do you, Dan? And as much as you bully your reporters during the next few days, they can pin nothing of consequence on Stump Reynolds. Then one evening, as you're nervously pacing back and forth in your downtown apartment, the doorbell rings. Patricia. Hello, Dan. I can only stay a minute. Oh, sit down. Drinks? Yes, thanks. Scotch and water. Yeah, I'll fix it right out. You know, I've missed you. I've missed you, too. I suppose you're up to date on the campaign. Yes, that's why I'm here. Mm. Your scotch. Thanks. Did, uh... Leslie Bryan sends you with a gentle hint that I quit? No, good news. I'd like to hear some. Leslie's got a tip on Stump Reynolds. What? He's found his weak spot. It uh, seems Reynolds can't keep away from the poker and dice table. Once or twice a week, he sneaks away to a small spot on the outskirts of town called the 611 Club. Are you sure? Quite sure. 
Thank you, Patricia. Well, don't thank me. Thank Leslie Bryan. Do that for me, will you? He's been a real friend. Let me get to the phone. I'll talk to you later, darling. It's only a week later that the 611 Club is raided with Stump Reynolds trapped inside. And you wait outside with a full complement of reporters and photographers. Uh, this is a police raid. All entrances are covered. Everybody inside, remain where you are. <laughs> the police are bringing him out now. <laughs> Doesn't Stump look dapper in handcuffs? <laughs> Harrison, get to work. Yes, sir. Joe, get some shots of him and the cop. Pete, train your lens on the patrol wagon. Get some pictures of the cops shoving them in. Then follow them down to the city jail. Be sure to get a big one of Reynolds behind bars. Very good, Harrison. Very good. Well, the police are bringing him this way. <laughs> Hello, Reynolds. Good to see you. I'll get you for this, cops. I swear it. <laughs> All's fair in love, war, and politics, Mr. Reynolds. <laughs> and the next afternoon, you receive the best news of all, don't you, Dan? It happens while you're celebrating Stump Reynolds' arrest with a few political cronies around the radio at a bar in the lobby of the Star Building, waiting for the announcement you know is coming. Ladies and gentlemen, a late bulletin from our newsroom. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Stump Reynolds announced just a few moments ago from his campaign headquarters that he is retiring from the race for mayor. <laughs> Mr. Reynolds, who was released from jail this morning following his arrest during a gambling raid, was running on a clean government platform. <laughs> now, back to our music. Gentlemen, a toast, gentlemen, to Stump Reynolds and clean government. <laughs> For the first time in months, you begin to breathe easy, don't you, Dan? Because everything is coming along fine. And you can daydream of being introduced to cheering crowds as Mayor Daniel Cobb, with Patricia at your side, the beautiful, charming first lady of the city. And then on Monday afternoon, Harrison bursts into your office. Dan, look at these headlines on the telegram and the ledger. What? Daniel Cobb's exposed as wife and child deserter. Yeah, but listen to this. A suit was filed against Daniel Cobb today in Superior Court by dancer Thelma Evans for $100,000. Thelma Evans? Miss Evans charges that the leading candidate in the race for mayor married her under the name of Paul Evans 10 years ago in Mexico City what? and deserted her in three months. She demands support of their child. It's an outrageous, libelous lie. I'll... I, I, I... Yo, what, Dan? Reynolds. How did you get in here? I wanted to see your face, Dan. You know it's not true. I know it's not true, but do the vote. I'll have this cheap little Thelma Evans in jail for blackmail. You can't stop anyone from suing you, Dan. <laughs> you, you, I'm beginning to see whose fine hand is behind all of this. Well, I'm willing to take part of the credit. I'm warning you. You don't like it when the shoe's on the other foot, do you? <laughs> so long, Dan. No, 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 wait, wait. I'll admit it. You've got me. Huh? Uh... You remember that offer I made you, political editor? I'll, I'll make it twenty thousand a year. I wouldn't take it if you made it a hundred thousand. Why, you remember jerk. what you said, Mister Cobbs? All fair in love, war, and um, politics. <laughs> <laughs> the opposition newspapers won't let go of Thelma Evans' charges, will they, Dan? And in spite of all your denials, the scandal takes hold and grows. Even some of your own supporters begin to think that where there's smoke, there's fire. Finally, at another uh, emergency meeting. Well, we've gone along with you as far as we're going to, Dan. Oh, bosh. The phony charges of a stupid little dancer send you all running for cover. I'll say this thing through. Alone? Well, you wouldn't dare dump me now. Oh, yes, we would. We're drafting Leslie Bryan to run for re-election uh -huh. as the people's choice. Right, right. We expect you to jump on the bandwagon. Oh, I have no choice. All right. All right, I'll go along. Mm -hmm. 
You withdraw from the race the following day, don't you, Dan? Giving ill health is the reason. Urging your supporters to re-elect Leslie Bryan. And almost immediately, Patricia turns her attention toward him, doesn't she? She's seen everywhere with him. One night, you're having a drink at the bar of the Precinct Political Club when... Don't you recognize old friends anymore? Who tipped you off about the 611 Club? Why don't you tell me who engineered that cheap lawsuit and dug up that Thelma Evans? All right. I'll swap I don't trust you. Well, what difference does it make now? We're both dead. That's so. Well, if you want to know, Leslie Bryan told me. Leslie Bryan. <laughs> oh, what's so funny? <laughs> Leslie Bryan. <laughs> Leslie Bryan cooked up the Thelma Evans charges. What? I shelled out the money, but he hired her and had her flown in from the east. Oh. <laughs> Leslie Bryan didn't think he had it in him. Bryan. <laughs> Leslie Bryan. He got us both. The more you think about it, the angrier you get. And the more you hate Leslie Bryan. The way he made a fool of both you and Stump Reynolds. And making almost certain his own re-election. An event which would greatly weaken, if not destroy, your chances of marrying Patricia Wilkins. And now you want Patricia more than ever. Suddenly it hits you. If something happened to Leslie Bryan, the main obstacle to your marriage to Patricia would be removed. And you love her enough to make certain something does happen to Leslie Bryan. Don't you, Dan? As the days pass, you wonder more and more just how to bring this about. And finally, a plan begins to take form. You know Leslie Bryan's habits. Know that he completes the routine business of his office in the evening hours when the city hall is deserted and he can work without disturbance. The following Monday evening, you leave your downtown apartment and take a cab to within a few blocks of the city hall. And you pay off the driver and walk the rest of the way. Let yourself in through a rear door left open for janitors and charwomen. Find your way to the mayor's office on the fourth floor without being seen. And then you grope your way through the dark reception room until you find the door to Leslie's private office. Who's there? Who's there? Damn, you idiot. What are you doing? Put away that gun. Sorry, Leslie, but your political career is over. <laughs> return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to the whistler. Now that Leslie Bryan is dead, you feel better, don't you, Dan? And you're sure you'll get away with it, aren't you? Mayors of large cities have been assassinated before, and that's what you're counting on, that the police will consider it the work of some fanatic. You're at least certain that they will be slow in suspecting a man of your eminence. And so, Dan, when a detective from headquarters comes to your apartment an hour later, you're in an easy chair, a drink in hand, your feet resting comfortably on the hassock. You're a little surprised to see Patricia Walcott with the detective, but you don't let it disturb you. You answer all his questions frankly and openly. You're sure Brian had no enemies, Mr. Cobbs? In politics, everybody is your friend and your enemy. You were an enemy of Leslie Bryan's? Politically, yes. Uh-huh. But not personally? No, I wouldn't say so. What were you doing in his office this evening about the time he was killed? You're mistaken, officer. Oh, no, I'm not. I've been looking at the soles of your shoes for the last five minutes. There's a lot of paint on them. I don't know a lot about colors, but uh, I'd say it was aquamarine. So what? That doesn't mean I killed Leslie Bryan. It does, unless you can explain that paint. The painters were there this evening after the city hall closed at 5, and they left around 8. You must have gotten there about 9. I'm afraid you'll have to come down to headquarters, submit to a path and test. Now, just a minute. Oh, stop it, Dan. You killed Leslie Bryan, and you know it. Funny you should be caught by the aquamarine paint on the floor. It was you who gave the orders to have it done. Too bad you killed Leslie. You see, I would have stopped his re-election anyway. You? Yes, me. He was a crook like the rest of you. 
I had the goods on him on at least a half a dozen crooked paving and building contracts. I was going to give the story to the newspapers a week before the election. What's this? Oh, Dan, you don't really believe that Leslie thought of Thelma Evans or knew about Stump Reynolds' gambling habits. It was you. Still catching on. Sorry, Dan, that you won't be able to attend my wedding. Your wedding? Yes, I'm going to marry the man I've been engaged to these past two years. Simple, honest John Coleman, I believe you called him. The political science professor, remember? Our next mayor. by Wilbur Hatch and is the property of Herman Music Incorporated as Cap Hollywood, California. Broadcast rights granted solely to Audio Arts Productions, La Mirada, California.